The Servant and the Scoundrel by Chris R. Sandrowski. Chapter 1. Gathering Clouds I could tell you the life of Alorianas is all honor and glory. I could boast that I stand beside my king, donned in the height of Desmonian fashion, an indispensable element of his court, and all the king's surveys. But reality is a far, far dirtier and random mess. You see, I am but a cog in the royal machine, a feather in the great duster that is Castle Sraden's labor force. My name and deeds will fade it into history, a footnote in the long line of master servants known as Thalorianas. I am the king's servant and general. But my army does not wield swords. They prefer butcher knives and cleavers instead of axes and broadswords. Our sole enemy, the unorganized whims of reality. When I am gone, the castle will live on, its halls polished, its shelves dusted, and all by a new and hopefully equal Lorianas. That was service. That was my life. I reminded myself of this as I stared into the king's clogged toilet chute. It was feces I was in the business of this morning. Hardened feces. And that, my friend, is the real life of a Lorianas. Bring in the scrapers, I said, wiping my filthy hands on a greasy cloth, and make sure they do a thorough job this time. I won't have time to inspect their work. My apprentice, a young culver boy named Jaya Nidem, nodded and scuttled off down the hall. He was a fifteen-turn old boy perpetually sunburnt from his days scrapping in the toxic culver waste. Just another doe-eyed youth, ignorant to the fact that some day he too might command the castle hands and walk in the shadow of the king, perhaps even die in it. I did have other acquaintances, though. One can't be Lorianas without allies. But even those whom I deem friends keep me at arm's length. To them, I am the overlord who scrutinizes every detail of Sraden, the fanatic who uncorks every bottle of wine and who ignites every Talafay cream cake. I am in charge of 115 servants, men and women who have all trekked to Sraden in the hopes of working alongside me. Together we scrub and scrape away its many imperfections until only an illusion remains. That is our skill, our power. But it is no easy task. Unlike the charges of the Isle, there are no magic rocks or rings to aid me in my quest. All forms of magic are strictly forbidden by the Loriana's order. Therefore, we alone are the cultivators of splendor, the dreamweavers whose sole purpose is to elevate our masters above the highest standards of the day. We are the order in the chaos, the mop in the filth, the feather duster wiping cobwebs from the world. We exist to serve and serve alone. But that all changed one morning, as I entered King Donan's stuffy bedchamber and smelled the fetid air. My footfalls echoed across the king's bedchamber, as they had every morning for the past fifteen turns. The same familiar sliver of sunlight cut across the grey marble floor, illuminating a thickening layer of dust. Three weeks earlier, I banned his personal attendants from the bedchamber. The servants were masters at gleaning information from the king, and it would do no good for others to learn of his condition. The dust will have to be dealt with, though, I thought, as a cobweb rippled before my eyes. And soon, on the west side of the room, the crimson curtains remained shut, as they had for almost a turn. Only the faintest bit of sunlight crept in around their edges, casting an eerie red twilight across the chamber. A far cry from its glory days, I thought. Just a few decades earlier, it had been the most sacred room in all of Sraden Castle, the very birthplace of every Deciman king since the dawn of recorded history. And now it's a tomb for a dying old man. Good day, your majesty, I whispered as I approached the enormous bed. It was situated in the center of the chamber, an incredibly ornate piece of furniture cut from a single piece of rare delcium wood. It was far too large and decadent, even for the bachelor king, and it was in desperate need to be turned down. The many silk pillows and sheets were covered in stains, and the mattress had taken on a foul, bodily odor. The king's thin, gangly legs dangled over the bed, entangled in a waterfall of sweat-soaked sheets. His pale face lay half-buried in a sea of stained silk pillows, 
and his chest rose and fell with a slight crackle. I did it again. He groaned. I knelt down. Vomit covered the right side of the bed and floor. Never mind that, your highness. I placed a hand against his sweaty brow. As I feared his flesh felt like a blast furnace, I dabbed his brow with a clean silk cloth and feigned a smile. I would tend to it all. To some, the final turns of an aging king's reign are a period best avoided. And understandably, many once great men spend their last days soiling themselves as they sink into pits of madness and despair. But this man was not just my king, he had become my friend, and like my father and his father before him, the royal household was my life. Lorianas take no wives nor sire any children. We serve our king, and our king alone. For life, and when he steps beyond the veil of shadows, we follow so that we may continue to serve in the hereafter. I felt my chest tighten as I began cleaning up the king's vomit. In a way, he was the son I could never have. A son who held the power of an army in the palm of his hand. That would soon change, though. Whispers of his condition had rippled throughout the capital. Many of the noblemen were already forming secret alliances in preparation for the power vacuum, certain to follow his death. A death which was creeping closer with every passing day. For the time being, though, King Donan was still in power, and before he died, his last wish was to end the rivalry between Deciman and our archenemy, Strantodin. For over fifty turns, the Strantodians had been raping and pillaging our coastal farmsteads and villages, but that was all coming to an end. In just a few days, a Strantodian delegation was arriving to negotiate peace between our two kingdoms, a peace they needed as much as us. For like my king, the Strantodians were a dying people, poisoned by the toxic air belched forth from the many expended meridium mines dotting their land, the same foul fumes which had slowly altered their physiology, much like the people of Triton. I pondered this as I began cleaning up the king's mess. News of Triton's fall had just reached Sredin. Shark Rider clans had blown up the metal city's support systems, dropping its dome into the sea. Now scrappers and criminal clans ruled the rusting carcass, rationing off its many wonders to the highest bidders. This was becoming a problem for Sredin. In that blast we lost a major manufacturer of rare and precious equipment. Equipment we desperately needed for the approaching summit. The Strantodians were unable to breathe our air, and just one Triton air filter now cost almost 500 times more than it had a turn earlier, and we need dozens more in order to cater to the Strantodians. I lifted the chamber pot and winced at the odor. Well, am I dead yet? the king asked. Before I continue, allow me to tell you something about excrement. It is a reviled thing, and rightfully so but one can glean much information from it with an open eye and nose. For instance, it can tell you whether or not the excreta was a drinker with a weak liver, or an adrena addict prone to chewing on their fingernails. It can also reveal if the individual favoured brothels and all the vile discharges that accompany such dalliances. It's all there, swirling about in the bottom of the pot, waiting to tell us its tale like bones tossed down by a crone. It's an ugly job. Thankless, especially for a man skilled in every culinary art form on Retract d'Or. But that is the charge of a Lorianas, to care for the king's every need, no matter how ugly or rotten. I am his Lorianas, his servant, now and in the hereafter. I repeated the Lorianas mantra over and over again as I examined the pot's contents. I had used it countless times since graduating from Cilium d'Or, the famed Loriana's school on Vespinor. It was a soothing mantra, invigorating, a reminder that even the dirtiest jobs were of the utmost importance. However, this time was different. The king was fading, and fading fast. The black cell disease had spread into his liver and lungs, and was now devouring the organs. How he came to be infected with it was still a mystery. Most men contracted it in the brothels, or from working in the toxic culver waste. But King Donan had no taste for women.
and he spent most of his days in his private library with his face buried in books. He had no vices that I was aware of and ate a strict, if not bland, diet of vegetables and fish. A good man, dedicated to his people without need for adulation or worship. One might even say a boring man. So why is he being struck down by the gods? I thought as I placed a cloth over the bedpan. Well, will I see another moon? he asked. I didn't reply. The king would be lucky if he saw another week, let alone a new moon. Even now his face and chest were covered in stinking lesions, and he could barely stand without the aid of a cane. I feel as if I've drunk from every cistern in Nithra, the king lamented. He began coughing violently. When it passed, he wiped his bloody palms across his robe and sighed. Is this it? Is this what it all comes down to after turns of dedicated rule? I remained silent. His fever was getting the best of him. Soon other symptoms would rear their ugly heads, paralysis, blindness, loss of hair, and eventually madness. The king scanned the chamber. Where are my maids? I ordered them away, your highness. We don't need rumors circulating through the halls. Bring them back, the king demanded. This room is in shambles. I will tend to it myself, your majesty. He turned to me and paused as a grin cracked his sweaty face. What would I do without you, Philem? I smiled but remained silent. It was not my place to accept compliments from a king. I am a mere servant treading in the shadows of giants, I reminded myself. We Lorianas have no knack for magic, and we never take up the sword. We can tell you how many torches burn in our castle halls. And I'm sure most Lorianas know how many steps lead to their king's bedchamber. In my fifteen turns as Sredin's Lorianas, I've discovered just about every hideaway and secret passage hidden in these walls, and I can also recite the name and title of every member of the royal household, servant and nobility alike. I am an expert in every wine known to man, and I have studied beneath the finest cooks in all nine kingdoms. I am a master tailor and cobbler, and have trained in horse riding since birth. Yet even with all of these skills, I consider myself nothing more than a humble servant. For my father, Gaunius Klain, was the true master of our craft, and the finest Lorianas ever to walk Sredin's halls. At twenty turns old, Gaunius became the youngest Lorianas to ever graduate from Cilium Dor. Within a month, he was appointed to Sredin Castle as its hundredth Lorianas. It didn't take long for him to meet my mother, who at the time was nothing more than a scullion working in the grand kitchen. Within a month, the two secretly broke his Loriana's vows and sired a baby boy. A baby boy they named Philem Klain. It was a proud name, for it came from the founder of the Loriana's order, Philem Alduin. He was the greatest servant ever to walk upon Retract Door. During his time as the first Loriana's, he forged a multifaceted army of artisans and experts who carried neither weapons nor meridium. Instead, they were trained in every facet of royal life. Even the most mundane chores were handled with the utmost care and expertise. For a good Lorianas was expected to keep candles burning in every window of their castle, or prepare a six-course feast for three hundred souls. Some had even been inventors, like Prue Slame the Western Lorianas who designed the Slame Bell system, which was strung throughout most modern-day castles. The king stood, his bones popping and creaking as he stretched his emaciated body. He was only thirty turns old, yet he looked well into his sixties. What remained of his thinning hair had turned grey and brittle, and his face had become a pallid mass of sores and blackheads. How are preparations coming along for tonight? he asked as he fanned his sweaty face. Everything is in order, Your Majesty. The Strantodians left Dulip a day ago and should be here by tomorrow evening. The king nodded. And the great hall? Has the work been completed? The Triton glass makers finished installations last night, I replied. The Strantodian side of the hall is sealed, and almost all of the air filters have been installed. Very well. The king approached a thick red curtain and pulled it open. Sunlight flooded the chamber, 
revealing its sorry state. The king squinted as the sun cut across his sore-covered face. Much hinges on this meeting. I nodded. Decimon and Strantodin had been at war for almost fifty turns. Violent, bloody war over northern lands now scorched and trodden into dust. This summit marked the first time both kingdoms had simultaneously sued for peace. A peace that was much needed after turns of endless bloodshed. This meeting, it could change everything, the king said. End this fucking war once and for all. I swallowed. The pressure was mounting. You could taste tension in the air, and it wasn't just the king and I who felt it. Every servant and soldier was on edge, awaiting the arrival of our darkest enemy. Have I ever thanked you, for Lem? My heart stopped. Your Majesty. He glanced at me, a shockingly earnest expression upon his face. Have I ever thanked you for your service? I bowed. Serving you is thanks enough, your majesty. He smiled. I really don't know how I could have done it all without you. I stood shocked. For a king to admit such a thing was highly irregular. You're my only friend, Philem, he went on. I see that now. He approached me and placed a hand on my shoulder. I'm not long for this world. You know it. I know it. Hell, the entire kingdom suspects it by now. And soon, so will the Strantodians. I remained silent. I already knew what that meant for me. Do you remember Darius Wilmot? He asked. How could I ever forget such a man? I replied. A tested warrior and gentleman of impeccable wit and grace. Darius had also been general of Sredin's forces for over twenty turns, and the king's secret lover until his demise at the Battle of Shadow Cove. The king sat back down on the bed, smiling. I felt a warmth wash over me, his smile. It wasn't like the one he wore at court. It reminded me of when he was a child. He had been so full of life then, so confident. Now he was both vulnerable and weak. The king gestured to a chair beside him. Join me, old friend. I swallowed. Of course, your majesty. The king draped an arm over the back of his chair and stretched out his legs. I still miss him, you know. I nodded. Darius was a good man. A true diamond in the rough. The king sighed. It's too bad he left us when he did. I could use his diplomatic talents now. Darius had been both a general and a court emissary, a rare combination considering his military background. But his expertise was political deception, a talent that had kept our country out of just about every major conflict since before the Meridian War. That is, until our navy locked horns with Strantodin's fleet at the Battle of the Shadow Cove, in just one day over twenty thousand souls, both Decimenian and Strantodian alike, perished beneath the waves. Half of our two naval fleets sunk in a single day, I thought. Darius had been at the vanguard of the battle, and one of the first to perish. I suppose it's time I handled the Strantodians on my own, though, he said. Leave my own legacy behind. He wiped his eyes. It's just too bad my days grow short. My chest suddenly felt heavy. I had known the truth about his health for some time, but to hear it come from the king's mouth made it feel all too real. And you know what that means, he said. I nodded. I'm a Lorianas. It is my honor to serve, here and in the hereafter. The king coughed into his hands. His labored breaths rattled in his chest, and tiny droplets of blood covered his palms. For thousands of turns, the king's Lorianas has joined him in death, he said. Some earlier than hoped, some far later. He looked me in the eyes. Your own father chose the Lorianas' path. Yet I never asked you how you felt about it. I took a deep breath. When King Raunius died, my father commit suicide, as was the Loriana's way. But it had happened so fast, I was never given the chance to say goodbye. My father had chosen service over his son, and for this I was granted access to Cilium Dor. But for turns, his choice had tortured me. 
What did loyalty mean if it came at the cost of family? And why didn't father say goodbye? I thought. I glanced at the king's withered hands. He was still a young man. So why were the gods allowing him to die in such a cruel manner? Perhaps they just don't care about us, I thought. Or maybe they didn't even exist. The king reached out and squeezed my hand. It's okay. You may speak freely. I cleared my throat. As my father did, I will follow you wherever duty demands. Donan huffed. Duty. The word rolled off his tongue venomously. It's been the bane of my existence ever since I became king. He met my eyes. Before I was handed this wretched crown, do you know what I desired to be? I shook my head. A cook. Just an ordinary cook. This shocked me. I loved the sweaty dance of the kitchens, that wild abandon that permeates everyone there. I smiled. It was indeed a dance, a wild one filled with ups and downs and heated chaos. To outsiders it was a view of the hells. To men like Opon and I, bringing order to it all was a thing of pleasure. For us, producing the world's finest dishes beneath Sredin's roof was both an honor and art form. The yearning for perfection on every level was as important to us as a trade deal was to the king. So seeing that same understanding in his eyes awoke wonderment and surprise in my soul. I, I never knew, I replied. Why would you? It was my secret and obsession. But then my father and brother died, and like that, he snapped his finger. My fate was sealed. I stood silent watching as he stared into the fire. He looked so lost, so forlorn. You know, I always prayed the old men would live to be overthrown. They would have stripped me of my birthright, freeing me of this accursed crown. My pulse quickened. I had never heard the king speak such things. It was bordering on heresy. You can't mean that, your majesty. He nodded. But I do. Every last word of it. This was never for me for Lim. None of it. I just wanted to live in peace with Darius, maybe open a small tavern on the edge of some distant city, maybe Nithra or Cumulty, but not rule, not spend my life trapped in this bloody castle dealing with sycophants and plotting noblemen. But you have done so much for this realm, I said. Have I? You ended the shark rider raids along the coast and arrested the Menuti factions that had gathered in the south. You even heralded in the complete restoration of Sredin Castle. These are no small feats, your majesty. They're not great ones either. He stood and approached the fireplace on the opposite side of the room. In the flickering light he looked like any other commoner, the pomp of his station all but replaced with uncertainty and sadness. I just want some peace in my final days, Philem, but I won't fucking find it knowing you're going to join me in death. My eyes widened. That Loriana's tradition was a silent one. To speak of it out loud was forbidden. Yet here he is openly promoting parting ways with it. I thought, I, I don't understand. He raised his hand for silence. I won't see you wasted like some burial cloth. You're the finest Lorianas in all the nine kingdoms. He tightened his robe around his emaciated body. The living deserve a man like you, not the dead. I'll be just fine in the hereafter on my own. But your majesty, I cur... He raised his hand again. It's settled, and I won't hear any more about it. I stood, my heart thundering in my throat. Forgive me, your majesty, but this will soil my name for all time. What of my father and his father before him? Their names will all be shamed if I breathe when you do not... The king warmed his hands above the flames. I've thought this through over many nights, and you will see no shame. I've seen to that. How? I asked. The king glanced at me, a mischievous glint in his eyes. I want you to personally oversee the summit feast. We need something unprecedented for our guests, and I'd like the games room to be prepared as well. I understand the Strantodians are quite fond of skulls. Skulls, your majesty. Don't worry. We won't be using a Barnite parasite. It will be more of a symbolic game. 
I swallowed. Skulls was a game of chance favored in the shadows, especially in places like Iang and the Culver, where law was all but forgotten and desperation dominated common sense. It was a game of death, plain and simple, a game for scoundrels and adrenaline addicts with nothing to lose. Before I go on, let me further explain the game of skulls to you. It consists of three ornate human skulls, each with a hole drilled into its cranium, revealing the mummified brain within. One of the three brains is randomly infected with the deadly Barnite parasite, an organism which awakens when it comes into contact with blood. Before the game begins, a cup of scorp blood is inserted into each skull. The players then sip from the skull mouths until someone dies. But it is not a clean, painless death. Once consumed, blood and other bodily fluids erupt from every orifice in the body, followed by diarrhea and vomiting. Once the parasite takes hold, the victim finally chokes to death on their own liquefied organs. It is a barbaric practice that is not just confined to the seedy bars of the world. Royalty have been known to use it in order to end political disputes and wars, a final solution to unsolvable problems. And that was why the current situation baffled me. We were on the verge of finally making peace with our enemy. Why would the king resort to such barbarism when we were so close to our goal? Our navy was at full strength and stationed all along the northern coast. Our soldiers had better armor, weapons and training than the Strantodians. We were the strongest kingdom in the Eastern Hemisphere, undefeated in battle and wealthy beyond all measure. So why would my liege resort to a rigged game of skulls to end a war with a country that was finally open to peace? I pondered this as I made the king's bed and laid his clothes out for the day. What would happen when no one died after sipping from the three skulls? Would Galnius Wren storm out of the chamber and call his army to war? Would the two men have a good laugh and begin negotiations? Or would one of them kill the other right then and there? I swallowed my reservations as I dressed the king. My place was to serve. If that meant preparing a game of skulls, so be it. I am a Lorianas and I do not question the motives of kings, at least not openly. But I do question the motives of friends. Is there no other way to deal with this man? I asked as I draped his ceremonial robe over King Donan's bony shoulders. It was made of the finest material on Retrack Door, an incredibly rare silk culled from grub worms found deep beneath the jungle city of Nithra. Such material was worth more than my life. But as I draped it over the skeletal king, it looked more like a burial gown. You know these people, the king replied. This is what they understand. Not treaties, not summits. Nothing short of a dance with death will end this war. But what happens when he finds out there is no parasite, I dared to ask. King Donan smiled. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. I smoothed out the robe and brushed lint from his back and shoulders. But to resort to such a barbaric gam, sometimes the simplest gestures are needed to move forward, he said, cutting me off. I would have preferred a sword duel. But alas, my Strantodian counterpart cares little for swordplay, and my current state doesn't exactly help. Gambling is his vice, so what better way to end this nightmare than to play to his needs? I placed his gold necklace around his neck. If this is your wish, I will obey. The king glanced over his shoulder at me. You don't approve? I brushed lint from his shoulders. You may speak freely, Phileam. A game of skulls is beneath you. Your majesty. For fuck's sake, stop addressing me as your majesty. When we're alone. I sighed. Very well, your... He frowned. Very well. He nodded. These Strantodians, they are not like us, I went on. They're desperate animals with one leg caught in a snare. They'll do or say anything to end this war, but only because they are losing it. And you think catering to their ways will show weakness? I think it shows a lack of decorum and resolve. We are Desmonians, to lower ourselves to Strantodians' ways. It's just absurd. The king sighed. Sometimes you have to swallow a bitter pill 
in order to vomit up poison, my old friend. This isn't a bitter pill, though, I replied. It's scorp blood and a barnite parasite. I picked up the king's meridium crown from the golden pillar situated beside his mirror. It was a heavy, awkward thing, deliberately designed to be uncomfortable when worn. No jewels adorned it, and there was but a single inscription on the inner band written in the ancient Desmonian tongue. No man shall be settled upon the throne, nor comfortable while wielding its power. Let the weight of the world remind you power is but a fleeting vice. Trust me, the king said, as he noticeably slumped beneath the crown's weight. This is the only way. I sighed but held my tongue. I would obey, but I didn't have to like it. The king approached the chamber door. Begin preparations, my friend. I will be down within the call. He exited the chamber, his uneven footfalls clacking awkwardly down the cavernous hall. I tore the soiled sheets from his bed. I was angry. For turns, Yulin Donan had ruled with grace and mercy. He was a man of the people, a kind and generous ruler who had brought prosperity to Decimon. He deserved better than this. Far better. As I tucked a fresh sheet beneath the straw mattress, my foot nudged something beneath the bed. I knelt. A small chest sat covered in dust. I pulled it free and wiped its surface with my handkerchief. A single sentence was inscribed upon the lid. Fate favors the brave. Death favors the weak. I opened the lid and felt my heart tremble. Three skulls sat inside, nestled in individual silk-lined depressions. Each one was bleached and covered with gold ornamentation. But what unnerved me most were the blue sapphires twinkling inside their eye sockets. I lifted the center skull from the chest. I could see my reflection shifting and refracting inside the multifaceted sapphires. I wondered how many men had seen the same sight moments before their horrific deaths. I removed the spout from its cranium and peered into its brain cavity. The mummified organ was still visible, a grey, desiccated thing that had shrunk to the size of a walnut. Once scorp blood touched it, though, any barnite parasite slumbering within would awaken. I put the skull back and slammed the lid shut. This was not the way to broker peace with the enemy. It's his choice, though, I told myself. A choice I must follow no matter what, even if it meant my death. In the past fifty turns only two Lorianas have followed their charges into the great beyond. The most well-known was Fratnim Ewan, the famed warrior Lorianas from Kasmir, who had fought alongside King Erwin during the War of Bones eight hundred turns ago. It was said he slayed almost fifty men before being burned alive alongside King Erwin in Castle Dopwin's Great Hall, a true Lorianas who followed our creed until his last agonizing breaths. The other man was my father, Wardius Clane. Unlike Fratnim, though, my father was no warrior. Violence was outlawed amongst our brotherhood soon after the War of Bones. Wardius's specialty was unquestionable loyalty to his charge, King Raunius. For over thirty turns, he tended to Castle Sredin, remaining at his post even during the great rot outbreak that eventually claimed more than half the people on Decimon, including King Raunius. And father, I thought, my stomach roiling. Within calls of the king's passing, Wardius took his own life by jumping from the castle rampart. I took a moment to digest this. I still missed my father incredibly. He had represented everything Loriana's strive for, dedication, duty, honor, unfettered loyalty. He had lived up to our every creed, dedicating his life to the perfection of the court, a perfection he completed with his final act as Loriana's. What greater glory was there? Perhaps saying goodbye to his son, I thought bitterly. I picked up the dusty box. This section of the castle would be mostly empty this time of day, so I wouldn't have to explain what I was doing to every fool that walked past. As I negotiated the twisting corridors, I kept a low profile, sticking to the lesser-used wings whenever I could. A few servants noticed me in passing, but they were smart enough to keep to themselves. Perhaps they could sense the box's dark purpose. I descended the eastern stairwell and made my way into the grand kitchen. As I rounded the final turn, 
I was quickly embraced by its welcoming heat. Morning, Philem, came a gruff voice as I marched past the prep tables. I smiled. OP? To anyone else in Sredin, he was master cook upon Thali, Castle Sredin's culinary wizard. To me, he was OPI, my dearest and oldest friend. He was a surly and rough man, but an incredibly hard worker with a heart of gold. That is, as long as you didn't fool with his recipes. Prep's almost done, Upon said as he diced an onion. He had a large, imposing frame, but inside he was a gentle giant who spent every day and night in the kitchens, experimenting, grinding, preparing. He never spoke of sleep, and I rarely found him outside of the sweltering kitchens. I tucked the box beneath my chipped wooden desk and wiped a smudge of dust from my tunic. Where do we stand for dinner service at the feast? Upon shook his head and laughed. These Strantodians are a strange lot, he said. Fucking mirewood soup. Honey glazed Draba. I would expect such requests in an Ixin flophouse, but not here in the king's court. I couldn't have agreed more, but these were the specific requests made by the Strantodian emissaries. To not follow even the most minute detail could end peace talks before they even began. It's not pretty, I'll admit, I said. His Majesty would be better off dining from a trough, but that is their diet, I'm afraid. And the king insists we deliver it. Well, it's shit, Upon replied. I put on my apron and cinched it about my waist. Upon cocked an eyebrow. And what are you doing? I am helping tonight, I replied. This is too important for any mistakes. Upon huffed. Only mistake here is our choice of menu. I ignored him as I walked between the two enormous tables situated in the center of the grand kitchen. Quaifs chopped carrots and onions, while lesser cooks shucked mirewood grain from their hideous black cobs. The more experienced cooks filleted draba birds and sturgeon fish. It was a vile meal with an even worse stink. But soon it will be a feast for kings, I thought as I inspected the odd ingredients. And myself, of course. For Lorianas were required to taste everything prior to serving. We acted as the royal food tasters, as well as servants. Nothing could be given to the king without it first crossing my tongue. I left the cooks to their work and moved on to the cutlery stored in the master cupboard. Everything would have to be disinfected before being laid out on the tables. The Strantodians lacked a proper immune system due to their homeland's toxic atmosphere. This meant Everything in Sraden Castle posed a risk of infection. Every plate, fork, cup, chair, table, anything that might come into contact with our guests had to be boiled in salt water. It also meant the great hall needed to be divided by a glass wall, with special air pumped in to match the Strantodian's toxic atmosphere. I'm ashamed to admit this, but prior to the summit, I had only ever seen a Strantodian once before. Their emissaries arrived ten turns ago seeking charges to help cleanse the Meridium mine fires burning on their southern shores. To my surprise, the king conceded to their pleas and granted them two of our best charges in the hopes of solidifying an alliance between our two nations. However, after only one turn, both charges were accused of stealing Meridium dust from Castle Elop stores and immediately put to the sword. Since then, our only relations with the Strantodians have existed solely on the field of battle. I placed the royal cutlery into the boiling water and headed out to the Grand Hall where dinner would be served. As I began preparing the king's table, one of the younger servants approached me. Lorianas Klain, the powdered young man said, bowing. His name was Porth Sama, a Lorianas apprentice fresh in from Cilium Dor. All seals are checked and secure. He wore an apprentice's robe, rough cotton dyed red and covered in grease stains. It was meant to both shame and remind him that something as simple as our appearance can alter the perception of both one's self and the kingdom. He would wear it for five more turns before receiving the traditional blue tunic and pants of the Lorianas. Only then could he walk in the king's shadow, humbled to be of service without desire or ambition. 
very well, I said, as I laid out a set of forks three inches to the right of the king's gold charger plate. I used my index finger to measure, making sure each utensil was exactly two knuckle lengths from the table's edge. When will the Tritonese engineers arrive with those pumps? Sometime later today, Lorianas, Porth replied. I've already sent a carriage to the docks to await their arrival. I plucked several pieces of lint from the tabletop and pocketed them. Alert me when they arrive. I wish to be present when they begin installing them. He nodded. What of Jilan Denma? I asked. Has he arrived with his team? Porth hesitated. What is it? Their ship, the Draba Queen, arrived just the other day. Only, for the sake of the gods, spit it out. It was empty, he said. No crew, no cooks, and no Jilan, and the main mast was torn to shreds. I swallowed. Jilan Denma was one of the greatest cooks in all nine kingdoms, a Netra-trained master with knowledge of every ingredient and cooking style. He even worked as Prince Prilne's private cook for almost five turns before the boy's demise on Triton. Now Denma was a masterless cook wandering from kingdom to kingdom selling his skills. I had hoped to make him an offer for permanent residence at Sredin alongside Upon. Perhaps it's for the best though, I thought. Opon had been upset with me ever since I announced my decision to acquire Denma. But Jilan Denma was an expert in Strantodian food, something neither myself nor Opon could boast of. Now we would have to scramble before the summit to learn even the most basic Strantodian dishes. What happened? Porth shrugged. Shark riders, probably. But there's a chance they were caught in an acid storm. It's hard to say. For the sake of the gods, I mumbled as I looked around the kitchen. It was a vast, cavernous chamber containing five enormous stone stoves and four brick ovens. We had three larders filled with just about every spice and ingredient on the planet, and an enchanted ice room containing over a thousand pounds of venadier, pork, beef and fish. But nothing was set up for Strantodian cooking. Have we begun querying for a replacement? I asked. Thirty-six birds were released with messages yesterday. Four to each of the kingdom's capitals, Porth replied. I shook my head. Even if all of the birds reached their destinations, it would take weeks for a new master cook to accept our offer and arrive. And the Strantodians will be here in six days. I sighed. There was only one course of action now. Very well. Opon and I will have to work in his stead. Porth chuckled. When I didn't react, his smile quickly faded. You are serious. Deadly serious, I replied. But we are not equipped for Strantodian cuisine. Lorianas. I picked up a book of recipes lying on the closest table and tossed it at him. The power of reading, my friend. Porth cocked his eyebrow. Forgive me, Lorianas Klain, but most master cooks barely have a handle on Dismonian cookery let alone Strantodian, and they've had their entire lives to learn the craft. Well, I guess, upon an eye of our work, cut out for us. If I'm being honest, I am not the greatest cook. I know basic Desmonian cookery. It's no miracle to prepare chicken or fish in dozens of different cream sauces or spices, but Strantodian cookery requires very specific skills. Skills which I had not been taught at Cilium Dor, this was a problem when you had to cook for those with entirely different physiologies and tastes than yourself. I want Felden and his team on duty the night of the ball, I said. Everyone else must stay in their quarters, at the behest of our guests. This is really happening, isn't it? Porth asked. I nodded. A hundred turns of war and strife, all culminating in a single dinner. I suppose we can't fuck this up then, Porth said. Language, my young friend. Porth blushed. My apologies, Lorianas. I wiped my hands together and headed for the exit. But not before glancing one last time at Porth. You are correct, though. We can't fuck this up. The grand hall was quiet. Rays of dusty sunlight inched across the grey marble floor, warming the priceless mineral. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. 
Several windows were open, allowing crisp morning air to waft into the hall. How I love winters at Sraden Castle, I thought as the cool air reinvigorated my body. Outside, the plains glittered with morning frost, a crystal green carpet stretching as far as the eye could see. By mid-morning the sun's golden wash would begin thawing the grass blades, drawing in hungry venadir for their morning feast. I sighed as I took it all in. Castle Sraden sat atop Drea's mound, a small hill located in the center of an enormous fertile valley. According to ancient records, it had taken sixty turns to complete the castle proper, with nearly ten thousand workers having laid stones upon its foundation. For all its beauty, though, Sraden was not the strongest military position. When it was built some nine hundred turns ago, it was designed as more of a manor than a military perch. A hideaway, if you will, for past kings during times of strife and upheaval. In place of a moat, there were gardens of lavender and pink roses encircling its walls, and the entire exterior of the castle was covered in panels of white gypsum that captured and reflected the sunlight. Some say its builders were foolish to design such a vulnerable structure. But any invaders would first be forced to cross Wanderer's Bridge, which led directly into a natural bottleneck between Lake Yelb and the silent forest to the east. This meant a small force could easily hold back invaders. Thankfully, though, few enemies were willing to cross the acid in order to reach Deciman. The Meridian War had poisoned most of the Northern Sea, transforming it into an acidic wasteland in which few boats could survive. Pirates and shark riders occasionally plagued the coastal regions to the north, but over the turns King Donan built such a powerful naval fleet that few enemies ever reached our shores. The only kingdom close enough to pose any real threat was Strantodin. Our adversary and neighbor, Strantodin, was an isolationist kingdom cut off from most of the world. Its naval fleet, which was smaller than ours by at least half, kept close to its toxic shores, leaving only to raid and pillage Deciman's coastline before running back to the blackened coast. But there will always be other threats, I thought, as I stepped outside into one of the castle's wards. This was Sraden's largest ward, stretching almost seven city blocks in every direction. Unlike the castle's manicured courtyards, it was filled with swaying pines that were as old as the castle. It was one of my favorite places in Sraden, for it existed in its own time and place, a twilight realm separate from the rest of Retrac Deor. But there was another reason I felt drawn to its swaying pines. Situated in its center was a large, bronze statue of a man gazing up at the sky. I approached it and bowed. Good morning, father. A yellow bird sat atop my father's head. As it chirped and fluffed its wings, white and black fecal matter dribbled down his bronze forehead and into his lifeless eyes. I sighed. It would have to be cleaned before the delegation arrived. The bronze was taking on a rusty green patina, and to my dismay, birds had begun nesting on his shoulders. Ah, Wardius Clane. Startled, I turned. Yori Calden, the king's envoy to Strantodin, stood behind me draped in a green silk robe. A great man, your father, he said as he approached. A quintessential Desmonian. He gazed up at the statue, a prideful grin creasing his powdered face. Did you know he once organized a banquet for over a thousand Garfaxian and Algin royals? I nodded. I was there. He always said it was one of the greatest feasts he ever presided over. It was definitely interesting, Yori said with a chuckle. The Garfaxians favor Laptane shark and fell tower meat, and the Algins subsist on a diet of rare fruits and vegetables carefully plucked from the continent's toxic jungles. He turned and met my eyes. Do you remember what your father served? Traditionally seared cartain bird, encrusted with cranberry jelly and thyme, I replied. He laughed again. I wouldn't have dared feed that to my family, let alone the royalty of two kingdoms. But he did, and born from those two meals were the trade routes we now enjoy with Garfax and Elg. I smiled. I remembered that banquet as if it was yesterday. I had stood by my father's side the entire evening, 
aiding in the preparation and plating of each meal. Father had been on edge that night, sweating and pacing nervously behind the prep tables. At the time, Desimin was attempting to negotiate a much-needed trade deal with Alg. If it failed, we would have lost access to Alge's famous lumber mills, as well as the precious delcium wood we needed for construction. One misstep, one undercooked course or improper vintage, and a permanent wedge would have been driven between our two great nations. But Wardius Wren met the challenge head-on, organizing one of the most memorable feasts in Sredin's history, as well as securing the castle's future for turns to come. It was one of his crowning achievements, I said. After that night, nothing was the same again. Yori nodded. Indeed, he stared at the statue, smiling. A new golden age for Desimon. I nodded. In my mind, father had been the greatest Lorianas ever to graduate from Cilium Dor. Strange how we are about to take a similar road, eh? How so? I asked. The summit approaches with Strantodin, and like your father, you will be center stage. I shook my head. The Strantodin situation is nothing like the Algin. I agree. The Algins were at least human. I glanced at him. His fists were balled at his sides and his eyes betrayed a deep-rooted hatred. Those animals have tormented our shores for far too long. Just like the Tritonese mutants, they live by their own laws without care for the rest of the world. Yuri spat onto the ground. Have you ever been to Strantodin Lorianas? I sighed. I had only left Desimon once, during my schooling at Cilium Dor. I have not had the pleasure. Yori laughed. Count yourself lucky, then. In my youth I stowed away on a trade barge destined for that wretched land. I had heard the stories of its people and culture, but like the naive fool I was, I had to see it for myself. He shook his head at the memory. When we arrived, only a third of the crew had functioning laptane masks. Those who didn't quickly fell ill and died, their exposed flesh covered in blisters and oozing lesions. Is the air there that bad? I asked. Yuri nodded. Worse. Within a call, most of their suits and masks were compromised. Do you know what it sounds like when a man's flesh and lungs dissolve? I shook my head. I can still hear their screams after all these turns. I doubt I will ever forget them. How did you survive? I asked. He laughed. I was taken in by a woman, a Strantodin woman, no less. She gave me proper gear and allowed me to stay with her until another vessel came to port. How long were you with her? Six months, Yuri replied. My eyes widened. By the gods, man. The gods had nothing to do with it, he replied. It was the woman, my wife. This shocked me. I had met his wife on several occasions, but she was no Strantodian. She was a healthy woman, tall and blonde, with blue eyes and supple skin. Strantodians were bald with white, lesion-covered flesh, and they all required special triton breathers filled with their homeland's atmosphere in order to survive beyond their borders. I thought she was Alemanian, I said. He shook his head. Strantodian, through and through. Only she was born with a rare condition that enabled the toxins to affect her body. How in the gods did she survive there? I asked. She had to wear a laptane mask all the time. That's remarkable. Not to Strantodians. They considered her a pariah and exiled her like some old crone to a small shack near the coast. That's why I smuggled her back with me on the first trade ship we could find. I flushed with embarrassment. I had known Yori for over five turns, and yet I still knew so little about him. It made me wonder if I was a bit too focused on my work. You're a Lorianas, I reminded myself. You can never be too focused. It was the sacrifice all Lorianas made in order to walk in the shadows of kings. One had to dedicate body and soul to the work. We were at the tip of the spear, where only perfection was acceptable. But occasionally I did wonder what it would be like to be free of this yoke. Yori tightened his crimson robe about his body. Well, I must be off. 
A bird has come in from Strantodin, and it requires my attention. I nodded. I liked Yori. He wasn't a Lorianas, but his dedication to servitude was just as strong. And, like myself, he was not afraid to get his hands dirty. Very well. I'll see you at dinner. He bowed and slowly shuffled off down the shaded pathway. I took one last look at my father's face and moved on across the courtyard. It was time to go to work. Chapter 2 Glass and Venomin The great hall was large enough to host over six hundred souls. A vast, opulent chamber, it had seen countless feasts and coronations throughout the turns. It was also the oldest section of Sredin. That meant its walls were prone to cracks and leaks. This was a problem. The entire hall had to be completely disinfected before the Strantodin atmosphere could be injected through the Triton filters. If any of the toxin escaped, countless Dismonians could fall ill, or even die, I reminded myself. It was an unbelievably complicated affair involving thousands of gallons of boiled salt water and a priceless thimbleful of pure, uncut meridium. For most charges, this was the equivalent of an entire turn's allotment. A tremendously expensive endeavor, but the treasury was more than equipped to handle it. The kingdom's wheat and potato yields had doubled the previous turn, and a new vein of gold had just been discovered in the south in the Aldous Mine. Sredin was now one of the wealthiest cities in all of the Nine Kingdoms, even wealthier than Nithra, the great jungle city on Alg. But what good will it all be if the entire court lay dead in a cloud of toxic gas? I told myself. I made my way through a warren of hallways and stairwells and entered the Grand Hall. Thirty brand new tables stood ready for seating. Each one had been cut from a single delcium tree and stretched thirty footfalls end to end. That was large enough to fit an entire royal household and its many noblemen. I examined every place setting, making sure each one was properly laid out. Custom crystal glasses and decanters had been placed before every seat. Each piece was custom made by Alamein's famous glass blower, Dalp Amor, and shipped to Deciman at a cost of five hundred coinage per unit. To fill them, I had a rare bayberry vintage I discovered deep in the recess of the castle's vast wine cellar. It dated back almost a thousand turns, and was assessed to be worth upwards of a hundred thousand coinage, a price worth more than all the furniture in Sredin combined. And that will be the vintage I serve to the Strantodians, I thought. Too much hinged on this summit for corners to be cut. I will also have to oversee every step of dinner preparations. I walked between the massive tables and examined each setting. The napkins were spun from priceless silk shipped in from Nethra. Each was bound with a ring of expended meridium gilt in gold and folded expertly by my apprentice, Jaya Nidim. The young apprentice approached me from across the hall. Good morning, Lorianas Klain, he said with a familiar smile. For the sake of the gods, just call me Philem when we're alone, I replied. I feel like a holy man whenever you call me that. Jaya chuckled. Very well, Lor. I sighed. Philem, the boy corrected, grinning. At times I swore he took pleasure in irking me, but he was an excellent apprentice and on his way to becoming an even better Lorianas. I also happened to enjoy his company. He brought an energy to the post few could muster, and for this alone I allowed a certain relaxation of decorum. I ran a hand across one of the tables and checked my fingertips. It was impeccably clean. Your men did well, I said. And the napkins? Remarkable. Each one was folded into a perfect silk swan. It took some apprentices' turns to master the art. But Jaya mastered it in just a few months. I think you're ready to move on to the kitchen. Jaya bowed. My skills as a folder will be known across the strait now. I don't know if I would go that far, I said, grinning. But your skills have definitely improved. Fieche, he spat. Folding napkins, polishing silverware, cleaning shit shoots. When do I get a real challenge? His enthusiasm surprised me. 
Most apprentices like to keep to the shadows, handling only the most trivial jobs. It only took one mistake to be called back to Cilium Door, a place few Lorianas returned from with their status intact. Such exile was considered the greatest shame that could befall our kind. That was why few students tempted fate by being overzealous in their work. But not Jaya. He willingly accepted every job and executed it flawlessly, with a zeal not even seasoned Lorianas could boast of. When the servant's privy became clogged last winter, Jaya voluntarily repelled into the chute and scraped almost a hundred turns of frozen excrement from the walls. When he was done, he immediately cleaned himself off and returned to the kitchens where he remained until his shift was through. I approached the enormous glass pane that separated the great hall. Clay had been used to seal its edges, forming a perfect bond to Sraden's granite walls. Such a wonder, I thought. The Tritonese used a carefully guarded method to craft the perfectly flat sheets of glass. Over the turns, many had tried to duplicate it, but all failed. That was why Triton charged exorbitant amounts for even the smallest panes of sand glass. I ran my hand over the wall's smooth, cold surface. It was indeed amazing, but also a nuisance beyond measure. The entire endeavor had taken weeks to complete, and at a cost that would have bankrupted most kingdoms. But King Donan insisted on it. He believed our willingness to spend a fortune on the summit would be seen as a gesture of good faith toward our Strantodian counterparts. I only hope they saw it the same way. Tomorrow the first Strantodians were set to arrive with hundreds of Triton canisters filled with their land's indigenous atmosphere. That meant everything in the castle was ready now. Large laptane hoses had been fixed to spigots drilled into the Great Hall's northern walls, and dozens of curved steel cradles sat beneath them on the floor. Several noblemen had expressed anger at these desecrations. But the peace and stability of our great kingdom was now at stake. If this meant a wall or two had to be drilled or torn down, so be it. Loriana's claim. I turned. A figure clad in black shark flesh stood a few footfalls behind me. The mask and triton breather tank obscured much of his face. But I could see a pair of deep blue eyes staring at me through swirling mist. And whom am I addressing? I asked. The figure bowed. Darden Woe, apprentice Lorianas to House Wren. Welcome to Sredin Castle, I said. I trust you are satisfied with what you see so far. I am just about to begin a third inspection, he replied. I cocked an eyebrow. A third. Surely you understand the need. My frustration began to grow. I had better things to do than argue with a Strantodian apprentice, especially when we were only days away from the summit. If it makes you feel more secure, feel free to inspect the entire hall, I said. But I assure you, the seals are in place. Every precaution has been taken. Every scenario planned for. If it's all the same, I will continue with my inspection, Darden said. But I did have one question, Lorianas. Very well. Have your people been questioned and approved through interrogation? This caught me by surprise. Interrogation? Who did he think we were? Shark riders. My staff is the most well-trained in all nine kingdoms, I replied. I assure you, none are plants or assassins. Darden huffed. And how can you be so sure, Lorianas? These people are my family, my only family, and if one of them meant to ruin this summit, I assure you I would know. Assassins often come with smiles, the apprentice said. It's best to be sure in these situations. My blood boiled. You will leave my people alone. Understood. You're a guest in my house and I expect you to act accordingly. Darden laughed. Did I jest? If you think this is your house, Loriana's claim, you're in for a rude awakening. I balked. Who did this boy think he was? I am third generation Loriana's, I hissed. I have lived my entire adult life here. I know every shadow and corridor in this castle. I'd say that makes it as much my house as the king's. 
Keep telling yourself that, Laurianus, the boy said. I know my place. And what's your place, apprentice? To my masters I am replaceable, he replied, as are you. We're both just pawns being shuffled about the game board of other people's lives. I clenched my fists. Did this boy really think we were just disposable housemaids? Our order was over a thousand turns old. Our founder, Laurianus Orinid Tidrakchi, stood beside King Topol the Black Heart during the Great Floods on Aulg. He helped build that continent's first trade outpost, a little wood-walled village that would eventually become the famed jungle city of Nithra. He even set forth the plan for its labyrinthine sewer system, a feat of modern design and architecture unsurpassed to this day. My king respects our order, I said. He has even allowed me to dine with him on several occasions. Several. Darden feigned excitement. Well then, I would suspect the king will be moving you into his bedchamber soon. Now the apprentice was just being insolent. I assure you, we are just as important to our liege as his generals and emissaries. Darden shook his head. Whatever you say, Laurianus Klain, whatever you say. He ran a hand down one of the long clay seals on the glass divider. This is good work, though. I think your people might actually know what they're doing. With that said, he moved to another part of the hall. I breathed a sigh of relief. His presence unnerved me. The mask made his voice sound otherworldly, and the smell of shark flesh was nauseating. For the rest of that afternoon, I tended to the microcosm of details surrounding the Strantodian's arrival. The docks needed to be retrofitted with Triton air canisters in order to replenish the Strantodian supply for the voyage home. The living quarters in the Dragon Wing had to be retrofitted with seals on all windows and doors. This would keep the Strantodian's atmosphere from leaching into the rest of the castle and killing us all. As for their individual rooms, each had been fitted with Triton disbursement canisters with sealants on all of the windows. It was a project made all the more difficult due to the many cracks and drafts plaguing Sredin's aging granite walls. I even brought in experts from the Culver Waste, who pumped smoke throughout the castle in search of leaks. Everything was shorn up and ready to go. As soon as the emissary's vessels arrived, the toxic gas would be released into the various bedchambers for the duration of their stay. Having finished my inspections, I headed back to the kitchen. But the Strantodian apprentice cut me off before I could duck inside. Oh, Laurianus, if I could have one more minute of your time. I sighed. What is it? Where was the glass made? He asked. I fear I don't recognize the work. We commissioned Triton's famous glassmaker, Dalp Amor. He used sand glass retrieved from the culver waste. Darden looked awestruck. How did he come upon so much, though? I was told he commissioned the blind scavenger tribes to harvest it from the ripple. The ripple. A shocked look came over the apprentice's face. I nodded. The ripple was a patch of desert located deep in the culver waste a hellscape surrounded by nests of deadly nagra and wild elemental traps. Prior to the Meridium War, it had been lush farmland cultivated by thousands of settlers serving cities like Triton and the Isle. But all that ended when charges loyal to Narthax Menuti set it ablaze. Their magic flames burned so hot they melted the very soil, transforming miles of farmland into a frozen sea of rippling glass. Now, it sat blanketed in poisonous cyanide clouds, inaccessible to anyone save for the blind scavengers. The nomadic tribe knew every inch of the culver waste, and if paid properly, they would retrieve just about any lost relic, no matter how dangerous its location. Darden adjusted a knob on his Triton air tank and took a deep breath. When he was satisfied with the flow, he turned to me and smiled. We may be from different lands, Laurianus Klain, but we are kindred spirits. However, I will do whatever it takes for this summit to succeed. I would expect the same from you. I nodded. Of course. Darden scanned the room. It would be something. For our two nations to finally be joined under one flag. 
I straightened my blue tunic and wiped a piece of lint off of my trousers. Indeed it would. The boy stared at the glass. He appeared awestruck, as if this was the first time he had ever seen his reflection. But sadness also lurked behind his mask, and stress. Stress for the emissaries and his mission. That I related to. We were both bound to duty. Nothing else could ever eclipse that. No matter the sacrifice. No matter the pain. The apprentice bowed. I will take my leave now. Good night to you. I sighed as the boy left. I too was feeling the crush. But this is the only way forward for our two nations. War had destroyed too many lives, soured too much land. Healing was necessary now, a time to let old prejudices and fears slip away into the dawn. Unfortunately, though, not everyone agreed. Already there were factions in our own court plotting against the king, and I could only imagine what was going on across the strait in Strantodin. The trappings of war were quite profitable, especially for the families who provided weapons and transports. To simply turn off that valve meant millions in lost coinage. And if there was one thing I've learned in all my turns, it was to never disturb the flow of commerce. Two men approached me from across the great hall. One was tall and muscular, with a long brown beard and a mane of hair tied into a ponytail. The other man was of average build, with short blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. Both men wore stained and torn work tunics, with triton tool belts bristling around their waists. Loriana's Clain, the tall man said, bowing. His companion did the same. Ranton, I said. Willem, how are the preparations coming along? The tall man named Ranton grinned. We are sealed up tighter than a virgin's twat. I frowned at the man's boorishness, and the temporary quarters for the Strantodians, all prepped and awaiting their arrival, Willem replied. I nodded. Things were finally coming together. Very well. Return to the lower levels and await further instruction. Both men bowed. As they turned to leave, Willem held back. If I may, Loriana's. I cocked an eyebrow. You may. We've drilled piping into every chamber in the Dragon Wing. All canister mounts are set and awaiting tanks from Triton. But there is one issue. Spit it out, man. I still have the kitchens to inspect. Willem sighed. Those chambers, they are the oldest in the castle. Should we really be desecrating them for the Strantodians? I sighed. Ever since the king announced the summit, this question had come up time and time again. Sraden Castle was considered a holy place, a sanctuary cared for like a fragile piece of crystal. In its thousand turns of existence, it had survived a dozen wars, as well as a great flood that once covered much of the land. But times were changing. The people who lived beyond the castle walls had suffered much the past twenty turns. War with the Strantodians had wiped out an entire generation of architects, builders, cooks, and countless other trades along the coast. The citizens had little patience for summits and peace delegations, especially when they altered their beloved Sredin. They just wanted an end to the raids and violence. Nothing more, nothing less. This isn't desecration. I replied to Willem. It's progress. Progress we need if this place is to stand for another thousand turns. But to do this for the Strantodians? I raised my hand. We must make sacrifices if we are to obtain a permanent peace. Drilling a few holes in our walls is the least we can do. Willem reluctantly nodded, but I knew he didn't agree. Very well, Lorianus, but I hope this is worth it. With that, he turned and left the chamber. I sighed. Too much was happening at an arrow's pace. If I wasn't careful, things could fall apart in the blink of an eye. To be a Loriana's wasn't just about decorum and dusting. I was a leader, a role model for the castle staff. One could even say a general of a weaponless army. We are the order in the chaos, I recited to myself. The mop in the filth, the feather duster wiping cobwebs from the world. We serve not for glory, but for our masters, for order. I believed this too. The creed had served my family well over the turns. 
Both my father and his father before him served Sridin loyally, establishing our name and reputation amongst the finest Lorianas in the world. But not everyone at Sridin was as dedicated. There were many young servants who were fairly new, refugees from Alamein who fled the great fire known as the Breath. King Donan had taken them in with open arms, offering them some of the most qualified positions on the castle staff. It was a decision I abhorred. To take on anyone without checking their credentials was foolhardy at best, especially when any one of them could be a Strantodian spy. But after turns of war with Strantodin, we were dreadfully short-handed, and with the summit breathing down our necks, I had no choice but to accept these unknown refugees. No matter what happened, though, my own people would always come first. Most of them have served at the castle their entire lives. They had grown up side by side with one another, playing in the castle halls and eating their meals together in the servants' quarters. Most of them had no family beyond these walls. Sredin was both their home and family, and I would do anything to protect them. I entered the kitchen and smiled. I could already smell fresh bread and frying bacon. It was mid-morning, my favorite time at Sredin. Everything always felt so alive this time of day. It was as if the kitchen's heat and steam infused the air with energy. Morning, Lorianas, the cooks shouted as I walked down the line. Four cooks were hard at work preparing for the night's dinner. I nodded as I inspected a starter dish of salted sardines and fresh strawberry jam. I took a quick taste and shook my head. The fish had retained both its flavor and texture. But the jam needed work. Too much sugar. I said, as I handed the plate back to the cook. It's undercutting the strawberries tart. I moved on to my baker's and sampled a cinnamon muffin and a sugar-glazed truffle. Both were a touch sweeter than I cared for, but I approved them and continued down the line. This was the process every day, a well-honed and efficient inspection of everything that would pass before the court and the king. I was a fair man but I demanded perfection. If it meant upsetting the fragile emotions of some of my friends, so be it. Nothing could be left to chance. Not when you were a Lorianas. As soon as my inspections were complete, I left the kitchen and headed toward the stables. The halls were abuzz with excitement. Servants wove in and out of the many corridors with trays of food and stacks of fresh linens. Most smiled as I passed, but a few noticeably avoided my gaze. That was life as a Lorianas. One made friends as easily as enemies, and I had plenty of enemies. The position of Lorianas was a coveted station. Every turn, thousands attempted the arduous task of entering our ranks at Cilium Door, but only two applicants would be chosen at the end of the turn, and only one would be allowed to graduate. This created an unfortunate cloud of jealousy and bitterness amongst the many hopefuls and failures. I entered another inner courtyard and approached the stables. Trainers were out front guiding a horse in a slow circle, shouting commands whenever it deviated from its muddy path. Lorianas. An older woman approached. She was slender and demure for her sixty-two turns, with locks of silver-spun hair that flowed down her shoulders like liquid metal. My heart raced. Radme Tilly, I thought smiling. She came from a long family line of master horse breeders who had served Deciman since its inception a thousand turns ago. Never have I met a better stable master. Radme could train anything, even a desert garan from my knee or an Algin land strider. Radme, I replied, smiling. She met me with open arms. As we hugged, I realized it was less than appropriate. If it had been anyone else, I would have scolded them for such a breach in decorum. Not her, though. She held my heart in the palm of her hands. If I had been a normal servant, I would have wed her already. But nothing could ever come from it, even if it broke my heart. I was a Lorianas, and the position could be my only love. Radme released me and patted my cheek. How has my favorite Lorianas been? Stressed. The summit begins tomorrow and we only just finished sealing the great hall. She cocked a brow. What was the hold-up? 
drilling of the canister connectors took longer than expected, and the sealant clay was giving us a difficult time. But things are finally falling into place. Thank the gods. She nodded. And the king? I sighed. He hasn't left his chamber in almost a week. Radme noticeably slumped. Like most Dismonians, she loved the king. Yulin Donan had secured turns of prosperity for Decimon. Beneath his rule, Sredin Castle had expanded its walls toward the outer edge of the Great Pines, and three new towers had been erected, as well as a new stable. Our military had been modernized and outfitted with new Triton Eterna blades. Food was plentiful throughout the kingdom, and even the Strantodian raiders had slowed their attacks. It was a golden time for both Sredin and myself. But like everything in life, all good things tend to come to a crashing end. Who will stand for him during the summit? Radme asked. If he can't be present, I might have to. Her bemusement quickly transformed into laughter. You, Alorianas, brokering peace with the Strantodians. Your confidence in me is overwhelming. She straightened. If there's one thing I've never lacked for, it was confidence in you. For Lemclain. She stepped closer, but not so close as to be inappropriate. Always remember that. Duly noted. She wiped her filthy hands on her smock. So, how are you going to do this? I don't have a clue. Radme sighed. Just forget everything you know about them. Forget that they are the most hated kingdom in all the realms, and that their army is one of the largest ever to tread upon this god's forsaken planet. Push all of that aside, and face them as you would face any guest in your household, terrified beyond belief, because that's what you're making me. She waved him off. You know better than anyone how to deal with these men, more so than the king himself, I wager. You'll be fine. I hope so. Otherwise Jaya will soon be overseeing you. I don't mind, she replied. The boy has quite the backside. I shook my head. I can't even remember why I came down here. To chat me up and make me smile. She brushed a piece of hair from her forehead and grinned. I think I already managed both, I replied. She laughed. We'll see. I melted. This was the best part of my day. Whenever I woke or went to sleep, Radme was the first and last thing on my mind. She was my forbidden crush, my torment. She was also my inspiration. But thankfully she understood the seriousness of my position and always respected my Loriana's oath. Nonetheless, it still felt good to be wanted, even if nothing could ever come from it. Now I remember why I'm here, I said. I need a horse for this afternoon. Dinner for the summit requires by berries and staunch root, and the eastern patches have got the blight. Staunch root. The only other place it grows is inside the western leg of the forest, near those gods' forsaken howler fields and caves. Guilt tugged at my soul. I actually had no intention of harvesting staunch root or by berries. Today I was after glow bulbs, and unfortunately they only grew deep in the southern caves. But why you? she asked. There must be a dozen other men who could harvest it for you. The summit is too important to leave anything to chance. I lied. Her expression became serious. The hunters keep sighting Jarawaks and trolls out there. Big, matron breeds feeding on Venadir. And you are going to go it alone. I sighed. If not for the summit, I would ask the hunters to bring back what I need. But a staunch root needs to be pulled just right. If it's damaged or strained, it will become tart when cooked, and poisonous. Radme laughed. So tartness worries you more than its toxicity. Both would be a disaster, my dear. But if one were to die from staunch root poisoning, wouldn't it be best if it at least danced blissfully across the palate? Radme chuckled. What would Sredin do without you, Philem? Fall into ruin, I suppose. Her smile returned. Go get your roots then, Lorianas, but for the love of the gods, be safe about it. I smiled, but in my heart I felt guilt for lying. What would I ever do without you? She turned and glanced over her shoulder. 
you would dream of my face every night. And with that, she returned to the stalls. I strode down the main gallery, past the many familiar afternoon faces racing to and fro on various chores. Most bowed and greeted me formally, while others ignored me, their eyes averted to the floor. That was life at Sraden. There were those in your camp, and those waiting to see you off. I lived for such challenges, though. Nothing made me feel more alive than taming the beast that was Sraden Castle and all its nuances. And what a beast she was. It took a veritable army to sustain its many walls, rooftops, privies and cellars, not to mention its grand kitchen and five Triton boiler rooms. I followed my normal schedule and headed to the laundry room. Once the king's clothes were properly cleaned and folded, I retired to a small study where I polished his riding boots and medals. Next, I checked in on the kitchens again. When I was sure breakfast was well on its way, I attended to the king in his chamber, bringing him his morning meal and emptying his wash basins and privy pots. Lunch soon followed, after which me and the servants ate a quick meal together in the kitchen. The rest of the day was filled with odds and ends, checking in on the royal servants and making sure the dining hall was cleaned and ready for supper. For Lim, I turned and glanced down the main hallway. Opon was racing toward me, his girth swinging back and forth beneath his stained apron. The silk linens have arrived from Nithra, he gasped. But they are short twenty. I sighed. Soon after Nithra's king died, the city dock workers began skimming from every shipment, leaving the continent. Lucky for us, though, Deciman was Nithra's sole source of pine wood and beef. This gave us leverage when we negotiated trade prices for our wood and produce. Very well, I said. And what of the shipment of Brie coming in from Alamein? He shook his head. The boat never arrived. The captain of a whaler, the Harpy's Lament, reported the vessel lost to the breath off the western coast of Alamein. Damn. A crew of over fifty burned alive. And for cheese. It was a sad, pathetic even. If the ship had been delivering Triton air canisters, at least there would have been some purpose to the loss. But cheese, and brie no less. I thought, it was not one of my preferred meals. I'll ride to Owlery, I said. There's a cheesemonger there who can procure us some. Upon bowed. And the guest rooms, I asked. Have they been taken care of? What do I look like? A housemaid, Opon barked. No. They are far prettier, I joked. I will be leaving the castle this afternoon for Owlery. Just make sure to prepare the kitchen for tonight's dinner. If I'm not back before sundown, serve the king the glazed quail and truffle potatoes. The staff can have the venison from yesterday's hunt. Upon bowed. When will you be back? As soon as I procure some cheese. Now keep it together for me, okay? Opon nodded. Be safe. Chapter 3 Dead Man's Tale The day was quiet and warm. The sun hung above the world like an old friend, and the crisp air was filled with the scent of fresh pine and dew. My horse sauntered down the wooded road, ignorant to the many worries swirling around in my head. I envied it for that. A bit of ignorance was a glorious thing. My life was one of ceaseless anxiety, constantly planning for both the seen and unforeseen. I was the finger in the dike, the mouth whispering in the nervous ear. I found little time for life's pleasures and escapes, and it had only grown worse ever since the announcement of the Strantodian's arrival. At times, the weight of it all crushed my chest like a pile of lead weights. To walk the path of endless service is to know only the realities of the world. Few Lorianas are dreamers, even few are prone to fancy, and rarely do they live past eighty turns. But this morning, as the sun warmed my face and the air swirled with pollen and life, I found myself drifting into a state of wonder. Beyond Sraden and its rules and mortal constructs, a world of wonder awaited, a land where fantastic beasts roamed both the air and sea, and where magic could alter the very fabric of our existence. As the turns drifted by, the allure of it all called out to me more and more. 
The itch had set in, as so many Lorianas warned me, it eventually would. The need to see the rest of the world, and all it had to offer. But I am a Lorianas, I reminded myself. Such things were not meant for the men of my station. That was the price of living amongst kings and queens, the sacrifice we all made to serve. A woodpecker banged its beak against a distant birch, and several blue birds alighted from a nearby bush, swooping overhead before vanishing into the surrounding pines. A mist hung low across the trail, and as we rode through it, sunbeams cut across my face, illuminating pollen and insects as they danced in the afternoon air. This far south, the road was far less travelled, due to the howler plant infestation that had spread throughout the forest. The tiny plants were not native to Deciman, but turns of trade with Nethra had spread them to our fertile soil like a plague. They now flourished like weeds along most of the coastal regions, tiny deadly bulbs that could kill in seconds if disturbed, for they had a defense mechanism that emitted a deafening shriek, which then spread to any other bulbs in the area. In the last few months alone, over a dozen men and women had been found dead along the southern roads, with blood gushing from ruptured eardrums. The king was currently negotiating with the circle to bring in charges to burn entire swaths of the southern forests. But for now we were on our own to deal with the problem. Bramble vines and branches tugged at my pants as we pressed on through thickening vegetation. My garren ignored the many thorns protruding from its hide, sauntering on without a care in the world. But Radme would certainly have a few things to say about it upon my return. The pines became denser, casting the forest into a bluish-gray twilight. The ground was covered in a thick blanket of soft pine needles which masked Poppy's footfalls. Even so, my nerves remained on edge. It would only take one snapped twig to set off a nearby howler. Then the chain reaction would spread throughout the entire area, killing us both. The road narrowed into a small three-footfall wide path as it wound down into a valley. I wiped sweat from my brow and opened my jacket. By the gods, I breathed. It was growing hot in the forest, a side effect of the howler infestation. Once their roots took hold, the plant's tiny, succulent-like petals gave off an ungodly amount of heat that not even the greatest minds on the planet could explain. Poppy nickered as a butterfly tickled her nose. She was a gentle horse and one of Radme's favorites. She had a beautiful black hide with a brown mane running down the back of her slim neck. I had ridden her once before on a hunt with the king, but today was different. I was taking her into dangerous country, and guilt tugged at my soul as she ignorantly sauntered down the road. A large black shape slowly materialized in the distance amongst the clustered pine trunks. It was a small cabin with a tall stone chimney. Every window was barred and sealed shut with clay putty, and the walls had been stuffed with moss and thatch to protect against the howler's deafening call. This was Waylon Fopin's place. A noted cheesemaker and shroom hunter, Waylon had served Sraden's kitchens for over ten turns. I had hoped to procure some fresh brie from him for the summit. But as we approached the cabin, my heart sank. There was no smoke coming from the chimney, and the entire area around the cabin was overgrown with weeds. I climbed off Poppy and tied her to a low-hanging limb. As I approached the cabin, I winced at the foul stench surrounding the place. Best not go in there. I turned. A figure stood a few yards away, partially hidden behind a pine. He wore a black laptane suit and a triton mask. A Strantodian, I thought. But why in the gods is he out here? The stranger stepped toward me, his triton air tank rhythmically hissing and popping. Good day to you, friend, I said as the man stared at me through his glass visor. A strange, yellow gas swirled before his eyes, masking his features. When he was close enough, though, I sighed with relief. It was Darden Woe, the Strantodian emissary. Emissary Woe. What in the gods are you doing out here alone? I asked. Darden glanced at the cabin. The man inside is dead. 
I grew tense as Darden approached the cabin and opened the door. There were no signs of struggle, but I could clearly see Wayland's bloated, maggot-covered corpse sprawled atop his bed. Blood and other bodily fluids stained the sheets and hay mattress, and part of his face had been picked apart by insects. He's been dead for days, I thought. But how? Howlers, Darden said as I stepped past him into the cabin. He stood in the doorway behind me, a hunched silhouette without expression. Must have fallen asleep without putting his plugs in. I looked up at the emissary. How do you figure? Saw several howler patches a half mile down the road, and just look at his ears. Blood was encrusted around the dead man's ears and nose, thick black blood which was a sure sign of howler exposure. I left Wayland's body and stepped outside. Why are you here? I asked as I took a breath of fresh air. I was looking for a local cheesemonger. My master is a connoisseur, and I had hoped to surprise him with this man's famous brie. I almost laughed. Then we're kindred spirits. For I, too, was looking to purchase the same. The Laurianus cocked his head curiously to one side. But I've been told your king has no taste for it. He doesn't. But yours does. The emissary stared at me, his hissing air tank the only sound permeating the forest. You came out here alone in order to please your enemy's king. I am a Lorianas, I replied. We live to serve. Even if it means serving our king's enemies. The man stared at me through his foggy mask. For a moment, I thought I saw a smile. Indeed. How did you avoid the castle guards? I asked. I know they wouldn't have let you leave the castle alone. Darden sat down atop a rotting tree stump and stretched his legs. I have my ways. I picked up an old shovel, lying half buried in leaves. I should bury him. It's the least I can do for all the turns he served Sraden's kitchens. Darden walked over to the cabin and picked up another rusted shovel leaning against the wall. Together then. Shocked, I nodded. Very well. Together. I walked beside Poppy, her reins gripped in my sweaty hands. Behind me, Darden walked in silence his face concealed beneath his hissing mask. We had spoken little since burying Waylon, and the silence was weighing on me. I had so many questions to ask the Strantodian, like what wine vintages were available in Strantodian's capital, and what types of dishes did they prefer for dinner? More importantly, what were his master's tastes? I had hoped to surprise King Wren at the welcome banquet with a traditional Strantodian dish, but my knowledge was quite limited. You don't dirty your hands often, do you, Lorianas? Darden asked, shattering the silence. I glanced over my shoulder, my eyes furrowed. I am no stranger to labor. But my duties rarely bring me beyond the castle walls. What might have been a chuckle escaped the man's mask. On Strantodin, Lorianas are not just housemaids. They are expected to work and fight alongside their masters in combat. He withdrew a dagger from a small scabbard at his waist. Both the blade and handle were black, and its edge glittered in the noonday sun. Strantodian Lorianas are given similar blades upon acquiring their position in court, he said. It's so they never forget their mission in life. And what is that? To protect our masters. At all costs. I pondered this for a moment. Everything the man was saying went against Lorianas' code. Servants do not carry weapons, nor do we participate in violence of any kind. We are the order in the chaos, a voice whispered in my head. The mop in the filth, the feather duster wiping cobwebs from the world. We serve not for glory, but for our masters, for order. I looked at my blistered palms. He was right. I had become soft in my old age. But I am a Lorianas, I reminded myself the pride of every kingdom, the keeper of order and slayer of chaos. But it didn't change the fact that this complete stranger saw my weaknesses just by looking at me. As we walked beneath the drooping pines, I wondered if times were changing for the Loriana's order. Most of my brothers wouldn't think of leaving the safety of their castle walls, let alone wander into a howler-infested forest in search of a cheesemonger, we're becoming a group of entitled and frail old men, I thought. 
men who would rather hand off harder duties to younger and braver men. Things were changing, though. Fewer kingdoms needed our services, and every turn more and more of the older Lorianas passed on. The younger generation had no desire to be celibate or locked into service for the rest of their lives. Even worse, our order had become more of a luxury than a necessity. We were looked upon as trophies for the wealthiest kings, trinkets to be shown off at court. I shook my head. Soon there would be no real Lorianas in the world. And what then? Who would bring order to the chaos of life? The world is changing, Darden said, as if reading my mind. Triton is all but gone now, destroyed by the damned shark clans. The breath just devoured Alamein for the first time in almost five hundred turns. And now there are rumors that some beast destroyed the barrier wall surrounding Nethra on Alg. I swallowed. I had heard about Triton's destruction from a group of whalers fresh in from a two-turn run. Apparently members of the Shark Rider clans had detonated explosive paste on the city's supports, dropping half the structure into the acid. Now Triton sat mostly abandoned, save for a few pockets of gobscrappers who had taken up in the city's weather-pocked carcass. But a beast on Nithra, I thought. What in the gods was happening out there? It was as if the entire world was tearing itself apart. Even stranger rumors had trickled in from iron in the culver. Tales of unnatural creatures roaming the culver waste, great hulking beasts all but alien to retract Deor. Not even the blind scavengers knew their origins. And then there were rumors of a massive metal disc that had crashed into one of the islands beyond Razor Reef. Look at the culver if you don't believe me, Darden went on. Even now... Its sands are said to be buried beneath ten footfalls of snow. And then there's this business with the meridium those scrappers discovered in the deep waste. Rumor has it it's the single largest cache the Circle has ever documented. But that, too, was lost on Triton, and is now rumored to be in the hands of the Shark Rider clans. He tapped his sheathed blade. I would prepare yourself, Lorianas. The world no longer needs men of your service. It needs swords and brute force. I met his eyes. The man wasn't boasting or making a threat. If anything, he appeared frightened. I take it you're a tank at his half-empty kind of man, I said jokingly. Darden's expression darkened. This is no joke. More is at stake here than just this summit. This piqued my interest. What could be more important than peace talks between our two nations? You don't know about our master's pasts, do you? he asked. I know everything about King Donan. Did you know our masters were childhood friends? I did, I replied. Then you know about their falling out? Of course. It was a wound the king rarely spoke of, but I knew he still loved the man like a brother, a love that would no doubt complicate things during the summit. It makes no difference, though, I said. It doesn't. You don't think our people will want blood if they learn the truth? Why should they? I asked. These men are our kings. Who cares who they played with as children? I don't, Lorianus, Darden replied. But others are not like us, and they will find out eventually. It's just a matter of time. So let them find out they were friends, I said. Shouldn't that help the peace talks? Darden shook his head. You don't understand my people, Lorianas. They will see it as a deceit. For a time I plodded on in silence, guiding Poppy down the soft, puddle-pocked road. Until now, I had felt good about the summit. Everything was in order and ready for the Strantodians' arrival. Even the king was aglow with newfound zeal. But my chest felt heavy. If word gets out about such a friendship... Certain factions might consider it a breach of trust and demand an end to peace talks, Darden went on. Then we mustn't speak of this to anyone, I said. Darden met my eyes and nodded. A secret pact between two servants. I stared into his eyes and shook my head. Agreed. Darden smiled, but it was quickly obscured by the gas circulating inside his mask. Very well, Orianus Klain, he replied. Let us retire before we end up like our friend back there. And with that, we rode the rest of the way home in silence. Chapter 4 
a promise of consequence. The servants sat silently at the dinner table, staring impatiently at the salt-encrusted salmon and seared honey duckling steaming before them. Upon entered the room with a large plate piled high with boiled baby potatoes dusted with salt and dill, as well as honey-glazed carrots. By all accounts, it was a simple meal, a peasant meal. But after slaving in the kitchens for the better half of the day, no one wanted to even think of preparing something similar for ourselves. This was our comfort food. This was home, our family time. And that's what we were, family. A mismatched band of soldiers tasked with holding Sredin together. I took my seat at the far end of the table. Tonight we have a special guest, I said as chairs squeaked and shuffled into position. Emissary Darden has come early from Strantoden to oversee preparations. Darden stepped from the shadows and took a seat beside me. Opon, I said, as the master cook returned with a covered bowl. Is it ready? He nodded. Why you would want to eat such slop is beyond me, though. He placed the steaming bowl down before Darden. A dry run for the first night of the summit, I said, as I removed the lid. Inside were clumps of what appeared to be tan worms. Urenti, Opon said. Darden stared at the worms, expressionless. Does this not satisfy you? I asked, shocked by his tepid reaction. My apologies, Lorianas, the boy said. I had hoped to try one of your dishes. Strantodian cuisine is quite dull to my palate. I cocked an eyebrow. Let's not disappoint you, then. I forked a piece of the salmon onto the servant's plate and grabbed the closest wine decanter. Before I poured it, though, Darden shook his head. Unfortunately, I will not be able to eat until I am back in my room. I looked at his mask and nodded. I am a fool. My apologies. Opon, can you plate a meal for our guest and have it sent to his chambers? Opon sighed, but did as I asked. I stood with a glass in hand. To our Strantodian guest, may this be the beginning of a powerful unity between our two countries. The staff stood and raised their glasses. Darden picked up his glass. I thank you for your hospitality, Lorianas, and I pray for our two kingdoms. May we finally end the bloodshed between us and unite our fractured lands. I brought my cup to my lips and sipped. The wine was warm and smooth, filled with hints of oak and nutmeg. It was an expensive vintage, rarely indulged by myself or the staff. But tonight was a special occasion. I will have a decanter disinfected and sent to your chambers, I said. Darden nodded. Thank you, Lorianas. May I ask where the vintage originated? It's from the king's personal cash, Opon whispered, grinning. Darden glanced at me, surprised. You stole from your master. I laughed. Of course not. He allows us to indulge in the finer vintages. Just as long as we don't empty the cellars. The servants chuckled at either end of the table. Do you not partake in the finer Strantodian vintages? Servants are forbidden from partaking in the upper house's meals, he replied. If any of us were caught with the higher foods or wine, we would know a stake outside Elop's walls by dawn. The servants fell silent. Even Opon appeared shocked, which was a rare occurrence for the surly cook. Execution. I asked. Sometimes worse, Darden replied. He stood and straightened his black tunic. My apologies, but I must take my leave. I do appreciate you inviting me to sit at your table, though. It is a courtesy rarely afforded to me. With that said, he bowed and exited the chamber. Opon shook his head. What kind of monsters are these people? The boy is not his master, I replied. No, but he's part of the problem. How so? I asked. Because he was born there. Opon shrugged. I turned to the other servants. Let me make one thing sparkling clear. All of us have been affected by this war. All of us have lost someone to a Strantodian blade. But that is all ending now. These people will be our guests, and I expect you all to act accordingly. Understood. The servants all nodded. Even Opon acquiesced. Wonderful.
Now let us eat. Forks clattered, and knives scraped as conversation resumed. I looked down at my plate. Upon had given me the choicest fillet and a nice, fatty duck breast. So tell me truthfully, Upon whispered, as he sat down and handed me a wooden gravy decanter. How did it go with that one? I poured the thick brown gravy over my potatoes. He seems reasonable enough. No special demands were made. To be honest, I kind of liked him. Well, that's a start, right? I sighed. It was. But the road would be long. Strantodin was a black hole. We knew little of their culture and people, and we had only mapped half the continent, so anything beyond Castle Elop was a mystery. My apprentice, Jaya, entered the chamber and approached me. He bent close to my ear and whispered, The Strantodian delegation has just arrived at the port, Lorianas. I nodded. They were right on time. I will meet you at the front gate in five minutes, I said. Jaya bowed and ran off into the castle. I placed my napkin on the table and stood. Ladies and gentlemen, assemble at the main entrance in five minutes. Our guests have arrived. Quiet murmurs rose from the table as the servants tossed down their napkins and slid their chairs out. They had been uneasy for days, and the arrival of the Strantodians only heightened the tension. I didn't blame them. We were welcoming our greatest enemy into our capital city. The heads of all three Deciman merchant families, as well as the noblemen who controlled them, had been unanimously against it. For they stood to lose their monopoly over the entire Eastern Hemisphere's trade routes. This meant both kings were in danger of reprisals. It would only take a single assassin's arrow to tip the scales in one direction or another. The king's guard had already searched the servants' quarters twice, and I was told my own bedchamber would be next. I didn't let it bother me, though. It was better to be cautious than to miss something that could later tear the realm apart. The staff silently filed out of the room, the laughter and revelry of a few moments ago all but forgotten. I waited until everyone had gone and turned to a pawn. Are you ready? I asked. He shrugged. One can never be ready for the unknown. Very true, I replied. But I figure if one shits his pants, it's best to just dive right in. Right. I shook my head. You have a way with words, O.P., but you'll have to soil yourself later, I'm afraid. We have work to do. Chapter 5 The Welcome I adjusted my vest and made sure there was no lint on my sleeves or pants. My thinning grey hair was freshly trimmed and my face was shaved and powdered. It's time, I thought. I looked at my servants. They stood at attention in a perfectly straight line, their uniforms pressed and ironed, every buckle and button polished to a high sheen. They faced the approaching wagons, their expressionless faces concealing the apprehension I knew bubbled within. I stood at the right flank of the line, closest to where the approaching carriage would stop. Darden stood beside me, the gentle hiss of his mask rising and falling like a ghostly tide. Remember, people. I said. We serve. That is our place in life, our mission. Let's make Sredin proud. The servants remained silent as the horses approached. They were the best I had ever worked with, a tight-knit family that took pride in their work. If a fire destroyed Sredin tonight, my people would have it rebuilt and polished by morning. If a flood came, they would have it dried and shorn up within the call. I was incredibly proud of them, they were the brothers and sisters I never had, my adopted family and army. And now we're heading off to war so that peace may be obtained. I spotted the lead wagon amongst the dust cloud surrounding the caravan. It was enormous, with two triton engines jutting from its roof. The king's carriage, I thought. I could only imagine the cost of such a thing. The entire vehicle was covered in onyx panels with gilt trimmings lining its every edge. As for the two Triton engines, they were beyond priceless, especially now that Triton was no more. Behind the king's carriage, lost in the swirling dust, were three more smaller carriages, each with a single smokestack belching forth green smoke. I glanced at Darden. The emissary had grown quiet, unease emanating from beneath his mask. The king's carriage entered the main gate 
and ground to a stop directly before the keep's entrance. The Triton engines spat out a final cloud of smoke as unseen mechanisms spun down inside. I felt the hairs on my neck prickle. Up close, the hulking engines were stunningly complex. As I stared at the network of pipes encircling them, I wondered how the Strantodians had purchased them. The gobs were notoriously secretive and only traded with a handful of kingdoms, and as far as I knew, Strantodin was not one of them. The driver jumped down and approached me. He, too, wore a triton breathing mask and black laptane suit. His Majesty Gaunius Wren sends his regards, the driver said, his voice distorted by his breather. I stepped forward. He's not amongst the caravan. He will not be arriving until tomorrow, the driver replied. In his stead is Willenius Dard, second overseer to the realm. I balked at the insult. Ten turns ago, Willenius Dard had been a general who commanded the bulk of the Strantodin army. His name was synonymous with countless war crimes. So why in the name of the gods had King Wren sent such a man to the summit? Was it a message? A threat, perhaps? The driver opened the wagon door. A river of green mist spilled onto the ground as a figure slowly materialized inside. All hail Willenius Dard. Overseer of Strantodin and second ruler to King Wren, the driver announced as the figure stepped into the sunlight. The overseer wore a gold mask painted into the likeness of the Strantodian god, Trax. It was an interesting choice. According to the tales, Trax had tried and failed to destroy Whitrina, the Strantodian god of light. Upon his defeat, he was cast down into Iro, the upper level of hell, where he eventually became ruler. As I stared at the man, I wondered if his choice in wardrobe was a hidden message. There was a chance the general simply had eclectic tastes. But one could never be sure with men of power. Diamonds and gems outlined the overseer's mask, glittering in the sun as he scanned my servants. He was tall, possibly six footfalls by my best estimate, and as he walked down the line of servants, he reminded me of a wolf stalking its prey. When he reached the end of the line, the overseer's shadow finally fell upon me. You are Sredin's Laurianus, he asked. I stared into his mask's diamond eyes and bowed. Laurianus Philem Klain, at your service. The overseer looked me over. You are old for a Laurianus. How long have you been here? I have had the honor of serving House Donan for almost sixteen turns. The overseer cocked his head as his mask hissed and popped. He wore a triton air tank gilt in gold, with three canisters welded together on a small frame slung over his back. But you still would have been old for a Laurianas when you graduated from Cilium Dor, he said, his voice muffled by the mask. I was my father's apprentice until he fell ill. After that, I took care of him for several turns before I finally entered and graduated from Cilium Dor. The overseer stared at me for what felt like an eternity. Finally, he nodded. And how has your stay been, Emissary Woe? Have our hosts treated you properly? Darden bowed. I have been welcomed beneath the Laurianus Code of Hospitality, and I have seen to it that all preparations have been made for His Majesty's stay. The overseer nodded. Show me your preparations, Laurianus Clane. I wish to see what all the huff is about regarding your reign. Here, I bowed and led him past the servants. My people stood rigid, their eyes locked on the distant forest as the overseer examined each of them in turn. I couldn't help but beam inside as we walked down the line. My people were the picture of perfection. The men wore grey trousers and black, silk tunics with vests of smooth grey venadier flesh and shoes of the finest verax leather imported all the way from Ab. The women wore small crystal tiaras in their hair, and black and white silk gowns checkered at the hem. The overseer finished the inspection and headed toward the main entrance. I tried to catch up, but by the time I reached him, he had already crossed the castle's threshold. This was a major lapse in decorum. Guests were always escorted across a castle threshold by the House Laurianas. It was a tradition that dated back to the time of Laurianas Milem Dwina 
one of the greatest servants ever to graduate from Cilium Dor. The story goes that a visiting dignitary arrived early at Loriana's Duina's castle. When Loriana's Duina was late for the customary inspection, the dignitary took it upon himself to enter the castle alone. Little did he know that an Ixian assassin was lying in wait in the shadows. Before the dignitary's body was even cold, Loriana's Duina was jailed and summarily executed for failing his position. Since that ill-fated day, all Lorianas are required to escort any visitors across the castle's threshold. I ran into the castle and immediately thrust myself in front of Duina. The overseer froze, staring at me as I caught my breath. Is there a problem, Lorianas? I wiped my sweaty brow. All dignitaries and guests of royal descent must be escorted across the castle threshold by me personally. He stared at me those eerie diamond eyes boring into my soul as yellow mist swirled beneath his mask. You know your duty well, Lorianas. He bowed and gestured for me to lead the way. This shocked me. I had expected to be chewed out before all of the servants, but the overseer simply bowed and shrugged it off as if it were nothing. We walked silently through the castle halls. Servants and guards stepped aside and bowed as we passed, their eyes averted to the floor. The wives of several noblemen stood whispering behind paper fans, watching the overseer and his retinue as if they were some carnival attraction. I kept glancing over my shoulder as we walked. The overseer's entourage consisted of five men and five women, all donning breather masks and trident air tanks. Their uniforms were all the same, black laptane suits with strange runes etched into the skin, the oddly coloured suits glistened in the torchlight as if they were wet, and at times they blended into the many shadows dotting Sraden's halls. I had heard about such suits from a culver trader who had visited Strantodin. They were made from flesh, harvested from laptane sharks, those same resilient and mysterious nightmare predators who ruled the acid sea. Normally their flesh was bright orange, a side effect from the acidic water but the Strantodians dyed them black to match their house colours. We approached the throne room entrance. Guardsman Stein Dunn and Racked Hammond stood watch before the massive Delcium doors. Both men stared at the overseer, their cold eyes filled with the promise of violence. Overseer Wallenius Dard commands time with the king, I proclaimed. Stein met my eyes as his hand noticeably tightened around the pommel of his sword. His rage and disgust were evident, and I didn't blame him. How many friends had he lost to Strantodin raiders over the turns? A dozen, a hundred, a thousand. The overseer and his entourage were symbols of the rage boiling in my people's souls. If I hadn't been present, these men of steel would have certainly cut down the overseer and his retinue, thrusting us into another violent century of war. Stein pulled himself together and glanced at the rest of the group. His Highness awaits you and the Strantodian, but the others wait here. I nodded. As I gestured for the overseer to pass, though, Stein stepped before him. Arms, he demanded, staring into the overseer's eyes. Without a word, the overseer raised his arms. Stein patted him down, tugging on his tank's hoses with excessive vigor. When he was satisfied, he stepped back and waved us forward. The overseer followed me in silence, unperturbed by the guardsman's behavior. As we entered the main gallery, dozens of noblemen and their concubines ceased talking and stared at us from either side of the chamber. King Donan sat upon his throne like a bag of bones, his emaciated form concealed beneath layers of opulent velvet and silk. Your Majesty, may I present? I'm familiar with our guest, Lorianas, King Donan said. I stepped back and allowed the overseer to approach the throne. The man bowed as his mask released tiny puffs of steam into the air. Your grace, it has been too long. King Donan stood and approached the man. It has, my old friend. It certainly has. The two embraced, a gesture that sent silent shockwaves throughout the gallery. I have come in advance of my king to make sure all is prepared for the summit, the overseer said. King Donan gestured toward me. Loriana's clan and your emissary have seen to it that all preparations have been made for your master's visit. 
but you are more than welcome to inspect for yourself. Very well, the overseer replied. The king placed a hand on the man's shoulder and lowered his voice. I really have missed you, old friend, I heard him whisper. The overseer nodded. The past is past, though, right? The king's expression notably darkened. I suppose so, he glanced at me. Loriana's claim, please see our guests to their quarters. I bowed as the overseer walked past me toward the main hall. Loriana's, the king said as I turned to follow. I halted. The fate of our two realms rests in Sredin's hands now, he said. Your hands. Understand. I nodded. I will not let you down, your grace. And with that, I turned and took off after our mysterious guests. Chapter 6 Banquets and Bastards The Strantodians settled into their sealed rooms silently and with few requests, but this did little to relieve my distress. The atmosphere of each of their twelve chambers had been tested and retested to ensure their safety. But as our guests sealed the doors behind them, my stomach boiled. If there was even the slightest imbalance in the artificial air, or, gods forbid, a leak in the room's fresh seals, any one of the representatives could fall ill. If that occurred, I would not only lose my status as Lorianas, but I would be banished to live out my days on Cilium Door as a statusless servant. For a Lorianas, that was a fate worse than death. And it is looming perilously close, I thought. Do another inspection of all the chamber doors and tanks, I said to Jaya, even though I was well aware he had just checked everything. My apprentice bowed and hurried off down the hall without a word. I respected him for this. The last thing I needed during this summit was my own people questioning me. Lost in thought, I ran a hand down the wax seal that covered the doors to the overseer's quarters. As I pondered the many things that could go wrong over the next few days, footfalls resounded behind me. You check those any more, and you're going to have no time for dinner. I smiled. Radme. So what do you think of this foreign Lorianas? she asked as she took a pull on an Adrena stick. I don't quite know yet. We barely spoke on the road. On the road? she asked. Like all stable workers, she wore stained overalls and knee-high leather boots, and she had a bit of mud caked on her right cheek. It drove me mad with lust. I found him at Wallen Fopen's place, I replied. Radme's eyes widened. Could he have been the one who killed him? Howlers got poor Wallen, I replied. I saw his bloody ears with my own eyes. She shook her head. Those damn things are spreading everywhere. We should send groups out to eradicate them and lose more good people. No. Those outside Sredin walls know the danger of the pines. Wallen took his chances and it cost him. But he lived a good life. Rather a cold way of putting it, though, don't you think? I sighed. It was, but I had known the cheesemaker for over ten turns. He was a stubborn man prone to the drink. When the howlers first started popping up, I requested that he move into the castle, but he refused, preferring the quiet of the pines to the clatter of the castle. And look what it cost you. I'll make sure his family is taken care of, I said. I believe most of them live in Durdam. Radme nodded. Well, the kitchen calls now, I said. Care to take a walk? You read my mind, she replied, smiling. We made our way through the castle's many corridors, chatting and laughing like the best friends we were. Sometimes our familiarity became almost too much to bear. It hurt not to be able to take her in my arms and kiss her. But that was the life I chose, the path I tread. Radme understood this, even if she couldn't hide her feelings as well as I. But it didn't lessen the pain. So what do you think will come of all this? She asked as we approached the kitchens. I sighed. One can never tell, really. But I think this will be the beginning of a peaceful relationship. I can see the yearning in their eyes. They're just as tired of war as we are. More so, probably. Will I be able to come to the feast? She asked. Don't forget you promised me. 
I silently scolded myself. She was right. I had promised her. However, the Strantodians insisted that only necessary servants be allowed in the Grand Hall. I'll try my best. But they are even more obsessed with security than we are. She cocked an eyebrow. Sounds like you're reneging. I am just being realistic, my dear. The slightest error could ruin this summit. She shook her head. I think you're just too afraid of these people. Let me stay in the kitchens. I can watch the feast from the windows. No one will be the wiser. If the Strantodians were to find out it could ruin everything, I replied. I'm sorry. I can't risk jeopardizing the summit. Not even for you. She scoffed. I'll remember that the next time you need one of my garrons. She turned to leave. Rad May, I called after her. But she stormed off down the hall. I sighed. She was right. I was reneging on my promise, but I had made it before the Strantodian guidelines arrived for the summit. You could do it, though, I told myself. Break a rule for once in your goddamn life. But the Lorianas in me wouldn't allow it. I entered the kitchen and sat down at my little wood desk. I poured a glass of Alemanian tart wine and gingerly sipped it, hoping to ease my nerves. As the warm, aromatic fluid flowed into my belly, my head spun with possible outcomes for the summit. This was one of the most important events I would ever oversee, a monumental one if you took into account that no Strantodian delegation had visited Deciman in almost fifty turns let alone Sraden Castle. In a sense, both kings' lives would be as much my responsibility as the royal guards. This made my stomach boil. The next few days would determine both Deciman and Strantodin's future, as much as my own. Care to put some hair on your chest? I looked up. Opon stood before me, a tankard of honey ale outstretched in his chunky hand. I put down my wine and accepted the tankard. Thank you. Opon nodded and took a seat beside me. I figured you might need something a bit stiffer. I sipped the warm ale and licked sweet foam from my lips. It was delicious, albeit a bit strong for my tastes. I downed it anyway, though. Liquid courage would be a necessity in the coming days. Better, Opon asked. I shook my head. There's so much that can go wrong these next few days. So much... My friend placed a warm, chunky hand on my shoulder and squeezed. You are the greatest Lorianas ever to grace these halls. Your name is known and sought after in all nine realms. In fact, you're probably the most famous Lorianas on Retrack Deor. This task is nothing compared to what you've accomplished in the past. I forced a chuckle. If only I had your confidence, old friend. You have something better. And what is that? Refinement and class, and the desire to serve. I smiled. Those are traits all Lorianas possess. What I lack and need now is luck. Upon laughed, his chubby cheeks quivering as sweat coursed down his brow. Luck. What is that but a crutch for mediocrity? He grabbed my wine glass and drank down the remnants in one gulp. Now this... This is the opposite of mediocrity, and who do we have to thank for its presence beneath this roof? I stifled a belch and sighed. It had taken me ten turns to track down the famously secretive Doshan winemakers. Every kingdom sought out their grape fields, but after six expeditions, my people had finally managed to find them. And now we were blessed with some of the finest vintages on the planet. That reminds me. Bring four cases to my personal chambers tonight. They need to breathe before the feast. Upon laughed. What? Always work with you. Don't you ever relax, Phileam. There'll be time enough when I'm dead, I replied. He continued chuckling. Even with the threat of war hanging over us, Upon was as jovial as ever. His station is one of service to the kitchens and only the kitchens, I thought. There... He was king of fire and steam. His scepter, a sharpened knife, and his throne the chair sitting opposite me. I envied him for this. The kitchens were home to men and women just like him. Servants whose hands were calloused and burned, and whose clothes were covered in stains. 
The kitchens were a place that bred hardened souls, whose lack of polish and decorum separated them from the gilt halls above. In their world, tucked beneath the pomp and finery that was shrayed in proper, they were free to do as they willed. They ruled over a place where the air was filled with laughter, and where one could let down their guard. They were a family, a raw collective of some of the most talented cooks and housemaids in all the realms. At times I yearned to trade places with Opon, to work beside my friends without the cloud of my station interfering. Was this too much to want? Was I betraying my Loriana's schooling by yearning for a simpler life? Caring for kings takes a toll on a man. It wears one down and erases the individual soul. My father was evidence to that. And even though I loved the man, I would never take the same path as him. Loriana's. I snapped out of my daze. Opon stood staring at me, a hesitant smile on his sweaty face. Everything okay? he asked. I kind of lost you for a moment there. I stood and flicked a piece of lint from my tunic. Apologies. I've a lot on my mind, that's all. Will you excuse me? Upon bowed his head. Very well, Lorianas. If you need to vent, though, I've got a bottle of two hundred turn old purple berry wine with our names on it. I gazed across the bustling kitchen. Cooks were busy prepping the rest of the night's meals, while quaifs peeled the strange Strentodian tine fruit. The fruit's pungent, meat-like odor filled the kitchen, but the seasoned cooks showed no signs of discomfort. These men and women had prepared meals for every type of guest, using some of the most deadly and expensive ingredients in all the realms. For them new and strange dishes were not something to be feared, but challenges to be relished. I smiled as my people hustled about the steamy kitchen. They were a loud, unpolished brood, forged from fire, grease, pot, and cauldron. But when it came down to it, they were as disciplined as soldiers. My family, I thought again with pride as two cooks, Frey Willen and Polar Den, placed a Trevanian vulture in the oven. The enormous, carnivorous bird had been imported from Strantodin, but had died as soon as it was introduced to Deciman's atmosphere. Its death will only make the meat more succulent, I thought, as the cooks sealed the oven. I wondered if my own death would elevate me in the king's eyes. If I were poisoned during a tasting, would I, too, attain a higher purpose on this planet? Perhaps someone would have me stuffed and mounted in the great hall, forever watching over the court. I watched as they stoked the flames beneath the massive oven. The featherless bird was already crisping as fluids bubbled up from its browning flesh. If prepared properly, our guests would be dining on one of the most expensive dishes ever to leave our kitchens. The vultures were incredibly rare and near impossible to catch. Not to mention the cost of keeping one alive during shipping from Strantodin, I thought. This one bird had cost Sredin over 5,000 gold coinage, an exorbitant amount for a single meal but it will feed the entire delegation tenfold, I reminded myself. First, it had to be cooked properly, though. The preparation of a Trevanian vulture was incredibly complex, due to the nature of its toxic homeland. The Strantodian air consisted of cyanide and other toxins, mixed together with magic pollutants and vapors blown in from the acid sea. If the beasts were not purged of the poisons prior to being served to the Strantodians, Sredin would soon find itself under siege by the largest army on all of Retrac Deor. I opened the day's chore scroll. I had tastings at midday, followed by dinner services for the Strantodian delegation. I was not looking forward to any of it, especially the tasting. But it had to be done. If anyone were to fall ill during the banquet, I would be held accountable. A young girl named Dari approached me with a small wooden box in her hands. She wore a smock, and had her blonde hair tied back into a ponytail, as was the custom in the royal kitchens. The goptry you ordered, Lorianas, she said. I took the box and cracked the lid. A pungent, mushroom-like odor filled the air. I smiled. The fungus was fresh, harvested only a few calls earlier in one of the caves located south of the castle. Are they to your liking? Dari asked. I met her eyes. My dear, they are perfection incarnate. She smiled. They found them in some of the smaller caves beyond the forest. 
probably the best any of the gatherers have ever found. You've done well, Dari, but I don't want anyone else going down there. Flay trolls have been spotted in the southern forests. I'd wager my life they're using some of those caves for their nests. She nodded. Very well, Lorianas. But what of the glow bulbs you ask for? I sighed. Glow bulbs only grew in the deepest caves, where their large, glowing stigmas lured cave insects and vermin into their sticky petals. Their luminant fluid was priceless, and a favored delicacy of the Strantodians. Many people believed the fluid was life extending. However, sending someone in search of it was a risk I didn't care to take, not with trolls roaming about the countryside. I'll handle it personally, I said. Dari's face paled. But you just said there were... I know what I said, but we need to impress. I swallowed as I pondered, venturing into the caves. The flay trolls' nests would be close to the surface, far away from the depths where the glow bulbs flourished. But the beasts had an incredible sense of smell and would immediately notice anyone entering their habitat. That meant... I had to mask my scent, somehow. I sighed as Dari nervously bit her lip. The only way to hide one's scent from a flay troll was to cover your skin and clothing with horse dung and skunk grass, a prospect that did little to elevate my morale. Have Radme set aside some dung in the stables, I said. Are you sure, Lorianas? Not really, but if you know a better way to acquire glow bulbs, I am all ears. Dari frowned. Then it looks like I'll be needing that dung. I stood outside the gates, a bedraggled mess covered head to toe in horse dung. The smell was awful, and the cloud of flies buzzing around me only made it worse. By the gods, you are ripe, Radme said as she finished smearing a particularly large handful of warm dung across my back. I swatted at a fly as I struggled not to gag. I believe that is the point, my dear. Radme stepped back and inspected her work with a grin. I'd say you're shitty enough now. Sighing, I whistled. Seconds later, Poppy cantered toward me, her throbbing nostrils curiously probing the befouled air. When she caught a whiff of me, though, she backed up and shunned me with a grunt. By the gods, even Poppy can't take the stench, Radme said, and laughed as she shielded her nose. I climbed onto the garren. I'll be back before nightfall. Radme handed me my backpack. And if you aren't, I suppose you'll need to send for a new Lorianas. She frowned. Don't even joke. I winked. Just hold the castle while I'm gone. Radme met my eyes, her face a mask of concern. Be careful. Really, Fi. I nodded as I kicked Poppy into a trot. Have Jaya look in on the kitchens. I don't want tonight's peach cobbler burned. Radme stood in the center of the road, watching as the forest slowly swallowed me into its unnatural twilight. My heart ached. I still remembered our first meeting in the stable courtyard fifteen turns earlier. She had been covered in filth, a bedraggled woman doing a farrier's job, even though such tasks were far beneath her position. Under the grime, though, was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. A middle-aged angel with a whip-smart personality and a tongue as sharp as any sword or quill. Within weeks I was closer with her than anyone else at Sraden. Friendship and love quickly entangled themselves around my heart. However, the code kept me in check. I could not be dragged into such trivialities, not if I hoped to run Sraden properly. Poppy nickered as we passed an enormous boulder, there were hundreds just like it in this section of the forest, great hulking pieces of granite and marble, covered in crude etchings and creeping ivy. Some had been completely hollowed out, while others were stacked one atop the other in pyramid-like fashion. How the ancients achieved these miracles was anybody's guess. For there were neither granite nor marble deposits anywhere in Sraden. That meant these massive monoliths had been shipped here but not even the greatest Triton alchemists or Isle scholars had learned their exact origin or purpose. I nudged Poppy away from the strange rock. Such things unnerved me. They were an unknown, a mystery without meaning or purpose. 
I was a man of fact and control. Without evidence, it might as well not exist. Without historical records, it was but a fable for children. Someday you're going to have to let go of that control for them, Rad May had once told me. Her words still stung my overworked conscience. For turns, she had tried to get me to delegate more responsibilities to the other servants. But the control I held over both my duties and the castle itself were all I had. How could I let go of that? And what would there be for me without servitude? Who would I be? I sighed. I loved Radme, even if I could never have her. That had been true since the first moment I laid eyes on her. At times I wondered if she felt the same way for me. Did she lie awake at night, daydreaming of our next encounter? Did she yearn for the warmth of my arms curled around her waist as I hugged her tight against my body? I doubted it. But I could dream. Patches of gold light cut down through the dense meshwork of pine boughs and splashed across the rutted trail like swaths of gold watercolour. In six calls, the sun would fully set. A tight margin to complete my mission. But there was no choice in it now. The last thing I wanted was to be stranded beyond Sraden's walls overnight. I just prayed the cave would be free of those beasts when I arrived. Chapter 7 Friend of my enemy The forest was alive with the gentle whisper of swaying pines and buzzing insects. Here and there, tiny dart moles and venner foxes scampered about the underbrush, watching as Poppy and I passed through their strange twilight world. In my younger days I enjoyed the forest's gentle song. I even took to climbing the steps of Killiam Duja, the famed ruins which towered above the eastern swath of the great forest. Those days were long behind me, though. As serene as the forest was, the aging Lorianas in me was all too aware of the possible dangers hiding in every shadow. The pine trunks began to thin to the east, revealing a small brook running parallel to the trail. The water gurgled and slapped over smooth, water-worn rocks, flowing toward the southern part of the forest, where it would eventually empty into the sea. I sighed as I listened to its steady song. I had always wanted to fish the brook, but duty had always prevented it. If there are trolls in the wood, they'll keep close to the brook, I reminded myself as Poppy's ears scanned the forest. The foul creatures preyed on venadier and bear making the water source a perfect hunting ground. If I kept too close to it, I ran the chance of bumping into a pack. But if I headed east into the thicker part of the forest, I would be in the middle of razorwing territory. The birds of prey weren't as dangerous as the flay trolls, but if I stumbled into one of their mile-wide nesting grounds, things would go bad quickly. I kicked Poppy's side and moved closer to the brook. If we encountered anything, I'd prefer it be a flay troll. At least I could attempt to deal with such a beast. The razor wings were lightning fast, and they always hunted in enormous flocks. We approached the edge of the brook, where I dismounted so Poppy could drink for a bit while I scanned the area. Unlike the northern part of the forest, there was neither wind nor birds disturbing the branches above, and the insects had all but fallen silent. This unnerved me. I knew danger when I sensed it, and it was getting close. Come, Poppy, I said, as I climbed back into the saddle. We need to keep moving. The Garen took one last gulp, and then returned to the path. She was nervous, her mane was stiff, and I could feel a slight shiver in her flesh. My hand drifted to the dagger sheathed at my side as she plodded onward. I had no idea how to wield the ornamental weapon, yet its presence somehow made me feel safe, like a castle wall or piece of armor. I just prayed I wouldn't have to use it. The undergrowth quickly became tall and unruly, devouring the ancient roadway as we pressed deeper into the forest. I could see the base of the rocky cliff-like protrusions that marked the beginning of the cave systems. The entrance was close now. I had seen similar topography several turns earlier while harvesting mushrooms for the king's fortieth turn ball. And just like then, the sight set my hairs on end. Branches whipped against Poppy's side as we ploughed onward. Bones lay scattered beside the path, most likely venadier or coon. Poppy noticeably kept her distance, curving around the bones until we could see them no more. 
We eventually passed several patches of dead, gangly pines. Like many of the trees in the area, their bark had been stripped bare, and claw marks adorned the freshly exposed wood. This entire area is tainted by trolls, I thought, as the main cave entrance slowly materialized in the distance. I swallowed. The gate that had been affixed to it several turns ago now hung ajar, creaking back and forth in the gentle breeze. Somehow, someone or something, had torn it from the ancient hinges drilled into the granite wall. This was no easy feat. Tritonese workers had installed it several turns ago, reinforcing the massive hinges with Triton steel. If it had been meant to keep something out, then nothing should have been able to disturb it. I climbed off Poppy and tied her to a nearby pine. The area was dead silent. Not even the wind circulated through this part of the forest. Like a tomb, the area surrounding the gate stood frozen in time, a forbidden dimension few meddled with. I reached into my saddle and withdrew the eternal lamp Jaya had filled for me. When I shook the viscous fluid to life, its core glowed bright orange, illuminating the entrance. I swallowed. Like the trees along the road, the trunks of the pine trees closest to the entrance were covered in deep scratch marks. Many were still fresh, the tan wood below glowing bright in the eternal lamp's eerie blue light. Poppy nickered fearfully behind me as she shifted atop the forest's pine needle-covered ground. Easy girl, I whispered. I tried to tell myself the marks had been left by bears or mountain cats. But I knew the truth. This was the work of female trolls. Such marks were meant to attract a mate. The deeper the cuts, the more strength the female projected. This was a bad thing. Female trolls were far more aggressive than their male counterparts. And unlike the male's padded, clawless hands, the females had four-inch long talons on both their hands and feet that could cut rock and wood. That was how they were able to burrow so deep into the mountain. Stories abound of troll warrens stretching for miles without end. Few were ever mapped, though, and those foolish enough to attempt such a feat were rarely seen again. But why are they so close to Sredin? I wondered. Both female and male trolls normally shunned civilization, preferring the deep wilds of the south or the mountainous regions north of Sredin Castle. Had the creatures exhausted their subterranean hunting grounds? Perhaps fire or flood had pushed them south through the Howler fields. Whatever the cause, I would have to report their presence to the king's guard. But first the bulbs, I thought as I approached the gate. It was odd that such a place hadn't been sealed off with explosive paste. Perhaps the rumors of gold were true. Over the turns, dozens of Garfaxian mining crews had tried to locate the precious ore down in the darkness. But not so much as a nugget had ever been found. Now the ancient mine stood as a testament to man's greed. I slowly stepped past the rent gate, my breath held. The lamplight illuminated a small fifteen foot full swath of light around me. But beyond its reach was nothing but a lifeless void. All sounds seemed to be absorbed by the darkness, and the damp air smelled musty and forgotten, as if it had been trapped beneath the ground for thousands of turns. The sunlight soon faded behind me as the tunnel sloped down and to the west. I ducked low, wincing as my lower back ached. The price of servitude, I thought, as my aging bones and muscles throbbed to life. I was damn near sixty-five turns old now, one of the oldest living Lorianas in the whole of Retrack Doe. Most men would have taken it easier at this stage in their service. Not me. The turns were like demons nipping at my heels, forever reminding of all that had changed throughout my life, of all the memories now fading into obscurity. Work kept the thoughts at bay. But every now and then a malaise still overcame me. For I had sired no children and could never wed. My father was all but ash now, and my mother's face had become obscured by the passage of time. And now your king begins the long walk into the nether. This shouldn't have frightened me as much as it did. It was considered the ultimate honor for a Lorianas to follow their ward into the next life. But what if I haven't left behind a life worth remembering? I thought. 
What if my service becomes just another footnote in Cilium Dor's history books? The tunnel was narrow, and its walls rough-hewn. Whomever had carved it from the mountain had been practical, cutting it just big enough for a grown man to navigate. I crouched as I walked, my back aching and my thighs burning. I kept the lantern raised before me. Aside from my dagger, it was the only other weapon I had should something decide to announce its presence. Find a hollow. Find it and harvest the damn things so we can get out of this silent hell. My crunching footfalls dominated my senses. There was no echo in the darkness, no hint of the vastness that lay before me. Only the crunch, crunch of my fine leather boots atop the mine's ancient, gravel-covered floor. A breeze swept up the tunnel, chilling my sweat-soaked face. It was stagnant and cold, like Sraden's dungeons. Only here it was air that had not seen the sun in centuries. Why am I doing this? I wondered. I could have sent any number of servants in my stead. Why did I feel compelled to risk my life in the winding black of this abyss? Because you are a Lorianas, my father's voice said, the finest on the continent, and you must show this to the visiting Lorianas. You must show him what it really means to dedicate one's life to the service of a king. My counterpart materialized in my mind. Proust Warden, I thought. We had schooled together at Cilium Door for ten turns. Competing for our master's attention, as we learned all there was to learn of servitude and its many responsibilities. Of all the other students, he was the only one who showed the same devotion and obsession to the order that I did. But there was a darkness in the man, a silent evil that made him approach the world with disdain and indifference. I, on the other hand, celebrated the prism-like facets of life, both good and bad. For the world was a puzzle to be solved, to be dealt with, and who better to handle this task than a student of the Loriana's order? Proust Worden. The name had haunted me for turns, for I was jealous of his skills and wanted nothing more than to prove to the order that I was the better Loriana's. But one day Warden left the school to seek out notoriety on the far side of the world. Eventually he found his place on Strantodin, where King Galnius Wren adopted him as the court Loriana's. Little is known of his service there, save for one dark rumour that made its way back to Cilium Dor. The story goes that in order to prove his undying loyalty to King Wren, Proust voluntarily burned his entire family alive in their manse. Whether there was truth to this was anyone's guess. But the tale was forever burned into my mind, as was my former classmate's name. Perhaps you'll learn the truth in the coming days, I thought, as I stumbled over a fallen rock. Like so many of the rumours fluttering about the castle halls, it was hard to discern fact from fiction, especially when it came to tales leaked from Strantodin. The island continent was nearly impenetrable to outsiders, a fortress whose borders were lined with sheer black cliffs topped with howler fields stretching for as far as the eye could see. I had been to the northern shores several times since my posting at Sraden began. I've even seen clearing fires wavering in and out of existence amongst the Strantodian howler fields, a sign that the once sought-after barrier was becoming too wild, even for King Wren's black tastes. <laughs> but that is all about to change, I said to myself as I tore through a massive cobweb. If all went well at the summit, the doors would finally be open to their mysterious culture. I wondered what kinds of culinary delights awaited us across that rippling strait, how many new wines and distilleries would we discover amongst their ashen land? I pushed the thoughts from my mind. First, the summit had to pass without incident. Then, and only then, could we hope to see negotiations between our two nations begin. That was when the real work would begin. We were two completely different cultures trying to come to terms with over a hundred turns of bloodshed and isolation. Could such deep wounds be cleansed and mended in one meeting? I doubted it. But what a legacy to leave behind if it was possible. The mere thought of it excited me to no end. This summit would be the ultimate test of my skills and devotion. It was my moment to show the world just what Loriana's Philemclane was capable of. The tunnel began to slowly widen. After a few hundred footfalls, 
It opened into a vast cavern which swallowed the eternal lamp's light into its black void. It was as if I had reached the top of some black mountain where not even the stars dared to gaze. My stomach began to boil. This was no place for a Lorianas. A knight, perhaps, maybe even a charger, but not me. Just keep moving, I told myself. Find the bulbs and get the hells out of here. The air was damp, stinking of rot and stagnation. I'm close, I thought. The glow bulbs flourished in the moist depths, their strange, sentient roots burrowing deep into the rock like draba bird beaks through flesh. The bulbs would remain dark until they sensed movement. Then their strange, bulbous heads would glow brighter than the finest eternal lump. That was why they were so prized by the Strantodians. One plant could fuel dozens of lamps for turns. And for a kingdom steeped in toxic fog and darkness, light was more valuable than meridium dust or coinage. I moved cautiously across the cavern floor. The soil was grey and covered in turns of bat waste and bone. That was a good sign. Trolls tended to nest as far from Calavax cave bats as possible. The winged creatures were opportunistic hunters, feeding on whatever became trapped in their black world. Even trolls. But unlike the docile breeds that dwelled on Algian Trias, these nocturnal hunters were unique to Decimen. It made me thankful I was covered in horse dung and skunk grass. My mind swirled as I scanned the darkness. So much had changed these last few turns. The king's illness had progressed much faster than expected, meaning my time was limited. I felt adrift in an uncontrollable vessel, all but cut off from the rest of the world, like a ghost wandering a lonely ruin. Time marched on at a brutal pace, the days and turns whipping past in a blur, as everything familiar and loved slipped further through my fingers. Was it the same for you in the end, father? I wondered. Did it all just begin slipping away one day as the world moved on without you? My chest tightened. I half expected to hear the old man's reply boom across the void, chastising me for not folding the breakfast linens into perfect four-by-two rectangles. But there was only silence, save for my own crunching footfalls. Father had served King Dolan loyally for fifty-six turns, one of the longest reigns of any known Lorianas. His first day of service began when he was only twenty-two turns old, making him the youngest Lorianas at the time. For turns he was respected and loved by all of Decimon, but he was also an unconscionable taskmaster, ruling his kitchen and castle halls like a seasoned general. So refined and obsessed was he that a simple cobweb or wrinkled bedsheet could mean a complete cleansing of the entire castle. Or a night spent scrubbing the grease pits beneath the kitchens, I thought. Like so many others, I had known the stink and slime of that place. Yet there were days I actually missed it. There was a sense of comfort working beneath my father. He was a Lorianas of the servants, watching out for us like a Verax cat, protecting its pride. And that's exactly what the servants were, a pride. A family. My mother had died when I was but a babe, and for much of my childhood, my father was far too busy running the castle to raise me into a proper Lorianas. That job fell to the servants, who quickly became my best friends and mentors. I knew the name of every cook and scouring wench in the castle, as well as every maid and cupbearer. And they knew and loved me. We were a secret village hidden beneath the throne room, the brains and brawn of the castle that powered Sraden's fragile pomp and civility. To me, these men and women of mop and spoon were the true kings and queens of Decimon. My lamp revealed strange patches of green lichen on the floor, as well as clusters of spider-like plants whose long blade-like leaves curled into their thick black stalks. But there was still no sign of the elusive glow bulbs. Perhaps trolls had devoured them all, or maybe they died off from some blight. There would be signs, though, I thought. There were no footprints or scat piled about. In fact, there were no signs of life at all. I pressed on until I reached the opposite side of the cavern. I then walked east along the wall until I found a small, four-foot-full-wide hole leading into another chamber. Crouching down, I raised my lamp. 
Mounds of what appeared to be bat droppings covered the tunnel floor. Insects scuttled across them, maggots and beetles and every other kind of filth burrowing into the fecal matter in search of warmth and sustenance. I gagged. This was no place for a Lorianas, or any human, for that matter. Don't stop, I told myself. I got on my knees and crawled through the hole. The air was cold and stank of decay and death. When I was through, I raised the lamp and gazed at the ceiling. High above, barely visible in the eerie gold light, were dozens of massive bats. Their sackcloth black wings were folded over their bodies like silk blankets, and their pointed ears were perked to attention. But the creatures didn't stir. I quietly made my way through the filth and crossed to the other side of the alcove. A powerful stench burned my nostrils, making my head spin. A hundred footfalls to my left dim pinpoints of light winked in and out of existence. There you are. I slowly approached the bulbs. As I walked, dozens more sprang to life, bathing the cavern in a ghostly silver light. By the gods, I breathed. The light revealed hundreds of enormous calavax bats dangling from the ceiling. I shivered as I watched them. The creatures wouldn't remain asleep for much longer, not with sunset approaching. I had to move quickly now. As I hurried between the mounds, something odd caught my eye. Pieces of hair poked out of several piles, and odd bulges distorted some of their pyramidal-like forms. I approached one of the larger dung piles to my left and was about to hurry past when the side of it crumbled onto the cave floor like wet sand. I jumped back as a black form rolled free. It lay on the floor squirming, its two ape-like arms clawing at the floor as it dragged itself toward my feet. A troll, I thought as my heart lurched into my throat. It was a youngling, most likely still blind from birth. The bats must have caught it and buried it in the scat. I ran toward the bulbs and began yanking on the largest stalk. At first, it resisted. But after a few pulls, it finally broke free in a shower of moist soil. I quickly tucked it into my satchel and moved on to the next. Behind me, the baby troll lay motionless, its hand clutching the floor. I pulled another glow bulb free, showering the area with fresh dirt as I cut the roots free. A loud groan then echoed across the cavern. Not more than twenty footfalls behind me, another troll clawed free from another pile. Its fur was coated in foul, grey matter, and its humanoid eyes reflected the blue light of my eternal lamp. I swallowed as I tucked another bulb into my satchel. This troll was larger, possibly twice the size of the baby. And when it met my eyes, its gnarled humanoid face crinkled into a sneer. The bats suddenly stirred to life, screeching and flapping their massive wings. In a wild rush, they swooped down from the ceiling and vanished down the tunnel into the adjacent chamber. Seconds later, a strange, ghostly moan echoed up from the darkness. Footfalls soon followed, a storm of frantic claws clicking on the granite floor, and they were getting closer. I continued to tug and pull, slashing at the thick roots as I filled my satchel with as many bulbs as I could harvest. Meanwhile, at least three trolls entered the alcove through another entrance. The horrid things froze when they saw my lamp. By the gods, I thought. The largest troll's head twitched from side to side as it skirted the edge of the lamplight, I tucked one last bulb into my satchel and synced it shut. Four more trolls were scampering about the gloom, their eyes locked on my lamp as they followed my every move. I took a deep breath and sprinted across the west side of the chamber. Everywhere I looked more trolls were appearing, their hideous humanoid faces staring at me with feral glee. The exit was just a few dozen footfalls to the north, so I made my move and crawled as fast I could toward the main cavern. But just as I was about to reach the end of the narrow tunnel, an enormous hand grabbed my ankle and yanked me backward. I screamed as my fingers dug trenches in the soil. I could smell the creature, a foul, bitter musk, not unlike a skunk or dead venadier. With what little strength I had, I grabbed either side of the hole and braced myself. 
The beast howled as it tried to pull me backward, but I kicked it in the face and scrambled forward into the main cavern. Oh dear, I breathed as soon as I stood. Dozens of trolls stood before me. Patches of tattered, lice-covered fur plagued their flesh, and their bodies were covered in bloody gashes and white scar tissue. I threw my bag over my shoulder and bolted for the exit. The creatures followed, keeping just to the edge of my lamplight as more materialized in the dark behind them. I ran blindly, indifferent to the creeping death surrounding me. There was no choice in it. I had to get outside. I had to return to the castle to warn the guards. Several trolls blocked my path, but I crashed through them, knocking the stinking things to the floor as their filthy fur brushed my arms and face. My lungs burned and my legs ached. The turns of servitude as Sredin's Lorianas had softened me, to the point that not even my adrenaline could propel me forward much longer. Finally, I tripped and fell in the dirt, my bag of glow bulbs spilling across the floor. I could clearly see my hunters now. They were running up the tunnel, indifferent to the glow bulb's golden light. What in the hells have I done? I thought as more shadows appeared. I picked up the bag and began stuffing the glow bulbs back inside. The trolls inched forward, testing the boundaries of the light. Above me, a bat unfolded its wings and shook itself off. Dozens more soon followed, raining fur and fecal matter onto the cave floor. I threw the bag over my shoulder and scanned the shadows for an opening, but the trolls had completely encircled me. I could try to smash my way through them again, but then you'll die horribly, I realized. The trolls began walking into the light, jumping in and out of it, as if it were a flame too hot to approach. When they realized that it couldn't hurt them, several larger trolls lumbered forward. I stepped back and drew my ornamental dagger. The blade was long and ornate, with runes etched into its steel. But its edge was dull, and the pommel was slightly loose around the tang. I waved it before me anyway, praying my pathetic display of bravado might push them back. So this is it, I whispered to myself. My heart was pounding into my throat, and my legs were beginning to give out. I braced myself for the end, praying someone might someday find my skeleton in this black hellscape. Just then, dozens of bats swept down across the cavern, cutting the air mere inches above my head. A troll let out a high-pitched wail as one of the bats tore its scalp off. Another fell to the ground as two enormous bats slashed at its chest with their ivory talons. I scrambled onto my feet and slammed my shoulder into the closest troll, knocking it from my path moments before a bat grabbed it and carried it off into the darkness. The rest of the trolls panicked, as bats plucked them one by one off the floor. Several enormous female trolls moved to the front of the pack, one of them taking hold of a bat and tearing its wings off. But the Kalavax bats continued to decimate their numbers, slashing and dragging away the smallest trolls. As I ran, I glanced one last time over my shoulder. Several smaller trolls were still following me. Their high-pitched wails pierced my eardrums, as I turned and raised the dagger. But before they reached me, a wave of fire suddenly flooded the cavern. I fell to the ground, shielding my face as the trolls erupted into flames. The wretched creatures danced about wildly, screaming and smashing into one another as fire consumed their fur. I closed my eyes. I had no idea what was happening. My grey hair was curling from the heat, and the back of my tunic smouldered as the temperature increased. Smoke exploded across the cavern, masking the chaos. I pressed myself to the floor. There was no escape, no God present to hear my pleas. This was death, my death, and I was alone. The last thing I saw before unconsciousness whisked me away was a figure on the far side of the cavern surrounded in flames. But before I could see who it was, my world fell dark. Chapter 8 Saviors and scoundrels. I awoke with a start, staring at a cracked ceiling. I was in my bedchamber. My chest was wrapped in bandages, and a piece of cloth covered a large portion of my right cheek. I groaned as I slowly sat up. My body protested every breath, but I was alive, back in the safety of Sredin Castle. I took a shallow breath and began coughing uncontrollably. 
Whoa there, came a female voice. Best you just take it easy. Radme, I thought. She sat beside me, illuminated by a single blue candle. I met her eyes and slumped back into the bed. What happened? You tell me, she replied, handing me a cup of water. I tilted it to my cracked lips and took a sip. The icy water instantly invigorated my parched throat. How long have I been here? I asked. And where are the glow bulbs? Slow down, Radme said. First, finish your water. Then I'll tell you what I know. I shut my eyes and drank down the contents of the cup. The last thing I remembered was the fire and the burning trolls. But everything after that was lost. Was it you? I asked, staring at her. Did you get me out of there? Radme laughed. What do I look like? Some kind of knight? Or someone dragged me out of that cave? And it wasn't me. You were found at the east entrance, lying in a cart alone, covered in a blanket. I shook my head. The fire had been absolute, devouring everything in its path. I looked at my trembling hands. They were burned and covered in bandages. Had I clawed my way out across the floor? I doubted it. I could barely push myself off the floor, let alone crawl two hundred footfalls through burning death. Here, Radme said as she lifted a large sack onto her lap. She reached inside it and removed a glow bulb. You're an angel, I breathed. I took the luminous plant from her and cupped it in my bandaged hands. Was it worth it? I met her eyes. We need all the help we can get in the coming days. Even if that help is a mere gesture to our Strantodin guests. I handed the glow bulb back to her and sighed. Keep them safe, will you? I'll need them later when we begin setting up the banquet hall. Radme laughed. You're not going anywhere, Philem. Have you looked at yourself? I sat up and winced as burns on my back cracked open. I'll be fine. Sure you will. Half your body is covered in burns, including your hands. How do you plan on executing your duties without hands? I don't need hands. Just helpers, I groaned as I threw my legs over the side of the bed. I must not fail my king, I told myself. The arrival of the Strantodians was the single most important event in his entire reign. How would it look if his Lorianas was absent? Can you speak with Dor? I asked, referring to the castle medicine man. Have him make me a salve or potion, anything to staunch the burns. Radme stood and sighed. You're an impossible man, you know that. I forced a laugh. Worse has been said of me. She bent down and gently kissed my forehead. I will speak with him, but only if you promise to hand off some of your duties to the servants. I met her eyes and nodded. This summit is important. More so than anything else I have ever presided over. It must go off without a hitch. And it will... How in the hells can you be so sure? She grinned. Because we have you. I slowly limped down the hall. Whenever I passed a servant, they gave me a wide berth and bowed. I nodded and pressed on. I was in no mood for pomp or chit-chat. I had work to do. Thankfully, most of the castle was still asleep. Moonlight cut in through the windows lining the hallway, casting patches of grey light across the cold stone floor. I glanced outside at the moonlit forests surrounding the castle. I had no idea what call or day it was. But the fact that the glow bulbs were still alive let me know not much time had passed. The sack hung heavy across my back, digging into my burnt shoulders. I adjusted it and winced as I pressed onward toward the Grand Hall. Voices echoed in the distance, accompanied by the sound of banging hammers. I said triple layers of wax along the edges. You fool! Jaya boomed as I entered the Grand Hall. Over a dozen servants were scrambling about the hall. Some were busy sweeping, others were double-checking that all of the tables had the proper cutlery. Jaya, I said, nodding. The young apprentice's face went white. Loriana's for Lem. I, I didn't expect you to be on your feet yet. I placed the sack on a table and approached the boy. 
How are the preparations going? Steady. But we've been having issues sealing the glass barrier. I approached the makeshift wall and touched its surface. Triple layers won't do. It needs at least seven layers of wax. Jair's face reddened. I, I am sorry, Lorianas. I will see to it immediately. The boy bowed and scuttled out of the chamber as I walked the length of the transparent wall. The only sections that should have been free of the wax were the openings through which only sound could pass. They were incredibly small, filter-like holes that enabled voices to pass with minimal distortion. Without them, neither of the kings nor their entourages would be able to communicate through the dense glass wall. Such a horrible way to live, I thought, as I stared at the triton vents recently installed on the Strantodian side of the hall. To dwell in such toxic poison, it was unthinkable. Why they hadn't abandoned their continent in search of a proper seat of power was beyond me. But they had stayed, and now we had to retrofit the entire castle, just for this one visit. Well, 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 crooned a familiar voice through one of the vents. Overseer Wallenius Dard stood on the Strantodian side of the glass barrier. I heard you had quite the adventure yesterday. I bowed. Not the kind I care to have ever again. Overseer Dard. Are the preparations satisfactory? He glanced up and down the barrier. They are. He stepped closer to the glass. Through his mask, I could see his brown, bloodshot eyes. Surprisingly, they were welcoming. Of course, Loriana's warden will have the final word, the emissary said. But I must say, I am impressed with what you have done here. Hearing warden's name spoken aloud, sent a chill down my spine. Soon I would meet the man whose name had haunted me for turns. Had we met at Cilium Door, perhaps we might have become lifelong friends, or at least associates. But would he have even talked to me? I wondered, as I continued my inspection. Such a man had countless sycophants groveling around him day and night. Why would he bother with the Lorianas of my standing? Will, you nearly killed yourself for those accursed glow bulbs, I reminded myself. It lacked elegance, but at least it gave me some bragging rights amongst my servants. When will Loriana's warden arrive? I asked. Overseer Dard shrugged. Proust is a very deliberate man, but he's not prone to announcing his plans. I nodded. Very well. Please let me know if there is anything I can do for you, Overseer. Overseer Dard grinned. Perhaps there is. The woman in the stables. Is she wed? My heart sank. She is not. She is a sprite, that one. Would it be too much to ask for a proper introduction? In my mind, I slapped the overseer clear across the face. This man had only been in my kingdom for a few days, and already he wanted to plunder our most cherished resources. I'll see what I can do, I lied. The overseer placed a hand on my shoulder. Wonderful, Lorianus. I will not forget the gesture. I returned to my duties as jealousy coiled in my chest. I wasn't in a position to deny the overseer's request. But I wasn't about to serve Radme up to the man like so much cake. How can I skirt this problem? I wondered as I exited the chamber and entered the hall. Two of the Triton filtration systems were chugging away in a corner... The machines were a wonder of design, driven by steel pistons and steam. Each one had cost ten thousand coinage. A small fortune, I thought, as the pistons moved up and down inside their steel casings. More than enough to buy the finest talist winemakers on ALG or the sharpest black cheese cultivators on Alamein. Such splendors could have graced our court for the next ten turns, but instead we have machines spewing toxins into our grand hall. I leaned down and touched one of the engines. Its iron surface was hot and covered in condensation, and steam puffed out of a small exhaust valve in its rear side. There's something, aren't they? I looked up. Opon stood a few footfalls away, a dead rabbit in one hand, and a sprig of thyme in the other. I suppose, I replied, wiping my knees as I stood. I heard you ran into trouble beyond the forest. I forced a laugh. You could say that. 
I also heard you burnt down half the forest. This caught me by surprise. Pardon. The forest, Opon said, a confused look in his eyes. After you left it caught fire. You don't remember? I shook my head. I only remember those accursed trolls swarming me, and fire inside the cave. The cave entrance was sealed by a rock slide, Opon said. We assumed you had something to do with that as well. I shook my head. I don't even know how I escaped. The cook cocked an eyebrow. Strange then, don't you think? Fire and rock slides out of the blue. Indeed, I replied. He shrugged. Well, I'm sure you'll remember everything in time. I pointed at the rabbit. What's this for? Our supper. I'm trying out a new stewed rabbit dish. I came across some black truffle crumbs in the larder. Figured I'd prepare something a bit different tonight. Sounds very Strantodian, I said. It's a dish they call the black crumb roast of Ella. The black truffles only grow once every thirty turns in the Ella Valley on Strantodine. It's supposed to be one of their most expensive and lavish dishes. I thought we might try it before we serve it at the feast. My stomach rumbled. How long had it been since I had a real meal? One day. Two. Very well, I said. But make sure to note how you prepared it, so we can duplicate it later. Strantodian meals were notoriously difficult to prepare due to their toxic ingredients. Anything organic from the continent had to be boiled in order to neutralize the poisons. This completely altered the flavor, giving it a bitter, spicy edge that most Ismonians were not fond of. But it was as close as we could get to sampling their food without dying. You sure you're okay, Falem? Opon asked. You look like hell. I sighed. I'm fine, old friend. I just need some fresh air. Opon laughed. I don't think you'll find that here. He tapped the engine with his grease-stained boot. The fumes are permeating just about every nook and cranny in the castle. Before long, we'll all be wearing laptane masks. With that said, he bowed and plodded off down the hall, whistling a gentle tune as he vanished around a corner. I envied the man. He would never know the pressures of having an entire castle to tend to, or a king to please. His world was his kitchen, his army, the cooks serving beneath him. He could marry any woman he liked, go anywhere, and do most anything without repercussions. His was a life of freedom, peace, everything my heart yearned for. But it can never be, I thought. Not for a Lorianas. But perhaps dwelling in Opon's glow was enough. I moved deeper into the castle. There were a million details to attend to before the summit. First I had to check on our wine stores. I had ordered over twenty cases of the finest Alemanian spring wine to be transported to the castle by boat across the acid sea. It was an incredibly expensive affair, made all the more difficult due to the firestorm engulfing Alemain. I unlocked the wine cellar door and carefully negotiated the dusty stairs. Aside from the king, I was the only other person allowed in the cellar. A castle's wine collection was almost as important as its treasury. The more expensive and rare a collection was, the more esteem a leader held. It was a mark of class and elegance of refined taste only kings and Lorianas truly understood. Cobwebs hung down from the ceiling, and the smell of sour wine and wood permeated the air. A few rats scampered down the steps ahead of me, vanishing into the vast cellar as I took an old torch off the wall and sparked it to life with a piece of flint. The flame cast eerie shadows across the dozens of dust-covered wine racks as I wandered between them. Thousands of bottles lay in their wooden berths, their surfaces coated in grey, cotton-like dust. I ran my hand along the many corked necks, until I found the special gold wax seal signifying the Alemanian vintages. This will do perfectly, I thought, as I pulled a bottle free, and wiped the ancient glass clean. This particular berry wine was over two hundred turns old, one of the rarest and most expensive vintages on Retract Deor. I extinguished the torch in a bucket of filthy water and climbed the stairs, cradling the bottle like some ancient artifact. As I locked the cellar door behind me, a familiar voice spoke up in my head. 
That's a good choice, son. Strantodians are quite fond of berry wine. My father's words pierced my heart. It was as if he were standing right beside me, whispering in my ear. Since his passing several turns earlier, the ghost of his memory haunted me every day. I should have taken solace in his imagined presence. But it was becoming too difficult to bear. I missed him. I missed his wisdom and company, his love for duty, and everything that encompassed being a Laurianas. He was the best of us, the greatest Laurianas to have ever lived. But he's gone, I told myself as I stepped back into the hall. A strange energy filled the castle. Apprehension and uncertainty reflected in every servant's nervous eyes. Even the royals moved about with an air of caution, their guards drawn tight around them, as if their very world teetered on the brink of destruction. Several servants nodded respectfully as I plodded down the corridor. I could feel the heat from the kitchens as I moved closer to the center of the castle. But something smelled different. The familiar aroma of thyme and dill that normally permeated the halls had been replaced by a potent sour smell I was unfamiliar with. I entered the kitchen and scanned the fires. Three large pans containing some kind of black meat sizzled and popped above the cooking fires. Opon stood over one of them, a steel spatula in hand. What in the hells is stinking up my castle? I asked as I stared at the strange dish. Oh, you should know this, he chided. I inhaled and let the stink settle into my sinuses. I recognized garlic and danned weed, and a hint of cracked peppercorn and rosemary. But no amount of spices could cover the bitter stink wafting off the meat. I still don't know what it is, I said. Troll meat, Opon said, grinning. Pardon. You heard me. He flipped the meat, splashing droplets of burning hot oil across the stovetop. One of them bastards was found roaming the king's road. A guard took it down and carted it back here. In the name of the gods, why? I asked. Opon shook his head. Tisk, tisk, Lorianas. You should know better than anyone that the Strantodians consider troll meat a dill. A delicacy, I said. I know this, but I didn't think it would be on the menu for the summit. Opon sprinkled onion powder over the meat. It wasn't. But how could I turn away such a challenge? He lifted the haunch with a pair of tongs and dropped it into an adjacent pan filled with oil. The meat sizzled and popped as bubbles swallowed it whole. Why are you frying it? I asked. It's the only way to kill off the damn parasites. Not to mention that foul stink the fat exudes. When cooked over a flame, I nodded. When it's done, let me know. I suppose I'll have to try it. Opon cut a small piece free and held it aloft with the tongs. No need to wait, Lorianas. I stared at it, the steaming meat as it hovered before my eyes. Everything about it was wrong. A piece of venison was plump and juicy. This was gnarled and dry, like a piece of old black leather. I pulled it from the tongs and hesitantly bit into it. Upon watched excitedly as I chewed. To my utter shock, it wasn't half bad. In fact, combined with the spices and oils from the fry pan, it was quite delicious. Good stuff, right? Upon said. Dozens of exotic flavors danced across my tongue. Garlic and thyme blended with the pungent fat, giving it a salty brine that was better than the finest haunch of bacon. Even the burnt ends exploded with flavor. By the gods I breathed. Upon nodded. Should I add it to the banquet menu? Make it an appetizer. First round, and see to it that it only goes to the Strantodians. Are you sure? Upon asked. Won't the king wish to try it? I sighed. The king was barely able to keep down his morning oatmeal, let alone a troll's backside. The king will be sticking to the menu I have composed. We don't need him vomiting in the middle of the summit. Opon shrugged before plopping the black meat into his mouth. Your call, Falem, he said as he chewed. But I think he would really like this. He was right. The king probably would like it. But I wasn't taking any chances. The king would stick to the original menu of smoked venadier and honey-glazed duck. 
if he were to get food poisoning from the troll meat, it might be seen as both a weakness and an insult. Tensions would be high enough as it is. There was no need to make my job more difficult with unknowns. I took a seat at my desk and continued wiping down the bottle of Alemanian berry wine. As I polished the ancient glass, the cooks and dishboys went about their business. Spoons stirred, forks clattered, pans and pots boiled and splattered. It was a symphony of controlled chaos, a storm of humidity and smells one could only find in the centre of Sredin's kitchens. I tossed the dust rag aside and placed the bottle in a straw-lined crate at my feet. I then turned my attention back to my desk. Lists of ingredients and menus lay three layers deep. Before I even picked one up, though, a servant boy named Pornan approached. He held a black tube in his calloused hand and looked as if he would rather be anywhere but here. Loriana's Clane, he said, extending the tube to me. This came directly from Strantodin. I cocked an eyebrow. Strantodin? The messenger said it was for your eyes only. Curious, I took the tube from the boy and waved him off. Its seal was unfamiliar. A crow perched atop a dead stag. I cracked the wax and opened the end of the metal tube. A piece of rolled-up parchment slid out into my hand. The handwriting was neat and concise, the ink exotic and silver-based. Regards, Loriana's for Lemclane. At the behest of my master, King Gaunius Wren, I request a palaver prior to the king's arrival in order to discuss culinary and security necessities. I will await you beside the Moon Lake on the fourth day of next week. Four calls prior to sunset. Please come alone and unarmed. The Honourable Laurianas Proust Worden. It was a strange request. Security was normally controlled by the King's Guard and the City Watch, not the Castle Laurianas. My job was to oversee the kitchens and castle servants. And why would he request me to come unarmed? No Laurianas carried weapons in Decimon. Perhaps he's extending his version of a peace flag, I thought. After all, we were brothers bound by the same code. It would be good to confer together and trade particulars regarding our master's needs. Yet the question of security still bothered me. I was not a man of the sword, nor would I ever don a knight's clunky armour. But I dare not insult the man, I told myself. We Lorianas rarely met our counterparts. It would be a shame to sour such a meeting with suspicion and fear. I made my decision. I would meet my fellow Lorianas at the requested time. No guards. No weapons. No word to anyone as to where I would be or with whom. This was between brothers. Or at least I hoped. Chapter 9 The Balava You look terrible, Radme said. I stood before her still covered in dirt and ash. I was exhausted, but there was no time to bathe or change. Thank you for the confidence boost, I replied sarcastically as I wiped ash from my sleeves. Radme shook her head as she dug a hoofpick into one of her mare's heels. You're a damn fool, Falem. You know that. Going into that god's damn cave alone. What's gotten into you? I pulled up a stool and sat down. We were in one of the stable stalls, the familiar smell of manure and hay filling my nostrils. I watched as she cleaned mud and stones from the mare's hoof with expert precision. The beast stood alert, its ears pricked to the wind, but it never once bucked or snorted. Radme was in complete control, and even the mare knew no harm would befall anyone in her shadow. You know you're no young buck anymore, she went on. You have nothing to prove to anyone. I sighed. A Loriana's always had something to prove. It was in our nature. This is the most important summit I will ever oversee. Every detail, no matter how minute, will be judged and analyzed by my counterpart in the Strantodian court. I have much and more to prove, my dear. Radme shook her head as she began shaving off pieces of the old hoof. You men and your egos... How many wars have been fought because of vanity and stubbornness? Too many to count, I said as I peeled one of the bandages off my arm. But that is the way of things. We serve, and we are judged by that service. 
Radme forced a laugh. You disagree? Of course I do. When we're gone, it's the good we've done that will be remembered. Not the planning of some summit, or the gathering of silly glow bulbs. Those silly glow bulbs, as you so delicately put it, are just the kind of gesture the Strantodians will appreciate, I said. We've been killing each other for almost fifty turns now. And for what? Invisible lines in the sand. It's time to put an end to this nonsense. And if risking my life is a requirement to achieve this, I will gladly sacrifice myself. Radme tossed her pick and peeler into a bucket at her feet. I just hope you know what you are doing. We are but pawns on a board, Philem. Expendable pawns. Remember that, and you might understand what I'm saying some day. I could feel my pulse quickening. I so hated when Radme went on like this. She was anything but traditional and loathed the pomp I struggled to uphold. But I understood the root of it. Her father had been the previous stable master, a strict and honest man who ruled over his little kingdom for over thirty-five turns. But then the raiding began on the southern shores, and with little ceremony he was handed a sword and shipped to the south, where he was ordered to oversee the cavalry stables. Months passed in silence as she awaited news from him. And then one day a flock of birds arrived carrying messages of a major deciman defeat at Coral Peninsula. A slaughter was more like it, I thought. Not a single Dismonian soul survived the battle. Not even Radme's father. I stood and approached the horse she was tending to. Its hide was silk-smooth and perfectly combed, its mane clean and free of knots. Radme was indeed her father's daughter, but a bitterness still dwelt in her soul, a bitterness toward the king and everything that had cost Radme her father. And it was growing worse with every turn. I serve, my dear. That has always been my purpose, I said, and I will not falter now, not when we are so close to peace. Radme dipped her hands in a bucket and then dried them on her stained smock. I hope you are right, Philem. I truly do. You deserve more than an unmarked grave in some god's forsaken troll cave. I shrugged. If that is my fate, so be it. Radme approached me. She wasn't mad. I knew her well enough to see that, but something hid behind her blue eyes. Pity. For me. You are a good man, Philem, and a great Lorianus. Don't be in such a rush to pass the baton to someone else. With that, she brushed past me and exited the stable. I sat silent for a few moments. Why was she pressing me this morning? What had I done to draw her ire? Perhaps it really was foolish to go to the cave alone, I thought. But if I had brought someone and they got hurt, what then? Their life would have been my responsibility. I wasn't about to put anyone else in danger for the Strantodians. Back to work, I thought. There would be time after the summit to sit and talk with her. For now, I had a feast to prepare. Sraden's halls were alive with footfalls and whispers as servants darted about on their individual tasks. I walked in silence, indifferent to the many concerned glances coming my way. I had forgotten I was still covered in bandages and bruises, and soot still stained the burnt part of my arms and face. A wet towel was suddenly thrust into my hands. Lorianas came upon his familiar voice from beside me. I took the towel and nodded my thanks. How is it you always seem to be everywhere at once? The cook chuckled as he walked beside me. You might not believe it, but I prefer the cool calm of the corridors over the steaming heat in the kitchens. Besides, Enro has tonight's meal in hand. Braised sap, duckling, and sweet potatoes with salt-encrusted hamer fish and candied carrots. I glanced at him. A peasant dish. The king specifically requested it. That was interesting. Normally all requests went through me or the head maid, Relin Dill. Very well, I said. I'll personally bring it to the king, though. Actually, I believe Jair was requested this evening. I stopped. By whom? The king. I shook my head. This was all wrong. Protocol demanded I taste every meal before it reached the king's table. If anything tainted or poisoned should slip past, 
I would be responsible. I'll get to the bottom of this, I said. For now, just see to it that no one else serves the king but me. Upon nodded. I pulled the remaining bandages from my shoulder and head. Had my adventure in the dark been so trivial that I was already being replaced by lesser servants? A group of four burly men hauling a Triton engine approached from the north end of the hall. Clear the way, one of them shouted as they shuffled toward me. I stepped in front of the group and gestured for them to stop. What is going on here? We've been told to remove this one from the eastern tower, a servant named Clory said. There's already two in place, and the captain of the guard felt this one was unnecessary. Unnecessary. I shook my head. What happens if the two remaining ones fail? Would you have a Strantodian diplomat die on our watch because the captain of the guard said so? I'm sorry, Lorianus, Clory said. I'm just following orders. Well, from now on, all matters of the summit are my responsibility, including these bloody things. I gestured to the engine. Return it to its original position and make sure it's ready for use. The four men looked at each other uncomfortably. You have your orders. Hesitantly, they turned and headed back down the hallway. What in the hells is going on here, Opon? I asked. I don't know, Lorianas. Perhaps the king wishes you to play more of a background role in the coming summit. My heart sank. Was I not the Lorianas of Sredin Castle? Hadn't I given this king the last fifteen? Turns of my life serving him loyally and without question. Why was my authority being undermined now? Come, I said. Where are we going? Opon asked as I marched down the hall. To see the king. Opon wiped his hands on his oil-stained apron. Um, I don't believe I am dressed for such an occasion, Lorianas. I glanced at the man. His white apron was spotted with various oil and sauce stains, and his clothes were wrinkled and impregnated with the aroma of onion and garlic. Maybe it will be a good thing for him to see you this way, I said. Perhaps he will remember who really serves him. I cleaned myself up and donned my blue tunic with the Loriana's emblem stitched in silver thread above the right breast. My pants were freshly pressed black cotton, and my boots polished leather shipped directly from Al. But as I stared at my wrinkled visage in my private mirror, my heart sank. My left eye was nearly swollen shut, and the entire right side of my face was covered in blisters and peeling skin. I look more like a beggar than the king's Lorianas, I thought, as I brushed what remained of my grey hair back. We are the order in the chaos, the mop in the filth, the feather duster wiping cobwebs from the world. We serve not for glory, but for our masters. For order, I repeated the mantra over and over again as my aching joints throbbed. I was no longer the young Lorianas whose father had helped shape a kingdom. Now I was just an aging servant with little to no tales to tell. Would anyone remember my name in a hundred turns? I doubted it. But it wasn't a Lorianas' place to make history. We were put on this world to create a civilized vessel for our masters to dwell within. That was our destiny and goal. But my time here was slipping away like grains of sand through my fingers. The king was only getting sicker, and soon I would have to begin preparations for my final walk. The thought saddened me. It should have been my greatest honor to join my master in the afterlife, but my passing would occur with little fanfare. I had made no major accomplishments in my fifteen turns as Sredin's Lorianas. Like my king, I lived and ruled, during placid times in Decimon. Aside from the occasional skirmishes with pirates and Strantodians in the north, the continent was mostly ignored by the rest of the world. We had no meridium reserves to speak of, and no magical firestorms to wipe us off the maps. King Donan was a decent ruler with few vices, but without a war to fight or lands to conquer, King Donan had done little to forge himself into the history books. Yes. He purged most of the Howler Blight from the Western Forest, or at least the prisoners he conscripted from the dungeons did. Women now held positions in both the court and the military thanks to Donan's progressive laws, 
and farm yields were up tenfold since his ascendance. The peasants' quality of life was far better than it had been before my father's time, and trade with other kingdoms flowed in and out of our ports daily. But aside from those small accomplishments, neither of us had really changed the kingdom. My father, on the other hand, had helped the previous king build a new wing on Sredin Castle. He had been present when the court charges finally surrendered to the Overwatch at the end of the Meridian War. Father had even negotiated a trade deal with I and me when the king became too ill to attend. Those were accomplishments. Those were history. I, on the other hand, had yet to be tested. That was until now. I brushed lint from my tunic and marched into the hall. I walked in silence, alone and unsure of my destiny. Loriana's clane. I sighed as I glanced over my shoulder. A portly man donned in Verax fur and black and white checkered pants stood behind me. How can I help you, Alarun? The castle jester kept pace, mocking me with an exaggerated gait. I understand you recently had a run-in with some trolls. Word, indeed, travels fast. What was it like, down there in the dark? He asked. Did you kill any with your blade? This is really not the time for this, I said, as I picked up my pace. Oh, don't be humble, Lorianas. You're one of the first people to see a troll in almost fifteen turns. So come on, tell me a tale of danger and mystery. Tell me everything that happened out there beyond our walls. So you can twist it into one of your nightly performances, I replied. I think not. Aluren laughed. If this was a tale of napkins and mops, I probably would. But you saw trolls with your own eyes, and made it back alive in one piece. I don't need to spin that any further. He unfurled a massive scroll, which rolled down the hallway. I think I will save this tale for the summit, he said, as he pretended to write on the scroll. I'm sure our Strantodian friends would love to hear about your exploits. I grabbed Alorun's chubby arm. You will not speak of the trolls or anything else regarding me. It is uncouth and inappropriate, especially for a Lorianus. Understood. Alorun pulled his hand away and smiled. I think Loriana's claim needs to enjoy the splendor he has so graciously bestowed upon us. Let down your hair, Loriana's. This summit is a good thing for everyone. I'll relax when the Strantodians are safely on their way back home. Aloran tossed aside his massive scroll. Enjoy the coming days, then, Loriana's claim. History is in the making, and we are its witnesses. And with that, he turned and vanished down the hall. I sighed. Why were the servants acting as if this was some kind of celebration? Desmond had been warring with Strantodon for turns, violent, bloody warfare that had laid waste to generations of young men and women. And now they welcome the enemy into our home as if they were some famous musical troupe, I thought. Proper decorum had to be adhered to. But the servants didn't have to enjoy it so much, at least not openly. My stomach turned. Complacency was infecting the castle. This was a time to have our guard up, to be prepared for anything and everything that might come our way. Not hopping about like excited school children awaiting a visit from a bard. I moved slowly up the steps, leading to the king's tower. In my youth, I could have taken them two at a time without breaking a sweat. But now, with sixty-four turns behind me, my bones and muscles protested every step. Most mornings I awoke with aching knees and a throbbing back. It was as if my entire body was rusting from the inside out. Time marches on, I thought, as I knocked on the king's chamber door and entered. The room was hazy and filled with incense smoke rising from pots hidden beneath his unmade bed. Good morning, your majesty, I said as I picked up his chamber pot and examined its contents. The stool was loose and bloody. A bad sign. Very bad. The king slowly sat up in bed and nodded. His hair hung limp in tangled clumps over his sagging shoulders, and his eyes were sunken even deeper than normal. How are you feeling today, your majesty? I asked as I emptied the chamber pot down the toilet chute. Better than last night, that I can assure you. 
He stood and slowly approached me. His sleep clothes were stained with sweat and vomit, and his skin had a yellowish tinge. He extended his arms and turned his back to me. I carefully removed his shirt and picked up a freshly pressed crimson tunic. It was made of fine silk, but as he slid into it he winced. Both his arms and back were covered in sores. Perhaps I should clean these before we proceed, I said. He waved me off. It will only make them worse. Besides, they're finally scabbing over. I nodded. Very well, your majesty. What news of the king? He asked, as he adjusted the tunic. He and his retinue are to arrive today, your grace, I replied. The king pulled on a fresh pair of breeches. I've been told you encountered some trouble in the forest. I nodded as I hitched up his pants and wrapped his gold belt about his waist. All is well now, though, your majesty. Why were you fooling around out there? I sighed. Glow bulbs, your grace. I wanted to present them to our guests at the feast tonight. The king sighed. A nice gesture, Philem. Foolish. But I'm sure our guests will be pleased nonetheless. You're not angry with me? The king laughed. I should be. There's no reason for my Lorianas to be crawling through that God's forsaken cave. Especially when so many others could have taken up the task. But if I'm being honest, I'm just too tired to care. I handed the king his comb and began laying out his ceremonial robe and medals on his bed. Your initiative has always been one of your strongest attributes, he continued. That, and your exceptional taste in wine. So who am I to question your motives? I grinned. You flatter me, your majesty. King Donan ran the comb through his hair and frowned at his reflection. By the gods, will I be left with nothing before this is through? He tossed me the comb. The bristles were filled with grey hair and dead skin. I will need to see the Grand Hall before the delegation arrives. I bowed. Of course, your majesty. But first I wish to speak with you. He gestured to a chair situated beside his bed. Please, sit. I helped the king onto the bed and sat down in the chair opposite him. How may I be of service? It's no secret I'm not long for this world, the king said. Whispers of political maneuvering have already reached my spies, and I know the Strantodians are aware of my condition. He coughed into his hand and sighed. Droplets of blood dotted his palm. Philem, I have known you for the better half of twenty turns now. You have always been loyal to me, and a fine servant, to both the realm and Sredin Castle. In many ways, you've been more of a father to me than my own. My heart soared. I had never heard the king speak so frankly. But why would he confide such things to me, when there were so many others in his court who were closer and more deserving? I, I am humbled, your majesty. The king leaned forward and placed a hand on my shoulder. This is why I do not wish you to fulfill your oath. My eyes widened with shock. Had I just heard him correctly? Your majesty. Traditions die hard, Philem especially barbaric traditions that serve no purpose. Perhaps it's time to quell such foolish gestures. But your grace, I am your bound, Lorianas, in life and death. It is the greatest honor a Lorianas can know. The king gently squeezed my shoulder. The greatest honor would be me seeing you continue to serve the realm, whether here or abroad. I won't be a party to your demise, Falim. I will not accept your final walk. I felt dizzy. Everything I had been taught, everything I knew and believed was being dashed to pieces. My life was my king, my passion, the Loriana's code. It was the very tenant by which I made every decision in my life. Now my liege wished me to turn away from this and live out my remaining turns in shame. Have I disappointed you in any way, your majesty? Donan shook his head. Far from it, Falim. That's why I want you to go on. But I won't argue this with you, he said. My decision has been made. Nausea swept over me. I felt lost and confused. Where will I be stationed, your majesty? I have not decided yet, he replied. 
but begin getting your house in order. I stood and bowed. Will that be all today, your majesty? My voice wavered as I began to break down. King Donan nodded. Know that you are the grandest Lorianas in the Nine Kingdoms, Philem. Neither Sredin nor I have ever had a better servant. Or friend. I bowed again. Your Majesty. And with that, I turned and left a smoky chamber. But not before wiping tears from my eyes. I was truly lost now. And where I would end up, only the gods knew for sure. Chapter 10 A New World For the rest of the day I drifted through the castle like a ghost, lost in my tortured thoughts. I felt alone and betrayed. What had I done to deserve banishment? Was the king trading me away for a better Lorianas? Perhaps the business in the caves had upset him more than he had let on. I obsessed over it. To be cut free was the worst punishment a Lorianas could face, even if the king considered it an honor. I was bound to him by my oath. If that was broken, I would be ostracized by my peers, a chargeless outcast without kingdom or purpose. My days clouded my thoughts, even as I commanded the staff to prepare the private bedchambers for the arrival of our Strantodian guests. I oversaw the final checks of Strantodian atmospheric canisters in the Great Hall and did a final inspection of the glass wall. But through it all I wasn't really present. My emotions were spinning about like a loom. Everything felt so pointless and hopeless. I, Philem Klain, son of Grand Lorianas Gaunius Klain, am losing my post, I thought, as I stared out a window at the grass plains. Lorianas. Startled, I turned. Jair stood before me dressed in the formal blue robe of an apprentice. His hair was freshly trimmed, and his beard was clean-cut and neat. Yes. The chamber and glass wall have been triple-checked, and everything has checked out. I turned toward the massive wall and touched its surface. Triton had been home to some of the largest glass greenhouses on Retract Deor. They were said to be a wonder of the modern age. How I yearn to see such things with my own eyes. But your place is here, Lorianas, I reminded myself. What about the wax seals on the ceiling? I asked. Have they been inspected? Jaya nodded. I personally took care of it, Lorianas. I stared at my reflection in the glass. My uniform was strikingly blue and crisp, but my wrinkled face and grey hair stood in stark contrast. Time rolls on without mercy, I thought. The turns at Sredin had come and gone so quickly it almost felt unfair. And now I have to begin again in a whole new realm. My heart ached at the thought. It had taken me fifteen turns to figure out Sredin and all its nuances. At my age, fifteen turns was a lifetime, a lifetime I didn't care to spend relearning the ways of a new house. And there was something else stirring inside me. A new yearning had been awakened after facing death head-on in the darkness of that cave. I didn't know what it was yet, but it was hiding in the recesses of my soul waiting to spring forth like an assassin's crossbow bolt. I returned to my desk in the main kitchen. It was my island of solitude, my sanctuary where I could sit and watch the workings of my castle spin around me. It had been a gift to my father from the previous king. Now it was my home away from home. I wondered if I would be allowed to bring it with me when I was reassigned. Good day, Lorianas, one of the cooks said as he tied on his apron. Delman, I replied, nodding. I hear the Triton glass wall is something to behold, he said, as he unrolled a small bolt of leather across the countertop. Inside it were various knives, all priceless heirlooms handed down from father to son. It is, I replied. I'm amazed it made it here in one piece, though. Delman picked up one of his knives and began chopping a carrot with practiced ease. Is it true the king needed to take out a loan from Alg in order to commission it? I will neither deny nor confirm that claim, I said. Let's just say the upcoming summit will be the most expensive event Sredin has ever known. Delman shook his head. Such a waste. I mean, these Strantodians. We've been pushing them from our shores for turns, sacrificing our children and families. And suddenly we're all supposed to be pals. 
I think this whole thing is a sham, Laurianas. I really do. I picked up the bottle of Algin berry wine I kept on my desk and cut the wax seal with a paring knife. I was relieved to hear his concern. Most of the others were dancing through their days completely ignorant to the ramifications of this visit. If it means peace with them, I'm all for it, I said. My only concern is their safety and comfort when they arrive. I twisted my triton screw into the cork and pulled it loose with a loud pop. I inhaled long and hard as it took its first breath in over four hundred turns. It had a perfect bouquet, sweet and nutty with a hint of spice. After all these turns, though, your purpose will be served in one night, I thought as I poured an inch into a wine glass. I took a sip. It tasted of pumpkin spice with a hint of delcium wood, a fine vintage from one of the greatest turns the grape growers had ever known. Have we received the shipment of tar truffles from Alge yet? I asked. No, Laurianus. And we're still short on Venadir and that rare plum tart we were supposed to get from Alimain. Upon walk toward us carrying a basket of potatoes. Have you been living under a rock, Delman? He placed the basket on the preparation table and wiped his perpetually sweaty brow. Alimain is a smouldering ruin. Nothing is coming out of there save for cinders and ash. I'm aware of the breathe, Delman said. I just hoped one of their cargo ships had made it out. Well, for now, make yourself aware of these potatoes and get them skinned and mashed before dinner service. Delman frowned as he placed the potatoes next to his cutting board. Very well. Opon sat down opposite me and ignited an Adrena stick. Must you smoke that in the kitchen? I asked. It was a filthy habit, one I normally turned a blind eye to. But tonight was different. I didn't want the Strentodian's dinner tasting of bitter Adrena smoke. Relax. It'll only add to the flavor of the food, Opon replied, before taking a long drag. I stared at the glowing tip and sighed as smoke curled around his sweaty face. Father had indulged in similar habits. Most Laurianas did. It was a stressful job that afforded little time to relax. Unlike my father, though, I chose to keep a clear head. The stress of my station was too great to be muddled by smoke or drink. So, are you going to tell me about your little adventure in the cave? Opon asked. I sat back and poured another inch from the freshly opened bottle. That cave, I said, taking a sip. It was infested. I never thought there could be so many damned trolls in one place. Upon shook his head. What did you think you would find in that god's forsaken pit? A fairy princess. I'm no fool, I replied. I knew the risks. I just didn't know there would be that many of them. Did you at least get those damn glow bulbs you've been going on about? I nodded. I made it out with five. And that was worth risking your life for. Opon scoffed. I stretched my legs beneath the desk and sat back. Can I be honest with you? Opon perked to attention. Please. I leaned forward. As scary as it was, it was also dreadfully exciting. All of it. Opon cocked an eyebrow. The cave. The trolls. I can't remember ever feeling so frightened. And alive. I finished the wine and looked my friend dead in the eye. For the first time in turns, I felt like I was doing something important for the realm. Getting glow bulbs. I shook my head. Being beyond the castle walls, Opon. Being in the dark, in an unknown place. It was all so thrilling and new. Opon chuckled. I don't think I'd call being eaten alive by trolls thrilling. If you ask me, you were foolish. Why didn't you bring a retinue of guards? Because I needed to do it alone, I said. I need to feel something. Do you understand? I poured another glass of wine and drank it down in one sip. Opon looked on in shock. Lately I've just felt so... Lost, I said. My life is slipping away, and I've missed so much of it already. Flames erupted behind Opon as one of the cooks braised a haunch of beef. I've spent too many turns cleaning up after royalty, I continued dusting old shelves or ordering others to do so in my stead. 
I'll be sixty-five turns this solstice, and in all that time I've barely seen the world beyond Sredin's walls. You're a Laurianus, upon replied, the envy of every squire, page, servant girl and cup-bearer in the nine kingdoms. What more do you want? More, upon. I need more. Especially now. Opon slid the cork back into the wine bottle. Is there something you're not telling me? I met his eyes. I wanted to tell him the truth, but not yet, I told myself. It would only make it more real. Of course not, I lied. I think you need rest for Lem, and a good kick in the ass. There are thousands out there who would kill to be in your position. And what position is that? I asked. Nursemaid to a sick king. I'm a glorified serving boy swaddled in blue velvet who examines excrement and cleans out shit shoots. You're a god's damn Laurianas, upon hissed. What's gotten into you? The rest of the cooks were listening now. I scolded myself for being so loud. The kitchens were not a place for such discussions. It was a hot, frantic battlefield where rumors were indulged like fine wine and spread like wildfire. You did well yesterday. Opon continued. Just don't let it sweep you away. Your place is here. With us. I met Opon's eyes again. Like me, he was common born, destined for a life of service beneath Sredin's roof. But unlike the other cooks who I had only known for a short while, we had grown up together in the kitchens, racing between our father's legs as we played at being knights and magic men. We explored every inch of the castle together, including secret places not even the king knew about. Besides Radme, Opon was my best friend, the one man in Sredin who would never pander to me or spin a lie. That was why I felt so guilty. I was betraying my best friend, my brother. I didn't say I was going anywhere. I lied. I just need something different. I need a change, Opon. You do best to remember your lot in life again, Philem. The quicker the better, too, else this itch will devour you. He stood and scanned the smoky kitchen. And that change you were talking about, we're about to get plenty of it in the coming days. So snap out of this rut of self-pity. We have work to do. He was right. I was feeling sorry for myself, an emotion most unbecoming of a Lorianas. But at least it was an emotion. I'd spent so many turns pushing my emotions into my stomach while doing monotonous chores or adhering to fading protocols and customs that I had all but forgotten what it meant to truly feel alive. Very well upon, I stood and stretched my aching legs. Back to it then. I'll meet you later for a drink at the Stumble Inn. That is, if you can stand the melancholy cloud prowling about my shadow. Opon smiled and bowed. The Stumble Inn it is. Lorianas. As my friend returned to his station, I stared at the remnants of my wine. Normally I could count on a glass to ease my nerves and prepare me for the day. But something new had awoken inside me, something no glass of wine or adrena stick could ever satisfy. My frustration grew. Had I lost the drive that all Lorianas needed to survive? Kitchen hands raced to and fro, preparing various elements of the royal breakfast menu as fire and steam coiled toward the ceiling. I could smell Venadia sausage roasting in the ovens and freshly baked cinnamon bread being glazed with sugar. They were smells of home, regimented and controlled. But after my adventure in the cave, the familiar idiosyncrasies of the kitchen seemed so small and trivial. I leaned over my chipped and battered desk and closed my eyes. A cloud was settling on me, one made of frustration and boredom. Isn't this what you always wanted, Philem? I asked myself. How long did you work for this? How many turns did you study and suffer in order to become a Laurianas? The answers didn't really matter, though. Not anymore. My resolve had cracked, and it couldn't have happened at a worse time. I walked the eastern corridor as I had every morning since my youth. It was my favorite place in the castle. As boys, Opon and I had claimed it for ourselves, haunting its many nooks and crannies like scurrying rats. During the winter months, 
It was the warmest corridor in Sredin, and in the summer the coolest. We played for calls amongst the many chambers and hallways that branched off from it, losing ourselves to a fictional world we deemed as real as the monotonous world surrounding us. I passed several maidservants as they removed dead flowers from the many vases spread throughout the corridors. The flowers would be replaced with fresh roses and exotic sprays from Aldi. It was an egregious waste of money, but our king insisted on fresh arrangements daily. I stewed on this as one girl inserted a dozen firebird blossoms into an enormous marble vase. Each of the blossoms cost the treasury over fifty coinage and only lived for eight calls. But the king insisted, so I obeyed. Good morning, Lorianas, a young maid servant said as she hauled away a stinking bushel of dead flowers. I tried to remember her name, but there were so many new servants I couldn't keep up. Ever since the king announced the summit, the castle staff had almost doubled. I wondered how many were spies planted by the Strantodians. Were any of them planning an attempt on our king's life? I shook the thought away. The king's guard were quite capable of foiling any assassination plots. But it didn't make me feel any better about the chaos. I adjusted my tunic and reached up to touch my Loriana's pendant. To my horror, though, it was gone. I immediately began scanning the ground for it. My father had given it to me on my twentieth birthday. It was the only thing I had of his to connect me with my past. And now you've lost it, fool, I thought as I wandered the halls with my eyes averted to the ground. But even after retracing my steps, it was nowhere to be found. The cave, I thought, my stomach sinking. During the attack it must have fallen off. I cursed it myself. My birthright. Traded for five measly glow bulbs. It was pathetic. My only connection to my father, and now it lay in some black hellscape surrounded by mindless shuffling trolls. What was done was done, though. It was gone, and nothing could bring it back. I pushed it from my mind and went about the rest of my chores. But my anger continued to grow. As I crossed the grand hall, I noticed several flower petals crumpled on the floor and a lone fork lying beneath a table. That was all it took for me to lose my temper. I clapped my hands together. Every servant within earshot abruptly turned toward me. Where do we live, people? The closest servant, a timid cupbearer who had been filling vases with spring water, froze and looked at me. Sredin Castle, Lorianas. I slammed my fist down on the closest table. That's right, Sredin Castle. Not some flop house in Ionix or an Adrena den in Cumulty. Sredin Castle. So why have you all been dressing my hall as if it were some flea-bitten whore house? There were over a dozen servants in the grand hall, and they were all staring at me. This summit is the single most important event to occur beneath this roof since its inception, I shouted. So I ask myself, why is this summit being treated with such careless abandon? No one said a word. Every servant stood rigid and embarrassed. I was not an exceptionally hard Lorianas. If anything, I was too forgiving. So seeing me in such a frazzled state was both a shock and humiliating to them. I want this banquet to go off without so much as a fly fart. Understand, that means no forks lying on the ground or flower petals browning in the hall. These next few days will determine the futures of both Sredin and the kingdom. I paused and scanned their many embarrassed faces that means your sons and daughters, brothers, mothers, uncles, and fathers. Everyone you know and love will be affected by the results of this summit. So don't let this kingdom die because you forgot to pull a fucking fly out of someone's salad. Understood? The closest servant's eyes widened. I had never sworn in their presence. But this summit was too important. And not just for king and kingdom. This was the final mark I would leave on Sredin. My swan song before the king unceremoniously shipped me off to another master. There could be no blemishes left behind. I adjusted the table and scanned the servants' pale faces. Let's get this done, people. And done right. That is all. The servants turned back to their individual tasks as I wiped my sweaty brow. 
Don't they understand what is happening here? Frustrated, I exited the grand hall. My hands were shaking, and my head ached. For the first time since the cave, my nerves were failing me. Everywhere I went, I expected the next shoe to drop. Loriana's. I turned, ready to chew out whoever it was. Radme stood behind me, a timid look on her face. Bad morning, I take it. She wore a full-length cream tunic and one of her brown bag hats. It was an odd choice for a woman, but her willingness to buck the standard fashions of the day was one of the things I loved most about her. I'm just a bit overwhelmed, I replied. I fear my jaunt in the cave has undermined my nerves. She placed a hand on my shoulder. You need to start taking better care of yourself, and I don't mean avoiding troll-infested caves. Her smile widened, and her blue eyes twinkled in the morning light. What a fine wife she would have made, I thought. I still remember the first time I saw her. Her face had been splattered with mud as she reshewed one of the king's prized striders. Even in such a disheveled state, though, she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. And that smile. It could set kingdoms on fire. She drew closer, her warmth wafting against my body. I grew tense. Servants were everywhere, watching and listening. I took a step back. I... I can't, Radme. Radme's smile faded. I was just going to hug you. You know my oath. The oath forbids a hug. I'm sorry, I said. She took my hand and stared into my eyes. Why do you do this to yourself? She whispered. Leave this life for Lem. Leave it with me and see what lies beyond Sraden's walls. Before it kills you, at that moment she held my heart in her hands. If not for my oath, I might have taken her up on her offer. But the part of me that was a Loriana's held me back. I slowly slid her hand off of my shoulder. I'm sorry I can't give you what you deserve. She shook her head. This is not living for Lem. I sighed. It killed me to see her so upset. But duty trumped all, even love. Whoever said Loriana's were allowed to live... I replied, This is the life I chose. I can't just abandon it. She shook her head. Some day you'll look back on this moment and realize what you lost. And with that, she turned and stormed off down the hall. I stood silent as she vanished into the distance. My chest felt as if a pile of bricks had been laid across it. Every ounce of my being wanted to take Radme into my arms and kiss her, to run off with her, and experience the world without rules or customs. But that was not to be. I was too stubborn, too dedicated to my craft. I reached into my pocket and felt a piece of paper. It was the invitation from the Strantodian Laurianas. I'd been so preoccupied with preparations I had completely forgotten about it. The Honorable Laurianas Proust Worden, the signature read. I wondered how honorable a man from Strantodian could be, especially one tied so closely to Gaunius Wren. There is only one way to find out, I thought, as I left the Grand Hall behind. It was time to finally meet my brother in arms. Chapter 11 The Mirror Image The Moon Lake was on the eastern side of Sredin, a small yet deceptively deep pool located in one of the oldest courtyards in the castle. I had only visited it once in my youth, but even then it had a certain mystery about it as if you were stepping into some ancient space devoid of time. I took a seat on one of the cement benches lining the pool and stared into it. I could only see a few footfalls down before the water turned completely black. It was said if you dropped a rock into the pool, it would sink all the way to the other side of the planet. Yet another reason I need to go beyond the castle walls and explore this world, I thought. If such a wonder existed here in Sredin, one could only imagine what lay beyond the great forests and oceans of the world. Loriana's Falemclain. I looked up. A figure wearing a black triton breather mask stood before me. The only discernible features I could see were his brown eyes, both of which were barely visible behind a cloud of green mist swirling inside his mask. Unlike the rumors, this Strantodian wasn't a monster or some gnarled wretch. He was the same height as me, thin yet sturdy with an air of practiced grace about him. 
The only real differences between us were the breather mask and the black robe he wore. He also had the Strantodian crest stitched into his right breast, two golden laxor whales with their necks entwined into an infinity symbol. The great sea beasts were said to be the last symbols of the old world before the Meridium War transformed the sea into an acidic wasteland. A resilient breed, the laxor whales thrived in their new toxic environment as the sole apex predator. They were also one of the few means of transportation available to cross the Acid Sea. Only three months earlier, a circle representative arrived in one such creature, a titan of a laxor named Mercala. During the welcome dinner, I overheard him describe the experience to our king as akin to being squeezed into a foul-smelling carcass for days on end while wearing a breather mask. I thanked the gods that we never had to use the wretched beasts. I doubted my Loriana's training could prepare me for such a claustrophobic nightmare. Loriana's word and Proust, I replied, bowing. Nay, he replied. I am his acolyte, Darden Lorin. Loriana's Proust will be arriving with the king in three days. I stood, my blood boiling. This was an incredible slight. No visiting Loriana's had ever sent an acolyte in his stead. Especially not before a summit as important as this. This is quite unorthodox, I replied. I was to go over plans for the summit with Loriana's Worden. Darden nodded. I have been tasked with handling everything until he arrives. My face reddened, but I held my tongue. Little would come of arguing with the Strantodian, especially with dinner service creeping around the corner. Very well, I said, my indignation barely contained. Once you are settled in your quarters, meet me in the kitchens. We can go over our plan of attack there. Darden stared at me. Attack? Scheduling, I replied. We will go over scheduling for meals and meetings between our masters. Darden stared at me for a few more heartbeats. He then turned back to the castle proper and, without a word, crossed the courtyard and vanished inside. I stood agog. Had he really left without even so much as a bow? Did these Strantodians follow any protocols in that black castle of theirs? I shook my head in disgust, but my anger suddenly turned to curiosity as I caught a whiff of whatever it was the acolyte had been breathing inside his mask. It smelled bitter and acrid, like a dead skunk left to rot in the sun. How are we supposed to make peace with these people? I wondered. What kind of common ground could we find with a country whose people couldn't even breathe our air? I sighed. A lot rested upon my shoulders now, and as I stared into the pond's empty darkness, I wondered if I might not need help. Radme stood clad in mud-spattered boots and a worn leather tunic which hung down to her exposed knees. Her hair was tucked beneath a scarf, and her cheeks were smeared with what I could only assume was mud. I marveled at her. Even in the stables, knee-deep in feces and mud, she made my heart flutter. What is it, Fi? she asked, a tinge of annoyance in her voice. She held a garin's right hind leg over her knee as one of her farriers tapped a new horseshoe into place. It's this Loriana's, I whispered. I was to meet with him this morning. But instead he sent an acolyte in his place. So, what's the problem? Wouldn't you prefer to deal with a boy? rather than some pompous old Lorianas. Realizing what she said, she bowed her head. I didn't mean it that way. I grinned. Yes, you did. She raised her hands in mock surrender. You know, you're right. I did. Your order is so bound to tradition and protocol, you get twisted up over the slightest infraction. So he sent an acolyte. That's on him. Just focus on making this a smooth visit, and you'll have done your duty. She pet the garin's mane, calming it as the farrier finished tapping the last horseshoe into place. I laughed. My duty. Cleaning tables and bedchambers. Radme motioned for the farrier to leave. When we were alone, she pulled up a stool and sat down in front of me. What is going on, Fi? I stared at the hay-strewn ground. Something was wrong with me. I had an itch that could neither be scratched nor ignored. All my life I had been content with the life of a Loriana's. 
I had worked my way up from a kitchen boy to Loriana's in a matter of twelve turns. It was the fastest ascension a Loriana's had ever achieved. My name, along with my father's, was known amongst all nine royal courts throughout the world. Every turn I received dozens of invitations to leave Sraden and become one kingdom or another's Grand Loriana's. So why did I suddenly feel so small and insignificant? Why did nothing satisfy me any more? I've been a good servant, I said. I've served my king and kingdom loyally for almost sixteen turns. Sraden is the envy of every Loriana's. Yet I feel empty. Radme cocked an eyebrow. Empty? I nodded. It began in that damnable cave. I saw death down there, and it woke something up in me. But I don't know what. I always thought this life was enough for me. But now... Radme placed a hand on my knee. I no longer cared if any of the servants saw, though. I placed my hand over hers. You faced death down there, she said. Of course it awoke something in you. You've spent so many turns swaddled in decorum, obeying the court's every protocol, while never once facing what lies beyond these walls. What does that mean? I should go gallivanting across the countryside in search of adventure and mayhem. She squeezed my hand. I just mean that the spectre of death changes us, makes us more aware of what's really important in this life. Her smile widened as her blue eyes bore into me. What you're feeling is normal, Fi, but it will pass, and then things will return to normal. My heart sank. But what if I don't want things to be normal? What if that's been the silent disease eating away at my soul all of these turns? She squeezed my hand and leaned in closer. Maybe you need to change things then. Change. That was the death knell for all Lorianas. Our world existed in a static bubble, where rules and doctrine were chiseled in stone. How could I change things without shattering my entire world? I let go of her hand and stood. You're leaving. I nodded. Dinner is in two calls. So, let upon handle it. I shook my head. Not tonight. Not with this emissary prowling about my halls. I must be seen as in complete control. You worry too much about what others think, she said. Perhaps you should turn your focus to those who don't judge you or grade your daily routine. I met her eyes. The familiar longing was there. But her patience was clearly waning. I'll see you soon, Radme. She shook her head. Very well, Orianas. Until later. I left the stables feeling worse than ever. You're a damn fool, I thought. Radme was right. I did need change, just not the change my king was thrusting upon me. I wove my way through the crowded corridors, nodding as servants greeted me. Everything felt alive and aglow with excitement. It was a strange thing to behold. Ever since the king fell ill the halls had been silent and gloomy, as if the slightest sound might shatter Sraden's walls. But now the castle was awake, nourished with hope and excited uncertainty. I wondered how this summit would change things here. Would there be visits to Strantoden? Would the king have to endure those filthy laptane masks while visiting their toxic court? I shook off my concerns and entered the kitchen. I was getting ahead of myself as usual, worrying about things that had yet to happen. Things that might never happen, I reminded myself. Has the shipment of tar truffles arrived yet? I asked upon, as I sat down at my desk. He walked over with a pan in hand. Inside it rested the largest tar truffle I had ever seen. What do you think? He asked as the black ball slid about in a puddle of olive oil and garlic cloves. I inhaled the truffle's powerful cheese-like aroma. It was perfect, plucked from the soil at just the right time in its development. And the rest of the shipment? Opon snapped his finger. Moments later... One of the prep cooks approached with a wooden box in hand. Show him, Opon said, smiling. The boy cracked the lid. My eyes went wide. A massive black truffle sat in a nest of straw. Its surface was pitted and cracked, and I could still smell the rich soil from which it had been dug. She's seven pounds, Lorianas, Opon said. The largest ever recorded. 
I picked it up and inhaled its organic aroma. It was perfection incarnate. I was going to save it for when Loriana's warden arrived, I said, upon cocked an eyebrow. But I thought this was for the king's feast. We wouldn't have needed all of it, just enough to impress my counterpart. But apparently Loriana's warden is too busy to join us. Upon gestured for the prep cook to leave. Can you believe that? I said when we were alone. Never have I been so insulted in all my turns as Sraden's Loriana's. Opon pulled up a stool and sat down. Who did you meet with then? An acolyte. Some boy named Darden Lauren. Opon's eyes widened. What? You do know who that is? He asked. I sat up. His father was a charger of great renown. I'm told the old man fought alongside Menete during the Meridium War. That was interesting. Anyone who showed loyalty to Menete during the Meridium War was either dead or exiled to cleanse the poisoned culver waste. So how did this boy manage to get a position in Strantodin's court? Perhaps it's considered a disgrace for a charger's son to be appointed as acolyte to a Loriana's. That made sense. Many cultures considered my guild to be little more than an organization of ornaments, with little value or purpose. I scoffed at the thought. Ornaments. My order had been present for some of the greatest moments in Retract Doa's history. Father had witnessed the signing of the peace treaty struck between the Overwatch and Menetee's splinter group of charges at the end of the Meridium War. The great Lorianas, Milton Fren of Elg, had helped design and build the Great Wall, which now surrounds the capital city of Nithra. And my great-great-great-grandfather, Loriana's Pinclain, fought alongside King Dren Whip of Alamein two hundred turns ago during the coastal wars, with rogue elements of the Shark Rider clans. Is he a loyalist to the Chargers? I asked. Opon shook his head. He broke ranks last turn, when that massive meridium cache was discovered in the Culver Waste, Apparently, he refused to go to Triton, where it was to be presented to Prince Priln as a gift. He's a wise boy, then, I replied. During the Circle Prince's ill-fated visit to the Metal City, Triton had been attacked by shark riders. Now more than half the city sat at the bottom of the acid, along with Prince Priln and all of the Tritonese leaders. I tapped my lip. If the boy had yet to be placed in the charger's yoke, he might still be salvageable, if handled properly, he might even enter into our ranks one day. That would help bridge the divide between Decimon and Strantodin. Perhaps we can make an ally out of this boy before the delegation arrives. How do you plan to do that? Opon asked. I sat back and drummed my fingers atop the desk. I will speak with the king to see if he might offer the boy a private audience tonight. Opon cocked an eyebrow. Private. That is the kind of invitation men have killed for. Are you sure the king will agree? Dear Opon, I said, sighing. I am not sure of anything any more. I think a private audience is a wonderful idea, the king said. Yu Lin sat draped in a fresh crimson robe, staring out across the grassy plains. It was half past the twelfth call and grey clouds were slowly creeping toward the castle. I stood silent as his majesty began coughing. When it passed, he spat out the window and wiped his chin on his sleeve. What will the cooks prepare for tonight? he asked, his voice noticeably strained. I handed him a clean handkerchief. I'm still brushing up on the Strantodian diet, but we've prepared another vulture, as well as some other smaller dishes. Very well, but don't make a show of it. I don't want these Strantodians thinking we're fluffing their feathers, if you know what I mean. I bowed. Very well, then. That is all. Philem. I exited the king's private quarters and made my way across the castle. When I entered the inner ward, I adjusted my tunic around my neck. In a matter of calls, the temperature had dropped at least fifteen degrees. We will have to prepare most of the fireplaces in the keep tonight, I told myself. This was no small feat, considering Sraden had well over a hundred to set, light, and monitor. I warmed my hands over a brazier as the first snowflakes of the season fluttered through the air. Within seconds, 
the gentle dusting turned into a gale, cutting visibility to just a few yards. I stomped my feet and rubbed my hands as snow began clinging to my head and shoulders. Where is he? I wondered. I had sent a servant to the acolyte's quarters with an invitation to meet here at the first call after sunset. Was he slighting me? He was an acolyte, one of the most famous Lorianas in the world. I found it difficult to believe he would be late. I was about to head back indoors when I noticed a shadow approaching across the yard. The snow was thick, but I could just make out the bulky mask the boy wore. He stepped up to the brazier and stared into the flames. Every few seconds, a tiny gout of green gas sprayed forth from a vent in the rear of his mask. Lorianus Klein, how can I help you this evening? I apologize for the secrecy, but the king felt it best for me to extend the invitation personally. He looked up, green gas swirling before his eyes. Invitation. The king wishes you to sup with him this evening. In his personal chambers, the boy continued to stare into the flames. Very well. I was shocked. It was a rare and honorable thing to be invited to a private audience with the king. But this boy seemed utterly disinterested. You know his majesty rarely extends such invitations. It's considered an incredible honor. The boy shrugged. Perhaps for you. To me it's just dinner with another master. I stood agog. Where had this boy been taught court decorum? A flop house. He will see you at the eight evening call, I said rather curtly. Dress appropriately. And don't be late. The boy turned and left without another word. Footsteps crunched behind me. Sounds like the king will be in for quite the night, eh? I smiled. Radme stood behind me, clad in her leather riding pants and jacket. In the brazier's flickering light, she looked not a turn over thirty. My dear, I said, he has no idea. She chuckled. Will you be attending the great feast when King Wren arrives? I would kill to get a good look at him. Especially after all of the stories. I laughed. And I would love to have you by my side, but alas my station does not forbid me such pleasures. Her smile faded. This wasn't the first time she had asked for an invitation to a king's feast. But there was little I could do. These were delicate times, and even I had to obey the king. You won't miss much, I said. The sight of the man is quite off-putting, I hear. Pitiable, even. The snow fell thicker, great feathery flakes clinging to anything they touched. It was odd weather for this time of the season. Snow usually didn't hit Sredin until after the first deep chill when the majority of birds fled south and the forest animals took to their cavernous shelters. I wondered if the strange goings-on in the culver waste were somehow making their way here. Gods, I hope not, I thought. We already had trolls and howler plants to deal with. Magical weather patterns would simply not do. Odd weather, Radme said, as if reading my mind. Very. And word has reached the king that it's occurring on other continents as well. Even now, the culver waste is encrusted in footfalls of snow. Radme shook her head. A desert buried beneath snow. Doesn't bode well for us, does it? No. But at the moment I have other things to worry about, like what kind of meal a Strantodian acolyte might prefer, and whether or not it will kill him. Radme stepped beside me. Her warmth resonated against me as we rubbed our hands above the brazier's flames. I wanted to take her hand in mine, kiss her lips, and tell her how much I yearned to be with her, if just for one night. But as always, the Lorianas inside held me back. Instead, we simply stood silent, our hearts heavy with unspoken desire as snow clung to our heads. Will you join me for a drink later? she asked. There was something I wanted to talk about with you. In private. I sighed. I doubt I will have time. The delegation has already made landfall. They'll most likely be arriving tomorrow. She nodded. Very well. I turned toward her. Something was off. Normally she was jovial and relaxed. It was what I loved most about her. But tonight she seemed tense and unsure. Is everything okay? I asked. 
She nodded. It's fine. It can wait. Our experience. Yes, Fi. Finish your evening. She left soon after, vanishing into the snowstorm much the same as the Strantodian. What is going on with her? I wondered. I had never seen her so uneasy and quiet. It would have to wait, though. I entered the keep and dusted snow from my head and shoulders. Even with over a hundred fires burning in the keep, the winter chill pervaded over all. My teeth chattering, I made my way to the rear of the keep, where the library was located. It was an enormous structure with the thickest walls in all of Sredin, providing protection from both the elements and invaders. I stepped onto the massive crimson carpet covering the main level. It was a sight to behold, an unbroken expanse of pristine, red Dismonian cloth bathed in the dim green light of a thousand Eterna lamps. I breathed in that familiar parchment smell I had come to know so well in my youth. Thousands of turns worth of knowledge and culture stood before me. One had only to flip a page. I grabbed one of the Eterna lamps and made my way to the section dealing with Strantodian history. It was a lonely and neglected section, with few working lamps and centuries worth of dust coating its warped shelves. I ran my finger along the ancient spines until I found the volume I was seeking, The Culinary Arts of Strantodin by Depa Stargel. I sat down at one of the desks located in the center of the library and cracked it open. It was written in Old Desmonian, a pared-down version of today's throatier dialect scratched in scorp ink across yellowed, delcium parchment. I had studied it for several seasons at Cilium Dor, but it was a tricky language and I was only able to reliably navigate the more basic texts. I flipped to the section focusing on Strantodian culture in the last two centuries. Much of it dealt with the turns predating the Meridium War, when the kingdom first began mining the magical ore near its southern coastline. Most of those mines have long since been abandoned and sealed off. However, at one time, thousands dotted the landscape, a vast interconnected system of mines more than ten miles deep, and all for a mineral that destroyed much of the known world, I thought. Nowadays, only one meridium mine remains operational on Strantodin, Tormax Cut, a deep and ancient system originally bankrolled for gold exploration. Accounts tell of it being a fouled place where not a shred of natural life remains. It also happens to be home to Strantodin's largest harbor city, Dulep, a city where the elite and powerful still burn the poisonous rock for their pleasure and trade. I flipped past the many chapters dealing with Strantodin's environmental collapse and economic turmoil, and stopped when I finally found one with a wooden spoon etched at the top of the page. According to the author, almost all modern Strantodin dishes are poisonous to outsiders. The gases released from the Meridium fires had saturated all of the farmland at the southern end of the continent, rendering plants and livestock completely toxic. That was why the continent had absolutely no exports to speak of. As I flipped through the chapter, I learned that visitors to the continent needed to ingest a parasite known as Gurana, a tiny creature which burrowed into its host's throat and fed on its meals. Strange enzymes in the parasite's stomach then mix with the host's food to render the toxins safe. By the gods, I breathed. It sounded like a ghastly place to live a land soured by folly and ruled over by a host of brutal autocratic leaders hungry for the fertile lands of Decimon. I continued to flip. Of all the dishes favoured by Strantodians, suckling pig was the most recognisable. Like a summer roast, the pig was braised in a tar truffle oil and then basted with caramelised shine berries, giving it a deceptively sweet and aromatic crust. But it also required Trentadure, a toxic spice that only Strantodians can ingest. I spent three calls studying the chapter, before I finally sat back and rubbed my eyes. We had originally planned on serving baked vulture, but that was proving to be far more complicated than we had initially expected. Originally, Opon was going to serve it over Algin rice with a dribble of berry wine and vinegar, an expensive and laborious dish which would have required more than half the kitchen servants to complete but I made my decision then. We were serving pig. I sat silent in the library for some time, lost in thought. 
How was it possible that a climate could alter an entire race's physiology? The gobs of Triton had lived for centuries beneath a toxic meridium dome, slowly mutating into goblin-like wraiths. But they didn't require special breathing apparatuses to visit foreign lands. I suppose burning meridium was far more toxic and deadly. Even so, for it to change their bodies that much was absolutely frightening. I took the book with me and headed back to the kitchens. I could read more about them later. Now it was time to cook. Chapter 12 The Test We stood in a semicircle around the largest stove. Opon and I wore protective smocks, and we each had on a Triton Laptain mask. Beneath the hiss and pop of the mask's filters, I could just make out Opon arguing with Pryle Dor. If you try to bake it with that much Trentadur spice, you're likely to kill every soul in Sredin, Pryle said. The boy was Sredin's second best cook and another personal friend. Unlike Opon, though, he was not thrilled to be trying out a Strantodian dish, especially one that could wipe out half the castle. Opon stood beside him, staring at the suckling pig. It was covered in Trentadur, a powerful brown spice favoured by the Strantodian population for its salty sweet flavour. When heated, though, a chemical compound within it transformed into a toxic gas which could kill anyone whose body was not acclimated to the Strantodian atmosphere. And that would be all of Castle Sredin, I thought nervously. How else can we prepare a Strantodian dish? Opon barked, if not with the proper Strantodian spices. Pryle shook his head. I won't do it. It's not worth the risk. I stared at the suckling pig. It was hard to believe such a simple dish could be so deadly. But Pryor was right. It was a risk to cook it here. I knew that as well as anyone. But if it was successful, we would serve it again at the Grand Feast when King Wren arrived. The fumes will be contained behind the Triton glass wall, I told myself. As long as we triple-check the seals, there shouldn't be a problem. I'll do it, I said. Upon's eyes widened. What? I'll prepare the damned dish. Pryle smiled. You. No offense, Lorianas, but you're not even a master cook. My face reddened. I liked Pryle a lot, but at times he was quick to forget his standing here. And mine. I would have... You know, I studied under some of the greatest culinary masters on Retract Deor. I replied curtly. Can you say the same? Pryle's cheeks reddened as he shook his head. My apologies, Loriana's clane. Opon shook his head. You're mad, you know that, Fi. Come, come, I said. With the three of us at the stoves, anything is possible. The master cook picked up a spoon and nervously tapped it against his chin. Here lies three fools, killed by a goddamn suckling pig. I forced a laugh. Stop being so dramatic. We'll take all the proper precautions. Like hosting the Strantodians outside the castle walls. Opon joked. I placed a lid over the pan and put it in the oven. No turning back now, Opon said as he shut the oven door. All right, you all know your jobs, I said. Let's get to work. The rest of the kitchen staff donned their new laptain masks and smocks which I had procured prior to the summit. The masks were oily and stank of bitter shark fat, but the resilient skin was impenetrable to almost any liquid, including acid. Every kingdom had adopted their use since the end of the Meridium War, especially in the Culver Waste, where exiled charges and scrappers donned entire suits of the material while cleansing the polluted desert. A strange mechanical purr filled the kitchen air as the mask-clad cooks returned to their stations. I sat down at my desk and stared at the oven containing the suckling pig. Was I making an egregious error here? Had my decision to cook a Strantodian dish in the castle put my title at risk? It has to be done. We have to make a perfect impression on these people. Otherwise thousands more would die in an endless and pointless war. Two calls passed in the blink of an eye. It's time, Opon said as he peered into the oven. He removed the sizzling pan and placed it on the wooden counter. Fumes rose from the pigs, 
deadly green vapors that were quickly sucked out the kitchen windows. The Trentadure spice had baked deep into the pig's taut flesh, transforming their once reddish hue bright purple. I sighed nervously as I stared at the creatures. In order to complete the dish, the piglets had to first be flamed. However, this was a delicate step. As the Trentadure infused itself into the flesh, the air would fill with a deadly toxin known as stuma. If anyone other than a Strantodian were to inhale it, their lungs would liquefy within seconds. Clear the kitchen, I shouted over the hissing masks and clanking utensils. Opon and I waited beside the tray as the masked servants exited the chamber. Once they had shut and sealed the door behind them, I turned to Opon. Is your mask secure? He nodded. We're all set here, Fi. I picked up a bottle of berry wine and began pouring it over the pigs. Once it was empty, I picked up a candle and touched it to their flesh. There was a loud whoosh as fire engulfed the tray. At first, the piglets glowed green, fueled by both the wine and Trentadure powder. But as the wine reduced, yellow smoke billowed upward toward the ceiling. Here we go, Opon said. On the surface I was calm, but my stomach boiled with fear. All right, let's begin prepping it. Opon withdrew a razor-sharp butcher's knife from beneath his smock and began sharpening it on a whetstone. Do you want the slices thick or thin? Thin, I replied. That's how the Strantodians prefer it. Opon cut into the pig's rear haunch. The flesh cracked open, spilling more yellow smoke into the air. I waited until Opon was done and then poured more wine atop the fresh cuts. We'll let it marinate until this evening, I said. Pryl nodded. Will the wine neutralize the remaining toxins? Hopefully, Opon said. Else we might just end up killing the entire royal court. Pryle picked up the plate of freshly sliced pig and slid it into one of the kitchen's enchanted ice boxes. When does dinner service begin? He asked as he sealed the box. One call, I replied. One call that could decide the next hundred turns. Two small tables had been pressed up against either side of the glass barrier. A candelabra sat atop each one, the flames yellow on the Desmonian side, meridian blue on the Strantodian side. Opon and I stood at the rear of the chamber. We were both formally dressed in our blue tunics and black trousers with a gold sash around our chests, bearing the Desmonian sigil. A rose intertwined around an olive branch. Look at that one, Opon whispered, gesturing toward the lone figure sitting on the Strantodian side of the glass. Darden Woe sat silent, staring at his table. Without his mask on, we could clearly see his blonde hair and blue eyes. They were abnormal features for a Strantodian. Most men and women from their land were usually bold and pale as ghosts. By Desmonian standards, though, he would be considered quite attractive. How old do you think he is? Upon asked. Probably not a turn past nineteen, I replied. I suddenly found myself pitying the boy. On Strantoden, such good looks would have made him a pariah. By sending him here, it was meant to be an insult to our king. Thankfully, though, the slight had gone unnoticed by his majesty. The doors on the Desmonian side swung open. King Yulin Donan, ruler of Desmonian, and all he surveys, I announced as the king strode into the hall. He looked better than he had in weeks. The colour had returned to his cheeks, and his hair was neatly trimmed and combed. He wore a red military tunic with a blue sash wrapped around his waist, and black pants with gold piping. If not for his gaunt, sallow face, I might have mistaken him for the king of old. Darden looked up from the table but didn't stand. Rise, fool, I whispered to myself. But the boy remained seated even as the king approached the glass barrier. Upon shook his head. Is he trying to end this before it begins? King Donan sighed as he slowly sat down. So this is the emissary they sent me. The boy nodded without addressing him. It was an egregious break from court protocol. However, there was nothing I could do about it. I am Darden Woe, your majesty. Emissary of Strantodin, 
and acolyte to Loriana's Proust Worden. The glass wall's triton filter distorted the emissary's voice, but the king heard him well enough. I sighed. At least Darden had finally addressed him properly. The king gazed at the glass wall. Magnificent, isn't it? Ten turns ago we would never have dreamed of hosting a delegation from your land. But thanks to this little marvel we can sup together like old friends. It is quite impressive, your majesty, Darden replied. Might I ask what such a thing costs? I swallowed. Such a question was completely inappropriate. The king smiled. More than I care to admit, I'm afraid. Two servants entered the hall, one on our side and one donning a laptane mask on the Strantodian side. My nerves flared as they placed plates in front of the two men. This was the first course, Dale cheese dusted with Trentajur for the Strantodian, and goat cheese with fresh fruit for the king. The boy stared at his course, his expression blank. Is it not to your liking? the king asked. I fear I'm allergic to Dale cheese, your majesty, but I do appreciate the gesture. I draped a napkin across the king's lap. Our servant on the Strantodian side did the same for Darden. I was told I would be dining with Overseer Dard and Eulorianas this evening, the king said. I do apologize, your majesty. Overseer Dard has arrived, but he prefers to dine alone in his quarters. I'm told he will be available tomorrow, though. The king huffed as he chewed his cheese. You are aware this might be taken as a bit of a slight. Here, perhaps. On Strantodin, it is customary to meet with a subordinate prior to having an audience with the king or his Lorianas. The king cocked an eyebrow. Is it now? I grew tense. The king was getting angry. Opon leaned close. This is not going well. No, it isn't, I replied. The second course arrived from the kitchens, I had picked it especially for His Majesty, seared draba meat with a gold berry sauce served beside freshly mashed desolan potatoes with a crusting of bacon and soured cream. It was considered quite the delicacy throughout much of the world. But the boy just prodded it with his fork. The king watched him as he ate. Even this is beyond your complex palate. My apologies, Your Majesty, he replied. But I fear draba meat does not sit well with my stomach. The potatoes are quite good, though. The king dabbed his lips with his napkin. I sensed his impatience growing, but he kept it in check. Your Lorianas. He is quite impressive, Darden said, surprising me. I'm told he braved a troll hive just to obtain glow bulbs for the summit feast. The king turned to me. Is this true? I took a breath. I had made it a point to keep my little excursion a secret from him. It is, your majesty. His eyes narrowed. And why am I only just hearing about this? I swallowed. I didn't want to concern you with trivialities, your majesty. He shook his head. You could have sent anyone else in there, Lorianas. My apologies, your majesty. I thought it best to handle it personally. Most of the soldiers are too unfamiliar with the plant to know where it grows best. We'll discuss this later he said. I bowed and slunk back to my position at Herpon's side. There's no need to reprimand him, Darden said. He was just being a good servant. The king drank down a swallow of berry wine. I appreciate your concern, but at Sraden there is a chain of command. And that chain does not include my Lorianas crawling around a troll-infested hive without my knowledge. The boy glanced at me. My apologies, to both of you. It's not my place to pry. The king finished the last of his potatoes and sat back. So tell me, boy, where are you from on Strantodine? Darden put his fork down. I was raised in Dama, a port city in the northwest. My father was a whaler and my mother an Adrena weed grower. You've come a long way then, the king said. Darden nodded. It has indeed been a long road from Castle Elop. And even longer, I'm sure, to become an acolyte to Loriana's Worden. Darden took a sip from his goblet. It was my honor to accept the position. 
I'm sure it was. The king finished his wine and gestured for me to pour him another glass. Loriana's Philemclane here spent nearly eleven turns apprenticing to his father. The king continued as I filled his cup. And when he is not crawling around troll hives, he is the finest Loriana's in the Nine Kingdoms. Upon cracked a grin as I returned to his side. You're the queen of the ball, apparently, he whispered. I ignored him as I took my place beside him. I've known Loriana's clan's name for as long as I can remember, Darden said. He is revered by many, especially King Wren. This surprised me as well as King Donan. Is that so? The king said. King Wren has referenced him on countless occasions, even to Loriana's Worden's vexation. I still wonder why he hasn't tried to claim him for our court. I shifted uncomfortably. Once a position was assigned, Lorianas are forbidden to leave their masters, no matter the situation. To break this law meant permanent exile from the Lorianas' order. A fate worse than death, I thought. It was also unheard of for any king to have multiple Lorianas in their service. The king laughed. Well, he is welcome to ask. But I fear Lorianas' clan is quite happy here at Sraden. He glanced at me, an uncertain look in his eyes. It made the hairs prickle on the back of my neck. I'm sure he is, the boy replied. From the looks of your castle, anyone would count themselves lucky to be in his service. Opon and I relaxed. At least the acolyte knew enough to salve his indiscretion with flattery. The king stood. I immediately rushed forward and pulled his chair back. Enjoy the rest of your meal, emissary woe. I'm afraid it's time for me to retire for the evening. He took a few steps and stumbled. I grabbed his arm and steadied him. Darden watched curiously as we left the chamber. He'll report this to Loriana's Worden, I thought. It was regretful, but there was little we could do to hide the king's failing state. As I walked the king back to his bedchamber, I couldn't help but wonder about Darden. He seemed so dumbstruck by everything he was seeing at Sraden. I could only imagine what life must be like for him on Strantodon. I'd heard rumors that Castle Elop and its surrounding city were toxic wastelands populated with thieves and murderers. I'd also heard Castle Elop's outer walls were stained black from all of the toxic filth in the air. Such a shame, I thought. Sraden's white walls and marble floors were the envy of every king and queen. I had worked hard to keep them that way. In the last ten turns I had employed over three thousands workers to clean the outer walls. An incredible expense, but one even King Donan was willing to accept. For Sraden was now a beacon of hope and commerce atop the Great Plains, its white towers stretching high above the surrounding forests. Once I was done helping the king return to his bedchamber, I made my way back to the hall. I was surprised to find Darden still picking at his food, as upon looked on. I approached the glass barrier and halted before the two tables. Do you need anything else this evening, emissary woe? Darden sat back. Green gas swirled around him, masking his features. Can I ask you a question, Lorianas? he said. I don't see why not, I replied. Is it true you once saved King Donan from choking to death? My eyes widened. The incident he was referring to had happened in secret several turns earlier. The king had been hosting a gaggle of friends in his private chambers. After they had left, I found Yulin lying alone on the floor beside his bed, choking on his own vomit. Luckily I had once watched a healer save a child from a similar fate, so I grabbed a king and did my best to mimic the healer's movements. Thankfully it had worked, and I was able to revive my master. But how could the emissary possibly know about the incident? I, I did. Whispers always find their way to our king's ears, the boy replied. You know how it goes. I straightened. He was talking about spies. I suppose I do. He stood and approached the glass. You've outdone yourself here. Loriana's word and could never devise such a contraption. He lacks imagination. I didn't reply. It was in bad taste to critique other Lorianas's methods. Don't get me wrong, he's a fine servant, 
the boy went on as he ran a hand across the glass. But his personality is a bit too... cold. He lacks the gentle touch of a northerner. Servants entered and began clearing away the king's plates. When they were gone, I stepped closer to the wall. May I ask a question? Emissary? He nodded. Will you be attending Cilium Door? Darden dabbed his lips with his napkin, perhaps in ten turns. My indenturement binds me to Loriana's warden until it's repaid. Indenturement. My family processed Trentadure and Adrena weed in the northern regions, but our crops failed several turns back. In order to keep from being jailed, my parents offered me as an acolyte to Loriana's warden. My pulse raced. He was describing slavery. You seem shocked. Loriana's claim. I am, I replied. I've never heard of such a practice being tied to an emissary before. Things are far different on Strantodon than Deciman. Customs you see as barbaric are commonplace in our culture. It's no shame to be indentured to a Loriana's, especially one as revered as Loriana's Proust Worden. And what kind of man is Loriana's Worden? I asked. Darden chuckled as green gas coiled before his face. You'll find out soon enough. Chapter 13 The Arrival The processional moved slowly towards Sredin. It consisted of six enormous horse-drawn wagons and a retinue of masked soldiers marching at both the head and rear of the line. Each vehicle was drawn by three horses and had a small smokestack on its roof spewing forth gouts of green smoke. Would you look at that, Radme said, pointing at the horses. She had insisted on joining me before I officially welcomed our guests. I raised a looking glass to my eye. The Strantodin horses were all wearing specially designed Triton masks. Are the stables properly outfitted for their horses? I asked. She huffed. Of course. But do you know how long it will take to tear down those glass barriers? It takes as long as it has to, my dear. Radme folded her arms and stared at the approaching column. Couldn't they have just purchased proper Desmonian horses? I mean, to drag those poor beasts all the way across the strait. I sighed. She was right. It was strange. And outfitting the stables with triton glass and gas pumps had cost a fortune. However, it was a cost both myself and the castle treasurer had approved. It was important that our guests saw the lengths we were willing to go through to ensure their safety. What do you think they're like? Radme asked. The horses? No, she laughed. The delegates. The Strantodians. I think we got a sneak peek with Darden Woe. But who knows for sure? No one has entered Strantodon in over fifty turns. Who knows what their lives are really like? But if the others are at all like the overseer and emissary, we might just pull this off. I hope so. I truly do. The people are tired, Fi. Tired of death and war. I nodded. We still have to be very careful. Everything we say or do around them will be judged and examined. She nodded. And what about the feast? My chest tightened. I knew this was coming. She had been asking me for days to sneak her into the summit feast. I told you, my dear, I'll do my best, but I can't guarantee anything. Security will be incredibly tight. If Darson Lap is in charge, I doubt even a fly will be allowed to attend without permission. She touched my arm. I had a dress made, silken gold and edged with mountain glass. I swallowed. I would very much like to see that dress. That is up to you now, isn't it? My heart raced. I could have stood beside her all day, breathing in her willow perfume as her warmth radiated against me. But there was so much work to be done. I will try my best, I replied, as I turned back to the smoky processional. The green gas swirled around it like a dust cloud rolling in off a desert. The horse's footfalls echoed across the plains, growing louder with every second. The wagons were painted black and had windows made of thick glass shielding with steel shades drawn over them. Pairs of mask-wearing drivers sat atop each wagon, 
their shouts overpowered by the horses' footfalls. I wondered which wagon Loriana's warden was in. I couldn't fathom having to travel in such a manner, masked or stuck inside a gas-filled box. But it showed that the Strantodians were serious. I could only imagine how expensive such vehicles were, not to mention the cost of shipping them all the way across the strait. And what of King Wren? Would he be arriving on a golden chariot pulled by a thousand doves? How could he top this? My heart beat excitedly at the thought. There was so much we didn't know about their kingdom. For turns it had been shrouded in toxic mystery, with little communication between our warring continents, save for the shouts of our fighting armies. It's time for me to get ready, I said to Radme. She forced a smile. That's my cue, then. She turned to leave, but I grabbed her arm. Can I see you later? I asked. Her smile widened. You know where to find me, Lorianas. And with that, she walked back into the castle, but not without casting one last smile over her shoulder. When she was gone, I turned back to the approaching wagons. This is it, father, I whispered to myself. Time to see if I'm worthy of our name. A flock of Draba birds swooped overhead, a great mass of undulating life expanding and shrinking as it flew over the smoky caravan. This was going to be my greatest test. I just had to make it through tonight's feast, and then I could relax. The portcullis rose with a deafening shriek as its ancient steel slid into the upper wall. I made my way down to the inner ward and stood silent beside the captain of the king's guard, Trey Cajun. He wore the guard's traditional red tunic and had his ceremonial sword dangling against his leather trousers. Behind us, a retinue of our finest servants stood bedecked in the blue robes of House Sraden. Look at these people, Trey mumbled as the lead wagon entered the inner ward. Green smoke coiled around it, masking the two drivers as they brought it to a halt several dozen yards to our left. I glanced at the servants. Several were nervously slouching or covering their noses. Straighten, I hissed. The servants shot to attention, adjusting their robes as the strange green smoke snaked around them. The other two wagons rumbled through the gate and ground to a halt behind the lead. This is it, Trey whispered. I swallowed. The lead wagon was enormous, far larger than it had appeared in my looking glass. By the gods, and this is just for the Lorianas. A gust of wind swept into the inner ward, blowing away the green fog. There was a dull thud, followed by a loud groan as a door opened on the side of the wagon. A small set of stairs slowly dropped down to the ground as a masked figure emerged into the sunny winter air. I could see little of his face beneath the mask, but he wore a black robe trimmed in gold and boots cut from the finest leather I had ever seen. The robed figure scanned the ward and then stepped down onto the ground. Loriana's for Lemclain, I presume, he said. I stepped forward and bowed. At your service, welcome to Sraden Castle. The man looked me over and then turned to the captain of the King's Guard. And you are Captain Trey Cajun? Trey nodded. Welcome. The man stepped aside as other figures emerged into the crisp morning air. I am Clay Dimroll, captain of King Gaunius Wren's King's Guard. Welcome to Sraden, I said. Nearly a dozen more figures emerged from the wagon and fanned out behind him. Is Lorianus Proust Worden amongst you? I asked. A large, imposing figure stepped down from the wagon. He wore a simple black tunic trimmed with gold piping and black trousers and boots made of fine black leather. He approached me and bowed. Lorianus Falem Klein, I have heard much about you over the turns. I straightened. Lorianus Worden was much more imposing than I had expected. He stood almost six footfalls tall and had a deep, raspy voice. I am honored to meet you, Lorianus Worden, I replied. I too have heard much of your exploits. He huffed beneath his mask. I am to inspect the king's quarters, as well as the kitchens and grand hall. Right to business, I thought. Perhaps we weren't so different, after all. Of course, Lorianas. 
Would you prefer to freshen up in your chamber first? Have they been prepared for us? We've installed Triton air filters in every chamber in the west wing of the castle. He stared at me through his Triton mask. He had green eyes and bone-white flesh. Very well then. Our servants will handle all of your baggage. I clapped my hands, signaling my people to begin offloading the wagons. Which wagon contains the king? I asked. Loriana's warden pointed toward the sky. I squinted. High above us, a massive shadow circled Sredin's towers. By the gods, I breathed. It was a Torinad, a rare and vicious reptilian creature normally found deep in the jungles of Al. The great bat-like creature folded its wings against its massive body and plunged toward the inner ward. What is that? One of the servants stammered. Loriana's warden followed the beast with his bloodshot eyes. Amazing, isn't she? The creature came within a hundred footfalls of the ground and then opened its massive wings. Get back, I shouted as dust kicked up around us. The beast slammed its feet into the ground and then settled into a crouch. I shuddered. The Torinat's feet were webbed and it had thorn-like protrusions dotting its spine and tail. Its eyes glowed white and it had two massive black fangs extending from its elongated snout. Her name is Wuldak, Loriana's warden proclaimed, unfazed by the viscous, yellow fluid dripping from the beast's black jaws. But where's the king? I asked. The beast lowered its massive head to the ground and opened its mouth. Watch your feet, Loriana's warden said. I stepped back as a river of yellow fluid spilled from the Torinat's mouth. Moments later, a large metal chamber slid up the Torinat's enormous throat. Loriana's warden watched it all in silence, as if he had witnessed this same scene a hundred times before. Prodders come forward, he shouted. A pair of men clad in triton masks and leather armor returned to the largest wagon and grabbed two massive poles mounted on its sides. What are they doing? I asked as they approached the beast. You'll see, Lorianus. The duo raised the poles and began poking the roof of the Torinat's enormous mouth. Seconds later, the beast gagged as a metal chamber slid free of its jaws onto the inner ward. I watched nervously as a door opened on the metal chamber. Two masked men clad in black armor stepped into the sun and took up positions on either side of the object. All hail King Galnius Wren, Loriana's warden announced. Master of Strantodin and all he surveys. A figure emerged from the chamber. At first I thought it was another Loriana's. He wore a simple black robe trimmed in gold and a normal triton mask. But when he spoke I immediately knew I was in the presence of a king. Wretched beast nearly vomited us up over the strait, he mumbled. He removed his gloves and handed them to Loriana's warden. I straightened. Welcome to Sredin Castle, Your Majesty. King Wren didn't reply. Instead, Loriana's warden stepped between us. Only the court Loriana's may speak directly to the king, he whispered. I cocked an eyebrow. There was no such rule on Deciman. But I would play along. My apologies, Loriana's. Can I? Worden raised his hand. The king wishes to go to his chambers. My blood boiled. Very well, I said, bowing. This way. Most mornings, the halls were filled with the familiar smells of burning fires and sizzling pig fat. Today, a strange and sweet effluvium polluted the air. It was akin to burnt cinnamon and cat urine, mixed with horse dung and dead flesh. Twice I almost vomited as I inhaled exhaust from the Strantodian masks. We were warned about the fumes, but no one informed us that the toxins could fill the halls with such a powerful stink. A hand touched my shoulder. That is far enough. I turned. Loriana's warden stood only inches away. Our tasters will be at the kitchen's one call prior to the feast. Please provide every course for their inspection. With that said, he turned and led the Strantodian king into Sredin's western wing. I stepped back, shocked. 
Not since my days at Cilium Door had someone spoken to me with such impertinence. But I let it go. After all, we were dealing with Strantodians. The delegation marched on, swallowing the king into their silent ranks. They were seventy strong, fifty soldiers and twenty servants. Each man and woman wore a triton air mask, filled with toxic fumes and a black laptane suit. Bet you never expected to see that, eh? I turned. Radme stood smiling at me. By the gods, are you trying to kill me, woman? She wore a beautiful gold dress made of Nethrarian silk. It was a rare and reflective material that caught the light and rippled with varying colors. There were even tiny gemstones lining her V-shaped neckline which glittered in the afternoon light. By the gods, woman, I breathed. She smiled. I take it you like it. An awkward silence passed between us as I took in her beauty. I was used to her wearing mud-spattered tunics and filthy overalls. But this, I do, I replied. She curtsied. Why, thank you, Lorianus. I could have kissed her then. In fact, I should have. But my training kept me in check. Instead, I cleared my throat and said, My apologies, dear. But I must tend to the kitchens. The meal is being cooked tonight. Radme's eyes widened excitedly. Oh, now you must get me in there. You must... I shook my head. I can't promise anything. Their security is incredibly tight. Worse than when the songbird performed here. Her smile dimmed. Is this going to be like that again? My heart sank. She was referring to the time the famed songbird of Pryor, Elethrae Wellen, graced our courts. Radme had begged me to sneak her into the grand kitchen, which was going to be directly behind where Elthrae was performing. But a month prior to the songbird's arrival, I received strict instructions that no one be allowed access anywhere near the rear of the stage, especially the main kitchen. I tried to explain what had happened, but it was pointless. Deep down, we both knew I could have found another way for her to listen to the show. Instead, I cowered behind my own rules, too afraid to risk a simple reprimand from the king. I shuddered at the memory. Not only did I fail myself, I allowed the Lorianas in me to hurt someone I loved. I made a decision then. Meet me in the cloakroom, just outside the great hall one call prior to the feast. The one that no one uses. She smiled. What are you up to, Lorianas? Just be there. She stepped closer, her eyes locked on mine. We began to drift toward each other. This is it, I thought. The moment I break my vows. But before we could kiss, more Strantodians filed past us into the western wing. I stepped back. I'll see you soon, Radme. Her smile dimmed as the masked men and women marched past. The cloakroom then. And with that, she turned and left. I took a deep breath and sighed. My emotions were being pulled in every direction. I loved Radme. She was my best friend, and even if I didn't want to admit it, I was in love with her. But the Lorianas in me refused to break the code. I watched as the last of the Strantodian servants vanished around a bend in the hall. It was a sight I had only ever seen in my worst nightmares. Yet here I was, playing host to Deciman's mortal enemies. It was like standing in a storm without shelter. A storm of the century. And I was already drowning in its floodwaters. Chapter 14 The Pig and the Peasant The kitchen was stifling. All three ovens were lit, as well as the six brick stoves. Cooks worked in every corner, chopping, ladling, stirring, frying. Sredin's kitchen was in full swing, something that had not happened for many turns and I loved it. I lived for the chaotic dance of the kitchens. It was my favorite job and place in all of Sredin Castle. But as I sat tapping my foot beneath my creaky desk, a pang of anxiety gripped my chest. I had already inspected the table setting several times, making sure every plate and utensil was properly positioned. The evening's wine vintage, summer berry, had been filtered for impurities and left to breathe. The glass barrier was sealed and safe. 
I even inspected the servants to make sure every fingernail was cut and clean and every face properly shaven and powdered. But something still gnawed at me. I didn't know what, but I felt as if a key element for the evening was being overlooked. I picked up one of the priceless wine bottles and poured its contents into a decanter. It was a 400-turn-old summer berry vintage, blended with hints of peach and orange. On the open market, it could easily fetch over 100,000 coinage. For not only was it one of the rarest wines in all of Retrac Deor, it had come from the famous island kingdom of Levia Dre. It was said the island's soil was the most fertile on the planet, capable of growing crops ten times faster than anywhere else. The island was also famous for its fire pepper and corn exports, but its vineyards were places of legend. Every Lorianas dreamed of the day he or she might get a chance to visit the island and taste some of its offerings. However, as I poured the priceless fluid into the decanter, I realized I had no compulsion to taste it. I was simply too nervous. This was one of the important evenings for me as a Lorianas, and I needed a clean head. Lorianas. I looked up. It was my apprentice, Je Needem. Master Cookapon says it is time to remove the suckling pigs from the ovens. My stomach turned. As soon as the pigs were removed, we would have to begin spicing their flesh with the Trentajur. That meant clearing out the entire kitchen prior to removal. I sighed. Very well. Dismiss the cooks and servants and prepare the masks. Might I stay during the preparations? He asked. I looked him over. He was only nineteen turns old, yet life in the kitchens had already taken its toll. His arms were covered in oil burns, and his skin was perpetually beaded with sweat from the cooking fires. But he was enthusiastic, and far more skilled than most other acolytes. Very well. But you will do exactly as you are told, understand? Jaya smiled. Of course, Lorianus. He bowed and returned to his duties. I turned back to the decanter. It had come all the way from Triton, a priceless crystal masterpiece blown by the famous Triton glassmaker Orphan Dop. At one time, it had even belonged to King Lanwindel, Decimon's first king. Normally, the priceless heirloom sat protected behind Triton glass in the king's bedchamber, but King Donan had specifically requested it be used during tonight's feast. Smoke coiled up from the cooking stations, vanishing into the ventilation chutes cut into the stone ceiling. Voices shouted and curses flew. Every cook was furiously dicing or mixing various ingredients as flames erupted from pans and the smell of garlic, thyme and dill filled the air. I watched Jer approach Opon and whisper in his ear. Opon nodded and turned to the other cooks. Time to clear out. The cooks quickly closed their stove dampers and filed out of the kitchen. As I watched the last one leave, I nervously bit my lip. We had never made more than one suckling pig before, and the thought of poisoning the entire castle horrified me. Jer approached with a cluster of Triton masks in hand. Lorianas, he said handing me one. I took the oily mask and examined it. The shark flesh smelled terrible, like rotten fish and sour pig fat. I marveled that whalers and other wastelanders wore full suits of the stuff. To be encapsulated in such filth for days on end must have been awful. Opon and Jaya waited near the largest of the six ovens. As I approached, they awkwardly donned their masks. Ready for this? Opon asked his voice muffled by the shark flesh. I nodded as I slowly pulled the mask over my face. The oil stank even worse on the reverse side, and the flesh clung to my face like tree sap. Here, Jaya said, twisting the steel cylinder jutting from the side of my mask. With a hiss, sweet metallic air rushed into my nose and mouth. My head swam as the strange air saturated my lungs. Is everyone's mask sealed? Upon asked. I covered the brass intake nozzle and inhaled. The seal was complete. Jer did the same and nodded. Opon opened one of the oven's six massive steel doors and removed a large metal tray from its top rack. Six suckling pigs sizzled and popped as he laid the tray down atop the largest stone countertop. 
Shame to ruin such fine swine, Opon said. I agreed. The pigs looked delicious. Their skin was crisped reddish-brown and oozing grease. To dust such fine specimens with what amounted to poison was tantamount to a sin. Opon placed a tin box on the counter. Well, here it is. Seven ounces of pure Trentadure spice. The box was sealed with red wax and marked the Strantodian Laxor crest. Here we go, Opon said as he picked up a knife. He slowly cut along the wax seal and cracked the lid. Inside was a mound of brown, pepper-like material. I coughed. Even through the mask's filter I could smell the Trentadure's bitter, nutty aroma. Hard to believe it's so deadly, I said, as Opon took a heaping spoonful and began slowly dusting one of the pigs. Only if you're not a Strantodian, he said with a laugh. He worked with a master cook's precision, evenly coating each pig with the foul dust. Fumes immediately began to rise from the flesh, rippling the air before us. Is that normal? Jer asked. The dust is interacting with the pig fat, Opon said as he continued dusting. Watch the flesh. It should turn soon. At first it was subtle, like a leaf slowly changing color in the fall. Then, all at once, the roasted skin transformed from a deep burgundy to a startlingly bright blue. What in the hells? Jaya breathed. Magnificent, isn't it? Upon said, his eyes wide with excitement. It truly was. The spice had completely altered the pig's physiology. Such bright blue colors were rare in nature. And this was the brightest blue I had ever seen. The cells within the flesh are releasing enzymes, Opon said. The Trentadure spice attacks the upper epidermis, impregnating itself into every cell. That's why the flesh changes color. I watched as the entire tray took on a bright blue hue. I had read several books about Trentadure spice after we procured the allotment. But the sketches did the real thing little justice. Back into the ovens now, Opon said, lifting the tray. I opened the oven and stepped back as he slid the tray back into the fire. I could smell the pig clearly through my mask, a bitter, bacon-like aroma with hints of cinnamon and garlic. Upon sealed the oven door and wiped sweat from his brow. Three more calls, and it will be ready. When can the staff return to their stations? I asked. Not until it's done cooking, Opon said. The pig's flesh is still producing fumes, it won't stop until the crisping process is complete. I sighed. We would be cutting it close. The bakers were still prepping confections for desert, and the minor cooks still had to prep and fire the ducklings for the deciman side of the feast. Not to mention the soup and cheese courses for both sides, I thought. Two complex meals in one night. Normally, I relished such a challenge. But tonight, everything had to be perfect. We left the kitchen and sealed the door behind us. As I pulled off my mask, and I took my first unfiltered breath in almost two calls, like the kitchen, the air in the hall smelled of cinnamon and bacon, but far less powerful. These masks are a royal hell, I groaned as I wiped sweat and oil from my face. Agreed, Opon said. Thankfully the glass barrier will keep the fumes on the Strantodian side, so we won't have to wear them during the feast. We hope we won't have to, Jair added. I glanced at the boy. Why don't you make yourself useful and do another seal check? Jair huffed, but left without any further complaint. You know he's right, Opon said. Do we really know if that glass will keep everyone safe? It will, I replied. It has to. I hope so, Opon said. I really do. We walked down the hall in silence, the calm before the storm had arrived. Soon all of my skills would be put to the test. Would I falter? Would I forget some minuscule detail and destroy any chance of peace between our two lands? I swallowed. As much as I hated to admit it, I was terrified. Sraden's Grand Hall was able to seat over five hundred souls, almost triple what most castles could accommodate. The famed Garfaxian architect, Trillwalker designed it during the initial construction of Sraden over nine hundred turns ago, 
and it remained one of the wonders of Desmonian architecture. I walked through the cavernous hall and looked up. A dozen massive meridium chandeliers hung from the ceiling. Their bright blue candles had been lit, and they now cast a strange, magical hue across the hall. It's almost time, I thought. It had taken almost five turns just to establish communications with the Strantodians. This was followed by an endless series of envoys shuffling back and forth between the two continents. When the terms were finally agreed upon for the summit, the planning began in earnest. But it took another two turns just to iron out the details. But here we now stand, I thought, as I stared up at the perfectly smooth glass wall. It was an incredible piece of engineering. Glass was rare and expensive, as were the men who knew how to work it. The process of creating it was long and complex, which was why so few people could afford it. It's a hell of a thing, isn't it? I turned. The king's envoy to Strentoden, Yori Kaldon, stood beside me. I understand it came directly from Triton, he said. Two thirty by thirty foot full squares of perfectly clear glass, and the gobs barely blinked when the kingdom commissioned them. Why would they? I replied. They have wonders buried in that rusting hulk that we could only dream of. He approached the wall and pressed his palm to the glass. You spent two months in Strantodin, correct? I asked. Yuri nodded. So what was it like? He chuckled. Not a place I would care to see again. But the people, what was their general disposition? Yuri shrugged. I wouldn't know. I was mostly confined to my quarters at Elop. They held you prisoner? No, but they didn't trust me, he replied. The only interaction I had with anyone was a young aide they provided me. But the boy barely spoke. What was the castle like? I asked. Yori laughed. Where to begin? Its exterior is covered in soot, giving it quite the hellish façade. A perpetual green haze hangs over everything else, and there are no trees or fauna anywhere to be seen near the castle walls. And the rest of the land? I asked. The castle sits atop a windswept wasteland surrounded by remnants of past wars. Most of the time you can't even see the sky due to the dense nature of the toxins. A chill tickled my spine. It sounded like he was describing the hills. Planning on visiting it soon, Loriana's. Yori joked. My duties will never allow it, I replied. Yet, deep down in my gut, a desire to see Strantodin stirred. I didn't know why but I had always been drawn to that mysterious land beyond the strait. Perhaps it was all of the stories I'd heard growing up. Whatever the cause, deep in my heart, there was an itch that yearned to be scratched. Count yourself lucky then, Lorianas, Yori said. I've never been to such a hellish place. It's a shame, I said. I once read that before the Strantodians began mining for Meridium, the land was quite beautiful. Perhaps. Yori replied. It's a shithole now, though. He met my eyes and smiled. You've done well here, Lorianus Klain. He gestured toward the glass wall. I'm sure our Strantodian guests will be quite surprised by the lengths you've gone to make them comfortable. I only hope it's a pleasant surprise, I replied. We know so little about their needs. They're not as bad as the tales say, Yori said. Many of them are just as curious about us as we are of them. This surprised me. How so? For one, your name is quite famous there. I cocked an eyebrow. I'm serious, he said. Word of your service has reached far and wide across the strait. What have I done to merit such a claim? I asked. Look no further than Sraden's walls and halls, he said, sweeping his arms before him. Everything here is immaculate, tended to and monitored constantly, when I returned from my last trip to Strantodon, I could see Sraden from ten miles off, glittering like a diamond above the forest. Even our kitchens are things of legend. I've met men who've dined all across Retract Deor, yet they always come back to Sraden's kitchens in conversation. Thank Upon and his team for that, I replied. They are the culinary masters of Sraden, not me. Yes, but you are their leader. The one who plucked them from the rough 
and placed them under your charge. That kind of management is in itself a thing of beauty. I reluctantly bowed. I thank you for your compliments, even if they are not deserved. Yori smiled. By the gods, you are a humble man, Lorianas. My purpose is to serve the king and his house, nothing more. We are the order in the char. And the mop in the filth, he interrupted. I know, Lorianas. I've heard the mantra a thousand times before, but it's so much more than you realize. I guess we shall see, I said. Indeed, he patted my shoulder. I just want you to know I've always had nothing but respect for you. This was strange. I barely knew the man, yet here he was, showering me with praise. Thank you, Yuri. He nodded. No matter the future, I'll always remember what you've done for Sredin, and Deciman as a whole. With that, he nodded and exited the hall. Jaya passed the envoy as he approached me. He looked as confused and shocked as I. Lorianas, he said, bowing. Is everything okay? I don't know, I replied. Something about Yori's words bothered me. Why would the king's envoy compliment me? Most of the upper-class representatives looked down on Lorianas as mere house servants and nothing more. Something more is going on here, I said. I just don't know what yet. Jaya shifted uncomfortably. If you know something I don't, spit it out, son, I said. Jaya glanced over his shoulder before speaking. I've heard whispers that King Ren may seek your services. I laughed. Nonsense. He has Loriana's warden in his service. Besides, what could I offer such a man? More than you know, Loriana's. He stepped closer, his voice but a whisper. Just watch yourself. Something is cooking behind the curtains, if you know what I mean. You're just overreacting, Jaya. My station is perfectly safe here at Sredin. I'm sure you're right, Lorianas, Jaya said. But if it's all the same, I'll keep my ear open for any more whispers. Very well, if it makes you feel better. Footfalls approached behind us. It's Lorianas, Worden, Jaya whispered as he stepped behind me. Proust Worden and a group of masked figures donned completely in black entered the Grand Hall and approached us. I bowed. Loriana's Worden. Worden remained silent. He walked through the maze of tables, scanning each piece of cutlery and linen as Jay and I looked on. When he spotted the glass barrier, though, he tensed. What is this? he asked, his voice muffled by his mask. Triton glass. I replied, molded and fitted by the finest artisans on the metal island. We had four Triton air filters installed as well, all modified to support Strantodin's atmosphere. He approached the wall and ran his gloved hand over its reflective surface. My staff have triple-checked every seal, I said. He turned toward me. Why weren't we notified of this? The king felt it would be a pleasant surprise upon your arrival, I replied. Few surprises are pleasant, he said emotionlessly. I stood confused. I thought the delegation would appreciate the lengths we went through for them. But Loriana's warden seemed anything but satisfied. My people must inspect it prior to the feast, warden said rather bluntly. Your emissary has already checked it three times, I assure you. We ha. I can't accept any assurances from you, Lorianas, he interrupted. I hope you understand. My face reddened. So this was how it would be. I had hoped to be greeted with a modicum of respect from my fellow Lorianas. But it appeared Worden had no such intentions. I'll admit, it bothered me. I had met so few of my brethren over the turns, and I wanted very much to connect with this man. But the war between our kingdoms had been long and the wounds deep. Perhaps there never could be a true bridging of the gap between us. The masked Lorianas looked up at me from a gold charger plate. We will finish our inspection now. My people are already on their way. I clenched my fists. Lorianas' warden should have known better than to question another Lorianas, 
especially in his own castle. Very well, I said. Come, Jaya, we have work to do. I left the Strantodians to their task and marched back into the kitchen. How is everything going? I asked upon as steam enveloped me. The master cook stood at his prep station pounding a piece of venadier. The suckling pigs are ready and stored in the chamber, he replied, wiping his brow. All the other courses are well on their way. I'm just finishing this and then I'll move on to the potatoes and sweet ducks. I nodded. That was good. Everything was coming together exactly as planned. I sat down at my desk and closed my eyes. King Ren seeks my services, I thought. It was completely implausible, yet Jaya had planted the seed of doubt. What if the Strantodian king really did want to poach my services? What if it was part of the peace agreement between him and King Donan? I picked up a small bottle of berry wine and poured myself a glass. It flowed down my throat and warmed my stomach as I gingerly sipped it. Are you well, Lorianas? Upon asked, as he continued to pound the venadier. I finished the glass and sighed. We will see, old friend. We will see. Chapter 15 Rumors The distant bells echoed across the castle signaling evening call. I stood and brushed off my blue tunic and trousers with a shaking hand. I was nervous, and it was throwing me off my routine. Normally, before a great feast, I made the rounds in the kitchen, inspecting every dish prior to it being served. But today we had a visitor in our domain, a silent wraith standing in the corner, who watched our every move. Loriana's warden and his cook's had arrived three calls earlier than expected. They tested each Strantodian dish for poisons and other contaminants. When none were found, they moved on to the wine and water. This is an insult, Opon whispered to me, as one of the Strantodian cooks lifted his mask and sniffed a bottle of uncorked berry wine. More than an insult, I replied. A damn shame. That was a three-hundred-turn old arbor gold he just opened, I hadn't even planned on serving it tonight. The Strantodian cook moved on down the line, lifting his mask so he could take tiny bites of each dish. This was a major break in castle protocol. Only the castle Lorianas was allowed to act as food taster. Rather than create an incident, though, I acquiesced to their demands. I watched Worden standing on the far side of the kitchen like a statue. He had barely spoken a word since his arrival. Even his people seemed oblivious to his presence as they moved about with silent precision, tasting, checking, nudging, wiping. The Strantodians finally finished their inspection and slowly filed out of the kitchen. Loriana's warden held back, staring at a plate of Opon's roasted duckling. Realizing it might be my only chance to speak with him, I approached the Loriana's and said, That is Opon's best dish. Roasted duckling glazed in sugar honey and stuffed with cranberries and Alemanian cheese. Worden looked up at me and extended his hand. My heart alighted, a handshake from a fellow Loriana's. It was a welcome break from protocol. But when I reached out to accept it, the man pushed it aside. Fork, Loriana's, he said. Fork. My ego bruised. I grabbed a clean fork off of a table and handed it to him. The Lorianas plucked a piece of moist duck from the plate, lifted his mask, and bit into it. I watched nervously as he chewed. The ducks were hunted along our southern shores, I said. They feed on the wild bay berries that grow there. That's what gives the meat a tinge of sweetness. He ignored me as he continued to chew. Master Cookapon then marinated the duck for two months in a brandy bath to increase its tanginess. Worden swallowed and turned to me. Give my respects to the cook. And with that, he turned and exited the kitchen. I stood shocked. That was it. I had hoped to at least pick the man's brain and maybe learn a bit more about his people and their strange customs. But just like their kingdom, he too remained walled off from me. Upon approached. What did he say? He whispered. I laughed. Not much. He did tell me to give you his compliments. Upon straightened. Really? I nodded. Well, 
It looks like for once I am the golden boy of Sredin. Don't get too excited, I replied. His king may have different opinions come the feast, upon shrugged. Kings have no taste anyway, but your breed. I'll take a Loriana's compliment over a king's any day. I forced a laugh. Let's just finish the preparations. We can pat each other on the back all we want later. The rest of the afternoon flew by in a wild blur. Every servant was out and about, delivering food or hauling Triton air canisters to every corner of the castle. It was a wild dance of responsibility. Everything and everyone had to fall in place perfectly, or my schedule would be torn to pieces. I stood watch beside my desk, as upon plated a piece of salt denier, one of the few denier fillets that survived the journey to the castle from the southern poles. The ocean fish was an ugly thing, with six sets of gills and tough, brown-spotted scales that were notoriously hard to remove. Upon picked up a ladle and covered it with a black sauce composed of vinegar and sour grapes. To the untrained eye, this might be seen as a sin. However, in Strantodian culture it was considered a delicacy, so we prepared it the same as we would any other meal, leaving the royal kitchens. I would not want to be remembered for this, Opon laughed as he poured the last ladle full onto the fish. Me neither, I replied. Porth Salmar entered the kitchens, a look of concern upon his face. Can I help you? I asked as the man wiped his brow. One of the Triton engines almost failed. My heart lurched. Which chamber? King Wren's he whispered. We caught it in time. But if it had occurred any later, we might have missed it. Upon glanced at me, a concerned look in his eyes. I know, I said to the cook. Upon had warned me about relying on Triton machines. But there were no other alternatives. Where is the king now? I whispered. He's taking a walk in the inner ward. Alone. Alone, I asked. I believe so, Porth replied. I took off my apron and tossed it aside. Upon. The kitchen is yours until I return. The master cook shook his head. Best you just stay here, Lorianas. We have plenty to do before the feast. I can't allow a visiting king to remain unescorted within our walls, I said. It goes against protocol. Whose? Upon asked. Yours or King Donan's? I shot him an angry look. Mine. Very well, then. But I still think you should leave it to the king's guard to watch over him. I fixed myself up and quickly headed off into the castle. My heart was thumping wildly. What if something happened to King Wren while he was alone? A dead Strantodian king in the center of Sredin Castle would surely rain hellfire upon us. I wove through the crowded corridors. Both Desmonian and Strantodian servants were out and about on various chores. As I passed the latter, though, they did little to move from my path. I reached the entrance to the largest of the castle's wards and stepped outside. It was a crisp blue day, the kind that chilled the lungs and prickled nostril hairs. As I entered the grove of great pines, familiar twilight enveloped me like the first whispers of dust. All was quiet now, the hustle and bustle within the castle concealed behind its dense rock walls. A few hundred footfalls to the north, I spotted a lone figure standing before my father's statue. I slowly approached, making sure not to be too quiet. The Strantodian king's personal guard could be hiding anywhere, and I didn't want a sword in the gut for sneaking up on him. King Wren turned toward me as I approached. Loriana's for Lemclain. I halted a dozen footfalls from the statue and bowed. At your service, your majesty. He turned back to the statue. Wardius Clain, the famed Deciman Loriana's. I heard he once prepared a feast for almost three hundred souls, single-handedly. I cleared my throat. It was closer to five hundred, but I dared not contradict him. The masked king turned to me. Were you close with your father? The question caught me off guard. As close as a son can be to the king's personal Lorianas, your majesty. 
he nodded. Service before family. I understand that all too well. He was a good father, though, I said. Taught me almost everything I know. I have no doubt, the king replied. He pointed at the statue. So why does this sit in such a state? I glanced at the bird droppings dripping down my father's forehead. It was to be tended to, but I fear we've been caught up in preparations for your arrival. A sad excuse coming from Aloriana's, don't you think? I swallowed. Indeed it is, your majesty. My apologies. He snapped his finger. Loriana's warden stepped from the shadows and approached us. You've met my Loriana's, I presume? I bowed. I have, your majesty. And what do you think of him? Loriana's warden halted a few footfalls behind his master. I have yet to make a determination, your majesty. But his staff appear to be quite disciplined. That they are, the king said. But there is something lacking. I glanced at Loriana's warden. The man stood rock still, his expression concealed beneath his mask. They lack the elegance of your service, the king went on. The grace and formal decorum that fills every inch of your castle. He gazed up at the sky. There have been days I longed for the blue skies above Sredin, and its white walls, how they always glitter like freshly fallen snow. He approached my father's statue and placed a hand on his bronze sandals. Our home has become so inhospitable these last few turns. A man such as your father would have been invaluable for turning that around. He looked at me and paused. You wish to speak, Laurianus Klein. My heart beat faster. I was the first Dismonian Laurianus to converse with a Strantodian king in over fifty turns. Did you know my father personally, Your Majesty? I asked. He slowly nodded. He visited my court on several occasions with King Friant. May the gods rest his soul. He was a Laurianus of impeccable taste and competence. He wiped pine needles from the statue's bronze sandals and stared up at my father's face. I suppose he never told you about the game of skulls I had with King Friant. Did he? I'm afraid not, your majesty. The king took a seat on the cement bench situated beside the statue. King Friant and I decided to end our rivalry with a simple game. But it was not borders or resources we played for. What I craved was your father's service. This shocked me. I had heard stories of kings playing skulls in order to sort out minor disputes. But I had thought they were simply rumours spread by drunken bards. King Friant wanted to open a safe crossing across the strait. I agreed to the bet in exchange for the service of his Laurianas if I won. However, I did not take into account the Laurianas code. I swallowed. Was I to believe that King Friant of Deciman died playing a game of skulls? The stories claimed he contracted an infection while on a hunt. There were even statues of Friant dressed in his hunting gear while wielding an onyx-tipped spear. Could it be possible that this was all a cover? that my father died alongside his king because of something as trivial as a parlor game. My head swam as I took in the man's words. I, I was not aware of such a wager, your majesty. You wouldn't be, the king replied. No one was privy to it. Loriana's warden remained still and silent in the shadow of my father. Yet I sensed discomfort emanating from his clouded mask. I still feel the wound left by that game, King Wren said. Mind you, the trade routes meant nothing to me. But your father, with his service I could have changed the entire world's view of Strantodin. He snapped his fingers and pointed at the statue. Loriana's warden stepped out from behind him and approached my father. He placed a hand on one of the bronze sandals and closed his eyes. Menwa Tame de Luthior, he breathed. I stepped back, shocked. The patina that covered the statue began to fade, along with the bird droppings and nests. Within seconds, my father's statue looked brand new. By the gods, I breathed. Loriana's warden returned to his master's side. His face glistened with sweat and his hands trembled at his sides. Now that's better, King Wren said. 
I remained silent. Worden had just broken one of our strictest laws. But look at father, I thought. The bronze surface was pristine and glimmered in the afternoon sun. I thank you, Loriana's Worden, I reluctantly said. Worden nodded. King Wren stood and smoothed out his black robe. Wardius was the best of us, a quintessential Dismonian who represented an enormous loss for Retrac Doe. You should be honored to have had such a great father. I am, Your Majesty. Every waking moment of every day, I replied, bowing. Is there anything I can do for you at this time, Your Majesty? The king stared at me. I will survive, Lorianas, as I always have. But thank you. He stepped back onto the cobbled path. I look forward to the feast this evening. And with that, he and Lorianas word and marched back toward the castle. My hands were shaking as I watched them depart. Had my father really died because of a bad bet? My chest weighed heavily and my head spun. I had always thought it an honor to be the son of a Lorianas who took the final walk. But now, enough of this, Philem. You need to get it together, I told myself. Tonight was going to be the most important evening of my life. The last thing I needed was crushing depression dulling my edge. I looked up at my father's bronze face and sighed. If the Strantodian king spoke true, my father's legacy was now permanently stained. As was mine. Pray for me, father, I whispered. For tonight, we dine with wolves. Chapter 16 The Feast the Grand Hall was a strange sight to behold. On the Dismonian side dozens of knights and noblemen sat chattering and laughing. Each of their tables had a grand centerpiece consisting of fire roses and hookla blossoms shipped in fresh from the jungles of Alg. Nestled amongst the priceless flowers were meridium candles, which glowed a deep blue. Above each table hung massive chandeliers, each glowing with the light of over a hundred triton candles, the synthetic wax candles could burn for days on end, thanks to their specially engineered wax, but they permeated the air with a bitter aroma not unlike that of an onion. The Strantodian side stood in stark contrast. The glow bulbs that I procured in the cave bathed each table in an eerie silver hue, but a deep green haze boiled throughout their side of the hall, concealing most of the guests. As for the chandeliers, each had to be outfitted with hundreds of specially made candles shipped in directly from Strantoden. Normal candles needed air to burn, and the toxic smog would have quickly snuffed them out. I stared at the glow bulb's light. There was little movement at the Strantoden tables. If I hadn't known better, I would have thought the room empty. But then a servant came into view bearing a large decanter. He wore no mask and donned the black uniform of Strantoden. As quickly as he appeared, though, he vanished back into the smog. I left the hall and entered the grand kitchen. The sound of chopping knives filled the humid air as sweat instantly beaded across my brow. I want the first course plated in five minutes, I shouted. Yes, Lorianas. The cooks replied, without looking up from their stations. I straightened my tunic and pushed back my grey hair. So far, so good. Opon opened one of the enormous brick ovens and withdrew a tray of fresh bread rolls. How are the guests doing? he asked as he placed the tray on a stone countertop. I shrugged. Their servants are the only ones allowed on that side of the hall, but since nothing has been sent back I suppose they are satisfied. Opon tossed me a roll. It was incredibly soft and hot. I took a bite and swallowed. What do you think? he asked. I added a hint of fresh dill to the mix. Outstanding work, I replied, dabbing my lips with a napkin. Upon nodded. Plate the first course, he shouted over his shoulder. The first course was chilled Neric stew. The key ingredient was the Neric fungus that grew on the northern shores of Decimon. When combined with goat cream and yellow onions, the black, moss-like fungi released a spice not unlike fresh pepper and draba flesh. A powerful flavor favored more for its exorbitant cost than taste. Personally, I thought it tasted like charred hen, but it was not my place to decide the palates of royalty. Several cooks began ladling the chilled soup into crystal bowls. 
When they were done, a line of servants took the trays on their shoulders and made haste into the grand hall. Behind them came a group of black-clad Strantodian servants in masks. The silent processional lined up and took the next round of trays. They would have to exit the kitchen and walk into the outside wing in order to circumvent the glass barrier. Once they reached the other side, they would pass through a special laptane portal that had been erected in the hallway. I watched through the kitchen's single window as the servants fanned out across the great hall. Would be nice if we could communicate with their servants, I said. I feel like a blind captain lost at sea. How am I supposed to run a proper feast like this? It's all well in hand, Lorianas, Upon said. Their people may be silent, but they seem to understand the flow of things in the kitchens. How so? I asked. Their servants move quickly, and quite orderly. In fact, I can't remember the last time our own staff served a first course from kitchen to table in under five minutes. I cocked an eyebrow. That was fast. Very fast. Has Loriana's word and spoken with you at all? Upon shook his head. The scarecrow has stood in the same spot all night. He gestured to a dark corner near the ovens where Loriana's warden stood like a statue, his expressionless mask gazing out across the cooking stations. Might as well go speak with him, Upon said. Perhaps you can pull him from his trance and learn a little bit more about these people. I stared at the Lorianas. Part of me wanted to ignore him, a well-deserved slight considering his rude behavior at our first meeting. But the Lorianas in me had so many questions. What was it like in Strantodin? Was this king a good master or a bastard like the stories said? How did the people live in Strantodin? and what was their culture like? He probably can't speak to me even if he wanted to, I thought. But still, to hell with it, I said. I'll be right back. I left upon to his work and approached the Lorianas. There were fifteen minutes before the second course of steamed lake squid, shipped in fresh from Garfax, needed to be plated and served. That was fifteen minutes for me to learn a lifetime's worth of information about this man's mysterious kingdom. Loriana's warden remained silent at his station as I approached. In a strange way, he reminded me a bit of myself. A silent overseer making sure every detail was executed perfectly. Perhaps we weren't that different after all. Loriana's warden, I said, bowing my head. The faceless mask nodded. Loriana's clane. How can I help you? Well, first, can I get you anything from our larder or wine cellar? I have an amazing berry wine vintage we've aged nearly. I am fine. An uncomfortable silence befell us. I waited for Worden to break it, but as the seconds dragged on I knew it was up to me. May I ask you a few questions, Lorianas? Worden looked at me. That depends on the questions. I've met so few of our order, and would love to hear about your service to the Strantodians. Lorianas Worden stared at me. I caught a glimpse of his eyes beneath his mask, but then the toxic green gases quickly snatched them away. What is Castle Elop really like? I asked. Loriana's warden scanned the room. When he was sure no one was nearby, he spoke in a low voice. Far different than your home, I assure you. How so? We have none of the beauty of Sredin. Elop's walls are made from granite mined in the eastern regions. But turns of exposure to Strantodin's atmosphere have turned them a deep black. Our keep is larger than your own, but the inner walls are aging and crumbling in sections. In fact, entire wings have been abandoned due to lack of materials to repair them. This shocked me. I had always heard Castle Elop was one of the more modern castles on the continent. The atmosphere also prevents torchlight so everything is illuminated by triton candles specially designed for our climate. He pointed to the large fire pit in the center of the kitchen. There are also no fireplaces in Elop. The entire castle is heated by elemental magic. By the gods, that must be expensive, I replied. It costs more than Sredin's weight in gold every turn. How does your treasury afford such a drain? I asked. He hesitated. Perhaps he thought I had been put up to this by one of our spies. I know I would have thought the same had the roles been reversed. 
he cleared his throat. Strantodin is home to some of the world's richest gold veins. Our shores are also home to dantle worms, so we are well funded. My eyes widened. Dantle worms. According to tales, the enormous creatures dwelled in permanent burrows just off the coast of northern Strantodin. Upon their deaths, the beast's jaws remained open, revealing priceless deposits of gold lodged in the folds of their throats. Men then dove down into them with triton mechanisms and harvested the material, an incredibly dangerous venture that only the most desperate men partook in. I did not know this, I said. Can I ask? Have you ever seen one of the worms yourself? No, but I have seen the men who come back from harvesting them. Most are crippled or covered in acid burns. Many more never return. By the gods, I said. I can't even imagine what that's like. Nor would you want to. I cleared my throat. I would love to sit and talk more, Lorianas. Would you join me here for dinner once the feast is over? Plating second course, Upon shouted from his station on the opposite side of the kitchen. Meet me here at the tenth call, Lorianas Worden said. Our masters will be playing a game of skulls at the eleventh call, so we can speak during the break. I nodded excitedly. Of course. Our servants began filing out of the kitchen with the trays balanced on their shoulders. Best return to your station, Lorianas, Worden said. Wouldn't want to throw off our schedule. I nodded very well. Until later, Lorianas. Both kings sat with their tables pressed directly against the glass barrier. It was an odd sight. Normally visiting dignitaries or kings were seated alongside King Donan at a single, elongated table on the southern side of the Grand Hall. But tonight, the two kings were seated face to face like lovers on a date. Special Triton filters had been installed in the glass above each table, allowing their voices to carry through the dense wall. But so far the two kings had barely spoken a word to one another. I turned to a pawn. This is a travesty, I whispered. An awkward travesty. I've been to funerals that were more festive. I wiped my brow. Such feasts were normally times of great celebration, with drunken laughter and chatter filling Sraden's rafters. But tonight, the only sounds permeating the air were the metallic clatter of cutlery and the occasional cough. Best hold the wine back, Opon whispered in my ear. I fear this group might get a bit too rowdy. Normally I would have chuckled at the jest, but everything felt so off. Staring out across the hall, one couldn't help but feel a chill tickled the spine. On the deciman side, blue and silver light twinkled atop the chandeliers, illuminating Sraden's grand hall with celebratory glee. However, the Strantodian side glowed a dark, ominous red, blended with the green smog swirling about the chamber. How is this dinner to work if neither side speaks to the other? I whispered. Opon shrugged. We are servants, Lorianas. That is all we can be expected to be. Leave the entertainment to that fool. He pointed at a portly man dressed in a jester's motley who had just entered the hall. Aloran Wayne, I thought. He had been a fixture here at Sraden since my earliest days as Lorianas. Unfortunately, he was also a notorious Adrena addict prone to physical humor, best left in an outhouse. I pray he is tame tonight, I said. I don't want another incident like last turn during the Alemanian's visit. Opon laughed. Come, Lorianas, you can't tell me you didn't enjoy it. He was referring to the Alemanian delegation, that had feasted with us last winter. The poor sods had come seeking boats and soldiers to aid them with evacuations from their continent. The magical firestorm known as the Breath had arrived for the first time in four hundred turns, and was now burning its way across their fertile lands. Unbeknownst to me, though, the old jester had hidden sulphur sparklers in the centerpieces arranged at each of the Alemanian tables, I can still remember the shock and horror on the delegation's faces as the yellow fire erupted toward the ceiling. The incident had nearly cost us one of our most lucrative trade routes with Alimain. As punishment, the king confined Aloran to his quarters for the better half of a turn without a single bud of Adrena weed. But it didn't appear to be holding him back tonight. I'll admit it. 
I liked the old jester. He was a fool, as befit his station, and he and my father had been good friends. He was also one of the few men in Sredin who could make the king laugh. Just keep an eye on him tonight, I told Upon. My hands are far too full to stifle a war. Upon laughed. I'll never understand that about you, Philem. What? You could have released that old fool from service turns ago, yet you keep him here at Sredin as if he were some window into the past. He was my father's friend, I replied, and I won't deny it. I have a soft spot for him. He was always kind to me when I was a child. Besides, the king loves him. It's your ass, then. I nodded. It always is. A servant, donned in a robe, exited the kitchen and approached me. I've been waiting for you, a familiar voice whispered. My heart skipped. It was Radme disguised in a servant's uniform. I quickly took her aside and hissed. What in the hells are you doing here? She shrugged. You forgot your promise, so I took it upon myself to snatch a peek. I sighed. I knew I had forgotten something. But this is the last thing I need tonight, I thought. I'm sorry, Radme, but if you haven't noticed, I've been a bit busy. Well, now you have more help, she replied, grinning. What can I do? And where is the Strantodin king? I must see him for myself. He's eyeing down King Donan, Opon interjected. The two look like blind lovers on an awkward date. Radme's smile widened, and it looks like it's about to get much more interesting. Look. I turned. Alarun stood in the center of the chamber, a finger held to his plump lips. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. A tale is in order for this momentous night. A tale of bravery and sacrifice written only days before in the sweat of our famed Lorianas. I swallowed. I knew where this was going. While preparing a feast for the ages, most men would tremble and falter but not our Loriana's clane. A quintessential Desmonian, he has risen to the occasion. Hands clapped, but mostly on the Deciman side. My pulse quickened as Aloran climbed onto a minor lord's table. This was getting worse by the second. Behold the light of the silver glow bulb and pay it homage, he shouted, pointing at the Strantodian side of the hall, for it was captured at great risk by Loriana's clane. He pointed to me. He braved the troll-infested caves of the eastern forest in order to retrieve a gift for our newfound Strantodian friends. More applause, this time a scattering on the Strantodian side as well. Aloran took a cup from a lord's hand and raised it above his head. Let us say a toast to the greatest Lorianas on all of Retract Doe. To Lorianas Falinclain, the true host of tonight's festivities. The gathered raised their cups and repeated, To Loriana's Philem Clain. Embarrassed, I quickly bowed and retreated back into the kitchen. Radme waited for me beside one of the ovens, a mischievous grin upon her face. The true host. Is he trying to have his head placed on a spike? I opened my mouth to reply, but someone began clapping behind me. I turned. It was Loriana's warden. Congratulations, he said, but tell us, how did you escape this so-called den of trolls? I froze. Every cook and servant was staring at me. Sheer luck, I suppose, I replied. Steam drifted past the Lorianas as he stepped from the shadows. Whispers have reached me, tales of a man in distress, overrun by feral trolls and praying for salvation. Any of this ring a bell? I straightened. And how would such tales have reached you, Lorianas? I was alone that day. Lorianas' warden began to laugh. Take no offense, Lorianas. I just prefer the truth to a fat man's bluster. He speaks true, I said. He just left out the part where I soiled my pants and passed out. Several servants chuckled behind me. After that, I couldn't tell you what happened, I continued. Perhaps you can fill in the gaps, Lorianas, since you appear to know so much of the tale already. Lorianas' warden's grin suddenly became visible through the mask screen smog. Next time just remember to bring some guards, he said. 
it will make both of our lives much easier. And with that, he exited the kitchen into the grand hall. Opon clapped his hands. All right, all right, let's get back to it, people. We've got the main course plating in ten minutes. The servants quickly returned to their work as steam and shouted orders filled the humid air. Radme approached me and dabbed my sweating forehead with a napkin. What was that all about? I haven't a clue, I said. How could he have known what happened in the cave? Radme shrugged. Why don't you just ask him? He's a wraith. Besides, I already tried speaking with him. I don't think he has much love for me, Lorianas or not. He is an interesting man, she said. I've heard many stories about him over the turns. What kind of stories? I asked. That he was once a charger. A powerful charger who was exiled to the Culver Waste. Why in the gods would the Order allow a charger into our ranks? Let alone a dishonored one, I asked. It goes against the code. Perhaps he was forced into the Order. Is that so hard to believe? What I believe is of no consequence, but you need to forget this man and keep a lower profile. If anyone learns I let the stable master loiter in the kitchens, I'll be strung up in the main ward. Don't be so damn dramatic, Fi, Radme said. Everyone is too busy walking on eggshells to notice me. I hope so, my dear. I really do. Chapter 17 The Main Course Plating the main course in five minutes, I shouted above the kitchen clatter. Aside from Aloran's little performance, the remainder of the third course had been pleasantly calm. All plates left the kitchen on time, and as far I could tell both sides of the hall were satisfied with their meals. Both kings conversed quietly through the glass wall's triton filter, as the rest of the delegation ate in relative silence behind them. However, bitterness was evident in the Dismonian nobles. Most of the men sat glaring at the clouded barrier as they angrily prodded their duck and potatoes. Turns of war and plundering along the coasts had left undeniable scars. As for our Strantodian guests, their disposition remained a mystery. The green gas was far too thick to see through, and not even the glow bulbs were bright enough to completely illuminate their tables. The Dismonian nobles were finishing the third course, a salad of tangerines, lettuce, water nuts, onion, and black truffle shavings in a honey dressing. Soon the plates would be removed, and then it was on to the main course. I shivered as I thought about the suckling pigs. The trays were warming in an oven that had been carried over to the Strentodian side. The Trentadure spice seeped deep into their flesh, making them a danger to anyone not wearing a mask. One mistake over there, and we would have a major incident on our hands. Loriana's warden had returned to the Strantodian side to oversee the final preparations. This relieved me. The man's judgmental presence unnerved me to no end, and I needed to focus on what remained of the feast. So how do you think things are going? Upon asked me, as I stared across the grand hall. We stood outside the kitchen entrance, monitoring the servants as they wove between the tables. I shrugged. Only time will tell. The Strantodian king had pushed aside the first three courses without so much as a glance. At first Upon and I took this as a slight, but then we realized he hadn't eaten because both leaders were too embroiled in their conversation. I watched as the Desmonian nobles tried to listen in on the two kings, but the music on the far side of the hall was far too loud and drowned out almost every other sound. That was my doing. I had given the band an extra hundred coinage to play a touch louder in order to conceal my liege's conversations. The others would just have to mind their own business until the feast was over. A serving boy approached upon and whispered in his ear. The master cook nodded, and the boy quickly vanished back inside the kitchen. What news? I asked. Loriana's warden is preparing to serve the sucking pigs. Is there a problem? He's had his cooks dust them with more trentadure. My boy said the fumes are starting to creep out into the halls. I swallowed. This could be a problem. I'll be right back. Where in the hells are you going? To talk to him. 
if he thinks he can do whatever he likes beneath my roof, he has another thing coming. The hallway outside the grand ballroom was alive with servants scurrying to and fro with dirty plates and cutlery, while others lugged large Triton air canisters to the Strantodian side of the hall. I pulled on my Triton mask and twisted the canister until I heard a deep hiss. Sweet, metallic air immediately flooded my mask, chilling my face. I approached the laptane tarp separating us from the Strantodian side of the castle. As I passed through the foul-smelling shark flesh, I felt as if I was stepping into another world. All of our torches had been extinguished and replaced with Triton Meridium candles. The eerie blue light made it hard to focus my eyes, so I quickly made my way to the Grand Hall's southern entrance. Two Strantodian guards were posted on either side of the entrance. As I approached, their expressionless masks followed me. Please let Loriana's word know Loriana's claim wishes to speak with him, I said. Loriana's warden is busy preparing the main course, one of the guards replied. Come back later. I need to speak with him now. I said, rather curtly. The safety of my staff, as well as King Donan, are at stake here. The guard stared at me through the foggy mask. Finally, he turned to his partner and nodded. Keep him here. I'll be back. I watched as the faceless guard entered the hall and shut the door behind him. The other guard stood staring at me for what felt like an eternity, until the door finally swung open. Loriana's warden stepped into the hall. You need to speak with me. I apologize for pulling you away from your duties, Loriana's warden. But it's come to my attention that you have added more Trentadure spice to the suckling pigs. This is true, he replied. Have you not considered the risk to my staff? I've already received complaints that fumes are filling the western wing. Loriana's warden straightened. I have considered all risks to the castle and its staff, However, your cook did not season the pigs properly. Opontali is the finest master cook I have ever known, I replied. I have full trust in his abilities. Perhaps. But he doesn't understand Strantodian tastes. The way he had prepared the course would have made my people ill. This shocked me. Ill. How? Our immune systems are compromised here. Even with our masks and these ungodly Triton air filters. The Trentadure fortifies our resilience against Desmonian diseases. You should know this, Loriana's claim. I felt my cheeks blush. He was right. I should have known this. But he should have also known to speak with me first, before tampering with Opon's work. I have made sure that any and all seals and barriers are properly functioning, he said. The fumes will dissipate soon, so there is nothing more to worry about. Please just inform me if there are any other changes to the menu, I said. Loriana's warden laughed. It will be my highest priority. And with that, he turned and re-entered the grand hall. The guard sealed the door behind him and took up his position beside his companion. I marched back to the kitchens. That had not gone the way I had expected. I felt like a simple serving boy shamed before the guards. Loriana's warden hadn't even granted me the professional courtesy of calling me Loriana's. Why does this man dislike me so much? I wondered. I had been nothing but respectful since his arrival. Yet he slights me whenever he gets a chance. I tried to push it from my mind as I tore the mask off and marched back to the kitchens. I was angry and hurt. All I ever wanted was to befriend another Loriana's, to trade secrets and talk of our experiences amongst the royals. Not today, though, I thought. So, how did it go? Opon asked, as I collapsed at my desk. Like shit, I replied. Loriana's warden may be one of the greatest Loriana's to graduate from Cilium Dor, but he's a daft fool with no manners. Opon laughed as he sliced an onion in two. He's getting to you. I poured myself a cup of cheap wine, and downed it in one swallow. Easy, Fi, Opon said as he diced the onion. We got a lot of work to do before the night is over. I put the cup down and sighed. All I ever wanted was to befriend another of my kind, to not feel so alone in my craft. Is that too much to ask? Unfortunately, 
You picked the wrong man for that, Opon replied. It would seem so. A bell rang in the distance. A kitchen bell. Why in the hells is the main course bell ringing? I asked. Opon tensed. The ducks still need at least another five minutes, Fi. I suddenly realized what was going on. It's him. He's serving the suckling pigs early. Opon's eyes widened. But the Desmonian course isn't even ready yet. I picked up my mask and stormed out of the kitchen again. Don't do anything rash, Upon shouted after me. I pulled on the mask and slipped back through the laptained tarp. Strantodian servants stood in line outside the kitchen, each bearing a plated suckling pig. What is the meaning of this? I said as I approached the guards. What does it look like? One of the guards said, it looks like a course is being served without the castle Lorianas's consent. The servants began moving off toward the Grand Hall's southern entrance. I demand to speak with Loriana's warden now, I shouted. Demand all you want, the guard said. We have our orders. My hands balled into fists. I am the acting Lorianas of Castle Sredin. Stand aside. The guards ignored me. Very well. I rushed forward, knocking one of the men against the wall as I barreled through the doors. The interior of the kitchen was almost completely dark. Only a few meridium candles flickered atop the ovens and beside the stoves, and not a single fire was lit. Behind me, the guards fumbled for their weapons. Halt! one cried, grabbing my shoulder. I suggest you unhand me, unless you want to deal with King Donan himself. The guard drew his sword and pointed it at my throat. What is the meaning of this? A muffled voice cried from behind us. I turned. Loriana's word and stood a few footfalls to our right, a bottle of wine in hand. My apologies, Loriana's, one of the guards said. This one tried to sneak past us. This is his castle, Loriana's word and shouted. He shouldn't have to sneak anywhere. I shrugged off the guard's hand and approached Worden. What is the meaning of ringing the dinner bell? Worden waved the guards aside. Accept my apologies. They are young and prone to overreacting. Now, how can I help you, Lorianas? You can help me by explaining why the dinner bell was rung. Lorianas Worden cleared his throat. Strantodian royals always dine before their guests. It's our law and custom. But you are our guests in our castle. Do you not see how this looks? He crossed his arms. I see a Lorianas who is crossing a line here. Oh, and what line is that? I asked. He smiled. We accepted your king's invitation with the hopes of retaining a semblance of our culture and decorum during our visit. Perhaps you should have thought about this before questioning our ways of doing things. My blood was boiling. This was my home, my castle and more importantly, my dinner. I am not questioning your kingdom's way of doing things. Only yours. Loriana's word and smile vanished. Trust me when I say all is in order here. Now go back to your little kitchen and see to your own king's needs. It will be better for both of us. My jaw dropped. I have never been spoken to in such a manner, especially by a fellow Loriana's. You will experience many new things amongst us, Loriana's word and said. I suggest you get used to it. And with that, he turned and went back to work. I stood silent, too shocked for words. What in the hells did he mean by that? I wondered as the guards opened the door. I left the kitchen behind and returned to our side of the hall. All of my preconceived notions regarding my brethren had been completely shattered. I entered the kitchen and tossed the laptane mask onto my desk. Radme sat in my chair with a mischievous grin on her face. She still wore her servant's uniform, but anyone with eyes would easily recognize her. Did your fellow classmate tell you what you wanted to hear? She asked. I sat down in the chair opposite her. What did I say about staying back here? It's fine, Opon said. She's keeping out of the way. I don't recall asking you. Radme stood and straightened her uniform. It's okay. Our Lorianus has spoken.
she turned and marched toward the exit. You're going to let her go, Upon said. I sighed. I can't do this now. Then when, fie, she's slipping through your fingers. I am Loriana's, I said. I shall take no wife nor woman. E-H-A, Upon huffed. You know as well as I do that every Loriana since Wellum the Red has taken wives into their home. I am not Wellum, and I won't sully the code. But even as the words left my mouth, my heart ached. I did want her. I did love her. But my Loriana's vows were entrenched in my soul, and I wasn't about to see those traditions blown aside. You're a damn fool then, Fi, Opon said. Perhaps he's right, I thought as I watched Radme vanish into the hall. I had sacrificed many things in exchange for my position. Family, friends, love. But wasn't that the price of standing beside a king? Are we almost ready to serve dinner? I muttered. Upon nodded. Very well. Let's just get through what's left of this night. Dinner was a strange and frustrating affair. The Dismonians were more interested in what we were serving to the Strantodians than the wonderful meals we had prepared for them. I suppose it was the allure of such a deadly meal that was simply too much for the Desmonians to bear. But this caused tension that was neither needed nor planned for. Lorianas. I turned. A young serving boy stood with a plate of uneaten duck in hand. Duke Laurel wishes to eat what the Strantodians are having. Please inform Duke Laurel that if he wishes to keep breathing, he will forget about the Strantodian meal. The boy's eyes widened. I... I can't... Of course you can't, Upon interjected. Lorianus Falem was only joking. Right. I nodded. But I wasn't even paying attention to them. King Donan and King Wren were sitting within inches of the Triton glass, whispering into the filter membrane. What are they talking about? I wondered. What plans were being spun by these two men? The fate of two kingdoms balances on these two men, I mumbled to myself. Opon gestured for the boy to leave. When we were alone again, he shook his head. You know, you really have to watch what you say around these serving boys. I heard Opon's voice but I barely registered his words. I was too mesmerized by this odd meeting of minds playing out before us. Never in all my fifteen turns as Castle Sraden's Lorianas did I ever dare to think peace was possible with the Strantodians. I had heard too many brutal tales of their raiding along our coastline, too many accounts of barbarism and butchery at their hands. But here our two kings sat laughing and conversing like the old friends they were. A hand touched my arm. Lorianus Klain. For fuck's sake, what now? A short, masked figure stood before me. King Wren wishes to convey his thanks for the wonderful meal. I glanced at Upon. The cook shrugged. King Wren also wishes that you attend him and King Donan in the games room after the feast. I swallowed. At the behest of my king, I was already going to be attending. But it was quite humbling for a visiting king to request my presence. Please convey my appreciation for the invitation. I will be joining both men as soon as my duties attended to here. The figure stepped closer and raised his hand. In it, he held a golden cup. A gift from King Wren. To be used tonight, during the games. I hesitantly accepted the cup and nodded. Please convey my thanks. The masked figure bowed and exited the kitchen. Opon sidled up beside me. What in the hells was that all about? I glanced at the cup. It was heavy and covered in a band of red rubies. I haven't a clue. Opon took the cup and held it up to a torch. This is pure gold. And those gems, each one would fetch a king's ransom on the markets. I had no doubt Opon was correct. But why give me such a thing? And why now, while I was still embroiled in my work in the kitchens? A cry rang out in the grand hall. What now? Upon breathed. I ran to the kitchen door. To my horror, a cloud of green smog was spraying out of a small crack at the base of the glass wall. Quick! I cried as I ran toward the barrier. 
bring clay and wet towels. Upon ducked back into the kitchen with several servant boys in tow, the Desmonian nobles fled toward the exit, coughing and gagging as they stumbled through the toxic smog. When they reached the door, though, it was locked. By the gods, I breathed. Someone had sealed us in. I pulled a napkin off of a table and wrapped it around my mouth and nose. I could already feel the toxins burning my throat and lungs. Your Majesty, I cried. The king stood beside his table, a confused expression on his face. You must leave now. Three men of the king's guard took up positions around the king. But as they scanned the chamber, their faces paled. The noblemen and their wives were piled up against the doors, screaming and pounding on the dense, delcium wood. King Donan slammed his fist on the table. You bastard, he yelled as he turned to the glass. But the Strantodian king was already gone. Valem, King Donan cried as the guards ushered him toward the kitchens. I grabbed a cup of wine and soaked several napkins in the priceless fluid. Meanwhile, behind me, Opon and several servant boys rushed into the hall with a large wooden bucket held between them. Each man had a scarf tightly wrapped around their mouth and nose, but I could already see blood staining the fabric. Come on, I cried, waving them toward me. Opon and the servants dropped the bucket at the base of the barrier and began grabbing fistfuls of the brown clay. Into the crack, I yelled. Get in as deep as you can. They smeared the thick clay deep into the fissure as I covered it with wet napkins. I hoped the fabric would bond with the clay, forming a tighter seal. But the crack had become a vast spiderweb extending all the way toward the ceiling. It's not working, Opon cried. I coughed uncontrollably. Blood was staining my own napkin, and my vision was beginning to blur. I looked up. The crack was almost thirteen footfalls high now. It's hopeless, I thought. Go, I shouted at them. Upon glanced at me, coughing. What? Evacuate the kitchen, I shouted. Get everyone you can out of the east wing. What about you? He cried. I can't leave here. If the glass comes down, who knows how long it will be before anyone can return. Forget the damn castle for once, Upon shouted. This is your life. This castle is my life, I replied. Now go. Upon reluctantly did as he was told and ran toward the kitchen. I turned back toward the barrier and continued smearing clay across the crack. But then green gas began erupting above my head. Gods be damned, I cried. I pulled the king's table closer and climbed on top of it. Cups and cutlery crashed onto the ground as I slapped clay over the lengthening crack. When I could reach no further, I fell to my knees. My vision was blurred, and the chamber spun around me like a top. I collapsed atop the table, tipping it over and spilling myself and the king's partially eaten dinner across the floor. The green smog swallowed me into its embrace, burning my lungs and throat. Help! I wheezed. I lay a shoe on the floor, soaked in wine and covered in braised duck. As I gasped my final breaths, I wondered who would fill my position. Jair wasn't ready for the responsibility, and there were no other apprentices present at Sredin. I've failed you, I thought, as I clutched a chair leg. A shadow approached on the opposite side of the room. Moments later, hands curled beneath my armpits and dragged me through the sea of toxic smog. So, this is death, I thought, as I struggled to stay awake. I had always expected something more grand, more poetic. Instead, death's shadow dragged me through the smog like a sack of turnips. Oh well, I thought as I slowly shut my eyes. It would have been a grand feast. Chapter 18 A Skull for Your Sorrow I awoke with a start. Be calm, a familiar voice whispered. I sat up. A single candle burned beside me, illuminating Radme's face. Where am I? I asked. Radme leaned in close, a concerned look on her face. I looked down at my ankle. 
a rusty shackle bound me to a steel eye hook drilled into the floor. Why? I stammered. Radme dabbed my forehead with a cool rag. The feast, Philem. They're holding you responsible for the leak. My heart leapt into my throat. You can't be serious. I'm afraid so. I was covered in sweat-soaked bandages, and almost every inch of my body felt sore. You were burned badly, Radme said. A few more minutes in there, and your lungs would have liquefied. Indignation suddenly replaced my fear. I was the one who tried to stop the bloody leak. I know that. But Duke Lara claims he saw you toss something at it. He's been spreading the rumor for the past two days. I shook my head. This was madness. Why would Lara want to see me hang? I wondered. Did everyone escape? I asked. Radme shook her head. Duke Lara's concubine died, as well as three minor noblemen from Durdam village. By the gods, I thought. It was one thing for a nobleman to die on the battlefield. That alone could cause bitterness to ripple throughout the kingdom for turns. But for a nobleman to be murdered, and on my watch, no less, they would strip me of my Loriana's status. The feast was my responsibility. I was the one who oversaw the installation of the Triton wall and filtration systems. Worst, though, the incident occurred during one of the most important summits in Desmonian history. I'm a dead man, I breathed. Radme continued dabbing my forehead. The king stayed the executioner's blade. For now, my heart sank. Execution. I had tried my best to stop the leak. Was this my reward? The harshest punishment possible? I shook my head. You know I had nothing to do with this. Radme nodded. Of course I know, but that doesn't matter. The Strantodians are furious, and Duke Lara seeks blood. I swung my legs over the side of the threadbare cot. The rusty shackle tugged at my ankle, irritating the burns. If not for King Ren, though, you would already be hanging from the drawbridge. I met Radme's eyes. King Ren. He stood for you. He said if you were harmed, all peace talks would be pulled from the table. That was strange. I had barely spoken with the man, save for that day in the inner ward. Why would he vouch for me, a Desmonian Lorianas? It made no sense. And for my own king to not stand in for me. King Ren wishes to grant you a pardon, Radme said. But on one condition. A pardon, I thought. For what? Saving the lives of countless Desmonian noblemen and their families. He wishes you to be present during his private meeting with King Donan this evening. I shook my head. This is madness. You know that, right? I stood and took a few steps before the chain tugged at my ankle. I've done nothing wrong. And he wishes to pardon me. Radme sighed. I don't pretend to understand the ways of kings. But rumor has it Duke Lara is abandoning negotiations with Strantodin. He's already returned to his stronghold in the south to bury his concubine. But he promised to return with his own headsman. For you, I stared at my surroundings. A single fly-encrusted bucket sat in the corner, fecal matter splashed across the floor and wall. Opposite it, a single cracked bowl sat on the floor its contents covered in white mold and flies. This is where rapists and murderers see their last days, I said, the worst men in Deciman. Am I really one of them now? I returned to the cot and slumped atop its mouldering sheets. Radme placed a hand on my shoulders. She felt warm and dry, the familiar scent of the stables still lingering on her clothes. We'll get through this, Fi. I promise you. I looked into her brown eyes. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever known. Even now, in her latter turns, youthful beauty penetrated the wrinkles on her face. I suddenly wanted nothing more than to kiss her. But even as I leaned in, the Lorianas in me pulled me back. Tell them I will attend the meeting, I said. Radme nodded. They won't let me return, Fi. I took her hand. We'll see each other again. She stood and wiped a tear from her eye. I'm sorry. For all of this, 
I nodded. Go back to your stables. I'll come by when this all passes. She rushed forward and kissed my cheek. I sat silent. My entire world was crashing down. Sadness and fear threatened to overwhelm me at any moment. Yet her kiss was enough to shine hope upon my soul. If a Lorianas won't give, I will take, she whispered in my ear. She pressed her lips to mine. Warmth washed throughout my body. At that moment, I was no longer in the cell. I was home, and Radme was beside me. I had always kept her at arm's length, forbidding myself the one thing that would have completed my life. No longer. I had dreamt of this moment for far too long. The Lorianas in me would have to step aside, if just for this one instance. She began to pull back, so I pressed myself against her, kissing her long and hard, until finally she smiled. Hang in there, she whispered. I won't leave you behind. With that said, she let go of me and knocked on the cell door. I slumped down on my filthy cot, watching as she vanished into the hall. So they think of me as a traitor now, I thought as the guard slammed the door shut. An insurgent who attempted to destroy peace talks with the Strantodians. Why I had been chosen was beyond me. Perhaps it was because I was the least likely candidate for murder. But my king should have known better. Instead, an enemy king staved off the executioner's blade. Everything felt wrong in my aching head. Had someone planned for the wall to fail? Was I the scapegoat being led to the bloody block? I swallowed. Whatever happened next, my status as Sredin's Lorianas was over. What would my father have thought if he were alive? Shame overwhelmed me. I lay back on the cot and shut my eyes. There was nothing else I could do right now. Nothing but sleep and dream of better days. But as a rat scampered across my chest, I knew those better days were long gone. The cell door opened, bathing me in blinding torchlight. I squinted as several figures entered. Loriana's clan, came a familiar voice. As my eyes adjusted to the light, I realized it was Loriana's warden. I nodded. Loriana's. He returned the gesture. My liege has sent me to retrieve you. I tensed. What for? The private sitting between King Donan and my liege, of course. I looked around the cell. You are aware I'm being accused of attempted regicide. Loriana's warden laughed. A blind drubber bird can see your innocence. What fool would sabotage Triton glass and then remain behind to die? Relief washed over me. At least I had one champion. Even if it was Loriana's warden. I had hoped others might realize that as well, I said. But apparently the wheels of justice have been churning quite fast in my absence. My liege has applied the break, Worden replied. Why, though, I don't yet know. I cast him a venomous look. Why do you dislike me so much? The Lorianas unslung a sack and withdrew a folded Strantodian uniform. He extended it to me. Wear this for now. I most certainly will not, I replied. Worden glanced at my filthy blue uniform. You would prefer to go in that instead? Indeed, I would. He stuffed the uniform back in the bag and slung it over his shoulder. Very well. Come then. I stood on trembling legs. I am free to leave here. Loriana's warden nodded. My heart raced. Was this some kind of trick? Had the Strantodians taken over the castle in my absence? I had so many questions and so few answers. Very well, I said, casting caution to the wind. We walked in silence down the outer halls, weaving our way back to the surface world. Everything looked in order, torches flickered at random intervals, and every now and then a Dismonian guard stepped aside as we passed. Worden said nothing to me as we walked. His face remained hidden beneath his foggy mask, and whenever I asked a question I was greeted with silence. We entered the main ward. Wind slammed into my face, chilling my sweat-soaked flesh. Several gawkers watched as we made our way across the grass. I recognized two of them, both lower lords from the southern regions. None acknowledged me as we passed. We entered the keep, 
and walked past the grand hall. The doors had been sealed shut, and masked guards now stood at attention. How many fell ill? I asked as we passed the kitchen. It too was empty and dark, an odd sight in Sredin Castle. When he didn't answer, I bawled my fists. Where are my people? He halted. His majesty awaits you. He pointed up a narrow set of stairs leading to the royal games room. I cast him a suspicious look. You're not coming. He shook his head. Hesitantly, I stepped past him onto the stairs. I had made the trip hundreds of times over the turns, but somehow it felt different today, like I was being marched towards the headsman's axe. I halted at the top of the stairs before a Delsium wood door and smoothed out my wrinkled uniform. Behind me, Loriana's warden stood watch at the base of the stairs, a silent statue in the flickering torchlight. I knocked twice on the door. Enter, came an unfamiliar voice. I pushed the door open and squinted. Hundreds of blue and silver candles flickered within the game room, a blinding wash that hurt my light-starved eyes. Come, Philem, and join us, King Donan said. I entered, wincing as my eyes slowly adjusted to the light. King Donan sat in a plush, velvet chair donned in a red silk robe. A rather informal look, I noted, but considering the events of the last few days it barely surprised me. Sitting opposite him was King Wren. The Strantodian king wore a similar robe, but it was dyed sackcloth black. He wore a new mask covered in gold leafing, and strange marks had been etched into almost every inch of his foggy glass visor. I apologize for the secrecy, King Donan said. After the events of the other night, it has been difficult to meet one-on-one. -on -one. What is going on, Your Majesty? I said rather curtly. I'm told I am being blamed for the accident at the feast. I am truly sorry for them, King Donan said. Some of our people made demands for your life, so I thought it best to confine you to the safety of the dungeons. Safety, I said. The entire castle thinks I was somehow involved with the accident. It was the only way, my friend. I turned to King Wren. He looked paler than usual, and his eyes were bloodshot and sunken. Only way for what? To save you, Lorianas, King Wren replied. I stood shocked. Save me, from what? An angry mob. Duke Lara and the executioner's axe. I had committed no crimes or infractions. I had tried to save these fools, and this was my thanks. A stay of execution. I don't understand. Your Majesty... King Donan sat up, his bones popping and grinding. You have served me for almost fifteen turns, Philim. Loyal service that has outshone even the greatest Lorianasis of the world. But I am dying now, sooner than I had hoped. And your order insists that you abide by the Lorianas' code. It is to be my greatest honor, Your Majesty, I said, smiling. I have waited my whole life to take the final walk with you, as any Lorianas should. I am the mop in the dark, the feathered dust. We know what you are, King Wren interjected, the finest servant in the Nine Kingdoms. That is why I made your king an offer. He leaned forward, his hands clasped together in his lap. We've agreed to settle our dispute the old way. And that is a simple game of skulls, he replied. If your king wins, I withdraw all forces from your borders and cease all raids. If he loses, you will enter into my service. Permanently. My jaw dropped. I turned to the king, but he refused to meet my eyes. Is this true, your majesty? I asked. King Donan averted his eyes to the floor. It was the only way. Only way for what? I asked. For my name to be forever soiled amongst my people. We will see to everything, King Wren said. You will break no rules, this I promise, no shame will sully your name. But it must appear that you had fallen out of favor with your king. But this is my home, I said. Sredin is where I was to be buried. Cold sweat broke out across my body. Besides, you already have Loriana's Worden. What do you need me for? Worden is a fine Loriana's, King Wren replied. 
but he lacks a certain sense of decorum. You, however, will be our shining star. I stood dumbfounded. He was acting like he had already won. You still need to play the game, your majesty. King Ren laughed. Indeed I do. He clapped his hand. Darden Wo entered the chamber with a familiar chest in hand. The boy placed it down on the table and quickly left. Shall we begin, your majesty? King Ren asked. Donan stared at the chest and sighed. This was not the way I wanted it to be, Philem. I hope you know that... He met my eyes for the first time since I arrived. I'm sorry, old friend, but this is the price of peace. I shook my head. My order has abided by this law for hundreds of turns. It is the backbone of our existence, and it will continue to exist, he replied. But without you, my name will be forever soiled, your majesty. King Ren grinned. My, my. You really do take those silly vows seriously, don't you? I straightened to attention and smoothed out my filthy tunic. It is all I have, I replied. Lorianus Philem is right, Gaunius, King Donan said. First you must win. King Wren nodded. Indeed. Let us play and let fate decide the outcome. King Donan gestured toward the box. Would you be so kind, Lorianus? I swallowed as I knelt beside the macabre box and opened its lid. The Strantodian king studied my every move as I removed each skull and placed them on the table. Who will pour? King Ren asked. King Donan looked at me. Would you be so kind, Philem? Hopelessness washed over me, but I had no choice. I withdrew the small vial of scorp blood from its silk-lined depression in the box and carefully removed the cork. I winced. The blood smelled like a rotting venadier carcass. Even the kings covered their noses with scarves as I carried the vial to the skulls. Bear witness, Loriana's warden, the Strantodian king said. Bear witness, Loriana's clane, King Donan said. Warden stepped from the shadows. Your ceremonial cup, Loriana's. He handed me the golden cup Wren had gifted me. How he came into possession of it was anyone's guess, but I no longer cared. I took it from his pale hand and then tipped the scorp blood into the first skull's dented spout. The fluid quickly vanished into the cranium. Next, King Wren said. I moved to the next skull, pouring several swallows worth of blood down the spout before moving on to the last one. The darkness awakens fate, I whispered, remembering the sacred words as I placed the cup into the silk-lined box. Both kings nodded. Let us begin, King Wren said. I nervously stepped back. If one of the kings died, I truly would be complicit in regicide. King Wren picked up the center skull and raised it before him. I choose Dalnian, the god of luck and profit. He lifted his mask and pressed the skull's lower jaw to his chapped lips. As he tilted it back, I caught a glimpse of the black fluid trickling across his tongue. He closed his eyes and swallowed. When nothing happened, he sat back and sighed. Luck favors you today, King Donan said. King Wren nodded as he wiped his lips with the back of his hand. King Donan leaned forward and stared at the remaining two skulls. Do you remember that summer we spent together here as kids? King Wren straightened. How could I ever forget? Donan ran a hand over both skulls. We were a truly devilish pair, raising the hells wherever we went. Wren hesitantly nodded. I always thought of you as my best friend, my confidant and brother. So I asked myself, why did your father blame me for what happened? I watched King Wren closely. His expression may have been concealed beneath that clouded mask, but I sensed sadness emanating from within. He was a king, Wren replied. It is our nature to blame others for our shortcomings. His was that he was a pederast who happened to yearn for another king's son. I grew tense. I had never heard this story before. The rumors said King Wren's father fell ill during a visit and had to return to Strantodin. 
soon after he died from a strange illness, which was then blamed on Desmonian assassins. But to hear the truth from Wren's own lips, it sent chills down my spine. King Donan shifted uneasily in his chair. I was not the one who turned him in, you know. The acting Lorianus had witnessed his behavior and reported it to the king. I never said it was you, King Wren replied. Then why did you never return? If you knew the truth, we could have ended it all. Countless lives saved from slaughter on the battlefields. Perhaps, Wren replied. But they told me your father was the reason he died. Murder, they said. An honorable death in Strantodin. But if the truth came to light, that he killed himself in his own privy, my crown would have been forfeit, and Strantodin would have torn itself to pieces. King Donan lifted up a skull and pressed it to his lips. Fluid tickled into his mouth and down his chin. But as he sat back, nothing happened. King Wren stared at the remaining skull. Father was a monster, there was no denying that. But he was still my father, and I would do anything to protect our family name. Even if it meant sparking the battle at Shadow Cove. Donan sighed. Such a damn waste. Wren nodded. What was it? A thousand souls lost in two calls. Three thousand, Donan replied. You had but to leave our shores and I would have granted you the parcels of wood and wheat you sought. Wren laughed. It wasn't wood and wheat we wanted. It was blood for the murder of a king. My blood began to boil. I was bound to silence, but my thoughts were of rage and violence. I had lost family members at the Battle of Shadow Cove, both my aunt and uncle, as well as several cousins who were sailors in the naval fleet. It was one of the costliest battles ever fought between our two kingdoms, and all for a goddamn lie, I thought. King Donan tapped the remaining skull. So all these turns, all this blood, was for a lie? Wren nodded. That was the difference between us. You were raised amongst honorable men. I was raised amongst devils. He lifted the skull to his lips. May those same devils now chase us through the fires of hell. He took a sip. When he was done, he frowned. You challenged me with empty skulls. I'm not one for welcoming guests into my home, only to watch them die, my king replied. No matter what lies your people have spun about me. Wren shook his head. You disgrace us both now. Donan sighed. I've had more than my fill of death these last few turns. I won't welcome it into my home. Not any more. Wren snapped his fingers. Moments later, Loriana's warden entered with a new chest in hand. We play the right way, or we don't play at all. Donan shook his head. Enough with these childish games, Galnius. You know what I seek. Let's be done with this nonsense. Wren glanced at Loriana's warden. Do you think he can survive? To my surprise, Worden looked at me and shrugged. Remains to be seen, but he is quite competent. Donan met my eyes. His face was a mask of sadness and regret. I'm sorry for Lem. You have served better than any soul on Retrac Deor. You are the greatest Lorianas to ever walk our halls. But it's time you moved on. Lorianas Worden placed the box on the table and opened its lid. Three gold-plated skulls sat within. Daruth, Mintra, and the Devil's Scorn, Loriana's warden said, a hint of pride in his muffled voice. We obtained them at great cost, King Wren said. It was hard enough just locating them. Killing them took nearly a hundred souls. I swallowed. The three men he was referring to were the leaders of a shark rider clan that had haunted our waters for turns. After the Battle of Shadow Cove, they went silent, vanishing without a trace. But now we know their fate, I thought. One last game, King Wren said, removing the center skull. A proper game. King Donan accepted the skull and waited as Loriana's warden poured scorp blood into the gold spout. Do you ever miss our friendship? He asked King Wren. The Strantodian king perked up in his chair. He stared at Donan for a time before finally replying, The loss of it is my greatest regret. So why were we never able to make amends? 
King Ren sighed. We are different breeds, he replied, with different needs. I grew to want the world, while you were happy with your little kingdom. We could have had both, King Donan replied. We could have ended the lies and repaired the rift between our two kingdoms. King Ren shook his head. The world needs adversaries. Without enemies, what is the prime motivator for the people? I tensed as King Donan stared at the skull. I suppose it doesn't matter anymore, does it? He said. Either way, my time is almost up. He looked at me, his eyes sad yet hopeful. You deserve better, Falem. I know that now. But one lie leads to another, and now the butcher has called in his coinage. He raised the skull to his lips and drank. King Ren sat forward in his chair as Donan swallowed. Your Majesty, I said. King Donan opened his eyes. May your life be filled with grand adventures, Lorianus, grander than anything I could have offered you here. Blood trickled from his nose, and the whites of his eyes began to turn a deep red. By King. The king convulsed violently, knocking over the table with his leg. All three skulls tumbled onto the ground, their macabre grins glittering in the torchlight, as scorp blood splattered across the marble floor. I turned to King Wren. What is happening? The Strantodian king remained calm, his gaze fixed on his dying friend. This was the way he chose. I turned back to Donan and lifted his head. Blood continued to gush from his every orifice, staining his robe and pooling on the floor. I'll call the healer, I said. Donan opened his mouth and cracked a bloody grin. Leave here, he gasped. I free you from your service, Lorianas. I looked at the other two men. Get help, fools. This was as much for you as it was for me, Lorianas. King Donan breathed. Be glad. Now your service can go on. It was madness. My king needed help, and these fools sat about like it was some kind of game. I got on my knees and leaned over him. Tell me what to do and I'll do it, your majesty. Just let me help you. King Donan met my eyes. Go with him, he breathed. End this feud of lies, for me, and the kingdom. With that said, he slumped in my arms and shut his eyes for the last time. I sat trembling as tears dripped down my face. For the first time in turns, I didn't know what to say or do. My king lay dead in my lap, blood oozing from his ears and nose. Everything I knew was being taken away from me. I met the Strantodian's eyes. Is this what you wanted? The king grinned. You are what I wanted, Lorianus Clain. Lorianus Worden approached the chamber door and opened it. Times are changing, Lorianus, King Wren said, and I need men who can help us change alongside them. Donan was a good man and friend, but the fates saw two different paths for us, and now we must tread the ground we've been given. Two Strantodian guards entered the game room and took up positions on either side of the door. Moments later, two Dismonian guards entered. The men froze when they saw King Donan's body. They will think I had a role in this, I thought. The two guards knelt before their king and whispered prayers before taking hold of his arms and legs. The Strantodian guards watched silently as the Desmonians lifted the king's body. I approached the two men and tried to wipe blood from the king's face, but one of the guards threw my hand away. Leave him, the man growled. You've done enough already. I stepped back as they carried him from the chamber. My friend and master was gone. King Wren remained seated, staring at me as the guard's footfalls faded into the distance. Everything had changed in the blink of an eye. The king had wanted this, I saw it in his eyes now. But there was still a kingdom to run. Why abandon everything and everyone just to protect a lie? You're confused, King Wren said. I understand. But it will all make sense. In time, I was about to speak, but Loriana's Worden raised his hand. Please escort Loriana's claim to his chambers. The two Strantodian guards took me by the arms. We leave in the morning, Loriana's Worden said. Bring only what you need and say your goodbyes tonight. I shook my head. 
I'm not going anywhere. King Ren approached me. You are in my service now, Lorianas. That is, if you still abide by your order's rules. He was right. King Donan had essentially commit suicide, freeing me from my oath. But why would he do this to me? And after all I ever did for him. Loriana's word and gestured to the hallway. Come, Clane. There is much to do in the coming days. Chapter 19 Goodbyes. I stared at my feet as the guards marched me back to my quarters. Everything was different now, darker and bereft of life. A deep sadness clung to my soul. I wanted to run, to cry, to scream. My world was over. Sredin's no longer my home, and there was nothing I could do about it. They took me to my quarters and shut the door. I sat on my bed with my face buried in my hands. How did this happen? One minute I had been one of the most revered Lorianas in all of Retract Deor. Now I was a pariah being shipped off to Elop. You failed him, I thought as I stared at the floor. And everyone in Sredin. I slowly looked up at my tiny room. The Strantodian guards had said to take only what I needed. But what did I need now? I had no home or king, and I was ashamed Lorianas confined to my quarters. Everything I had cherished was gone. Everything except Radme and my friends. Someone knocked at the door. I ignored it. But the knocks came harder. For Lem, open the door. It's me. Radme, I thought, my heart alighting. However, when I opened the door, I was greeted by Loriana's warden. What is the meaning of this? I asked. I knew you would open the door for no other, warden said as he pushed past me. The man had used a voice charm, yet another major infraction against the Loriana's code. I slammed the door shut and approached him. Do you know how many laws you just broke with that little stunt? Loriana's warden huffed. And who is coming to shackle me? You. I could send a raven to Cilium Door, I said, as well as the Isle. If the Chargers knew Alorianas was using magic, they would have you in chains by the end of the week. Or worse. Worden laughed. You really need to relax, Clane. There's a whole world out there, one where men like us have no codes or rules to abide by. Just possibilities. I have no interest in whatever you are offering, Lorianas. Worden sighed. I am not offering anything. If it were up to me, I would sooner leave you here to deal with the headsman's axe. But, alas, my king has taken a peculiar liking to you. He approached me. I could hear his mask hissing and popping as the strange triton filters pumped poison into his lungs. You don't need to feel this way, though, he said. Strantodin is not the horrific land your leaders would have you think. A land where you need a mask just to walk outside. I spat, a land where its king gladly fuels a war to protect his dead father's name, and where reavers are allowed to plague the coastal lands, murdering countless innocent people. Worden huffed. We are not perfect, but neither was your glorious king. How many Strantodians died at the Battle of Shadow Cove? When your fleet ambushed my people, how many prisoners were taken? I fell silent. The Battle of Shadow Cove was one of the bloodiest battles ever fought between our two kingdoms. And a dark stain on King Donan's rule, I thought. Hundreds of Strantodian reavers had landed on our shores with the sole mission of pillaging the coastal villages. But Donan had received advance warning of the attack and stationed 5,000 of our soldiers in nine key villages along the coast. 5,000 armored warriors against 400 ragtag, armorless reavers. Six calls, Lorianas he said. Make sure you take care of whatever needs taken care of. You will not be returning. With that said, he exited my chamber and shut the door behind him. I sat silent for a time after. There was nothing I needed here, only Radme. My heart ached. Why had I always kept her at arm's length? For a code. A code that meant nothing anymore. She was the spark in my life the smile that made every day worth living. Yet I never really allowed her into my heart. My stubbornness and loyalty to the Order had formed a barrier I was never able to tear down. 
And now it's too late, I thought. I took one last look at my room and stood. There was nothing for me here. Not anymore. What I needed were friends. And Radme. Six calls, Lorianas, Worden had said. His words echoed through my head. Six calls to say goodbye to a lifetime. I held my head high as I shut my door one last time. If I was to be exiled, I wanted the people of Sredin to remember me as the man I once was, not the failed Lorianas who had watched his king die. The stables were empty. Neither Radme nor her people were anywhere to be found, and the horses normally housed it were all but gone. What in the hells is going on? I wondered as I peeked into the empty stalls. Even the blacksmith's familiar hammering had ceased. It was as if the entire castle had simply shut down. Radme, I shouted. There was no response. I left the stable and moved back inside toward the kitchen. Thankfully it was open again. But a strange silence hung over everything and everyone as I entered. Opon sat in one of the old rickety chairs we kept beside my desk. He looked up from a flask of Algin white and forced a smile. Lorian for Lem, he corrected. I didn't expect to see you here. I sat down opposite him. For a time neither of us said a word. Several cooks diced tomatoes and onions, but I could tell they were trying to listen. I am truly sorry, I finally said. Opon sat back, his hands nervously clutching his wine glass. Is it true? Is what true? I asked. Were you involved in the attack? My heart sank. My friend of over fifteen turns was questioning my integrity. My honor. Why would I ever do such a thing? I asked. Opon stared at me for a few breaths and then nodded. I'm sorry. It's just, well, ever since the feast things have been crazy here. They questioned every one of us. And not politely, mind you. I'm sorry, friend, for everything. But I had no part in this madness, I replied. He poured some of the wine into a clean cup and slid it toward me. Are you going with them like the rumors say? I took the cup and drank down its contents. What choice do I have? I am ashamed Lorianas without a position. My king has died by suicide, forbidding me from following through with the code. Opon poured himself a cup and drank it down. I won't pretend to be sad about you not following through with the code. I'll admit, I always thought it was born of madness, to die simply because one's master has passed. He shook his head. No, I'm glad you won't be following through with it, Philem. I wanted to slam my fist down on the table, to scream at the top of my lungs. It was to be my honor to join King Donan in the hereafter. My destiny. And now it is gone. I was a renegade Lorianas being shipped off to an enemy capital. How anyone could find peace in that was beyond me. But apparently Opon had... It was what I wanted, I said, swallowing back my anger. It was to be my honor. Now my name is forever tarnished. Everyone thinks I tried to kill him. But you will be alive to repair that honor, Opon said, no matter where you are. They could have just as easily executed you for attempted regicide. Then where would your honor be? I opened my mouth to reply, but I found no words. He was right. I could have easily met my end beneath a headsman's axe. Both my name and my father's would have been erased from the doorway. The great book containing the name of every Lorianas to ever graduate from Cilium Door. It would be as if the clan name never existed at all. But to be exiled to Strantodin, I thought. It felt just as bad. You are my friend, Philem, Opon said. I've sweated with you in this kitchen for over fifteen turns. You are the greatest Lorianas to ever grace Sredin's halls. Even if they sent you to the Culver Waste, your name and accomplishments will live on for centuries here. But this is my home. My world, I replied. How can I possibly start anew without you all? And in Strantodin, no less. You are the strongest man I've ever known, Phelem. Do you remember the time we hosted the delegation from Triton ten turns ago? 
I feigned a laugh. How could I ever forget? The mutated Tritonese had been the pickiest eaters we ever served, and the prickliest. In order to please them, both Opon and I spent two days in the kitchen preparing a talatum broil. It was one of the most expensive and complicated dishes I've ever worked on. The talatim cows were the rarest and most sought after sources of meat on retract door. But the meat required a complex amount of seasonings in order to bring out the cherished flavor. It cost nearly 20,000 coinage just to ship one of the beasts to Sredin, Opon said, and laughed. And preparing it nearly broke us over the course of those two wicked days. I replied, But you did it, Philem. You pushed us forward and made it all happen. If not for that little cow, we would never have secured trade routes with the metal city. I poured another glass of wine. You give me too much credit. I only give it where it is deserved. He sat forward, his face suddenly serious. You have been my biggest inspiration here, Lorianas. I sipped the wine and met his eyes. You've been a pillar to all of us, he went on, and you've made Sredin the place it is today. We won't forget that. I won't forget that. I raise the glass. To friends. May we be close even when we are apart. Upon picked up his glass. To you, Felem Klein. My friend and Lorianas. May your travels be forever blessed. I struggled to hold back tears. Upon was my best friend. He was the first face I saw in the kitchens every day. We had spent countless calls together, working, sweating laughing. Without him there was a massive hole in my life, a hole I had no idea how to fill. I will miss you, Upon. The master cook forced a smile. And you as well. Friend. We sat silent, sipping our wine and listening to the familiar clatter of the kitchen. I ran my hand across my desk. It was all that would remain of me once I left. A fleeting echo of all my accomplishments, and turns at Sredin. I picked up an old letter opener and began carving my initials into the ancient wood. When I was done, I wiped away the fresh wood chips and stood, straightening my tunic. I'll send word whenever I can. I know you will, Lorianas, Opon said, tapping the freshly carved initials. In the meantime, I'll keep your desk warm. Radme stood outside in the morning sunlight, her grey hair shimmering like spun silver. A brown destrier stood beside her, saddled and freshly combed. I took a deep breath and approached her. My footfalls crunched atop the frozen grass as the mighty destrier grunted. Have you ever seen a more beautiful morning? Radme whispered without looking at me. I shook my head. And I never will again, I thought. Do you remember where I first met you? She asked. Right here, I replied. She nodded. We were just kids back then. Skinny teenagers with about as much experience in life as old Sheila here. She patted the Destria's side. The horse whinnied, flicking its tail excitedly. I had expected to be stationed at a frontier post or some minor lord's keep, I said. Never did I dare think Sraden would be my first posting. Your father left big shoes to fill, she said. Indeed, he did. Radme pointed toward the edge of the distant forest. Remember when we snuck out there with a skin full of old man Willie's ale? I nodded. I also remember vomiting for three calls straight. Radme smiled. We sure had fun back then, though, didn't we? I looked at her. The morning light revealed whispers of the girl she had once been, smoothing away the many wrinkles that now adorned her beautiful face. How I loved this woman. We did. She met my eyes. Why did you never try to kiss me? There was an awkward moment as I cleared my throat. Finally I gathered my courage and spoke. The code. It was always the code. And look where the code has gotten you, Philem. We stood silent, listening to the morning birds as they piped their gentle calls amongst the willow grass. The sky was already a deep blue filled with the most miraculous clouds I had ever seen. Sredin was giving me one last glorious morning before I rode into the bowels of the hells, and it was bittersweet. Radme took my hand and gently squeezed it. 
my body tingled with warmth. We had never touched this way before, and it was glorious. What if we just rode away from here, she said, right through to the southern coast and onto a boat bound for Aug or Le Viedre. An outlaw Lorianas and jobless stablemaster, I said. It sounds like a bard's song. She turned to me. Tears were trickling down her cheeks. Come with me, Philem. We don't need kings or castles any more. I removed a handkerchief and dabbed the tears from her cheeks. I wanted to go with her. In her eyes I saw a life for myself, one filled with love and adventure. No more schedules. No more cleaning. No more kings and their dangerous games. Just the two of us riding toward a new dawn. But the code was always in the back of my mind. Like a chain, it bound me in place, grounding me in the real world. It was part of my soul. I couldn't break away from that. Not after all the turns of work to get here. She drew closer. We can do it, you know. Right now. We just have to climb on Sheila and leave. I cupped her cheek. Nothing would make me happier. But I can't run from who I am. And who are you, Philem? A servant, or a stepstool? I'm a Lorianas, as was my father and his father before him. It's just another word for a slave, Philem. Her words cut me deep. Was that what I was? Some glorified slave bowing to his master's every whim? No, I told myself. We are the order in the chaos, the mop in the filth, the feather duster wiping cobwebs from the world. We serve not for glory, but for our masters, for order. She pressed her lips to mine. I held her tight as a morning breeze gusted across the plains. Every cell in my body alighted with fire as we embraced. I had wanted this for so many turns, dreamt about it at night as I tossed and turned, but never did I dare risk breaking my code. Until now. Come with me, she pleaded, her voice barely a whisper. I looked out across the plain. The forest stood black and silent in the distance. It was only a week's ride to the southern coast. We could easily make it if we tried. But then I remembered Strantodin. It was my duty to enter into Wren's service, my oath. Nothing could change that not even my love for Radme. I'm sorry, I can't, I breathed. Radme's eyes trembled. You're a fool then, Philem. I leaned in to comfort her, but she pushed me away. Just go, go fulfill your silly oath. I only pray you find whatever it is you're looking for. With that said, she swung herself onto the Destria and sauntered off across the plains. I wiped a tear from my eye as I watched her go. I already regretted everything I had just said and done. For she was right. I had nothing now. Nothing but the code. I stood before my tiny trunk, forlorn and lost. My entire life lay inside, a handful of baubles and memories collected during my time at Sredin. Why hadn't I made more time for myself? All the turns spent at Sredin, and I only had a few happy memories from beyond its walls. And then there was Radme. Just the thought of her sent a blade into my heart. I should have gone with her, I thought. We could have found a way to survive. It would have been hard, but deep down, I knew we could have made a new life for ourselves. But then who would you be, if not a Lorianas? I asked myself. I had no answer. And that was why I chose to go on. I sat down and continued to stare at the trunk. I would miss my friends. Opon Jaya Porth. The list went on and on. They were my family. I loved each and every one of them. I placed a hand on the trunk and closed my eyes. Guide me, Father. Help me make the right decision. I had never prayed before, at least not to my father. It felt strange, pointless even. But I did it anyway. A knock came at the door. I stood and adjusted my blue tunic as a Strantodian soldier entered. It is time, he said, his voice muffled by his mask. Very well. Your baggage? The guard asked. I pointed to the tiny trunk. That is all. What more does a Lorianas need? I said as I stepped past him. 
to my surprise, the servants lined both sides of the outer hall. I saw both old friends and familiar faces I had learned to love and admire over the turns, and they all stood at attention. For me, the Strantodian soldier snapped his fingers. Two more guards appeared and took hold of my trunk. As they carried it away, I began the long walk down the corridor. I kept my head high as I struggled to hide my emotions. But it was all too much. Tears began trickling down my cheek as I watched the many faces of my past drift by. Some smiled, some cried, others stood rigid. I nodded to each man and woman as I walked. They could have ignored me and remained at their posts. I was ashamed Loriana's being relieved of his station. Yet here they were, showing their loyalty and respect to a man who deserved none. Let's hear it for Loriana's Philemclane, Opon shouted. Here, the others cried. Here, here. The entire staff clapped and shouted as I passed. I smiled. If nothing else, I had this moment to keep me warm during the unknown nights ahead. When I reached the end of the hall, I turned and slowly bowed. The servants continued to cheer, their voices echoing throughout every inch of the castle. I have never known a better family, I said. May the gods shine on you all. More cheers as I turned and stepped outside into the inner ward. Loriana's warden stood silent beside a dilapidated wagon. As I approached him, I could still hear the servants cheering behind me. You will be riding in the servant's carriage, Loriana's warden said, as he gestured to a dilapidated carriage. It was empty save for a single cracked leather seat. I turned back to the keep. I had spent the best turns of my life here. Outside of Cilium Door, it was all I really knew. But it is no longer home, I thought. A figure appeared near the keep's entrance. Radme. I met her eyes and bowed. Without a word, she turned and vanished back into the castle. That hurt more than any blade or spell. Hopefully in time she would forgive me, or at least come to understand why I left. But for now, my heart ached. Opon approached me from the west wing entrance. He wore a crisp white tunic and freshly pressed trousers. I smiled. Never had I seen the master cook dressed so well. Opon, I said, wiping a tear from my eye. The master cook bowed. He held a package which he extended to me in his shaking hands, a gift from Sredin to its Lorianas. I accepted the package and shook his calloused hand. You will always be in my thoughts, old friend. He forced a smile. As will you. I sniffled as I tried not to cry. Take care of my desk. Make sure the new Lorianas doesn't just toss it. Opon laughed. Perhaps they'll have a similar desk in Castle Elop's kitchen. We can drink together there. In spirit, anyway. I nodded. I'd like that, old friend. He looked at both the carriage and Loriana's warden. Take care of my friend, else I'll be coming for you, Loriana's. Loriana's warden stood silent, his face hidden behind a veil of green smoke. Opon hugged me and then stepped back. Safe travels, friend. I nodded. You as well. I took one last look at Sredin's inner ward and then climbed into the wagon. I wondered how the next Lorianas would handle the new king, whomever he might be. The entire kingdom was now adrift in unknown seas. Soon every duke and lord would be scrambling for the throne. I had no doubt my staff could weather the storm, though. This was our home, our land, like the castle walls themselves. The servants would remain long after our kings and queens passed on, as Loriana's warden shut the carriage door, I sat back and sighed. This was it. My last moments at Sredin. I glanced down at Opon's gift. Normally it was considered uncouth to open a parting gift right after receiving it, but I didn't care. I untied the twine encircling it and tore off the wax paper. It was a wooden box just large enough for a hat. Slowly, I cracked the lid. By the gods, I breathed. A crown sat inside it. A gold crown. 
the king's crown. I looked out the window. In the distance, I spotted a pawn standing beside one of the servant entrances. He met my eyes and nodded just as we passed beneath the portcullis. And then he was gone. I swallowed as I picked up the crown. A note sat at the bottom of the box. It read, It was only fair that the true king of Sredin should have his crown. Just don't squander it, Lorianus. I looked out the window. For an instant, I thought I saw Radmay following behind us atop her destria, but then green smog spilled forth from the Triton filters and swept my homeworld away. Chapter 20 Flight of the King Killer The ride was long and lonely. I tried to sleep, but whenever I shut my eyes Radmay's heartbroken face appeared before me. I sat up and stared out the window. We were passing Lake Yelb. It was a beautiful body of water with a large marble statue of Ovius, the god of prosperity, perched at its northernmost end. I still remember the day I commissioned Halidon Stroke, the famed Alemanian artist, to sculpt it. He had been staying at Sredin while completing a portrait of the king and agreed to the commission as long as I personally attended to him during his stay. I closed my eyes until we had passed the lake. It was too hard to look upon. Decimon was no longer my home, and I had to start realizing that Within a call we entered the great forest. Its dense canopy blocked out much of the sun, allowing only patches of dappled light to waver over the twilight realm below. I stared through the maze of pine stalks and brush. What awaited me in the coming days? Would Castle Elop ever become my home? I squeezed the box and sighed. There were too many questions, too many possibilities. Every now and again green smoke wafted past the window. I could hear the Triton air filters hissing and popping atop the carriage ahead of us, an unnatural din that echoed rhythmically throughout the forest. I sighed. It was a whisper of things to come. For soon I would be bound beneath a Triton mask as I wandered the gloomy halls of a toxic castle. Distant thunder rumbled somewhere to the west. I stared up through the pines, but the sky was clear and blue. The thunder grew louder and closer. I scanned the eastern side of the forest. Something was moving amongst the pines. And fast. On guard, someone cried. The carriage picked up speed, jolting me backward into my seat. The thunder suddenly grew louder and more rhythmic. As we picked up speed, it took on a different sound altogether. Hooves. A meshwork of bars suddenly flipped down over the carriage windows. I shouted at the driver, but my voice was drowned out by the approaching din. What in the hells is going on? I thought. Were we under attack? As if to answer, an arrow whipped past the carriage, vanishing into the forest. Another quickly followed, slamming into the front of the carriage. Two arms, a muffled voice shouted. The carriage dipped and jolted as its wheels ran over potholes and debris littering the road. I squinted as a blur of trees and foliage whipped past the window. I could see the approaching riders now. They bore Dismonian colours, the red and white of House Tankrel, the orange and black of House Dart, and the white and green of House Luter. But why in the hells are they attacking us? I wondered. After the king's death, the leaders of all six Dismonian houses had agreed to a ceasefire with Strantodin. It wasn't the peace proposal King Donan had imagined, but it was better than nothing. My only guess was the Desmonian lords were using the king's death as an excuse to exert their power over the kingdom, and what better scapegoats than the Strantodian delegation? But I had been there for his death. I saw the look on King Ren's face when his old friend succumbed to the Barnite parasite. It wasn't the face of a murderer. Quite the opposite, in fact. Ren had looked heartbroken. I watched him wipe tears from his eyes as they carried away my king's body. This was no usurpation of power or assassination plot. It was simply the result of an agreement between two friends. I took a deep, nervous breath. I knew now that the game of skulls had been a cover for Donan's suicide. It was the only outcome that would free me from my Loriana's oath and satisfy the Strantodians. If that were true, though, King Donan had known all along that he would have to trade me to the Strantodians. 
But why would he do such a thing to me? I wondered. Did he think saving my life was what I really wanted? I was more than prepared to follow him into the hereafter. Instead, he damned me to live out my days, sucking on triton air amongst our enemies. Another arrow thudded into the carriage, its steel tip penetrating the door by several inches. I sat back, using the carriage wall as a shield. We were bolting down the road now, and it was all I could do to keep from being thrown to the floor. Protect the king's carriage, someone cried. Several Strantodian riders thundered past us toward the head of the caravan. One of the soldiers was struck in the head by an arrow and tumbled backward off his horse. Another took a bolt in the chest and slumped forward as his horse veered off into the forest. Get down, my driver cried. The Dismonian riders ran parallel to the caravan, losing a barrage of arrows at the carriages. I peeked through the small window located behind my driver. The Strantodian held a large crossbow with over a dozen arrows fitted into a strange, cylindrical drum. A triton crossbow, I thought. The king had outlawed the use of such weapons due to their brutal nature. Apparently the Strantodians had not received the message, though. My driver raised the crossbow and fired. The drum rotated, instantly loading another bolt into the firing trench. He fired again and again, mowing down five riders in as many seconds. The bridge is out, the driver cried. I peered out of the right side window. Smoke drifted through the pine forest as flames danced above the northern treetops. They're herding us, I realized. The Wanderer's Bridge was the only way to enter or leave the forest by road. Without it, the only other option was the Troll Road, a narrow tunnel which cut directly through the impassable Lantern Mountains. But the tunnel had been abandoned over a hundred turns ago after flay trolls began nesting there. A knight donned in the white and green of House Looter galloped alongside my carriage. He glanced at me through the bars and then spurred his horse forward in an attempt to cut off the carriage. My driver dropped his crossbow and pulled back on the reins, steering the carriage off the road and into the pines. Where in the gods are you going? I screamed as the cart jolted and bucked atop the uneven terrain. The rest of the caravan continued down the road as dozens of armored riders gave chase. The lone rider followed us, though, his armor glittering in the dappled light. Here, the driver shouted over his shoulder as he slid the crossbow through the small window. Deal with him. I looked at the brutal mechanism. It was made of solid steel and bristled with dozens of razor-sharp arrows. You're joking, I replied. I'm no soldier. A blind scavenger could fire that thing. Now do it, or we both die. I stared at the cold and lifeless weapon. Fire, damn it, the driver cried. I can't, I shouted. These are my people. The Desmonian rider pressed in close to the left side of the wagon. When he was within arm's reach, he drew an axe from over his shoulder and slammed it into the carriage wall. I fell backward as the soldier jumped from his horse onto the carriage. Kill him, the driver cried. I pressed my face to the bars. The soldier was struggling to cling to his axe as branches whipped against his body. I reached out a hand to help him. But instead of taking it, the rider grabbed the steel bars and pulled himself onto the roof. Defend yourself, Lorianas, the driver cried. If you want to live... Footfalls echoed above me as the Dismonian rider approached the Triton filter. He then began pulling on the device, shifting it back and forth until it finally broke free of its mounting. The soldier hurled the device over the side of the wagon and dropped down into the cart. This is no rescue, I thought, as he climbed onto his feet. The King Killer he hissed. He pulled a small dagger from his belt and lunged at me. I dogged the attack and rolled away to the other side of the carriage. The soldier recovered and met my eyes. Did you think there would be no consequences, servant? Did you think you could just ride into the sunset after killing our king? I picked up the crossbow and aimed it at his chest. What in the hells are you talking about? I stammered as the weapon trembled in my grip. He was my friend. The man glanced at the weapon. 
Come on then, King Killer. Show me what you showed your king. He inched closer. The cart hit another dip, knocking both of us off balance. I quickly recovered, though, and shouldered the heavy crossbow. Try me, boy, I said. I don't want to hurt you, but try me. The man laughed. Ah, there it is, the killer glint in your eye. That's what I needed to see. With that said, he lunged forward. I closed my eyes and pulled the trigger. There was a loud metallic snap, followed by a thud. When I opened my eyes, the soldier was on his knees, clutching a bolt protruding from his left breast. After a few seconds, he collapsed face first onto the floor. I dropped the weapon and sat back. What have I done? The driver leaned back and looked into the wagon. Dump him, he shouted. He pulled a lever and the left side carriage door swung open. Without thinking, I kicked the bloody corpse into the forest and shut the door. Very good, Lorianas, the driver shouted over the horse's thundering hooves. We'll make a Strantodian out of you yet. We ploughed onward through the forest. There was no sign of the other soldiers or the Strantodian caravan. I sat back and tried to calm myself, but my hands wouldn't stop shaking. The trees began to thin as we entered a small swamp. Mud splashed on all sides of the carriage as its wheels ploughed through the sucking mire. After a few hundred footfalls, though, the land sloped upward again, carrying us from the swamp onto a windswept plain. A massive line of mountains stood in the distance, extending east to west across the horizon. The abandoned mountain road, the driver shouted. Guide me to it. I scanned the horizon until I found a recognizable landmark. That copse of trees to the east. It's on the far side. We rode on across the open field until we reached the copse. The driver then brought the wagon to a squeaking halt. The crossbow, he said, pointing at the device. I quickly handed it to him through the open window. He flicked a switch and slung it over his shoulder. Where is the entrance? I opened the wagon door and stepped down. My legs were trembling so badly, though, I lost my balance and fell onto the leaf-covered ground. The driver knelt down, laughing. Quite a ride, eh, old man? I doubt too many Lorian has been through something like that before. Slowly, I crawled onto my feet and wiped dirt from my trousers and tunic. Why were they trying to kill us? The man cocked an eyebrow. Why do you think, King Killer? I shook my head. I played no part in Donan's death. Ask your own king and he'll tell you. The man huffed. I really don't care, Lorianus. My job is not to judge, but to deliver you safely to Elop. The driver was young, probably no more than twenty turns old. His face was bone white, and his mask appeared far larger than the rest of his bald head. He wore black pants and a black, moth-eaten cloak over a ragged black tunic. He checked the crossbow and added several more bolts to the metal drum. This is madness, I said. The lords. Why would they risk breaking the peace agreement? The boy shrugged. Vengeance, I suppose. Or maybe they simply changed their mind. Whatever the case, they seem intent on getting their hands on you. I suddenly felt dizzy. As I knelt down, bile rushed up my throat, and I vomited across the dusty ground. That's it, old man. Get it all out of your system. Don't need to be retching in the tunnel. I caught my breath and wiped my mouth on my sleeve. Nothing made sense anymore. What now? I breathed. Come on, Lorianas. He loaded the crossbow into the front seat and climbed back onto the carriage. We still have a long way to go and the Laxor won't wait forever for us. I froze. Laxor. The boy laughed. That's the least of your worries. He pointed to the base of the mountain, where a large opening yawned in the rock. First we need to get through that. Then you can worry about the fishy. I swallowed. The tunnel was five miles end to end, and that didn't factor in any cave-ins that might have occurred since its abandonment. Not to mention the infestation of trolls, I reminded myself. I climbed aboard the wagon and shut the door. You know what lives in there, right? I said. The boy nodded. I've always wanted to see a troll. 
all of the ones on Strantodon died before the mine fires began. If the gods favor us, your wish will go ungranted. The boy turned to me. Then I pray they don't. He took his seat and snapped the reins above the mares. I shivered as the wagon crept forward. We were on our own now. I just prayed we lived long enough to reach the other side of the mountain. The enormous steel gate that once sealed the tunnel lay on the ground, torn from its massive hinges as if by the hands of the gods. The mares bucked and grunted as we approached it. The tunnel entrance was wide enough for three wagons to ride abreast. Its floor was smooth and undisturbed, but a foul stench blew up from its subterranean throat. The boy lit a torch and tucked it into a sconce beside his seat. Shadows danced wildly across the walls, merging black wraiths that flickered in the torchlight like jubilant ghosts as the daylight faded behind us. So far, there were no signs of a troll hive. Perhaps the creatures had all taken root in the glow bulb caves south of Sredin, I thought. We could only pray. If we encountered a hive on our own, we were dead men. Keep your eyes open, the driver said. We hit trouble. I might need you on the crossbow again. I shook my head. This was madness. Who did he think I was? Some jumped-up warrior. Are you aware of my position at Sredin? I'm aware you have two hands. That's enough to fire a crossbow. My cheeks reddened, but I held my tongue. This was not a time for arguing. How long is this road, anyway? The boy asked. Two miles, I replied. But no one has used it in turns. Trolls might have blockaded the narrower sections. We'll worry about that when it comes time for worrying. We moved deeper into the darkness. Every rock and shadow twisted in the shifting torchlight, making the hackles on my neck stand up. Trolls were masters of hiding in plain sight, their fur a natural camouflage capable of adapting to any environment. Everywhere I looked, I thought I saw one, but thankfully they were nothing but shadows. So why are you so important to the king? The boy asked. I shook my head. Your guess is as good as mine. You know you were the real reason for the peace summit, right? I cocked an eyebrow. Nonsense. Who am I? But a servant to the crown. Yes, but a servant to the wrong crown, he replied. King Wren rarely leaves Castle Elop. If he dragged us all the way across the strait with your name upon his lips, I'd wager you were the cause. I assure you, son, I am but a Loriana's and nothing more. Besides, he has Loriana's warden. Loriana's warden is an old man, he said. As am I? Perhaps, he replied. But warden is also a man of the past. The king is trying to pull us into the future. So why would he want my services? I am a man of sixty-four turns. I'm sure there are far younger Lorianas out there who would be more than happy to serve House Wren. Indeed. But none of them are Philem Klain. I laughed. And what makes me so special? I haven't decided yet, he replied. A cry rang out ahead of us. The boy raised his finger to his lips. We're not alone, he whispered. I'd gathered that much from the scream. Footfalls crunched toward us, clumsy and without rhythm. The boy picked up the crossbow and checked that the metal barrel was full. Get up here. I can't guide us and shoot this at the same time. Are you mad? I said. Either you're a bowman or a dead man. Take your pick, Lorianz. Something thudded against the side of the carriage. I swallowed. What was that? Another thud, followed by several more. Get up here, the boy hissed as a rock whipped past his head. I climbed across the inside of the wagon and clumsily pulled myself up through the window. The boy grabbed my arm and dragged me up onto the driver's seat beside him. Here, he said, thrusting the crossbow into my lap. If anything moves, kill it. My hands trembled as I clutched the Triton device. Even with the torch I could only see a few footfalls ahead of us. A rock hit the carriage, shattering one of the windows. I raised the crossbow to my shoulder and scanned the tunnel walls. I thought I saw a shadow slithering about the inky black. 
but as quickly as it appeared it was gone again. The boy snapped the reins, and we slowly picked up speed. Another scream filled the air, followed by dozens more. It was a ghostly chorus unlike anything I had ever heard before. My eardrums rattled, and my hands shook. A light suddenly appeared ahead of us. We're almost out, I cried. As we rounded a curve, though, my heart sank. It wasn't daylight. The source was glow bulbs. Thousands upon thousands of the strange plants lined the walls and ceiling. And that wasn't all. Piles of bone littered the ground, a graveyard of ancient fur and bone with glow bulbs growing atop it. The boy's eyes widened. What in the hells is this? A large figure dropped down from the ceiling onto the rear of the carriage. I stood and aimed the crossbow in my trembling hands. This was no troll, though. It looked far too human, and its fur was bone white and covered in black spots. Kill it, the boy cried, as he drove the horses into a sprint. The beast stared at me through white eyes, its nostrils swelling as it sniffed the air. I took aim and pulled the trigger. The beast screamed as the bolt punched through its shoulder. It then fell to its knees, whimpering as black blood pulsed across the roof. The carriage smashed through the piles of bone, nearly tossing me to the ground. When I regained my balance, I stared at the beast, transfixed. It was definitely not a troll. In fact, it was nothing I had ever seen or read about. Finish it, the driver yelled. I raised the crossbow again and fired. The creature let out another scream before tumbling off the carriage with a bolt in its forehead. I turned back to the boy. What was that? You tell me, he replied. This is your land. The horses thundered onward. The deeper into the tunnel we rode, the thicker the piles of bone became. I think those are troll bones, I said. It was hard to be sure from atop the wagon, and I wasn't about to get off for a closer look. But clumps of fur lay everywhere, natty, stinking threads intertwined with black bone. This place is death, the boy said, as we pressed on. I couldn't agree more. Human bones lay mixed amongst the carcasses, the gaping skulls screaming silently in the glow bulb's light. How many turns had those strange creatures been nesting here? There were no signs of living trolls, nor were there any footprints visible on the dusty road. It was as if the creature had appeared out of thin air, descending on us from above. Whoa! the boy shouted, pulling back on the reins. A massive pile of bones blocked our way. The boy stood and scanned the area. I kept the crossbow pressed to my shoulder. It was heavy and clumsy, but it helped bolster the false sense of safety I so desperately needed. We should press on, I said, my teeth chattering. And what about the carriage? The boy asked. Just then, another scream echoed down the tunnel. The horses bucked, their eyes wide with terror. The boy withdrew a dagger from his belt and jumped down onto the ground. Where are you going? I hissed. The boy ignored me as he cut the horses free of their harnesses. When he was done, both mares took off into the darkness. I listened for some time as their hooves thundered into the distance. When silence finally returned, though, another scream erupted in the black, followed by the horses braying wildly. I looked at the boy as the ungodly sounds filled the air. Why did you do that? He looked at me through his foggy mask. Better they die free than bound to a carriage. I swallowed, the crossbow trembling in my liver-spotted hands. What was I doing here? I was a Lorianas, a servant. I should have been back at Sredin, resting beside my king in the sunken crypts, not crawling around in some god's forsaken tunnel. Let's go, the boy said. You can't be serious. You have a better plan, Lorianas. I looked at the top of the mound. It touched the ceiling, but there were several areas with enough room to wiggle through to the other side. But what if it's worse on the other side? I thought. There could be an entire pride of those pale nightmares nesting down here. I swallowed. Very well. The boy extended his hand. The weapon. 
I quickly handed it to him. The boy checked that there were still arrows in the drum and slung it over his shoulder. What's your name? I asked, as we began climbing the mound. The boy hesitated. Dario, he replied. Dario Ren. Chapter 21 The Darkness and the Wail Dario Ren, I thought. King Ren's son and successor. But that was implausible. Why would the king risk bringing his heir and son to Dessa? And even if the boy was who he said he was, wouldn't he have rode alongside his father in the royal carriage? And why hadn't he been at the feast? Who are you really? I asked. The boy stared at me. Exactly who I said I am. I shook my head. So the king has his heir and son driving a carriage. You weren't even present at the dinner. No, I wasn't. Do you know why, Lorianas? Enlighten me. I'm his bastard, he replied. I fell silent. Bastard sons were quite normal in Decimon. Countless dukes and lords had them spread out all across the continent. They were treated as family here, with all the rights and privileges due to them. Strantodin was a different story, though. There they were treated as pariahs. More often than not, they were exiled to Sumera, a small island just off Strantodin's eastern coast, and those were the lucky ones. There were countless stories of bastard sons being executed before they could rise to any prominence in society. I can see by your expression you understand what that means, Dario said. He pulled up his right sleeve. A waxen scar in the shape of an X glowed in the torchlight. The mark of a Strantodian bastard, I realized, only this scar had a royal crest burned beneath it. He's telling the truth. The green smoke momentarily thinned beneath the boy's mask. I could see the similarities now. He had the same sunken brown eyes, and just like his father, his face was drawn up in a perpetual sneer. So there it is, Dario said, pulling his sleeve down. Now you know what thousands already know, so can we move on? I bowed, embarrassed. My apologies, your royal highness. Let's just be done with this place. You can apologize all you want when we're back at Elop. We clawed our way up the pile. Bones snapped and shifted beneath our weight. More than once the razor-sharp end of a broken bone pricked my hands and knees. Behind us, the screaming had stopped. The creatures were probably too busy feeding on the poor mares to worry about us. But when they're through, they'll be coming back, I thought. My knees ached and my back burned as I scrambled up the vertical graveyard. It had been turned since I'd had any real exercise, and I was beginning to feel it. The boy moved with ease, though, casting annoyed glances over his shoulder as I struggled to keep up. Come on, old man, he hissed. Those things won't stay away forever. I nodded as I picked up my pace. My heart thundered in my ears, and my lungs burned as if filled with glass. Somehow, though, I pressed onward. The glow bulbs throbbed with light all around us. They had anchored themselves atop the ancient bones, feeding on their calcium and marrow. When we finally reached the top, I pulled a bulb free and raised it above my head. The silver light revealed a three-foot-four-wide crack between the mound and the ceiling. So, this is it. I said. Dario knelt down and thrust his torch into the crack. Appears so. Without another word he began crawling forward. I quickly followed him. It was brutal work, dragging and clawing my body forward atop the sharp bones. The cold ceiling pressed against our backs and white dust filled the air as we pushed the ancient bones from our path. It was a waking nightmare, unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Was I even here? Or was I back in Sredin, fast asleep in my bed? The horror of it all was becoming too much for me to comprehend. But I pressed on, clawing and clamoring a few footfalls behind the bastard prince. After what felt like an eternity, the prince slid down the opposite side of the mound, vanishing from my view. I picked up speed, ignoring the many bloody cuts on my palms. Finally, I reached the far side and slid down beside him, the bastard prince was already on his feet, 
wiping dust and fur from his black tunic and pants. We must hurry. My tank only has a few more calls of air. I crawled onto my feet and wiped my bloody palms across my uniform. Can you see the other end? I asked. The prince raised his torch and stared into the tunnel's black throat. There were no more corpses or bone piles. Instead, the ground was littered with ancient swords and armor. Queren, I realized, shocked. The ancient race who had smithed the weapons predated most of the Nine Kingdoms. Thousands of turns earlier, they had been explorers spread out across most of the world, building societies where only savagery dwelt. Many believed they had built the first outposts on al prior to Nethra's rise. But there had never been a discovery of their presence here on Deciman, at least not until now. Dario picked up an ancient helmet. Dirt trickled out of its eye holes as he examined it. Queren, he said, his eyes wide with excitement. I nodded as I scanned a heap of dented shields. They were covered in layers of dust and moss, but the Queren crests were clearly visible. A draba bird intertwined around a crumbling lighthouse. My pulse quickened. A part of me had always wanted to explore the world, to see the wonders of Retractor for myself. Yet here I now stood, staring at a treasure trove of history, and the only thing I could think of was to run. Troll horde, the prince said, as he sifted through the pile of swords. Looks that way, I replied. But it makes no sense. The prince pulled a sword free and swung it expertly through the air. Satisfied, he tucked it into his belt and grabbed another, shorter sword. Here, he said, tossing it at my feet. I looked down at the ancient thing, unsure what to do. It won't bite, Lurianus, the prince said. I hesitantly picked it up. It was heavy and clumsy in my arthritic grip. But its presence reassured me. Even if I didn't have a clue how to use it, at least I could defend myself if it came down to it. And what a sight that would be, I thought. A sixty-four-turn Loriana swinging a sword about in the dark, like a fool. The prince laughed as he watched me struggle with the weapon. What's so funny? I asked. I never thought I'd live to see the day a Desmonian Lorianas took up arms. We walked for another call, tripping over mounds of rusted weapons and armor. The trolls must have been dwelling here for turns, possibly even before the tunnel was sealed off. That would explain the Queren relics scattered across the ground. If we survived the journey, I would have to send word to Sraden's scholars. Even if I was no longer their Lorianas, I was still their friend, and such a discovery would send them into a frenzy. For little was known of the Queren, and few relics ever saw the light of day. But they don't want you any more, a voice said in the back of my head. They traded you like a bolt of cloth. What in the gods do you owe them? I pushed the bitterness from my soul. King Donan had given me up. The servants and my friends had nothing to do with it. The king would bear my hurt, not the others. I was his Lorianas, and he severed that bond forever. Now I was just another masterless servant. Not masterless, a voice inside me corrected. Strantodina waits. As well as your new master, King Wren? I stared at the prince's back as we walked. Were I a braver man, I would have run from him. There were countless villages in the south where a man could disappear. I could have started over again. A new name, a new life. But what would father think? I thought. I took the oath. I knew the laws. Besides, King Donan had set up the betrayal so nothing could be questioned. I was in the service of another now, whether I liked it or not. And no matter what else happened, I was still a Loriana's. Even if I didn't feel like one any more, Another scream erupted in the distance. The same shrill cry we had heard earlier before the white demons attacked us. The prince froze, his sword drawn. Here we go again. I squeezed the sword's pommel as my heart lurched into my throat. I sensed movement behind us, a frantic scuttling as claws clicked atop the relic-strewn ground. Perhaps I wouldn't live long enough to room my new station. The thought did little to comfort me, though. Get over here, Lorianas, 
the prince hissed. I moved to his side, the sword trembling in my pathetic grip. Something stepped into the torchlight several footfalls before us. But it wasn't one of the white demons. It was a man. He wore clothing that I had only seen in illustrations. A leather vest fashioned in the ancient, Sidrim style, rough-hewn trousers of blue and green, and boots wrought of venadier skin. The anachronistic man stood silent at the edge of the torchlight. His eyes were black as sackcloth, wide and feral. He took a clumsy step forward, his hands raised. I mean no harm, he breathed. His voice sounded strange, as if three people were speaking simultaneously through his mouth. Be ready, the prince said. My body tensed. Who in the hells was this man? And why was he wandering around in this god's forsaken tunnel? Hello, I said, my voice echoing into the distance. The man continued to approach, his wild, black eyes locked on us. I mean no harm, he repeated. Prince Wren took on a fighting stance. That's no man, he whispered. It sure looks like one to me, I replied. It's a Zarent. I glanced at him. From the storybooks, sure looks that way. The man's arms and legs began to tremble as he moved closer. A shapeshifter, I thought. But those were just stories created to frighten children. No one had ever encountered such a creature, at least not on Deciman. The tales claimed they could take on the forms of their victims. If that were true, we were staring at someone who had died long ago. The man's face began to melt like candle wax, but instead of revealing the white demon from earlier, the melting flesh congealed into the visage of a young woman. Please, I mean no harm, help me, she said. Like her voice, her body was twisted and wrong, and her clothes were of an ancient style I had never seen before. Stay where you are, the prince shouted. The woman ignored him. Her black eyes locked onto me as she limped into the torchlight. Her flesh was rough and wrinkled, covered in a fine layer of white hair. Her ears were misshapen, and her fingers were fused together and elongated. Help me! she screamed, her shrill voice piercing my ears. Her face began to slough off onto the floor like a sheet of soft wax, revealing more of the white fur. The creature opened its mouth as if to scream, but there was no sound. Instead, a stream of clear fluid exploded across the floor, sizzling as it touched the ground. The prince jumped back as droplets hit the ground at his feet. Keep back, Lorianas. I'll deal with this. My hands trembled and my legs froze. I had never seen such a horror. I wanted to run and hide, but my muscles wouldn't move. What remained of the woman's flesh and clothing quickly melted away, forming a puddle of green slime at its feet. The white demon then rushed at the prince, its black claws bared. The prince dodged to his right, barely evading its wild attack. The creature recovered and quickly lunged forward again, smashing into the prince's side. The boy fell to the ground, his sword skidding off into the darkness. The creature howled as a liquid-like substance began oozing from its every pore. Within seconds it was covered in a new layer of flesh-like material. My jaw dropped as confusion swept over me. An identical version of Dario now stood over the prince, its flesh dripping and steaming, as clothing materialized across its naked body. The prince pushed himself backward, kicking at the ground as he searched for his blade. What in the hells are you? he shouted. The demon inched closer, a vulpine grin creasing its waxy face. Help me, please, it repeated. It sounded almost identical to Dario, save for the strange octaves intertwined in its voice. In the torchlight, though, its flesh looked fake, as if it was sculpted from wax. The stories. They were all true, I realized. The reality had just been hiding in the tunnel's endless dark, devouring anyone or anything foolish enough to stumble into its path. The man and the woman they had encountered, echoes from the past, their final moments of horror forever possessed by the Zarent. An impulse suddenly overcame me, the need to move, to fight, to live. Like a fool, I raised the sword 
and rushed toward the prince's doppelganger. To my shock, the blade slid through the creature's flesh with ease. Get back, I shouted. More of the clear fluid sprayed from the doppelganger's mouth, coating the sword. I stumbled backward. The false flesh was bubbling and dripping again, forming another brown puddle around its body. But this time, the Zarent collapsed onto its back, steam rising from its soaked fur as a final breath rose from its gaping maw. I took a deep breath and exhaled. My entire body was numb and overwhelmed with adrenaline. I looked at my liver-spotted hands as they trembled like leaves in a breeze. You did well, Lorianas. I glanced at Dario. The boy appeared shaken, but otherwise unharmed. Another scream erupted in the distance, followed by dozens more. My heart sank. One of those nightmares had nearly killed both of us. Now it sounded like an entire pack was approaching. Run, Dario cried. We stumbled through the darkness as Dario's torch snapped wildly in our wake. More troll bones littered the floor, some still covered in fur and mummified flesh. After only a few hundred yards, we were climbing over waist-high piles. What in the hells has been going on in here? Dario cried. The trolls must have formed a hive here, without realizing Zarin dwelt here as well, I shouted. It was the only explanation for all the bodies. Trolls normally only traveled in groups of four, an alpha male and its male child, and two female matrons. I stumbled up another mound of bones. Dario struggled beside me, the torch casting a yellow pallor atop the unnatural Golgotha. Faster, Lorianas! He gasped as he slid down the far side of the mound. Bones rained down on us, an avalanche of death threatening to swallow us into its fleshless embrace. But before I could be buried, Dario dragged me from the pile and pushed me down the tunnel. Oh, unless you want to end up like one of those poor bastards. We ran, a blind flight through the impenetrable dark as claws clicked across the floor behind us. Like a fool, I dared a glance over my shoulder. In the dancing torchlight, I saw a mob running after us. Some were still in their natural form, all spotted white fur and claws. But others had transformed into victims, men, women, children, the elderly. They were all ages and cultures, howling endlessly as they hunted us through the dark. More bones littered the path, but the mounds were finally beginning to thin. In the distance, I saw what I thought was a pinprick of light. Dario noticed it too. Look, the exit, he cried. There was no time to think or celebrate. My lungs were on fire, and my leg muscles felt like porridge. We could only run and pray as adrenaline propelled us into the light. A rock flew past my head, smashing against the tunnel wall. More followed, a hailstorm raining down around us. I put a hand over my head in a pathetic attempt to protect myself. But the rocks kept coming. Dario grabbed a shield off the ground and tossed it to me while running. Protect yourself! I raised the ancient thing over my head and flinched as a massive rock smashed into it. The shield held, though, even as more rocks crashed down on it. The light ahead of us grew brighter, revealing another trash-strewn stretch of tunnel. Ancient wagons and carts lay upturned and rotting, and countless shattered boxes littered the ground. At the end of the tunnel, a massive steel gate towered over us. At its base was what looked like a blockade, for mounds of detritus had been systematically heaped against the ancient steel bars. The screaming grew louder as hundreds of Zarent flooded down the tunnel, morphing in and out of their natural forms. Dario reached the gate and began smashing his shoulder against the archaic bars. Help me, Lorianas, he cried. I slammed into the gate and kicked aside several rotting crates. To my surprise, there was a footfall-wide gap between two of its rusted bars. Here, I cried. Over here. Dario scrambled over the blockade and raised his torch. You first, Lorianas. Go. I got down on all fours and crawled through the opening. The rusted bars scratched my shoulders and back, but I reached the far side easy enough. Dario came next. He was covered in sweat and dirt, 
and his mask was completely fogged with condensation. I grabbed his arms and pulled him free. Several claws reached through the opening, slicing the air mere inches from Dario's back. We scrambled backward with our swords raised, but the creatures stopped at the entrance. Help, their unworldly voices cried. Help us. We both raised our swords. After a few moments, though, the creatures fell silent. One of them leaned down and peered at us through the opening. It had taken on the form of a child, but its black devil eyes betrayed its true nature. Help me, it screamed. It then smiled, before vanishing back into the darkness. Why aren't they following us? I asked, gasping. Dario didn't answer. He had fallen to his knees, wheezing as his air tank hissed and popped. I ran over to him. The green vapors had cleared inside his mask, and I could see his eyes bulging as he clawed at his throat. My tank, he gasped, pointing at his back. Put, put the emergency. A small canister was attached to the large one that fed his mask. I pulled the hose from the main canister and fitted it over the smaller tank's nozzle. With a loud hiss, air rushed into the Triton mask. Is that it? I said, my voice trembling. Dario slowly nodded as he took a deep breath. Moments later, he crawled onto his feet and leaned against a rotten tree stump. We need to keep moving. This tank is only good for two calls. Where in the hells are we going? I asked. To the coast, he replied. We brought several Laxor whales, in case we needed to flee in a hurry. You mean in case the peace talks failed, I said, wiping filth from my face and arms. He nodded. Exactly. I stared at the barrier gate. Whoever had installed it must have known about the Zarent, as well as the trolls. The cold rolled steel was thick enough to hold back an army. But those things were afraid to come out, I thought. Trolls would have pursued us no matter what. I shivered as the image of the Zarent materialized in my mind. What had been a tale was now a reality. How many more nightmares would come to life in the coming days? I feared I would find out soon enough. The far side of the mountain was thick with pines and brush. At one time several villages had existed in the area. But after the tunnel was sealed, trade had been cut off. Now only a few lonely chimneys remained, the houses having long since fallen to ruin. As for the road itself, it was covered in downed trees and tangled brush, making passage for a carriage impossible. Exhausted both physically and mentally, we wandered through the dense forest in silence. It was hard going, and more than once we had to take a break just to catch our breath. Dario withdrew a metallic device from one of his pockets and held it up to the sky. What is that? I asked as the prince squinted at a small eyepiece extending from the device. Triton Compass. It can find our location based on the sun's position in the sky. So where in the hells are we? I asked. He sighed. South of where we need to be. He snapped the device shut and pressed on. Come. We need to reach the coast before nightfall. What happens then? He met my eyes through his mask. I die. We picked up our pace, running whenever we could over the rough terrain. We had taken a westerly route into a mostly uninhabited part of the forest, for we had no idea if we were still being hunted, or if King Ren and his retinue had even escaped. And to make things worse, we were headed toward a laxor whale. The massive beasts normally dwelt in the acid sea, feeding on pods of laptain sharks and jellyfins. Some were used as transportation for those with unsavory business needs, but most were hunted by whalers whose ships scoured the seas for their precious oil and blubber. My stomach turned, as I imagined what it was like to be seated inside one of those titans. It was said most men who travelled inside a laxor's mouth lost their minds in the first few calls. How would I survive such a thing? I had spent most of my life hidden behind Sraden's walls. Adventures like this had never been in the cards. But you have no choice, I thought. And besides, isn't this what you always wanted? Adventure. I swallowed. Wanting something wasn't the same as getting it. 
The reality of our little jaunt was pure terror. Too much was happening too quickly. My life as I had known it had been severed at the throat, and now I was being shipped off to a devil. The forest eventually gave way to open plains dotted with ancient ruins. Before war broke out between Deciman and Strantodin, the entire area had been covered with vast stretches of wheat and barley fields. But then the raids began, and the farmers moved inland, closer to Sredin's protection. Now the fields were overgrown and forgotten. Dario stumbled onward ahead of me. He hadn't spoken a word since leaving the forest. He was trying to conserve his air, but I also sensed growing resentment. For what, though, I did not know. These Strantodians were a complete mystery to me, and soon you'll be living amongst them, I reminded myself. Forever, the sun began to dip toward the horizon. Golden light bathed the plains, a warm, welcoming gloaming that eased my tattered nerves. How much farther to the coast? Dario asked, shattering the silence. I looked at the horizon. Beyond a few small hills I could see a faint sliver of green marking the beginning of the strait. Probably half a call, I replied. If we keep up this pace. Dario nodded. How much air do you have? I asked. Dario glanced at me, a hint of fear in his eyes. Not enough to keep talking to you. We marched in silence as the plains gave way to another forest. This one was populated with Debmar birches and great gnarled oaks, whose limbs extended in every direction. It was brighter than the pine forest, and filled with chirping birds and insects. Normally, this would have been a good thing. But it also meant we were moving closer towards civilization. Dozens of fishing villages lined the coast. And it only takes one person to sound an alarm, I thought. If one of the locals were to spot a masked man roaming the woods, we would quickly find ourselves in trouble. Every now and again we passed the ruins of abandoned villages long since overcome by the forest. The largest we encountered was Room, a forest village that had been burnt to the ground ten turns earlier by the Strantodians. Dario stared at the charred remains as we drifted through it. What happened here? the prince asked. Strantodin is what happened, I replied. The prince fell silent. Perhaps he realized the pointlessness of the fighting and death. I wanted to ask him why his people had targeted innocent villages, but I knew it would be pointless. His kingdom had indoctrinated him since birth, filling his head with countless lies about us. That sword has two edges, though, I realized. How many tales had I heard of Strantodin's cold-hearted butchery? In many ways, our war was more of a war of words than battles, an invisible war that clung to the coastlines of both kingdoms. Raiding parties and pirating made up the bulk of the violence, but every few turns fighting would break out inland, reminding us that a war was still going on. I looked at the charred husk of a farmhouse entangled amongst vines and brush. These poor souls, I thought. The coastal dwellers had borne the brunt of the war while we sat protected in our castles. I felt ashamed. Everything I had deemed important in life felt insignificant compared to the misery these people must have endured. Dario halted behind a massive oak. He peered around it, pointing at something in the distance. A road. But it wasn't empty. At least twelve soldiers on horseback were sitting idle in the center of it, scanning either side. They wore the red and blue colors of House Tame. I shivered. Lord Di Tame was not a man to be trifled with. Over the turns, he had strung up countless raiders and pirates atop his castle battlements. I had even heard rumors that he allowed his archers to use them for practice on more than one occasion. Keep still, I whispered. We want nothing to do with these men. Dario continued to scan the road. His mask hissed and popped threatening to betray us. Thankfully, though, a powerful wind swept through the forest, masking its sound. So now what, Lorianus? he whispered. I thought you had a plan, I replied. This is your land, your people. You know their ways. I met his eyes. Not any more. He shook his head in disgust. 
Why did it have to be Loriana's? Couldn't my father have sent me after a warrior or magic man? At least they would have been useful. I ignored the slight and searched the road for anywhere we might cross. If we moved to the west, we would eventually encounter one of the larger fishing villages. But if we traveled east, we would be moving closer to Dai Tame's land. My hand brushed against my pocket. Something bulged beneath the fabric, so I reached in and withdrew it. It was my old miniature dinner bell, the same one I had rung countless times before to signal the servants that our dinner was ready. I pressed my finger against the clapper to keep it from ringing. What about this? I said. Dario looked at me and huffed. What do you intend to do? Let them know evening tea is ready. A distraction, I replied. He thought about this for a moment and then took the bell from my hand. Very well. To my horror, he hurled the bell toward the eastern side of the road. There was a metallic clink as it hit a tree, followed almost instantly by a shout from one of the soldiers. The mounted men quickly kicked their horses into motion, scanning the eastern section of the forest. Let's go, Dario whispered. He ducked down and headed toward the road. My heart crept into my throat. The soldiers were close enough I could hear them talking now. I blocked out their conversation. The only sounds that mattered were our own footfalls as we crept out of the forest. The entire endeavor only lasted a few seconds, but as I ducked down on the far side of the road behind a fallen tree, it felt as if it had lasted a lifetime. We sat still in the muck and rotten leaves, waiting as the soldiers searched the forest. Finally, they moved far enough away we could no longer hear them. Dario looked at me and laughed. Perhaps you're not as useless as I thought, Loriana's. I ignored him as we moved deeper into the forest. After a few minutes, distant waves echoed through the trees. I should have been relieved, but the sound only reminded me how close I was to leaving behind everything I had ever known and loved. You're a Loriana's. You go where your master deems fit, a voice said in the back of my head. Stop complaining and man up. For the sake of the gods, the strait was now visible through the forest. We were on the edge of a volcanic beach, its black sands heaped into massive dunes. Beyond them, enormous waves crashed against the jagged coastline, a thunderous din that echoed far across the land. Well, this is it, I said. Where's this beast of yours? The Laxor will be waiting offshore for a signal, Daria replied. He coughed, tugging at his shirt collar. His air tank made a strange grinding sound. Are you well? I asked. The prince shook his head. My air, it's almost gone. Without another word, he stepped onto the black sand. I waited amongst the trees as he approached the water's edge and withdrew a small metallic cylinder from one of his pockets. Dario then twisted off the lid and tossed it into the sea. I waited for what felt like an eternity, as the prince stood exposed before the sea. Looks like we're swimming, I whispered to myself when nothing happened. Suddenly, a massive plume of water exploded into the air several hundred footfalls away from Dario. My heart stopped as an enormous brown back snaked through the surface of the sea and breached. By the gods, the Laxor's glistening body hung in the air for a heartbeat an undulating mass of barnacle-covered blubber. It then exploded back beneath the surface with a thunderous din. It's a damn devil, I thought, as my mouth went dry. The creature's flesh was brown and covered in scar tissue, and it had an elongated neck and four massive flippers. It was easily the largest creature I had ever seen, stretching the length of at least ten carriages. I suddenly forgot about the soldiers hunting us. What were they compared to this devilish titan? And we are supposed to travel inside it, I thought, as the beast thrust its head onto the beach. Its enormous neck allowed it to keep its body in the deeper water while its head rested on the black sand. Its head was reptilian in nature, and it had massive yellow eyes and a mouth filled with hundreds of enormous chipped fangs. Dario turned to me and gestured for me to follow. I scrambled across the shifting sands, 
The creature was only a few dozen footfalls away, but I could already smell its foul, rotten meat breath. Dario picked up a large stick and approached the creature's maw. To my horror, he jabbed it between its fangs until the beast slowly opened its mouth. Come on, Lorianus, he said. We don't have much time. I stepped into the beast's shadow. My body trembled as horror gripped my soul. The enormous whale's rubbery flesh was covered in huge waxen scars, and several harpoons jutted from its battered hide. Do we really have to go in that? I asked, my voice cracking like a child's. You could swim to Strandtoten, he replied, but I don't think they taught you that at Cilium Dor... The laxor's fangs stretched a footfall above my head and were as wide as my body. Pieces of decaying fish lay wedged between some of the teeth, giving off an ungodly stink. What was in that tube you tossed? I asked as I followed him inside the gaping maw. Fermented laptane blood, he replied. They can smell it from a hundred miles away. He moved to the side of the beast's mouth, stepping over its enormous tongue as if it were a simple pile of hay. He reached down and withdrew a satchel that had been wedged between its gums. Here, he said, tossing me the sack. Put on the mask and screw in the breather tank. I opened the bag. An orange triton mask lay crumpled at the bottom. It had a glass viewport stitched into it, as well as a metallic filter with threading for a tank. Dario stared at me as I rolled the mask over in my hands. It won't bite, Lorianas. I pulled the slimy thing over my head and instantly regretted it. A foul-smelling oil coated the inside of the shark flesh, making my own flesh crawl as I tugged it into position. When it was situated, I reached into the bag and took out the metallic cylinder. It had threading on one end and crude welds on the other. I placed it into the metallic filter and twisted it into place. There was a loud hiss, followed by a rush of sweet metallic air. I closed my eyes and took a breath. It tasted awful, like blood and sugar mixed with rotten fish. Dario nodded when it was done. Take a seat between its tongue and gums. They'll brace you during the journey. What about you? I said, as he withdrew a pole from the folds of its gums. The prince was still wearing the same mask and tank he'd had on since the forest. If the currents are with us, we'll reach Strantodin's shores in under two calls. Again, my heart stopped. Two calls. How will you breathe? I won't. But it's my duty to get you to Elob. If I fail, my name will be erased from the Ren genealogy. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. He would rather die than risk being removed from the family histories. That's madness, I said. He looked at me and smiled. No, that's Strantodine. I sat dumbfounded as Dario raised the pole and prodded the back of the laxor's throat. The whale grunted, followed by a muffled roar as its jaws slowly shut. You'll at least have a story to tell, Lorianas. I took a deep breath as the beach shrunk between the laxor's massive fangs. I would indeed have a story to tell, but to whom was anyone's guess? Chapter 22 A Road Less Travelled I sat silent in the fleshy pocket, submerged up to my chest in mucus. Every now and again the beast's tongue pulsated against me, threatening to crush my body like a grape. Thankfully it must have sensed my presence, though, for whenever I screamed, it relaxed its muscles. Dario had withdrawn a tiny lantern from the satchel that was hidden in the beast's gum. Now it swayed to and fro from a tiny hook that had been pierced through the roof of the whale's mouth. I stared at the wavering flame. It was our only source of light, and a reminder that I was still alive. Dario sat on the opposite side of the beast's tongue, wedged beside its gums just like me. Ever since the beast shut its jaws, he had been silent. At first I thought he was angry about having to babysit a Loriana's, but every now and then I heard his mask pop loudly as the air tank began to empty. Do you have another? I asked shattering the silence. Another what? He breathed. Air tank. He shook his head. The one they left for me was no good. I sighed. The prince looked bad. 
his eyes were sunken in black pockets, and what I could see of his face was drenched in sweat. I began unscrewing my tank, but he shook his head. Won't work. It's not the right mixture, he said. But thank you. I scanned the inside of the moor. It was large enough to hold a modest-sized house. Stringers of drool dripped from its upper gums, and every now and then a deafening grunt belched up from its sphincter-like throat. I tried to stretch my legs, but whenever I moved the creature groaned. How much longer? I asked. The prince shrugged. A call. Maybe two. It all depends on the currents. And Japrix. Japrix. That's the beast's name, he replied. He sounded annoyed, as if I should have known that piece of information. She's one of the last deep runners. Our wranglers think she's over a thousand turns old, but no one really knows for sure. This shocked me. I had heard accounts of Laxors being old. But a thousand turns, that was older than Sredin Castle. It was hard to imagine these giant titans swimming about the sea prior to it being poisoned by the Meridium War. It must have needed tons of food daily just to sustain itself, and that was before the sea became a graveyard. Now the only other living things in it were laptane sharks and jellyfins, both of which had been deliberately modified and bred for the war. For a time we sat silent. The swaying lantern cast strange shadows across the drool-soaked mouth. Every now and then I noticed Dario coughing or tugging on his air tank. I wanted to share my air with him, but the Triton air was as deadly to him as Strantodian air was to me. When I could take it no more, I stood and let the mucus cascade down my torn clothing. The beast groaned, but was otherwise still as it carried us through the unknown depths. Daria watched as I stumbled across the tongue. I moved to the massive teeth that stood clenched before us. Part of a harpoon jutted from its gums. The metal shaft was covered in rust and decay, and the gums appeared to have grown over the lower section. Dario coughed again, a wheezing, dry cough that filled the whale's mouth. He then fumbled with the air tank, twisting and untwisting the canister. Can I help? I asked. He shook his head. Not unless you have another canister in your pocket. I scanned the fleshy folds lining the inside of the beast's mouth. Are you sure there are no more here? I asked. He shook his head. The whale was an emergency contingency left here for myself, and one other in case things went bad. He pointed at my tank. These things are priceless, probably worth over a thousand coinage each. They would not have wasted a third on us, especially considering my condition. Your condition? I asked. I was not born on Strantodin. What you saw was just normal air, infused with low-level toxins. I'm more like you than any Strantodin, but appearances are more important. It wouldn't do for the entire kingdom to know I was both a bastard and a freak. But you're the prince, I said. He laughed. You have a lot to learn about Strantodin, Laurianas. I was about to sit down again. But Dario suddenly leaned forward, gasping. By the gods, he's going to suffocate, I thought. He may have been my enemy, but he was also a human being. I couldn't just sit and watch him die. He was the heir to the Strantodin throne. That meant I was now bound to protect him. I scrambled to the side of the beast's mouth closest to where I was sitting. Without thinking, I reached into one of the many slimy folds lining its mouth. There was nothing, so I tried another, and then another. I was about to give up, when finally my fingers slammed into something hard and cold. I quickly grabbed the object and pulled it free. To my relief, it was another air tank. Someone thinks you're worth it, I shouted. But the prince didn't reply. I moved to his side and unscrewed his empty tank. But before I installed the new one, my own air tank began hissing. I banged the metallic filter, hoping it was just a clog but it did no good. Within seconds, I began to feel lightheaded and dizzy. I'm out of air too, I realized. That meant we had one tank to share between us. I glanced at the unconscious prince. I could have easily kept the tank for myself, but it wasn't in my nature to watch a fellow man die before my eyes. 
especially one whose father was now my master. He also said it was infused with trace amounts of Strantodian air. If that was true, it was more likely to kill me than save me. I grabbed the prince and began screwing the tank in. There was a rush of air, followed by a dull pop. Moments later, the prince opened his eyes and slowly sat up. What did you do? He breathed. I found it in one of the folds, I replied. He looked at the tank as he inhaled the precious air. You could have let me die, Lorianas. Most would have. Why didn't you? I opened my mouth to reply, but suddenly everything began to spin. I fell to my knees, gasping for air. I was about to tear off my mask, but the prince grabbed my hand. You do that, and you're dead, he shouted. Here! He unscrewed the tank and quickly inserted it into my mask. A familiar rush of sweet metallic air flooded my lungs. Within seconds, the world stopped spinning and my vision cleared. I knelt down, gasping. Thank you, I breathed. He nodded. We'll have to share it for the rest of the journey. I laughed. What's so funny? I met his eyes. Who would have thought a Desmonian and a Strantodian would be sharing the same breath? I don't plan on taking warm baths with you, Lorianus, so let's not make this more than it is. I sat down beside him, awaiting my turn with the canister. For the next few calls we swapped the tank between us, sucking at the precious air. To my relief, the air had no negative effects. Even the prince seemed surprised after a call of swapping. Perhaps there's some Strantodian in you yet, Lorianas, he said. I didn't reply. I was too focused on my breathing. We needed to conserve the air if we were to reach his homeland. Time will tell, though, I thought, as I listened to the whale's heartbeat. The gods willing, we would arrive on Strantodian shores soon enough. Once there, we would learn the fate of our two kingdoms. And myself, I thought, as I stared at the swaying lantern. The calls came and went, and still the beast swam on. I stared at the air tank as Dario took a few breaths. It wouldn't last much longer, not with both of us using it. He handed it back to me, and I quickly screwed it into place. It felt lighter, and when I twisted it into my mask's filter, there was only the slightest hiss. The beast grunted, a thunderous din that shook my organs and bones. I looked at Dario. The prince shrugged. She's tired. Can't say I blame her. My head ached, and I felt dizzy again. We were having to swap the tank much more frequently now. Soon, it would be completely empty, and then we're both dead. Something brushed against the whale's underbelly. The beast let out another groan, and then came to an abrupt stop. What's going on? I asked. But the prince lay silent atop the tongue. I crawled beside him and rolled him over. His eyes were closed and his lips were purple. Wake up, I shouted. I unscrewed the tank from my mask and connected it to his, but nothing happened. The air canister was empty. Suddenly the laxor's jaws began to open. We were on some kind of beach. It was night time, and like the volcanic beach on Deciman, the sand was as black as the sky. I knelt down beside the prince. Wake up, your grace. He didn't move. Without thinking, I pulled off his mask. Blood trickled from one of his nostrils and his lips were a deep blue. Come on, your grace. We must go. I shook his shoulder, but he remained unconscious. Fearing the beast would swallow us, I dragged the prince onto the beach. We fell clumsily onto the sand, the prince's weight crushing the air from my lungs. As I lay gasping beneath him, the laxor slowly closed its jaws and slithered back into the sea. I sat up and took in our surroundings. The moons were full, bathing the beach in their silver light. A breeze rolled in off the sea, warm and acrid. I had no idea where we were, or if we were even on Strantodin. Behind us, smoke coiled into the sky but the source was blocked by a massive black sand dune. I climbed its face, scrambling atop cascading sand, until I reached the summit. I swallowed. We were on Strantodin.
Vast, black pits dotted the landscape, smoke billowing up from their black throats. The meridium mines, I thought, or what was left of them. The fires had collapsed many of them, leaving nothing more than massive craters yawning at the sky. But three of the shafts were still intact. Fire and black smoke danced up from their hellish throats, filling the sky with toxic poison. I scanned black horizon. In the distance I could see tiny pinpoints of light. But how far they were from the coast was anyone's guess. The only other signs of life were several collapsed structures lying half buried in the black sand. I returned to the prince and sat down beside him. I was exhausted and my head throbbed. I hadn't had anything to eat in days, and our water had run out inside the whale. We need to leave, I thought. But how? The prince was far too heavy to carry, and I didn't see anything I could use to drag him. I looked east and west down the beach. Pieces of rusted metal and sun-bleached wood lay scattered everywhere. I approached a sheet of rusted steel. It was the right size for the prince, but as soon as I touched it, it disintegrated into dust. The atmosphere must be caustic, I realized. If I didn't get a mask and air tank soon, my lungs would meet the same fate as the steel. I hooked my arms beneath the prince's armpits and slowly dragged him off the beach. It was back-breaking work, and my head spun as sweat dripped into my eyes. Soon, though, we entered the dunes at the edge of the beach. There were a few abandoned huts still standing, so I entered one and began digging around on the sand-covered floor. I found several pieces of timber that were still intact, so I tossed them outside and continued to dig. Eventually I found an old sheet that had somehow survived the turns of abandonment. I tore several strips from it, and used them to tie the remainder of the tattered sheet onto the two pieces of wood I had found. It wasn't much to look at, but when I rolled the prints onto it, it surprisingly held. I lifted the makeshift stretcher and began dragging it off the beach. My hands and arms burned, but I didn't stop. The boy's life depended on me now. What kind of Lorianas would I be if I allowed my new king's son to die in my care? I struggled on, every muscle burning as my feet sunk into the black sand. After a hundred footfalls, the sand gave way to gravel, and finally dirt. I skirted the edge of one of the collapsed mine pits, casting cautious glances into its steaming throat. It was hard to imagine such a thing could destroy an entire continent. But the further I walked, even more pits appeared on the horizon. The entire outlying area was a rent wasteland scrapped of all vegetation, and life. Not even the birds dared to fly over the poisoned realm. After a call, the pits became less and less frequent, until finally we entered a dead forest. Not a single tree remained alive, and even the soil looked dead and ashen. I wanted to rest beside one of the gnarled stumps, but I knew if I stopped I might never be able to get up again. I was running on fumes now. If we didn't find civilization soon I would have to leave the prince behind. And that cannot happen, I told myself. The dead forest was vast, stretching deep inland toward a distant mountain range. But a narrow dirt road cut through it no more than two hundred footfalls from our position. I knelt down beside Dario and touched his forehead with the back of my hand. He was hot, but not feverish. When I tried to wake him, though, he groaned something unintelligible and then fell silent. Sighing, I took hold of the makeshift stretcher and began dragging it toward the road. When we finally reached it, I sighed with relief. Unlike the sandy beach and ashen forest, the ground was packed down and solid, making walking far easier. On we went, snaking through the black forest as black smog slowly settled upon the land. Everything hurt, my arms, my legs, my chest, and head. I doubted I could go on much longer yet I somehow found the strength to keep walking. Eventually the dead forest thinned, giving way to a rocky, windswept plain. In the distance, the pinpoints of light were clearly visible, as was the shadow of a large, fortress-like structure. Elop, I thought. It was an ominous place. Its walls and battlements were covered in black soot, making it blend in with the scorched landscape surrounding it. Worse, though, were the many crow cages lining the road. 
many still held bodies, some more decomposed than others, and as we moved closer to the castle, the more cages we passed, a horn echoed in the distance. Several torches began moving about the base of the fortress, followed by the sound of distant horse hooves thundering toward us across the rock plain. I laid the stretcher down on the road and took a seat beside the prince. I could go no further. My head swam and black spots danced before my vision. I slowly slumped forward, unable to control myself. The last thing I saw before the world went dark were several mounted knights in black armor bearing down on me atop the largest horses I had ever seen. Then all was silent. Chapter 23 A Scoundrel's Prize I sat up gasping. My world was black, an impenetrable darkness that threatened to suffocate me. I reached up to touch my face, to remind myself I was still alive. But instead of flesh, my fingers brushed against the glass portal on my mask. I took a deep, cold breath. I could taste the artificial triton air as it rushed into my throat, that nauseatingly sweet metallic flavor that lingered upon the tongue like a bitter tonic. I reached out into the void and felt a cold stone wall. As I ran my hand along it, stone gave way to wood. A door. Hello, I shouted. I found a handle, but it was locked. Is anyone out there? Footfalls approached, heavy and deliberate. When they stopped, keys jangled as a tumbler clicked into place. I stepped back, shielding my eyes as torchlight flooded the cell. I nearly tripped over a bucket filled with feces as a man in black armor entered the cell. Come, the guard said, gesturing to the hallway. I pulled my shirt down and tried to flatten its many wrinkles, but it was pointless. My clothes were stained and torn from the journey inside the whale. Swallowing my pride, I stepped past the brute. He was bald and covered in scars, and his flesh was pale as milk. He pointed down the hall. Let's go, he said, nudging me forward with a meaty hand. We passed more doors as we walked. More than once I heard whimpering pleas emanating from within. The guard ignored them, nudging me in the small of the back whenever I slowed. We eventually ascended a staircase and entered another hallway. Torches danced against black walls, bathing dozens of ancient paintings in their orange glow. As we walked, I began to recognize some of the works. A black and white charcoal sketch from Uane Deep, an oil on canvas from Halidon Stroke depicting an angel hovering above a wall of fire. There were also statues, dozens of busts and broken figurines representing Strantodin's many generals and nobles, situated atop onyx pillars. The guard guided me into a large chamber. Dozens of Strantodians sat hunched over wooden desks, copying manuscripts with ancient-looking quills. Several looked up and stared at me, whispering to their companions as we passed. The castle interior wasn't as forbidding as the exterior. The floor was made from white marble, and most of the walls were made of blocks of grey granite. But it was bare and colourless, as if it were undergoing an endless renovation. We crossed the chamber and halted before a massive set of black steel doors. Three guards stood before it, their bloodshot eyes following my every move. I'm to speak with King Ren, my escort said to the three guards. Is this him? one asked. What do you think, fool? But he's an old man, the guard replied. What in the hells could he want with him? You could ask him yourself if you feel so inclined. The guard huffed before stepping aside and opening the doors. My escort nudged my back. Let's not keep him waiting. I stepped over the threshold and gasped. We were in the largest gallery I had ever seen. Enormous black pillars lined either side of a carpeted walkway, which stretched all the way to the far side of the chamber. Fires burned in a dozen massive braziers, the flames snapping and dancing toward the distant ceiling as shadows flickered across the walls. To my surprise, dozens of people stood at attendance between the pillars, staring at us as we approached the distant throne. King Ren sat still atop his stone chair. The prince stood at his side, dressed head to toe in black leather. I bring you Loriana's Falemclane, your majesty, my escort proclaimed. 
bowing before the king. King Ren stood and gestured for us to approach. Well, I hope your trip was not too much trouble, Lorianas. I wanted to laugh, but my throat was sore from the triton air. Instead, I approached the king and took a knee. I am at your service, your majesty. King Ren glanced at the gathered lords and noblemen. They say you can judge a court by its Lorianas. How about one in exile? Some of the noblemen and lords laughed. Others stood silent, their faces blank. King Ren approached me. He wore a simple black robe with gold piping on the sleeves and a black crown encrusted with small animal skulls. I hope you find the climate to your liking. I'm told the adjustment can be quite harsh. I cleared my throat and adjusted my mask. I am well, your majesty, ready to serve any need you command. My mask hissed and popped as the king looked me over. My son tells me you saved his life. Is this true? I glanced at Dario. The prince met my eyes and nodded. We saved each other, your majesty. The king huffed. Modesty is unbecoming of a Lorianas. He stepped within a few footfalls of me and extended his hand. I leaned forward and kissed his signet ring, as was customary when addressing a king. The gathering erupted into laughter. Rise, Lorianas, King Ren said, grinning. No man or woman kneels in my court, nor do they kiss rings. My face blushed with embarrassment as I stood. My apologies, your majesty. Join me for supper tonight. I have much I would like to discuss with you. I bowed. I'm at your disposal. The king laughed. You see that? That is dedication. This man was a servant to my enemy only days ago. And now he stands before me, ready to obey my every command. He looked over the faces of those in attendance. If only all of my people were as loyal. Shall I escort him to his chamber? The guard asked. The king nodded. Garnum here will see to getting you a proper uniform, one with the proper colors of your new house. I looked at my blue tunic. It was torn and filthy, but the color still shone through. My color, Sraden's color, and now he thinks I'll just abandon it. Fury coiled inside me. I was his Lorianas now, yes, but I chose my own colors, not the king. Very well, the king said. That concludes our business for today, Lorianas. Go clean yourself up and settle into your new quarters. A new day approaches, and we have much to do. The king returned to his throne, where he was immediately met by several advisers. As they pored over a set of scrolls, I followed Garnum from the throne room. Here are the rules, Lorianas, Garnum said, as we wound our way through the dimly lit hallways. Keep your mask on at all times as you know our environment is quite toxic and will kill you within minutes, so don't tempt fate. He pointed at the tank jutting from my mask. You will receive two of these a day, every morning before breakfast. If you need more, you must report to the supply quarters before anything can be given out. I didn't say a word. I was still lost in a fog of confusion and sadness. Everything was so different here, the architecture, the air, the people. I realized right away that there were only three colors in Elop, black, gray, and crimson. Sredin, on the other hand, had been a castle of light and color, its many walls reflecting the colorful nature of its inhabitants. Here the servants were indistinguishable from one another. Each man and woman wore either a black robe or black tunic, and every room I passed was as bare as a prison cell. On Deciman, the people expressed themselves through their clothes and art. On Strantodin, there was no expression. The people were silent and cold, a single mindless unit obeying the king's every whim behind the castle's black soot-covered walls. How will I live here? I wondered. Our two kingdoms were so different, so separated. It would take everything I had learned at Cilium Dor just to survive here. Was I up to such a task? I had no answer. Only time would tell. Garnum halted outside my bedchamber. You will find everything you need in the dresser. Be ready no later than one call from now. And with that, 
He turned and marched off into the castle. I shut the door and exhaled. The mask felt hot and sweaty, and my mouth was as dry as a bone. I sat down on the meager cot in the corner of the chamber and stared at the rock wall. So this is it, I whispered to myself. After turns of loyal servitude I'm to finish out my days here, in this black realm. I wanted to scream, to punch a hole in the rock wall. I felt betrayed by my king. Was this my reward for standing beside him, tending to his every need? It was the darkest and most desperate I had ever felt in all of my turns on Retrack Deor. I stood and opened the top drawer of the chipped wooden dresser. A black tunic sat folded atop a pair of black trousers. I shut the drawer. Normally my Loriana's training would have dictated that I obey and wear the uniform. But a part of me was not ready to let Sredin go. I clung to my former life like a bear cub clinging to its mother. I would serve here, as was the Loriana's way, but they would have to pry Sredin from my soul. A knock at the door. I fixed my tunic and pulled the door open. Loriana's warden stood in the doorway. He no longer wore his mask, and his expression was less tense than it had been at Sredin. I was also surprised to see we were almost the same age. He had thin, grey hair and crow's feet wrinkling his pale face, and his hands had several liver spots dotting them. I am to take you around the castle and familiarise you with its layout. I nodded. When? Now. I followed the Lorianas down a winding staircase into another dimly lit hall. This section of the castle was even more barren, and an oppressive heat lingered in the toxic air. We passed countless servants, scuttling about on various duties. Many stopped to stare at me, only to be quickly pushed aside by Loriana's warden. Almost all of them were bald with bone-white flesh, just like their king. Most were missing teeth and had sunken bloodshot eyes. Have they never seen a Dismonian before? I asked, as several bald serving girls giggled behind cupped hands. No, not in the flesh, Loriana's warden replied. We approached a set of steel doors. Worden pushed them open, bathing us in dancing light. By the gods, I breathed. The kitchen was enormous, possibly three times larger than Sredin's. Fires burned at over a dozen stations, and I noticed several enormous ovens pressed up against the walls. This will be your home away from home, Loriana's warden said. He led me into the chaotic sprawl. Servants chopped vegetables atop wood cutting boards as cooks stirred steaming pots and wrangled flaming pans. I could smell none of it, though. The mask's filter kept everything out, save for my own bitter breath. Four meals are served daily, three in the great hall and one for us in the servants' quarters. Your people only eat once a day, I asked, shocked. At Sredin we ate three square meals a day, sometimes even the same menu as the king. It was one of our greatest pleasures. We serve. That is all that matters. If it takes more than one meal to accomplish this, then you are not a true Lorianas. I looked at Worden, affronted. Who did he think he was, questioning my competence? I held my tongue, though. I would not start off our relationship beneath a black cloud. This was his home, his world. I was just a stranger here, alone and unsure of my standing. I am starting over, I realized. All of my turns at Sredin meant nothing now. I was the outsider, the unbroken servant upon which every awful duty would be heaped. The cooks were pale, muscular ghosts covered in burn marks and scars. Several were missing limbs, and one man had only one eye. Probably veterans of past campaigns, I thought. Campaigns against us. As we walked across the kitchen, I began to realize there was no desk for the Lorianas. It shouldn't have bothered me, but it did. I needed something familiar, something I could cling to during the long turns of my adjustment. Perhaps they would let me bring one down here. That was a request for another time, though. Loriana's warden led me from the kitchens into a large, ice-cold chamber. As soon as I entered it I sensed magic at work. Dozens of massive ice blocks sat heaped against the walls. Fish, 
poultry and numerous other meats stacked atop them. In one corner, a large black cat covered in white stripes dangled from a thick steel hook. Is that what I think it is? I asked. Worden scoffed. One of our hunters caught it a week ago, killed three of his party. The Virax's fur bristled with ice, and its cat-like eyes were completely frosted over. I didn't know their meat was palatable, I said as I stared at the many slits lining its belly. When the beasts fed, they covered their prey in an acidic fluid that flowed from the slits. Once the meal was liquefied, the Virax could then ingest the remnants with its tongue. Palatable, yes, Loriana's Worden replied. Would I feed it to our king? There were even stranger creatures hanging in the chamber. One was a baby fell tower. Its ropey fur and centipede-like legs were frozen solid, but its powerful skunk-like odor penetrated my mask. My stomach turned at the thought of cooking such foul meat. The beasts were mostly used as pack animals in the culver waste, where their dense ropey fur trapped what little moisture there was in the air. But their meat was notoriously stringy and bitter, requiring a complex blend of spices to mask the foul flavor. We passed other exotic creatures I had no names for, beasts with long, thin limbs that stretched to the floor and bird-like animals with white beaks and feathers that sparkled in the torchlight. But before I could make any inquiries, we exited the chamber and entered yet another poorly lit room. There was a large table situated before us and a fireplace snapping and popping on the far end of the room. Over a dozen servants were seated at the table, all of them eating in silence. None looked up as we entered. This is our new servant, Worden announced. He will be in charge of the kitchens until I return from my duties up north. Loriana's Worden swept his hand across the chamber. This is the servant's dining room. Use it to get to know your people. With that said, he turned and exited the chamber. I stood alone before the group. A few of them looked up from their supper, their bloodshot eyes locked on me. Continue your meals, I said. It was all I could think of. The servants quickly turned their attention back to their plates, the clicking of forks and scraping knives filling the air. There was a chair positioned at the head of the table. I pulled it out and sat down with a sigh. Several of the servants looked up at me with shocked expressions, their forks trembling before their chapped lips. That is former Cook Deary's seat, a boy no older than twenty said. I looked at the others. They were all staring at me. You would do well to find another seat, old man, the boy said. Slowly I stood and pushed the chair beneath the table. My apologies. I found a stool positioned beside the fireplace and took a seat. A half-call slowly passed, anxiety pressing down on my chest as I sat silent beside the fire. Was this how I would finish out my turns, playing second fiddle to another Loriana's? Take a seat. I looked up. One of the servants, a boy of around fifteen turns, was gesturing toward an empty chair beside him. I hesitantly abandoned the stool and sat down at the table. None of the other servants so much as looked at me. My thanks, I said. The boy nodded. He too was bone white and bald, his teeth black and crooked. Here. He handed me a bowl and quickly ladled what might have been beef stew into it. Salted venadier boiled in draba grease, he said. It's no decimal dish, but it'll fill you up. A gruff, middle-aged woman with blonde hair and a patch over her left eye laughed at the far end of the table. It'll also give you the runs for most of the day, she said. Several servants chuckled as they continued to spoon the mush into their mouths. The boy slid a bent spoon in front of me. Never mind them. It ain't all that bad. When prepared by cook, deary it ain't, the woman said. Too bad he's dining with the worms now. I picked up the spoon and dunked it into the clay bowl. Carrots and potatoes bobbed amongst chunks of brown meat and chicken. I tasted a spoonful. It was bitter and seasoned with too much garlic, but I had been served worse. The woman laughed as I slurped it down. Hope you're free for the rest of the week, she said. That's how long you'll be praying to the privy gods after eating that shit. I licked my lips. 
It needed a touch more salt and pepper, and some onions wouldn't have hurt it either. But overall, it was a decent peasant dish. Reminds me of the venadier stew we used to make back home, I said, taking another spoonful. The woman picked up a roll and tore a piece free. Where would that home be? This surprised me. I had thought my name would precede my arrival. Sredin, I said matter-of-factly. The servants dropped their spoons simultaneously and looked at me. Come again, the woman said. I was brought here from Sredin Castle. I was King Donan's Lorianas before your king. Acquired my services. Silence befell the room. Even the boy beside me appeared shocked. You are Lorianas Philemclane, he whispered. I nodded. The same Lorianas who murdered his king? The woman asked. I grew tense. What in the hells were these people being told about me? He was my king. I paused. And my friend? The woman laughed. Remind me not to become one of your friends then. The boy's shocked expression transformed to curious excitement. How did you do it, Lorianas? Poison, like we were told. Or was it something else? I shook my head. I had nothing to do with it. He died during a game of skulls. With your king? Some of the servants stood and exited the chamber. The boy and the woman remained, along with two other men. Come on, a squat, overweight brute said. You think we're fools. I know a murderer when I see one. The man sitting beside him laughed. You would know better than anyone, Clape. The man named Clape eyed his companion and then turned back to me. So what's it like to watch a king die? The image of Donan lying on the floor, blood oozing from his nose and mouth, materialized in my mind. I had tried to forget it, to push into the furthest reaches of my memory, but it was always waiting to resurface. Leave him be, the boy beside me said. The older man threw his spoon at him. Shut your damn mouth, Minnow, or I'll boil you up just like this dog shit. And then Loriana's warden will have you hung from the castle parapets, the boy replied. Clape sat back, fuming, but he remained silent. I played no part in King Donan's death, I repeated. The Barnite parasite is to blame for that. So none of it's true. The boy asked. Of course not, I replied. Clape's friend sat back and threw a leg onto the table. He was bald and hairless, with strange green eyes that twinkled like sapphires in the firelight. You're not lying, he breathed. I shook my head. A bell rang in the distance, its deep, metallic call echoing throughout the castle. What is that? I asked the boy. Sup is over he said, tossing his napkin into his bowl. Clape and his bald companion stood and exited the chamber. The woman cast one last glimpse in my direction before following the others into the hallway. The boy stood. My name is Durkin. Durkin Wanero. I'm the kitchen scraper. He extended a calloused, grease-stained hand to me. I accepted it. Philim Klain. He nodded. It is an honor to meet you. Lorianus Klain. He turned to leave. Wait, I said. Can I ask a question? Durkin glanced over his shoulder at me and nodded. What does a scraper do? He smiled. You have a lot to learn here, Lorianus, and I'd be glad to teach you. In time. For now, keep a low profile. Things are far different here than on Deciman. With that said, he followed the others down the hallway. I sat alone for a time, staring at the cluttered table. When I could take it no more, I stood and began cleaning up the dishes. It was all I could think to do. Is this how it will be from now on? I wondered as a knot twisted in my gut. Left to drift the halls of a strange castle. No orders, no schedules, no friends. My hands began to tremble as I placed several plates in a nearby washbasin. What was my purpose now? And what did this king want from me? A figure appeared at the kitchen entrance. The king wishes to speak with you. 
It was Loriana's Worden. He had changed out of his black robe and now wore a crimson tunic with black pants. Very well, I said, drying my hands on a rag. We walked through several hallways and up a flight of spiral stairs, before entering one of the castle's inner wards. Like Sredin's, it was open to the sky, but there was no grass or flowers, only blackened dirt and smog. I looked up at the grey sky. It, too, was empty and blank. No birds, no insects, nothing. We approached the king's keep, but were quickly blocked by two burly guards in black armour. His majesty is expecting us, Worden told them. The guards uncrossed their swords and waved us through. As I passed, one of the guards slammed his shoulder into mine. Loriana's Worden halted. Stand straight, dog. The guard snapped to attention, staring at the distant battlements. Loriana's Worden circled him like a Verax cat. I will give you one warning, and one warning only. Loriana's clan is now second Loriana's to myself. You will afford him the same respect I command. Unless you want to hang from the castle gate. The man glanced at me, his eyes betraying fear. My apologies, Loriana's. Loriana's clan, Worden shouted. Remember it, and remember it well, and make sure the rest of your men understand this too. We left the guards behind and stepped through the keep's two enormous Delsium wood doors. Inside, I could see white marble walls, and the floor was covered in fresh crimson carpeting. Chandeliers hung from the arching ceilings, their blue meridium candles flickering and dancing in an unseen breeze. Loriana's Worden led me through the grand entrance hall and up another flight of spiraling stairs. It was an exhausting climb made all the worse by the hissing triton mask sucked to my face. The glass port fogged constantly, and whenever I lifted it to wipe it clean, wisps of toxic air burned my throat and lungs. We reached the top of the stairs. I leaned over, gasping as Loriana's Worden knocked on a set of steel doors. Enter, boomed a voice from within. Loriana's Worden pushed the doors inward. Loriana's Felimclane, Your Majesty, he announced. I hesitantly followed him into the chamber and bowed. Your Majesty, the king stood before a giant mirror. He was not the most imposing figure. He stood only five footfalls tall and was thin and pale. Wisps of hair still clung to his scalp, but most of it had long since fallen out. He wore a humble black robe and brown moccasins on his feet. Ah, yes, my new Lorianas. How are you settling in? My mouth went dry. I wanted to fall to my knees and beg him to free me from his service. But the Lorianas in me was far too proud. I am well, Your Majesty. Your servants have been quite welcoming. He studied me for a moment. His bloodshot eyes were deep blue and far less intimidating without his mask on. You do not like the uniform we provided. I swallowed. I had left it folded atop my new dresser. I have donned the blue of House Sredin for most of my life. The king stepped within inches of my face. You are no longer of House Sredin, though. Elop is your new home, and I am your new king. I understand, Your Grace. But I can't wear the black. Not yet. Loriana's Worden met the king's eyes and shrugged. The king sighed. I suppose for now we can make an exception especially considering your recent actions. My actions, your majesty. He smiled. The prince has told me how you saved his life. Most men in such a position would have let him suffocate or fed him to the Laxor. But you risked your own life to help him. For that I am eternally grateful. He approached a small wooden dresser and withdrew a satchel from a drawer. I am told you were quite fond of King Donan that you and he shared a special friendship which transcended most Loriana's. He held the satchel out to me. Loriana's Worden's eyes widened. My son has been a fool these last few turns. He refuses to marry his selected bride and seeks only hedonistic pursuits. But some day he will have to rule, to take over from me when I step beyond the veil. I am hoping perhaps you can aid him in this pursuit. 
He opened the satchel and withdrew a large object. A crown. King Donan's crown. My heart stopped. I had hidden it beneath a loose cobblestone in my chamber. You fool, I thought, scolding myself. How could I have been so naive as to think they wouldn't check every inch of my bedchamber? King Wren held the crown before his bloodshot eyes. It was wrought of solid gold and encrusted with priceless rubies and diamonds. A far cry from his own skull-covered crown. Why did you take this, Lorianus? he asked. I didn't. A friend gave it to me. Ah, yes, that makes more sense. He placed the crown on his head and approached the enormous mirror propped against the wall. For a time he stared at himself in silence, turning his head from side to side. I have yearned for this crown most of my life, fought countless battles in the hopes of one day holding it in my hands. But now that I have it, I find it unbecoming of me. He took it off and tossed it to me. Thankfully I was quick enough and grabbed it before it smashed against the floor. Keep it safe, Lorianus. Guard it with your life. There are countless men who would kill just to hold such a thing. I nodded. Thank you, Your Majesty. The king smiled. Now for your reward, Lorianus. He walked toward me and extended his hand. With great trepidation, I reached out and shook it. It was surprisingly warm and powerful. Welcome to your new home, the king said. I hope someday we can be as close as you once were with my old friend. I swallowed again. Thank you, your majesty. Nothing would make me happier. It was a bold-faced lie, but I wasn't about to spit in the face of my new master. No matter how evil he was. King Wren nodded and approached a table covered in maps. That is all, Loriana's Worden. Make sure our guest's prize is returned safely to his chamber. Loriana's Worden bowed. Of course, your majesty. Worden and I walked down the stairs in silence. I sensed anger emanating from him, but I didn't dare inquire as to its nature. Instead, I tucked the crown beneath my tunic and followed the Lorianas through Elop's labyrinthian sprawl. When we reached the kitchen, he deposited me at the door and left without so much as a word. Several scullions looked up from their work as I entered the kitchen, but none acknowledged my presence or greeted me, as was customary. I didn't care, though. I still had the crown and needed to get rid of it before anyone noticed. I left the kitchen behind and quickly walked back to my chamber. Once there, I shut the door and exhaled. The loose cobblestone had been put back in place, but I wasn't about to use that spot again. Instead, I reached up the chimney chute and tucked the crown on top of the metal damper. It was far enough up that I doubted the heat would damage it. I washed my hands in my water basin and brushed away soot smudged across my uniform. When I was clean, I left the room and shut the door behind me. A few servants passed me as I made my way back to the kitchen. None bowed or nodded, as was customary when approaching the castle Lorianas. But I ignored the slight. There would be many similar ones in the days and weeks to come. That much I was certain of. Ah, Lorianas Klain, someone shouted as I entered the kitchen. It was Durkin, the boy from supper. He smiled. How has your first day at Elop been? I halted a few footfalls from his station. He had a draba bird splayed out on a chopping board. Its feathers lay everywhere, drifting in the kitchen's rippling humidity. Eye-opening, I replied. He laughed. Not quite Sredin, eh? Night and day, I replied. He slammed a cleaver down on the bird's neck, severing its head. I am told you made a friend of the prince, though. I shrugged. I did what any other man would have done in my position. Durkin laughed. What? The boy shook his head. You are a sentimental man. Be careful. It will get you killed here. This confused me. Was it wrong that I had saved the prince's life? He was heir to the Strantodin throne, first son of the king. Durkin began dicing up the draba bird. Just be careful who owes you favors, Lorianas. It's best you know your place here. And what's my place? I asked. Durkin waved his hands before him. Here, in the kitchens. 
This is our world, our kingdom. Up above, we are mere sheep amongst wolves. I stood silent, digesting his words as he dumped the chopped drubber meat into a clay bowl. So what now? I asked. He looked up at me and chuckled. You tell me, Lorianas, this is your kitchen now. Lorianas' warden doesn't oversee the kitchens. Durkin chuckled again. Of course not. He is more the court charger than he ever was a Lorianas. Rumor has it he was kicked out of Cilium Door during his third turn for using magic. King Ren is the only reason he retains the title. The man has an affection for your craft. No one knows why, but he does. I nodded. So I was on my own to govern the kitchens and servants. Perhaps all wasn't lost here. I sat down on a small stool and adjusted my mask. I was slowly getting used to it, but the glass port had a tendency to fog up. I lifted the shark flesh and quickly wiped the inner glass. When it was dry, I pulled the mask down and gasped. Use salted water, Durkin said, as he watched me fumble with its seals. It'll keep the glass from fogging. He lifted a jar and tilted it over a bowl filled with water. Salt slid out and dissolved almost instantly. Thank you, I said. I removed my mask and rubbed the water across the glass. I then pulled the mask back on and took a breath. So, what is to be your first order of business? Durkin asked. I looked at the wall beside me. Like almost every other surface in Elop, it was coated in a layer of black soot. I ran my finger across it and stared at the freshly revealed streak. Has this castle ever been properly cleaned? I asked. The boy laughed. Cleaned. The famous black walls of Elop. He shook his head. Lorianas have tried over the turns. But it's pointless. The atmosphere will only saturate it again. And then the next Lorianas will have to deal with it. I nodded. But, deep down, I was already concocting a plan. One that would hopefully solidify my position at Elop and prove to the king the true worth of his new Lorianas. Chapter 24 a new page is turned. Elop Castle was not without its charm. Yes, most of its halls were coated in a thick, toxic layer of soot, and what passed for decor were mostly mouldering paintings stolen during one raid or another. But there were sections of the castle that held the same splendor as many at Sredin. During my first morning walk, I stumbled upon a wing that had once been the height of Strantodin architecture, even though the rooms had been abandoned turns earlier, the ornateness was clearly visible beneath the layers of dust and soot. Many of the rooms had checkered, marble floors concealed beneath layers of grime and rot, and some even had ancient murals splashed across their grey granite walls. Much of the furniture was in the same condition. Couches sagged in lonely, mouldering corners, their once opulent cushions torn asunder by rats and covered in moss and mould. The few chairs and couches that had survived now sat covered in ghostly, moth-eaten sheets. But not everything was a loss. In one room I found an enormous mirror stretching from floor to ceiling. It was surprisingly clean, considering it had probably sat there for decades. I gazed at my aging reflection for a few heartbeats. It wasn't often one of my stations saw their reflection so clearly. Mirrors were a rare and expensive luxury reserved for kings and lords. Why has it been abandoned, though, I wondered. Had something bad happened in this part of the castle? Perhaps some dark tragedy long since wiped from Elop's memory? These were the private quarters for Castle Elop's nobility, the most relevant chambers in the entire castle, aside from the throne room and kitchens. Now they were forgotten and forlorn, bathed in the cold, toxic wind blowing in through the shattered, stained glass windows. I have my work cut out for me here, I thought, as I wandered from room to room, accessing the state of my new home. By the time I finished, I had my conclusion. Elop was a disaster. But it wasn't a total loss. There was a diamond hidden in the rough. The ornate architecture was evidence to that, even if it had been left to fall into ruin. Thankfully, though, the walls were still sound and most of the main towers remained occupied. I finished my walk and headed toward the castle gate. 
I had been given no orders or guidance, so I decided to walk around the exterior of the castle to finish my assessment. I approached the guardhouse and smiled as one of the soldiers stepped into the open. Hello there, I said. The guard stood silent, staring at me. I halted a few footfalls away. Good day to you. The guard nodded. I was hoping to walk the outer perimeter this morning. The guard shook his head. No one leaves Elop without Loriana's word and say. But I am the new Loriana's, I replied. Shouldn't that grant me some authority? The guard looked me over. You're trying to tell me you're for Limclane, the famed Loriana's from Sredin? In the flesh, he laughed. Oh, piss off. I have no time for pranks today. And with that, he re-entered the guardhouse and slammed the door behind him. Unwilling to relent, I knocked on the guardhouse door. The guard pulled it open and aimed a crossbow at my face. What did I say, old man? I raised my hands. Listen, I just want to take a walk. I've been cooped up here for days, breathing this damn triton air. What do you say? Just for a few minutes. The guard laughed again, revealing a set of gold-plated teeth. You've got stones, I give you that, but no one is leaving this ward without a direct order from Loriana's warden. I dropped my hands and sighed. Very well. I turned back to the castle. Hey, wait a second. The guard put the crossbow down. As he approached me, I braced myself for another scolding. But instead, he just stopped and stared at me. You're really Loriana's clan? he asked. I nodded. I arrived a few days ago with Prince Dario. He continued to stare, but his demeanor relaxed. I've heard much about you, Lorianas. Is it true your apple tart helped open trade routes with Triton? Now it was my turn to laugh. It might have greased a few wheels with the Tritonese delegation, but in the end it was all King Donan's doing. May the gods watch over him. The guard smiled. Maybe some day you could make it for us. I'd kill to give it a taste. I'll tell you what, I said. Let me slip outside for half a call, and I'll personally make you a batch tomorrow. The guard licked his lips. Half a call. But you must not stray from the walls. This isn't decimin. There are things out there best left undisturbed. I extended my hand. Very well. The guard grabbed my hand and shook it. Pyre Stolworth. Commander of the main gate. I nodded. For Lemclain. He waved me forward and slipped back inside the guardhouse. Seconds later there was a dull grinding sound as the gate opened several footfalls. When it stopped, he waved me forward. Go, he hissed. And be quick. I ducked down and slipped through the gap. Knock three times when you return, he said behind me. And remember, don't stray from the wall. I nodded. See you soon, friend, and thank you. He smiled. Just don't forget about those tarts. The gate shut behind me with a dull thud. For a time after, I stood silent, watching as the wind carried wisps of green smog across the barren plain. There were no trees near the castle, no bramble plants, fireweed, nothing. A three hundred yard swath of open plain surrounded the castle walls. Beyond that, far off in the distance, were the gnarled and blackened remnants of Strantodon's once lush forests. I followed the western wall, keeping as close to it as possible. Every now and then I passed human bones or the remnants of various siege weapons. Rent armor and rusted shields poked up through the loose soil, and more than once I passed the rotted remains of a catapult. It was a desolate place, devoid of color and life. Even the castle looked dead and empty, its black walls forming an unnatural hole in the horizon. This is going to be a monumental task, I thought, as I passed the sun-bleached bones of some long-dead animal. The walls were over fifty footfalls high, smooth and angled outward. It will take an army to clean this place. My mask hissed and popped as I continued my inspection, a rhythmic din that was already fading into the background of my perception. To the east, 
at the edge of the dead forest, stood a large, crumbling keep. It was at least a half-mile away, barely visible amongst the smog. I stared at it for a time, transfixed by its design. It was tall, with a single tower extending from its centre. Like Elop, it too was coated in black soot. Curiosity began pulling me toward it. I had only ever seen one Strantoden structure, Castle Elop. This new building looked far more ornate. There were enormous gargoyles perched atop its crenulations, and its entrance looked like a giant fanged mouth. The guard said not to stray, I reminded myself. But if I hurried, he would never know. I began walking toward it across the dusty, windswept plain. At first my boots crunched atop broken arrow shafts and spears, but after a hundred footfalls the detritus thinned out, giving way to charred soil. Someone, or something burned down the forest, I realized as I passed several charred stumps. I tried to imagine what the battle had been like, had magic been at play. It was more than likely, considering the state of things, but it was hard to fathom such carnage. I had never known war. Most of the battles with Strantodin had been coastal skirmishes fought between raiders and the occasional mercenary outfit. Neither kingdom had ever marched inland beyond the coastlines. So who had tried to attack Elop? And why? The keep loomed over me as I entered into its shadow. It was larger than it first appeared, perhaps not as big as Elop, but it was still far larger than any keep I had seen on Decimon. I approached the gate. It had been made to resemble a mouth, black teeth the size of a small horse lined the upper jaw, and its cracked lips creased into a nefarious grin. The portcullis was half down, so I ducked beneath it into the courtyard beyond. To my surprise, the inner ward was covered in lush green grass and wild daisies. To my right, there was an empty stable, and to my left a cold blast furnace. I followed a small rock pathway across the ward, toward a set of iron doors. You should turn back, I thought. But it was too late. My curiosity had the better of me. I had to see what was behind those doors. I placed my hands against the cold steel and pushed. To my surprise, the doors opened with ease. The keep's interior was dark, and the air smelled stale and mouldy. As my eyes adjusted, I noticed several patches of light illuminating a large black throne on the opposite side of a massive gallery. I approached it, my breath held. A skeleton sat atop it wearing a golden crown and a moth-eaten robe of spun silk. What happened here? I wondered as I climbed the first few steps leading up to the throne. And who was this man? There were other corpses scattered about the chamber. Most were seated at a long wood table situated before the throne, their heads slumped forward and their jaws frozen in eternal screams. Ancient mugs lay scattered atop the table amongst shattered plates and cutlery. There were no signs of struggle, and as far as I could tell no one had breached the outer gate. These men killed themselves, I suddenly realized. What else could explain their deaths? But why had they been left here? I had so many unanswered questions. I glanced one last time at the dead king and then headed for the doors, but they suddenly slammed shut. I blinked. Aside from the dim patches of light arching in through a distant window, the keep was pitch dark. What have I gotten myself into? I thought as my heart began to race. I ran to the doors and pushed, but they wouldn't budge. Help? I shouted. I pounded on the cold steel, screaming as loud as I could but it was no use. No one would hear me. The walls were several footfalls thick, and my mask muffled my voice. I turned back to the throne. To my horror, the skeleton was gone. What devilry is this? I thought, trembling. I stood still, listening to the deathly silence. But the only sound I could hear was my own breath hissing inside my mask. I swallowed. Had I walked straight into an ancient magic trap? You should have listened to that guard, I breathed as I scanned the darkness. Something glittered to my right. Hello, I whispered. Who's there? Footfalls suddenly approached. At first they were quiet and gentle, like those of a hesitant child. 
But then I heard boots grinding atop the floor. I ran toward the lighted throne. The corpses were still seated at the table in front of it, but there was no sign of the king. Who is wandering Drantwin's halls? A voice hissed. My heart stopped. I'm Philem Clane. Lorianus to King Wren of Castle Elop. What business do you have here? I shook my head. None. I was just curious to see the architecture. The footfalls came closer, yet I still couldn't see the source. I wanted to run and hurl myself through the steel doors, but I was frozen beside the throne, too terrified to move. Were you not warned to keep to Elop's wall? The disembodied voice asked. I was. Laughter filled the hall. I've waited so long for a companion. For anyone to speak with, I could now see a figure lingering a few footfalls away, but its features were concealed in shadow. Who are you? I stammered. I was once the king of the Juridan people. This was to be my new seat of power. But our war was lost, and here my inner council and I were entombed. My body trembled as I stared at the silhouette. This was dark magic, the kind best left to history books. I'm real, Lorianas, it said, as if sensing my doubt. As real as any king or queen you've ever known. It stepped closer. By the gods, I breathed. The light revealed the wraith's skeletal grin as it wavered half in the shadows. Not the gods, it said. This was King Ren's doing. But how? The skeleton king laughed again. Does the how or why really matter? I've been trapped here for over twenty turns. Free me, Lorianas. Find a magic man and free me from this godsforaken prison, and I will reward you in ways you couldn't imagine. I tried to swallow, but my mouth and throat were bone dry. I felt lost in a nightmare I couldn't awake from. How was any of this possible? The skeleton king came closer, halting only a few footfalls away. Wisps of ancient hair still poked out from beneath his rusted crown, blowing in an unseen breeze. His eyes had long since rotted away, but patches of mummified flesh still clung to its skeletal face. My appearance upsets you, it asked. Everything about this place upsets me, I replied. It placed a skeletal hand on my shoulder and squeezed. Every nerve in my body prickled and every hair stood on end. I was not always like this, the skeleton said. There was a time when women killed to be at my side. He scanned the chamber, but no longer, I fear. Now I am alone here, cursed to watch the world go on as I rot beside my dead companions. My body began to go numb with terror. I could no longer feel my legs or arms, and every breath I took was ice cold. Bring me a magic man, Lorianas. Free me and I will make it worth your while. I stared into his empty eye sockets. Why should I trust you? He reached out a fleshless hand and touched my forehead. Because you are Juridan. Like me. I stepped back, tossing his hand off of my shoulder. I am from Deciman, I proclaimed. The creature laughed. In time, you will sense it awakening inside you, and then you will be called to me again. Ignore the calling and you'll suffer the same fate as I. But if you aid me, I will see to it that you never bow or bend the knee again. With that, the skeleton fell apart, its bones clanking onto the floor amongst a tangle of moth-eaten fabric. The crown rolled from the remains and fell on its side, wobbling back and forth before coming to a stop beside my foot. Run, I thought. Leave this place and never come back. Instead, though, I bent down and touched the crown. It was ice cold and covered in frost. I lifted it and slowly turned it over. There was writing inscribed on the inner band, but it was a language unknown to me. The doors suddenly swung open behind me. Like a gold tide, sunlight flooded the interior of the throne room. I dropped the crown and ran out into the inner ward. The grass was gone, as were the daisies. In their place were piles of bone and rusted armor. As I ran toward the great mouth, skulls turned toward me, their jaws clicking together as if trying to speak. I ignored the horrors 
and rushed out onto the plains. Get back to the castle, I told myself as I ran, and don't look back. Chapter 25 Consequences of Curiosity Loriana's warden grabbed my arm and dragged me into a side chamber. I was still covered in dirt and ash from my little excursion, and my air tank was almost depleted. But he didn't care. What in the name of the gods did you think you were doing out there? He hissed. The Lorianas had been waiting for me by the guardhouse. As soon as I ducked beneath the gate, he grabbed me and marched me back into the keep. As for the fate of the poor guard who had let me out, I knew not. I could only pray he was safe. I... I was just examining the castle exterior, I said, as he slammed the door shut behind us. We were alone in a small library. Hundreds of ancient, leather-bound books lined the shelves. But there were no candles. Just the eerie blue light of meridium lanterns flickering against every surface. What did you see? He hissed. Did you touch anything inside the fortress? I... I saw a throne room. And bodies. He shook his head. You damn fool. You have no idea what you were playing with out there. I tossed his hand off my arm and stepped back. So tell me, I snapped. Tell me what it is I wasn't supposed to see or touch. Tell me what I'm supposed to do here. Worden stared at me. My hands were balled into fists at my sides, and I was trembling with rage. You people ripped me from my life and dragged me across the strait, I said. And for what? Your king and his ego. For what do you need me that was worth destroying my life for? Worden appeared shocked by my outburst. I too was surprised. Lorianas were trained to control their emotions and to never refuse an order. Yet I had defied both in one day. Yes, I saw something out there, I continued. A king, or what was left of him. And he spoke to me. Or at least I think he did. Worden's eyes widened. What did he say? He said I was Juridan, like him. And then he asked me to free him. Worden took several steps back. You must be quarantined immediately. Why? Who was that thing? What in the hells is going on? Worden pulled up a chair and slid it in front of me. Sit. I plopped down on the chair, exhausted. Worden dragged another chair over and sat down opposite me. Elop was not always located here, he said, his voice barely a whisper. There was a time when that keep you entered was the true seat of power on this continent. But then the Juridan arrived. The Juridan, I asked. Magic men. But far stronger than any Isle Charger. You see, Juridan don't require Meridium to work their craft. They are born with the gift. A gift that is far stronger than anything Chargers possess. I never knew you were at war with anyone other than Deciman, I said. We kept it a secret. It was hard enough fighting on two separate fronts. If word got out that we were under siege from another enemy, your king would have used the distraction to invade. He sat back, the chair creaking, as he adjusted his black robe about his body. What I'm about to tell you is dangerous, Lorianas. If anyone finds out, we'll both be hanging from the castle walls. Understand? I hesitantly nodded. The Juridan attacked us twenty turns ago in the dead of winter, he said. No warning. Nothing. Even our scouts missed them. It was as if they appeared out of thin air. He withdrew an Adrena stick from a small box tucked inside his robe and ignited it with a match. The green smoke coiled out of his nose and mouth as he nervously exhaled. By the time the warning bells were rung, half of our cavalry had been reduced to dust. And I don't mean that figuratively. A hundred armoured men on horseback, all gone to ash. I sat silent. I was horrified, yet a part of me wanted to know more. So, you see, this is not something to be trifled with, he continued. We lost more than half of our number during the first month of the attacks. Their magic men knew sorcery beyond anything I have ever seen. It even enabled them to take on the guise of our own people. Once they began slipping inside Elop's walls, they chewed away at our hierarchy, driving men to madness. And worse, 
But aren't you a charger? I asked. Couldn't you have used your power to fight them? Loriana's Worden's demeanor darkened. I did, and it cost me dearly. But if they were so powerful, how did you defeat them? I asked. I brought in colleagues from the Isle, old friends loyal to me. We eventually smoked out the moles and drove them from Sredin's walls. We then endured two turns of bloody warfare across the plains. But the Juridan just holed up in the ruins of Waisin's Keep, a nest of spiders biding their time until our defences slipped. That's the structure I found, I asked. He nodded. It was once part of the original Elop, before King Seren Fron abandoned it three hundred turns ago and had this fortress built. Wasin's keep was then sealed for turns, but the Juridan broke down the magic barriers and took it for themselves. He took another pull on his Adrena stick and exhaled. After a time we learned their tricks and were able to defeat their army. But the castle remained impregnable. So we used a powerful hex to keep the king and his commander's prisoner. My mind struggled to digest what I was hearing. Who were these Juridan, and why had they attacked Strantodon? For Meridium, there were other places said to be far richer with the mineral, and Castle Elop wasn't exactly the jewel in Strantodion's crown. What had the Juridan really been seeking? So what happens to me now? I asked. Am I to be executed or locked away? Worden huffed. Normally you would be executed for leaving the castle walls without permission. But considering how much trouble the king went through to obtain your services, I doubt that will be your fate. For now, you will be confined to a cell until we're sure you're not a threat. I sighed. For the time being, I would live. But who knew what would happen in the coming days? The guards marched me down the stairs at sword point, unwilling to touch me. We reached a door-lined hallway lit by several torches. They quickly opened the closest and pushed me inside, slamming the door shut behind me. I sat down on a small cot and stared at the wall. This was the second cell I had been locked in since arriving. Was this how things were done in Strantodin? Was I not a guest of the king? Was I not the new castle Lorianas? I shook my head. They'll keep me here, alive so as to not create a stir back home. But this is it. I'm damned to these cells until my dying day. I lay back and closed my eyes. Images of Sredin flashed before me. Sunrises across the grassy plains, breakfast with Opon and the servants, and Radme. She hung before my mind's eye like a carrot dangled before a mare. I had ruined things between us. But now, as I sat trapped and helpless, I wanted nothing more than to take her in my arms and leave everything behind. My chest felt heavy as the memories taunted me. However, as I drifted off to sleep, I felt something else bubbling inside. I couldn't put a finger on it, but it felt akin to excitement like some great power was awakening in my soul. I stared at the ceiling as I struggled to decipher these new feelings. Just then, a strange glow flickered across the walls. I sat up. It wasn't just the walls. Green light surrounded my entire body, a strange, ethereal glow that throbbed in time with my heartbeat. Guard! I shouted. Guard! Help! Footfalls approached. Moments later, a metal slot opened. The guard looked at me as his eyes widened. What in the gods? He slammed the slot shut and ran off down the hall. Help, I cried as his footfalls faded into the distance. The entire cell was illuminated now, and I was the source. I fell to my knees, terrified. Whatever magic had been present in the abandoned keep, it had somehow infected me. Footfalls approached, accompanied by frightened voices. The slot opened again. Loriana's warden. I breathed, recognizing his eyes. Help me. I don't know what's happening. He looked me over and then shut the slot. Please don't leave me, I cried. The door opened and warden entered. Stand guard by the stairs, he said to several soldiers outside. 
I stood and backed away as he shut the door behind him. What's happening to me? I asked. Worden waved a hand before his face, whispering unintelligibly beneath his breath as the green glow throbbed ever brighter around me. When he was done, he leaned against the wall. What did you do? I asked. A spell of protection, so you don't infect me with whatever it is inside you. He coughed as sweat trickled down his pale forehead. It's taxing, though, quite taxing. I sat down on the bed, my head in my hands. I was ashamed to cry in front of him, but I could no longer hide it. Too much had changed. Too much had been lost. Worden pushed himself off the wall and approached the bed. To my surprise, he sat down beside me. It may not appear like it, but I do understand what you're going through, he said. I wiped tears from my cheeks and met his eyes. And how is that possible? He pulled his collar down, revealing a waxen scar in the shape of a circle. A slave mark, I thought, shocked. I was born into slavery on Worden. I spent the first half of my life clearing out howler plant infestations across the Alawane Plains. He pointed to his left ear, lost the hearing in that one during one of our little harvests. He pointed to his left eye. Also lost sight in this one, after a charger lost control of a fire elemental. Finally, he pointed to his chest. My heart, though. I sat silent, unsure of what to say. Eventually I escaped from my new master and ended up on the aisle. The chargers took me in and schooled me in their arts. But it was not to be my calling. I wanted to see the beauty of the world, not the toxic remnants left behind from war. So as soon as I could, I made my way to Cilium Dor and pleaded with the Master Lorianas to be allowed in. How did you pass the test? I asked. At Cilium Dor. I read everything I could get my hands on. He laughed at some distant memory. Wasn't easy, though, but I eventually graduated and found myself employed here. The strange glowing light had finally dimmed. Loriana's word and touched a match to a bedside candle. You have a natural gift, Loriana's, he said, his voice low. A very rare, natural gift. Some men spend their whole lives trying to tap into it, but it rarely shows itself. However, whatever you disturbed in that wretched keep has somehow awakened the power inside you. You're trying to say I'm one of them. A Juridan magic man. Perhaps some latent ability has come to the surface, Worden said. It's not unheard of. But I fear it's been amplified unnaturally by whatever witchcraft you encountered out there. I swallowed. This was all becoming too much for me to handle. My entire existence was crashing down around me. If I wasn't a Loriana's, what was I? And what was my purpose? For now we will keep this between us, Worden said. It wouldn't do for the king to learn his latest pet has the blood of our greatest enemy. I cringed upon hearing the word pet, but I was too exhausted to argue. My mind was spinning, and I only wanted to slow things down, to feel normal again. Somehow, though, I knew things would never be normal. The skeleton king had seen to that. Its macabre face suddenly materialized in my mind. How long had those men been out there, trapped, before they finally took their own lives? And how long had the Juridan king been alone in that black fortress, wandering the shadows as the days slowly spun by? Loriana's word and stood and straightened his robe. I must attend to the king, but I will return later. We will have much to discuss. I sat back against the wall. I am a Loriana's, I said. Nothing more and nothing less. Unfortunately, fate has decided differently, Loriana's claim. With that said, he left the chamber and locked the door behind him. I stared at the door for a time. I wanted to scream, to claw at the walls until I was returned to Decimen. But that will never happen now, a voice said in my head. You are too dangerous, too important to them. I sighed. Only time would tell. Loriana's word and returned later that night. 
he led me through the castle in silence, like an executioner marching his quarry to the block. We entered Elop's abandoned wing and walked down its lonely, cracked halls. Eventually, he gestured for me to follow him into a torch-lit chamber. The room was unlike any other in Elop. The walls and floors were clean, the windows mended, and the furniture intact. Candles and torches were lit throughout the room, revealing dozens of shelves packed with books and ancient relics. Take a seat, Worden said as he pulled shutters over the windows. I obeyed as he wandered about the room igniting more candles. I prefer shadow to light, he said, sitting down at a small desk. Several skulls sat in glass jars before him, their eyeless sockets staring at me. There was an ancient dagger mounted atop a holder, the blade gleaming in the candlelight. Other odds and ends lay scattered across the desk's chipped surface. Rocks, rusted buckles, a piece of shattered crockery. I wanted to meet with you alone, he said. I thought you might find my quarters more preferable. I nodded, but his den of shadow did little to ease my nerves. Everything about the room had an ominous feel. Darkness continued to thrive here, even as the candles struggled to stave it off. Would you like a drink? he asked. He pulled a bottle of crimson fluid from a drawer and poured it into a glass. He then slid it toward me. I accepted it and took a whiff. The bouquet was surprisingly sweet with a hint of delcium. Berry wine, I thought. An Algin vintage, probably forty turns old. I nodded my thanks and took a sip. The wine felt warm and invigorating. I licked my lips. That's a wonderful vintage. Indeed, he said as he poured himself a cup. I purchased it a few turns back while visiting Al. It's quite rare. I took another sip and closed my eyes. If it was poisoned, I didn't care. It was the best glass of wine I had ever tasted. Worden finished his glass and tucked the cork back into the bottle. I brought you here, Lorianas, because I think I can help you. Why would you want to help me? I asked. You've barely spoken a word to me since I arrived. He sighed. One Lorianas is sufficient to run a castle. Two is a maelstrom. I had no need of an assistant, let alone another Lorianas prowling my halls. But you are here, and I must find a use for you, even if you are Juridan. He opened another drawer and withdrew a small leather pouch. He tossed it in front of me. Open it. I picked up the pouch and reluctantly looked inside. It was filled with a fine brown powder that smelled of cinnamon and copper. Meridium, I thought. Shocked. Enough to supply a charger for several turns. Judging by your expression, you know what this is, he said. Of course, I replied. One couldn't be a Lorianas without some knowledge of Meridium. It was too ingrained into our society to avoid. But what of it? I asked. It is yours now. I closed the pouch and pushed it back across the desk. Lorianas are forbidden to dabble in magic. He laughed to himself. A moronic rule. Do you know how much magic can accomplish? The wonders that we can behold if only we were free to harness its power. I've read about the so-called wonders, I replied. Firestorms, cyanide clouds, ice traps. The people who live in the culver waste would beg to differ, I'm afraid. Those were fools who soured that land. Magic men who operated without care for the world around them. But that is not how I use it. So you are a charger then, I asked. He shrugged. I do not follow their ways, but I have received my dose. He left the pouch on the desk, his eyes staring at it greedily. There was a time when I thought it was to be my calling. However, after I found Cilium Door, I realized there was more to this life than magic. Now it is just a tool, a wonder that I can call upon if the need arises. But I refuse to become another Meridium addict, like so many other charges. And I refuse to turn from my power because of an outdated law. So what do you want with me? I asked. What I want is to train you. To teach you how to harness your power for the good of the castle. What power? I said. I'm no goddamned magic man. You are Juridan. 
and all Juridan are magic men, whether they know it or not. You have shown me nothing but scorn since I arrived, and now you want to help me. To train me in some latent magic I've never even had. He sighed. I'm not getting any younger, Lorianus. Every turn I feel myself losing touch with Strantodian culture. What I need is a younger Lorianus, a fresh mind with a fresh outlook to help guide this wretched castle into a new era. You do realize I'm sixty-four turns old, right? I said. I'm not exactly a fountain of modern culture. He laughed. Of course not, but you are a renowned Lorianus, a man of upstanding reputation who served one of the greatest courts in all the land. This shocked me. He was a Strantodian. My enemy, flattery over wine, was not something I ever expected from him. Worden leaned forward. I don't need a friend. That's not what this is. I need fresh eyes, fresh thoughts if I am to bring this kingdom into the new century. The days of raiding are coming to a close. The mine fires are slowly dwindling, and someday the atmosphere will return to its former glory. I want us to be ready for the new dawn. I want to die, knowing that I did one thing right in my life. And that's where I come in, I asked. You would ask for help from your enemy. He met my eyes. I never said you were my enemy. Then what am I? He sighed, tapping a finger on the leather pouch. A second chance. Chapter 26 Lessons I had not seen the kitchens for days, and since I did not yet have a defined purpose amongst the servants, I spent most of my time in Loriana's Worden's private quarters where he kept a vast library of books dealing with everything from proper court decorum to how to bend the wind in order to clear pollutants from crops and homes. Worden even taught me about meridium and its many uses, both good and bad. I learned about dosing and how to control ice storms and fire elementals with minimal physical side effects. He indulged my every question, and I had many and through it all we remained confined to the darkness of his inner sanctuary. It was a very strange time for me. We were delving into things that had always been forbidden by the Loriana's order. Yet Proust made a good argument for magic and its many uses, especially on a continent like Strantodin, where the pollution was incredibly intrusive and deadly. Unlike Deciman, where both the air and water were clean and usable, Strantodin needed other ways of sustaining its people, and those ways existed within magic. In return for this knowledge, I taught Worden about life on Deciman. The Strantodin people knew very little of the world beyond their toxic borders, and even Proust was curious to learn more. King Wren and the many kings before him had transformed Strantodin into a hermit kingdom, a land where nothing from the outside world was allowed to penetrate. We spent calls discussing the various dishes preferred by the royals at Sredin Castle. I taught him everything I knew of Deciman agriculture and trade, of wine and food culture. And even after our countless conversations and lessons, Loriana's Worden still wanted to know more. For he was a man without a tribe, much like myself. And what he sought, I was willing to give. Information. Yet through it all, he kept an invisible wall up between us a barrier concealing the real man behind those bloodshot, sunken eyes. I tried on numerous occasions to pry him free, to learn more about the man beneath the black robe. But it was to no avail. That was a side of him I was forbidden to know, so I accepted it and did my best not to pry. On one particularly rainy afternoon, I sat in his quarters examining an old journal a previous Lorianas had left behind. The man's name was Stratum Dill, and he had been Loriana's two hundred turns earlier, prior to the mine fires that had destroyed so much of the kingdom. It was strange reading about the endless fields of wheat and barley that had once surrounded the castle. Even more peculiar, though, were the entries in which the man wrote about the Algin and Desmonian villages lining the northern coast. Apparently the Strantodian people had not always been so reclusive. The Lorianas spoke of summer festivals in which the coastal foreigners mingled with the people of Elop and its surrounding villages, mixing their cultures and bloodlines. This went on for decades, establishing Strantodin as one of the great powers in the world, that is, 
until Triton explorers discovered meridium deposits along the southern coast. Soon after the discovery, a deal was struck between Triton and Elop, with both sides agreeing to wield the considerable costs of establishing exploratory mine shafts along the coast. Work soon began, and as the mines began producing, both sides drew up another deal to split the profits down the middle. But in a matter of months, Tritonese workers forcefully took control of the mines and blocked all access by outsiders, including the Strantodians. War quickly erupted between the two kingdoms, and within a turn the Tritonese workers were pushed from the continent, but not before they set every single mine on fire. Ah, I see you found Loriana's Dill's diary, Worden said as he entered the chamber and shut the door behind him. I found it hidden under a tile in one of the old bedchambers further down the wing. It's incredible, I said as I continued thumbing through it. He documented everything with such clarity and objectivity. It's utterly amazing. Loriana's Worden took a seat opposite me and sighed. I find it sad, though. It's like a love letter lost at sea inside a bottle. A time capsule from a time that no longer exists. You should consider it a lesson, I replied. Something to strive for before your time as Loriana's is over. Worden laughed. What? You think I have any real power in this place? He asked. Of course. You're Loriana's to the king of Strantodine. More laughter. You've been here for almost two weeks. In that time, what have you learned about us? I've learned Strantodin was once a flourishing kingdom, until greed and carelessness soured the land. He nodded. What else? Loriana's claim. I closed the ancient journal and sat back. I've learned that the people hold little to no power, and that all traditions pertaining to Loriana's are non-existent. He clapped. Correct. I knew you had eyes. So the king never confides in you. He never seeks your counsel on Strantodian affairs. Loriana's warden shook his head. To him we are ornamentation, necessities of court to be shown off to our adversaries. But to answer your query, no, we hold no sway here. The king does what he wants when he wants. We are merely his audience, and trophies. My heart sank. On Deciman, King Donan had consulted me countless times, we had developed a relationship of trust and friendship. I knew secrets even his closest advisers were not privy to. But here I am just decoration for this king's court, I thought. Another trophy to be flaunted before Wren's people. That is, until war broke out. Then I would be expected to fight alongside the king's troops. Loriana's warden stood and straightened his black robe. Today I want to take a walk beyond the walls. I looked up at him and swallowed. I thought that was forbidden. Not if you're with me. I followed him through the abandoned wing and back into the castle proper. How are you on air? Worden asked as we entered the grand hall. A handful of men and women were going about their business, petitioners and nobility seeking audience with the king. We walked past them without so much as a bow or nod. To my shock, though, several of them bowed to us. Worden took notice and laughed. You looked surprised, Loriana's claim. Why do the nobles bow to us? I asked. On Strantodin, men of magic are ranked higher than nobility, he replied. But don't let it get to your head. Many of them could have you killed with the snap of a finger if they felt so inclined. That sent a chill down my spine. There was so much ambiguity here. I had no idea of my real standing or what any of the proper protocols were. I would do my best to keep my head down and follow Loriana's warden's lead. I had no love for the man, but I was now the student walking in his crooked shadow. We approached the main gate and halted before the guardhouse. I peeked inside it, but there was no sign of the man who had let me out. What became of the guard? I asked. Worden looked at me and then turned back to the gate as it slowly opened. He stepped past the massive steel doors, and I quickly followed. Within seconds, the doors shut behind us. Today's lesson, Worden said, pointing up at the castle wall. To my horror, 
a body dangled from the ramparts. The guard, I realized. Why? I asked. He disobeyed the king's order. No one was to leave the castle walls without my say. My horror transformed into rage. He meant no harm by it. He disobeyed an order, Worden shouted. That is his punishment, no matter his intentions. Remember this lesson well, Lorianas. Else it could be you feeding the crows come morning. After that we walked in silence, the only sound our feet crunching atop the sun-bleached detritus. I wanted to throttle the Lorianas, to smash his skull against the ground and run as far as I could from this place, but I was too old and too frightened. Instead, like a coward, I fell in behind him and followed. Come join us, a voice suddenly whispered in my head. My heart stopped. I looked around, but there was no one else with us. Help us, Lorianas. Free us from this place. My stomach twisted into a knot as we slowly approached the black keep. I wanted to run back to Elop and clamber over the wall, to lock myself in my pitiful chamber and sleep until I could sleep no more. But Worden had other plans for me. Now for your second lesson, Worden said as he halted before the keep's mouth-like gate. I shivered as I stared up at the giant metal fangs. In the morning light, the keep looked even more foreboding than when I first saw it. A flock of Draba birds sat perched atop its crumbling crenellations, their drill-like beaks shimmering in the sunlight. Beneath them, hundreds of skeletons dangled from the keep's ramparts, their hands and legs bound in wire. We ducked beneath the portcullis and crossed the now barren inner ward. Loriana's warden then approached the keep's massive doors and placed his hands on their rusted surface. Today you will learn the most important lesson of your life, he said as he stepped over the threshold. What is that? I asked. How to absolve yourself of a curse. This place, there's dark magic at work here. Worden opened his palm and whispered something into it. Seconds later, a white flame burst forth, illuminating a large swatch of the inner hall. We stepped down from the throne and approached the table, where the noblemen and their followers remained slumped over their overturned cups and plates. Once they settled in, we trapped them here with a hex, Worden said. Not even a fly could have escaped. My skin crawled. The entire place felt like a bad dream. I shouldn't have followed him back here, I thought. It was too late now, though. We were in the heart of darkness, wandering the dust-covered hall like thieves in the night. Worden headed straight for the dead king. Somehow, his bones sat as they had when I first discovered him, cobwebs and dust draped over him. This isn't how I left it, I said. Worden glanced at me. What do you mean? I mean it came alive and spoke to me, I replied. Before I ran it fell apart on the ground, though. Worden turned back to the corpse. Our friend may still be here with us then. How is that possible? I asked. He was a magic man. He might have tried to save himself by locking his soul to his body, he replied. Only he didn't plan on being trapped in here by our hex. He leaned in close to the king's skeletal face. Ah, uh, I fear the turns have not been kind, my friend. He circled the throne, keeping a few footfalls back. What would have happened if they tried to leave? I asked. He pointed toward the entrance, where bones lay scattered across the floor. A hex is powerful magic. Nothing living can escape it. But there is other magic at work here. Black magic beyond my understanding. Kill him, a voice whispered. I glanced over my shoulder. I sensed something close, a presence lingering just out of reach. But the chamber was empty. Worden looked at me and frowned. Did you touch the corpse, Lorianas? Hesitantly, I nodded. I... I didn't know. Worden shook his head. Damn fool. The gods only know what you've infected yourself with. He cupped his hands and raised them to his mouth. As he blew on them, a blue flame danced atop his palms. Seloitanum, he whispered. 
I took a few steps back as the air around us crackled with energy. Pain then exploded across my arm as the dull green glow returned. Priyo Tiliandama, Worden shouted. Leave this man of flesh and blood. Walk the final walk to the kingdom of the dead and leave the living to their realm. Stop him, the voice hissed in my head. He'll kill us both. I fell to my knees. A primal urge was overwhelming me, unnatural thoughts of death and violence churning to the surface. At that moment I wanted to kill the Lorianas, to snap his neck in two and bathe in his blood. Stop it, I cried. Worden raised the blue flame higher above his head. Be judged and follow your final path. The same green aura surrounding me suddenly engulfed the skeleton. The bones began to vibrate, shaking off decades' worth of dust. Then the king's skull turned toward the Lorianas. Bastard, it hissed. Free me. Free me from this curse. Worden closed his eyes and mumbled unintelligibly beneath his breath. The skeleton turned its empty eye sockets toward me. Kill him, fool, or we'll both be damned to this crypt. I began to rise as ethereal power took control of my body. My hand reached out for the Lorianas' throat, but I fought the impulse and turned away. You are Juridan, the skeleton hissed. I can taste the power in your soul, brother. Free me. Kill this man and free my soul from this prison. I picked up a rock and approached the throne. Worden was still chanting, lost in a trance-like state. I pushed past him and slammed the rock down on the skeleton king's head. The crown fell onto the floor, bent and scuffed as the rest of the skeleton crumpled to dust atop the throne. Worden opened his eyes and grabbed my shoulder. Stop, you fool. I haven't finished yet. Green light engulfed us as I staggered backward. I had regained control of my body and mind, but unbridled energy now flowed through the air, burning my face and hands. Run, Worden shouted. White light erupted atop the throne, illuminating the entire hall. My skin sizzled as heat washed over us. I was blinded and confused, staggering about like a fool. Another energy pulse radiated from the throne, followed by a deafening blast. I fell to the stone floor, my ears ringing. I lay for what felt like an eternity, until finally a hand touched my shoulder. Lorianas. I rolled onto my back and opened my eyes. Lorianas Worden stood above me. His face and hands were covered in black blisters. Can you speak? he asked. I... I think so. He took me by the arm and dragged me onto my feet. We both walked toward the table, limping with every step. Worden pushed aside two corpses and sat me down atop the dust-covered bench. You fool, he said, shaking his head. What happened? You destroyed the shell before I finished excising the Juridan king's soul. We're lucky my enchantment was far enough along that he couldn't take possession of you. I'm s sorry, I breathed. He shook his head. Count yourself lucky. Otherwise, you would be damned to this place like the others. I looked around the table. The skeletons had all turned to dust, but a dim green glow still clung to every surface. Can you walk on your own? Worden asked. I, I think so, I replied. We staggered through the black mouth and back out onto the plain. Worden turned toward the keep and drew a strange symbol in the air. Seconds later, the black jaws slammed shut with a guttural din. This place will never be for the living, he said. Best it remains as we found it. It was raining hard now, a foul black rain that stained everything it touched. I looked at my hands. The green glow still throbbed beneath my flesh, but the black sludge quickly concealed it. Worden led the way across the plain. Occasionally he would guide us around patches of steaming soil, but I was too tired to ask why. It wasn't until I heard a click beneath my foot that I became fully aware of what we were avoiding. Stop, Worden shouted. I froze. The ground around my moccasin was soaked in black rain, but I could see a piece of metal jutting out from the mud. Don't move, Worden said. He crouched down beside me and carefully wiped away the mud. 
To my horror, he revealed a steel plate beneath my heel. You stepped on a culfit. I'm going to need a better description than that. A magic trap, he replied. It's triggered once your weight releases the mechanism within. He got down on all fours, staring at the edges of the device. Can it be, be disarmed? I stammered as my pulse quickened. He shook his head. Only the one who set it can disarm it. So what does that mean? He stood and stared at me. I'm sorry. Sorry, I hissed. A lot of good that does me. Lightning flashed in the distance. I could see Elop clearly now. It was only a few hundred footfalls away, a great black hole on the horizon. But you heard him, I thought. Take one step, and you're a dead man. Worden turned to leave. Wait, what are you doing? I can't help you, Lorianas. But maybe you can help yourself. Don't leave me, I cried. Please, not like this. He glanced over his shoulder. Death awaits us all, my friend. You have but to choose how and when. With that said, he walked toward the castle, vanishing into a cloud of rolling smog. I stood shocked. How could he simply abandon me? What kind of scoundrel was this Lorianas? All right, keep calm, I told myself. Thunder grumbled in the distance as lightning flashed across the sky. I was soaked in black rain and the temperature was beginning to drop. I needed to get back to the castle. But how? Slowly I shifted my weight off of my bad leg. Gods be damned, I whispered. Yet again I had been tossed to the wolves. I felt ashamed of my own naivety. One would have thought a man of sixty-four turns knew better than to trust a Strantodian. Now I would die alone on some windswept plain. My bones scattered amongst the nameless dead. I looked at the trap. It looked harmless enough, like another piece of forgotten trash. Perhaps the magic has dissipated, I thought. I had heard rumors of such things occurring in the Culver Waste. There were once thousands of elemental storms roaming those gods-forsaken lands. But most of the storms had grown so weak over the turns as to not be a threat anymore. I could just run, run as fast as these old legs will carry me, and pray that the magic has weakened. There was a chance I could make it. There had to be. This was not the proper death for a Lorianas, or for anyone. To hell with it, I breathed. I lunged forward. The plate shot into the air behind me, spinning wildly as silver fire sprayed in every direction. I felt the flames engulf me, but they didn't burn. Instead, ice encrusted my flesh. Unable to move, I took a final breath as ice formed over my nose and mouth. My lungs began to burn as panic overwhelmed me. I tried to move, to breathe, anything to break free. But it was futile. Resigned to my fate, I closed my eyes. Death was coming, and I had to prepare myself. Just as my breath ran out, though, a strange, prickling warmth spread throughout my body. At first I thought I was passing out, but then my flesh began to glow as heat radiated from my hands. My mouth opened, shattering the ice. Strange words poured forth, a litany of alien phrases I had never heard before. Seconds later, a sphere of light illuminated the area around me. Carna te adrulis, I cried. A flash of orange fire blasted forth from my body, rippling across the rain-soaked plain. When it reached Elop, there was another blinding flash. I fell to my knees as smoke and flame swirled around me. There was no time to wonder what had happened. For my world had become black. And then there was nothing. Chapter 27 Swine Prefer Pearls I awoke, half submerged in a puddle of black muck. Bones poked out of the mud beside me, and what might have been a shield jabbed me in the chest, I crawled onto my feet as rain pounded my back. I had no idea how long I'd been unconscious, nor could I tell how much air I had left in my canister. I scanned the wasteland. Fog hung over everything, blotting out the horizon. Dazed, I started walking. Everything was coming back to me now. The Black Keep. That bastard, I thought as I balled my fists. 
So much for the Brotherhood of Lorianas. Perhaps it was better this way, though. At least I now knew the make of the man. The rain began to die down. I didn't know where I was, or if I had just been walking in circles for the past call. The fog was all-encompassing, a soupy, green smog that permitted only a few footfalls of visibility. Just keep walking, I told myself. I refused to die out here. My life had already been stolen. I would not let Strantodin claim my soul as well. My muscles ached and my head throbbed. I should be back at Sredin, I thought. With my friends, I missed Radme and Upon. I even yearned for my old desk, with all of its chips and splinters. For here I had nothing. Like an old tool, I was just left out in the rain to rust. A horn sounded in the distance. I froze. A shape was materializing ahead of me. A building. Elop. I picked up my pace. I could clearly see the castle's ghastly silhouette. Anger boiled inside me. Did these devils think they could just discard me after uprooting me from my life? First I deal with that scoundrel, Worden, I thought. I was not a man of physical violence, but it was time to change that. Another horn echoed across the wasteland. As I approached Elop, though, something odd caught my eye. Dozens of figures stood outside the walls, and they were all staring up at the castle. What now? I thought. Suddenly a powerful wind blew away the remaining fog. My heart stopped. Elop's blackened walls were now bone white. What devilry is this? I walked past the Gorkas, but none even took notice of me. Their attention was locked on the castle's white façade. A hand touched my shoulder. I turned. It was Loriana's Worden. Without a word, I slammed my fist into his face. Before he even hit the ground, hands grabbed me and threw me to the mud beside him. Boots and fists then pummeled my back and stomach as men and women howled for my blood. Let him up, gods damn it, someone cried. As fast as it had begun, the beating stopped. Moments later, two soldiers dragged me onto my feet. I dangled in their arms like a rag doll, struggling to breathe. Worden approached me, blood trickling from his bruised nose. Bring him inside and clean him up. The king will want a word with him in private. The soldiers dragged me toward the entrance, tossing servants from our path as people cursed at me. Behind us, Worden turned back to the wall, but not before meeting my eyes one last time and grinning. The king's quarters were garish. All of the furniture was gilt in gold, and dozens of faded paintings covered the walls. I was seated in an incredibly plush chair, two guards standing on either side of me. They had allowed me to clean myself up and change, but the many bruises I had received at the hands of the mob throbbed mercilessly. A door swung open behind me as Loriana's Worden entered the chamber. You can go now, he said to the guards. The men nodded and quickly left the chamber. Worden approached me, a smile upon his face. What in the gods could possibly be so funny? I asked. Worden made no reply. Instead, he took a seat in the shadows and stared at me. Another door suddenly opened on the right side of the room. King Ren swept into the chamber, frowning. So, our new Lorianas has returned from the dead. I bowed my head. King Ren took a seat opposite me in a gaudy gold-covered chair. I take it my men had a little fun with you, eh? He shook his head. For that I am sorry, but you must understand the situation here. He wore a glittering gold robe with black piping on the sleeves. His pale, bald head glowed in the candlelight, and his bloodshot eyes looked dead and empty. What is the situation? I asked. Because as far as I can tell, this man, if you even want to call him that, abandoned me after dragging me back to that accursed keep. That was a necessary evil, I'm afraid, Wren replied. You had passed through a hex. Lucky for you, it didn't kill you. That is one reason you are here. The other is my beloved castle. I looked at Worden, 
but the Lorianas ignored me. He can't help you now, King Ren said. He didn't help me when I needed him, I replied. Why would I expect anything different now? King Ren laughed. Worden is a strict man, yes, loyal to a fault, but he has motives behind his actions. What kind of motives? I asked. We believe you are part Juridan. Do you know what that means? I swallowed. Loriana's Worden spoke of them, magic men born with a natural gift. But I have never shown signs of such power. Not until now, Worden interjected. I glared at the Lorianas. What in the gods are you talking about? King Ren raised a hand, silencing Worden. He then turned to me. I assume you've seen the castle walls. Yes. What happened? We were hoping you could tell us, the king said. After all, it was your power that bleached them. I sat dumbfounded. What were they talking about? I had almost died out there, and somehow they thought I had something to do with the castle walls. It was madness. I beg your pardon, your majesty, but your Lorianas left me on a magic trap to die. When I tried to flee, it knocked me unconscious. That is all I remember. Worden huffed. And you don't recall anything after that? King Wren asked. Nothing. Worden stood. For Lemclain, you are Juridan. I saw you work that magic with my own eyes. You were just watching me out there. I growled. I could have died. Worden huffed again, but the king glared at him. I believe in my Lorianas. He may not be Juridan, but he was schooled on the Isle as a charger. He knows magic and its sources. If he says you were the cause of that explosion, I believe him. I felt my skin crawl. So, now even the king thinks I'm a magic man, I thought. If this rumor were to reach Cilium Dor, I would be summarily stripped of my Lorianas standing. You are Juridan, Lorianas. Whether you like it or not, the king said. So what now? I asked. Am I to be sent back to Cilium Dor? Or will I be jailed for what happened outside? The king laughed. Jailed. He looked at Worden, who was also chuckling. My best people have tried to clean Elop's walls for the better half of a decade. Yet they failed every time. But here you come and accomplish this in a matter of seconds. He rose and approached a small desk beside Worden. The Lorianas watched closely as the king opened a drawer and withdrew a small medallion. I know you've been taught that we here on Strantodin are devils, the king said as he approached me. And perhaps some of us are, but not you, my friend. He halted before me and placed the medallion around my neck. I trembled as it slid down over my chest. I beg your pardon, your majesty, but what is this? This is a medal of king and country. A mark that you have served your master well. It is considered a great honor here. I shook my head. I do not deserve this, your majesty. I understand you believe me to have magical power. But I assure you, I am just a humble Lorianus. I live to serve and serve to live. That is all. I removed the medal and handed it back to him. The king took it, a surprised look on his pale face. This award has never been refused, Lorianas. What gives you the right to turn from such a gesture? I mean no insult to your majesty, I replied. But I can't wear a medal I didn't earn. Worden continued to stare at me, but his expression had changed. He almost looked concerned. The king tossed the medal across the room. Take this fool away, Worden. I have nothing more to say right now. Loriana's Worden stood and bowed. Yes, your majesty. We left the king's chamber and marched in silence down the stairwell until we entered one of the main galleries. Dozens of servants watched as we passed, whispering behind their cupped hands. You made a mistake in there, Loriana's, Worden whispered. I didn't reply. I had nothing to say to this man. He was a traitor to all Loriana's, past and present. Juridan. Someone shouted. More servants stepped out of the shadows. Kill him, another cried. Worden gripped me tighter as he picked up our pace. We rounded a bend 
and entered the abandoned wing of the castle. More shouts echoed behind us, but they quickly faded as we stepped into his quarters. Sit, he said, as he dropped a bar across the door. I obeyed. I was too exhausted to argue any more. Worden took a seat opposite me. He stared at me for some time, his expression blank. Finally he reached into a drawer beside him and withdrew what appeared to be a silver necklace. He looped it around his neck and closed his eyes. Menwatan, he breathed. My heart skipped as the necklace began to glow. It grew brighter and brighter, until finally I had to shield my eyes from it. And then, all at once, everything went dark. Open your eyes, Juridan. Reluctantly, I obeyed. Worden sat before me, studying me like one of his books. What was that? I asked. A temeral. A totem that senses Juridan blood. I blinked. My vision was surprisingly clear. The many black dots and transparent worms that had plagued me for so many turns were mysteriously gone. I glanced at my hands. The skin looked less wrinkled, too, and all of my liver spots had faded away. What is happening to me? Loriana's word and smiled. I helped to awaken your power. Nausea suddenly swept over me. Without thinking, I ran to an open window and lifted my mask to vomit. Worden shot to his feet. Stop. But it was too late. I gagged, and then took a deep breath, even as his hand grabbed my shoulder. Worden stared at me, his eyes wide. By the gods. I glanced at him. I was breathing without the mask, and my lungs were fine. How is this possible? I asked. I told you, you are Juridan. They too could breathe our air without filters. He took my mask and tossed it on a table. We are all ancestors of the magic men. But you must have a direct link in your bloodline. That's the only explanation. I shook my head. There's never been a magic man in my family. My father and his father before him were all Lorianas of normal blood. Worden stood beside me. In the afternoon light, he no longer looked so imposing. His eyes betrayed fear, and his skin was covered in sweat. We will work to learn your roots, he said. But for now, you need to become a Strantodian. Learn our culture and understand our history. The people will not trust you until you embrace your new home. I scanned the wasteland outside the chamber window. Hundreds of people were mulling about the barren filth, all of them staring up at the castle's whitewashed walls. Heed this warning, and heed it well, friend, Worden continued. You must not fight the king. Apologize for your slight today, otherwise you will have an enemy not even a Juridan can withstand. I turned away from the window and slumped back down in the chair. My identity was being stolen. Hadn't I already lost enough since leaving Sredin? How much more would the gods take from me before they let me die? Worden lit another Adrena stick and handed it to me. I shook my head, but he thrust it into my hand anyway. It will ease your nerves and calm the magic within you. Reluctantly, I took the corn husk and inhaled the bitter smoke. The weed burned my lungs, but it didn't make me cough. Instead, it calmed my nerves and slowed my racing heart. I closed my eyes and took another deep breath of Strantodian air. What had been toxic when I first arrived now cooled my lungs and invigorated me. How is this possible? I asked, handing him back the corn husk. I still have much to learn about Juridan, he replied, but together we can discover what is happening inside you. That is, if you're willing to obey me. I met his glassy, bloodshot eyes. Why should I believe a single thing that you say? I knew you were safe out there, he replied. The trap was old and weak. But I needed to test your abilities. To see if you could conjure the power when necessary. I didn't believe him, but there was no point in arguing. I was his prisoner now. Both he and the king could execute me with a single word. I would remain silent, obedient, until it was time not to. Loriana's word and reached into his robe and withdrew a small object. He leaned forward and folded it into my hands. 
I received this several days ago from a crow, he said. I unfolded it. It was a letter. A letter from Radme. My heart alighted. There's something else, he said. Follow me. He stood and opened the door. What about the other servants? I asked. No harm will come to you, not while I breathe. I wanted nothing more than to read the letter. But instead, I tucked it into my pocket and joined the Lorianas. He marched me through the castle in silence, keeping to the lesser used corridors. Finally, we reached the main kitchen. Steam hung heavy in the humid air. Only three cooks were present, and they were too busy preparing for the night's meal to pay us any mind. Worden led me to the corner of the kitchen, where an object sat draped in a grey cloth. You may not trust or like me, and I may not like you, Lorianas, but we Strantodians are not what you think. He grabbed the cloth and pulled it free. My eyes widened. It was my old desk. I approached it and ran a hand across its chipped surface. My heart ached as the familiar nail heads and knots rubbed against my palm, and there was something new on it, a message carved into its wood surface. You are not forgotten, Lorianas, nor will you ever be alone. Your friend and loyal servant, Opon, a tear trickled down my cheek. I could sense my friend in the freshly carved wood. It was a window into a better time and place. I will see you again, Opon, I thought. You can count on that. I turned to thank Worden. But the Lorianas was already gone. Exhausted, I took a seat at my desk and lay my head on the ancient wood. I was home, even if it was just for a short while. And nothing was going to take that away from me. A hand jarred me awake. I looked up, drool dripping down my chin. You're wanted in the great hall, Lorianas. It was one of the cooks, a young man named Gil. Like so many Strantodians, his flesh was white as a ghost, and he was mostly bald. But he had a kind face and a portly build. Do you know what for? I asked, still half asleep. Only that Loriana's Worden made the request. I sighed, rubbing my eyes. What time is it? A call after supper, the boy replied. I found a basin and splashed water in my face. I then adjusted my blue tunic and made sure that there were no stains or wrinkles on it. The other two cooks ignored me as I left. Only Gil met my eyes and bowed. Thankfully, the hallways were mostly empty. A few servants passed me going the opposite way, but none said a word. I rounded a corner and entered the main gallery. To my shock, it was packed with murmuring people. Eyes fell on me as I stepped onto the crimson carpet. The king sat upon his throne on the far side of the room, surrounded by hundreds of noblemen and guards. They all stared silently at me as I approached the king. Presenting Loriana's Falimclane, a voice announced somewhere amongst the crowd. The king stood as I hesitantly approached, his face expressionless. I scanned the area, making sure there wasn't a headsman present. Thankfully, only Loriana's Worden stood beside the king. I reached the base of the throne and took a knee. Your Majesty, King Wren raised a hand. At once, the chamber fell silent. Today is a grand day for Elop, he announced. No longer will it be known as the Black Horror or Sootkeep. We've spent enough turns hidden in the shadows of our toxic clouds. A new day has begun, and all thanks to one man. My heart skipped as every eye fell on me. Lorianus Klain has shown us what it means to serve loyally, no matter our past histories. And for that, I am forever thankful. I met Loriana's Worden's eyes, but the man quickly looked away. Stand, Loriana's, the king said. Stand and accept our gratitude for this, your first act of loyalty toward your new home. I turned as the room erupted with applause. Many of the nobles refused to meet my eyes even as they clapped, and some stood defiant, their hands tucked into their pockets. But there were a few who smiled and bowed. Come, the king said, gesturing for me to step forward. 
I reluctantly climbed the steps onto the platform and approached him. He held the same medallion he had tried to give me earlier. You have done us a great service, Lorianas, an honorable one, and for that, I present you with the Order of Elop. More applause. I met the king's eyes as he placed the medal around my neck. Lorianas Philim Klein, he announced. Cleaner of Elop's walls and master Lorianas. Every nobleman, including those who had avoided me, took a knee and bowed their heads. Even Loriana's word and knelt, though I sensed it took everything he had to swallow his pride. The king smiled at me as the applause filled the chamber. We have much to discuss, Loriana's, he said. Come, join me in my private library. He turned and approached a door located behind his throne. I quickly followed. We entered another enormous room. It was easily three times the size of Sraden's library, with dozens of rows containing books of all sizes and colors. The king took a seat on a plush couch located in the center of the dimly lit room. Like the smaller library, it too was illuminated solely by eerie blue meridium lanterns. Sit, Lorianus, he said. I adjusted my tunic and eased down onto a chair opposite him. I trust you are feeling refreshed. I am at your service, your majesty, I replied. He leaned back, his bloodshot eyes locked on mine. You are not satisfied with this new position, are you? Please speak freely here. I cleared my throat as my pulse quickened. I, I am lost here, your majesty. Lost. Loriana's warden tells me you are quite the fit for Elop. I am trying to find my place, your majesty. But the servants, most won't even look at me. How can I lead them if they do not respect me? They are frightened of you, he replied. You're Desmonian and Juridan. I understand if they are a bit hesitant to speak with you. He raised his goblet. At first I thought he was waiting for a servant to fill it. But then he looked at me. I stood and grabbed the decanter on the table between us. As I poured the black wine into his cup, he sighed. Please sit. I took my seat and waited to be addressed. Loriana's warden has told me what happened at the keep. You are lucky to be alive. Not many men can boast of surviving such a hex. I did nothing, though. You did plenty, he replied. For one, you helped clear that God's forsaken place of those accursed souls. I've brought four charges in over the past five turns, and none could crack the walls. Even Loriana's warden gave it a try. But here you come and walk right through its doors. He sipped his wine, his eyes never leaving me. I am but a simple Loriana's, your majesty, I said. I have never sensed the power, nor have I dabbled with meridium. It is forbidden in my order. He leaned forward and smiled. That is what excites me. You are pure, a jurid and uncorrupted by your power. Those who attacked us were driven mad by their abilities. To have magic flowing unimpeded through your soul, I can only imagine what that does to a man. He finished his wine and raised his cup again. I quickly filled it and remained standing at his side, as was proper etiquette. Oh, sit, Lorianus. You are not at Sredin any more. Here we are more relaxed. I bowed and took my seat. The king stared at me for a time. Finally he put his cup down and crossed his hands over his lap. My father would have had you flayed alive for what you did to our walls, but I am not my father, no matter what they taught you at Cilium Dor. I seek to bring Elop and all of Strantodin out of the shadows, to reclaim our place in the world as one of the greatest kingdoms. That is why you are here, Lorianus. King Donan, he understood this. He was a sickly fool, but a kind man and a good king. He knew your worth, and that's why we came to our agreement. Your agreement, your majesty. His expression became serious. I once loved that man like a brother. Did you know that? I did, I replied. In our youth I met him during a peace summit, when my father was king. Back then our two kingdoms were allies. Strantodin was wealthy beyond measure, thanks to our meridium mines, 
and Decimon was ripe with rare lumber culled from your forests. We shared such great wealth together. It was truly a glorious time. But then my father went mad with the wasting disease. For five turns, he slipped deeper into his insanity and paranoia, until finally he concocted a lie that he had caught both myself and King Donan lying together in bed. As I listened, I tried to keep my composure. He was speaking of things few people knew, or dared to whisper about. But why? What was I to him but a glorified servant? Does this all surprise you? he asked. I, I knew of the rumors, I replied. My king was very open to me. He told me your father was ill and had threatened the peace pact, but I did not know he had gone mad. Father was already slightly mad. Even before the wasting disease burrowed through his brain, King Wren said, but it made him wild and prone to hallucinations. One night when we were visiting Sredin, he convinced himself that your father was spying on him. He marched halfway across the castle with his sword drawn before guards finally calmed him down. He shook his head. War almost broke out right then and there. We fled back across the strait, and within days, my father had our borders shut to all Desmonians forever, all because of a disease, I breathed. King Wren nodded as he sipped his wine. We were never meant to be enemies, he finally said, but my father saw to it we were, and since then Strantodin has played the role of the villain. I'm tired, though. Tired of dwelling within these dark halls, surrounded by toxic gas and nothingness. I need a change, Lorianas. I need you. I'm here to serve, I replied. Will you serve me as you did Donan, though? I am a Lorianas, I replied. I serve my master until we both walk the shadows. That is our way. He nodded. We shall see, Lorianas. We shall see. Chapter 28 A New World I walked back to my quarters confused and exhausted. The medal still dangled around my neck, a heavy piece of onyx inscribed with words I could not read. I felt foolish wearing it, for I had done nothing to deserve it. However, I didn't want to insult the entire castle by pocketing it, so I left it alone. I passed a group of servants. To my shock, they stopped and bowed. This made me quicken my pace. I was not accustomed to such things. On Sredin servants only bowed to kings or noblemen. I approached the kitchen entrance and peered inside. The cooks were hard at work, shouting and chopping, stirring and sweating. The smells of dill and plain weed filled the air, and flames erupted from pans as fat sizzled and popped in ovens. At that moment, I felt at ease. Down here in the steam and chaos I was most at home. I had always danced between two realms, but the pomp and polish of the world above never quite satisfied me. I was a servant, and this was my kingdom, my people. I watched as Gil expertly cut an Algian snapper into three fillets. The boy moved with the grace of a seasoned cook, slicing the meat from the bone as if it were butter. He noticed me and nodded. I did the same. Perhaps I had found my first friend and ally here. I continued on, wandering the gloomy corridors. Finally I reached my chamber and grabbed the door handle. But the door was locked. What now? I mumbled. Lorianus Clane. I turned. A Strantodian of no more than thirty turns stood behind me. He wore the familiar black of House Elop. However, unlike so many of the other servants, his clothes were impeccably clean and unwrinkled. I am to escort you to your new quarters, he said. New quarters, I repeated. Do you mean the dungeons? The man laughed. Quite the opposite, Lorianas. I followed him back down the hall. When we approached the kitchen, he gestured for me to enter. I hesitantly obeyed. The cooks and servants dropped what they were doing and watched as the man approached a large door at the back of the kitchen. I glanced over my shoulder as the man fumbled with a key. Gil and the other cooks watched with excitement as he pulled open the door. Lorianus Klain, welcome to your new quarters. I peered inside. To my shock, 
It was not a linen closet or cell. It was a large room lined with beds. I followed him in and walked toward another door at the far end of the room. Welcome to Elop Castle, Lorianas, he said as he opened the door and stepped back. My jaw dropped. It was a huge bedchamber, filled with beautifully ornate furniture gilt in gold and silver. A grand bed sat in the center, its dust ruffles spun from the finest Nethrarian silk. There were two wash basins filled with water and rose petals, and not one but three dresses wrought of rare Delsium wood. But most shocking of all was the private privy located behind the bed. This was normally a luxury reserved solely for a king. I'm sure you will find everything you need here, the man said. I turned to him and shook my head. Why? It is not my place to question the king, but I think he has taken a liking to you, Lorianas. Some of the cooks were peering through the kitchen door at us. Gil watched as well, his warm smile a beacon of hope in the darkness. My name is Prel Dian, the young man said. I will be your acolyte and assistant from now on. He gestured to one of the dresses. You'll find your uniform and underclothes there. Anything else you need, please don't hesitate to ask. I stood dumbstruck. Compared to my quarters at Sredin, this was palatial. I approached the dresser and felt a tinge of shame wash over me. The uniform they provided was not the black of Strantoden, but the blue of House Sredin. Prell cleared his throat. His Majesty thought you might be more comfortable in Sredin's colors. My emotions spun about inside me like an elemental storm. Since arriving, I had been more of a prisoner than a guest. But now... Please give the king my thanks, I said. It was all I could think of to say. Everything was changing again, my emotions, my standing. Maybe life wouldn't be so bad here after all. Perhaps I had turned to the next chapter in my life. A happy chapter. Only time would tell. The next day I stood beside the king as he ate a breakfast of deviled eggs and rye toast. It was my first morning tending to him, but he did not speak a word to me. Prell entered the room and placed a steamed kettle before the king. He then approached me and leaned into my ear. Loriana's warden used to prepare black leaf tea for him every morning, he whispered. It is his favorite. I nodded my thanks. I will show you how it's made tomorrow. Thank you, Prell, I replied. King Wren poured himself a cup of tea and slowly sipped it. I stared at the kettle. Loriana's warden had been absent since the day I received my medal. I will not lie. This came as a relief. I no longer trusted him and his judgmental gaze had become a bit too much to bear. Perhaps there would come a day when we could cast aside our differences and work together to bring Elop into a new era. That was if he ever returned. For now, though, I alone was in charge of every servant in Elop Castle. The king finished his meal and continued sipping his ginger tea. When he was done, he left the room without a word and shut the door behind him. What's become of your uniform, Lorianas? I turned. Prince Dario stood behind me, a grin upon his pale face. I looked down at my tunic. I had traded the blue uniform of House Sredin for the black of Elop. If this was to be my home, I needed to start acting like it. I thought it more fitting, Your Grace. The boy smiled. Indeed, Lorianas, indeed. He sat down in his father's chair and crossed his legs. He then gestured for me to join him. Are the quarters I provided you up to your standards? He asked. I paused. I was told I had your father to thank. Father. He couldn't care less if you lived in a gutter outside the walls. I bowed. You have my thanks then. It is beyond anything I have ever been given. Prince Dario nodded. And you have mine. It's not every day one's life is saved by a... Desmonian. I sat down before him, humbled and overjoyed by my reward. It may have been a simple bedchamber, but to me it was a sign that I had been accepted as Elop's new Lorianas. For a fleeting moment I almost felt whole again, but then the sadness returned, 
hastened by the memory of my friends back home. Will you help me, Philem? the prince asked. Anyway, I am able, your grace. I don't mean with the servants or kitchens. Will you help me undo the wrongs of my father and his father before him? This took me by surprise. I am a Lorianas. I live to serve, and serve to live. Dario's smile widened. You have much to learn, Philem, he said. A jurid in Lorianas. I never thought I'd live to see the day. Anxiety twisted my stomach. The power had not shown itself since the day of the explosion. And I pray I never see it again, I thought. But I knew it wasn't the end. I could sense the ethereal power stirring inside me, waiting for the day it would reveal its full strength again. I just hoped I could control it, when the time came. Lorianas! I snapped out of my daze. My apologies. Your grace. You made my home the jewel of the realm again, he said. I shook my head. I did nothing of the sort, your grace. Indeed you did, and without the aid of my father or warden. He looked out a nearby window at the setting sun. A strange, golden wash covered the land, foggy and filled with diffused sunlight. Father doesn't care about his people or the realm, and least of all you. Everything is a trophy to him, a prize to be flaunted to his every enemy. Your grace, the prince forced a smile. You still have a lot to learn about us, Lorianas, but perhaps we can learn together and maybe steer this kingdom from my father's grip. I met his eyes. He was being sincere. But what he says is tantamount to treason, I thought. King Ren was our ruler and master. Nothing could change that, not even the prince. Will you help me? the prince asked. Help you how, your grace? He grinned. Help me make this place a kingdom worth fighting for. Help me introduce us to the world again, and leave behind my father's stink. I looked around the chamber. What he was talking about was far more dangerous than simply cleaning the castle walls or reorganizing the staff. This was treason whispered from the lips of a bastard prince. But he was a prince I had come to like and respect, for in him I saw an ally, perhaps even a friend. If the two of us worked together, we just might be able to transform Elop back to its former glory. But the father will not like this, I thought. The king's trophy was meant to be flaunted, not put to work. But I couldn't just sit by without lending my expertise to this place. I was a servant, plain and simple. Whatever I could do to serve the realm was my highest priority. I hesitantly nodded. I think I would like that, your grace. He smiled as he raised his wine glass. Here's to a new world, one where the possibilities are endless. I joined him in the toast. What shall our next order of business be, your grace? Prince Dario shrugged, undoing everything my line has done to Strantodin for the past one hundred turns. I cocked an eyebrow. A bold proclamation. Dario grinned. Bold moves make for bold changes. I nodded. Let us do it all together then. Dario's smile widened. I like you, Lorianas. I bowed my head. And I you. Dario stood. Well then, shall we begin? To be continued.